journals and has and in, been an investigator in, of, of over 200 clinical trials. Over to Dr. Abhishek Karan to talk to us on drug-induced liver injury. Thank you, thank you, kind chair. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to deliver this talk on uh, a very different topic, of course. Uh, that is drug-induced liver injury. And uh, to in today's presentation, we'll be discussing briefly about the uh, injury, how does it cause to liver, functions of liver, and a brief classification of the drug-induced liver injury, mechanism and the risk factors, grading and severity. We'll also discuss about the signs and symptoms. Of course, something about diagnosis and management. We'll also discuss something about vanishing bile duct syndrome as well, which is another entity on, of the drug-induced liver injury. So it's a bigger challenge. Why? Because it's often underlooked, but it's a very, very serious problem because drugs like acetaminophen overdose it can cause daily, but there are other drugs and the biological agents which are responsible for causing acute liver failure and causing major clinical and regulatory challenge. So DLE is an uncommon but potentially lethal adverse drug reaction in population-based studies of different methodologies. The annual incidence is between 2.4 to 13.9, but it is uh, very common with certain drugs. Some life-saving drugs like cancer medications are used with caution despite of the risk of the cancer injury, the liver injury, because there are no therapy alternatives or because the benefit still outweighs the risk. DLE may also mimic any, any known type of liver disease and there are several well-recognized phenotypes of that which, do, which are defined based on the clinical and pathological criteria. So <clears throat> let us see what the liver does in a brief. It serves as the body's chemical engineer and control center and regulates the various metabolism of internal compounds and it also processes compounds from external sources like drugs. It is very adaptable and can regrow even if two-thirds resected, regenerates rapidly, and it's very, very important that enzyme and transporter functions can be altered with the help of liver function. So if you look at the liver physiological functions, it's been involved with formulation, secretion of bile, nutrient and vitamin metabolism, detoxification and activation of various substances, synthesis of plasma proteins, and of course, helping in the immune system by the help of Kupfer cells. It has got many assaults of different kinds. We all know it's one of the organs which really has been vulnerable, but uh, how it really adapts, it's another very, very exciting thing. It's been, uh, been assaulted by many insults like alcohol, drugs, various other environmental chemicals, uh, over-the-counter use of estaminophen, of course, diseases, hormones, cytokines, various kind of adulterants, proteins, biller beans, dietary supplements, food additives, and even the herbal products these days, which are one of the main causes of causing liver injuries. And it has got its own responses in the form of cholestatic ways, the <coughs> hepatocellular injury, a mixed response, and can mimic any other known disease cause, and it can even regenerate. So if you uh, ask about drug-induced liver injury, liver may injury may be produced by a large variety of the substances. Type of uh, degree of liver injury is extremely varied and may mimic entire spectrum of hepatobility disorder. Central role played by liver is clearance and biotransformation of chemical susceptible to drug liver induced injury. Drugs can initiate progressive chronic liver disease and are single leading cause of <coughs> acute liver failure. So going to the classification, it goes uh, in, and is divided basically into three parts, idiosyncratic, indirect, and intrinsic. The idiosyncratic is further divided into ty two types. It's, it can be allergic or non-allergic. Intrinsic is basically predictable in type of injuries, which are linked to the toxic exposure levels of a drug or its metabolites, whereas idiosyncratic are rare and unexpected uh, given at the drug pharmacological action linked to yet poorly understood interplay of individual host susceptibility and other factors, whereas indirect is linked to an unwanted biological action of a drug on an individual patient. If you look at <coughs> the comparison between these three, indirect, direct, and idiosyncratic, the direct, that is intrinsic, is basically dose-related, whereas the other two are not dose-related. The latency period in a direct a liver injury is much shorter compared to the indirect or the idiosyncratic type. Rate of reoccurrence or occurrence is very, very high in direct injury compared to the indirect or the idiosyncratic type. 
it is predictable, whereas indirect and idiosyncratic are obviously not on most of the occasions. In the implicated drugs, which is very important to understand, indirect liver injuries like estraminophen, nicotinic acid, aspirin, cocaine, and many cancer chemotherapies, amiodarone, methotrexate, can be one of the causes. Indirect can be related to the very high dose of corticosteroids and anti neuroplastic agent, immune checkpoints inhibitors, protein kinase inhibitors, of course, some of them new moral clonal antibodies, idiosyncratic isonized, one of those drugs which have been commonly used, amoxicillin, clavulanic acid combination, macrolide antibiotics, fluorocrinolone, statins, and diclofenac, and certain herbal dietary supplements often are uh, linked to that. The various pathological mechanisms you see, which are linked to the same, are liver damage occur if the parent drug or the metabolite concentrations in liver cells exceed a toxic threshold in case of a direct liver injury, whereas as I already told you, indirect is unintended effect of a drug actions on the liver, and idiosyncratic is adaptive immune response to a parent drug or the drug metabolite, which may con contribute to the liver injury. So there are various mechanism and risk factors if you discuss. In most of the instances, the mechanism, the risk factors are very poorly understood, despite of the low instance. The main factors, although they which have been uh, postulated, are one of the uh, thing is age. Age may be one of the risk factors for drug-induced liver injury. In uh, regarding with the specific drugs, as has been seen with nitrofluorantoin, isoniazid, and fluoxetine. On the other hand, uh, the children are uh, who are less than 10 years of age are, have increased risk of uh, dealing with the anti-epileptic drugs or the valproic acid. Talking about the gender, females and males appear to be have similar risk of DLE. However, females were found to have increased risk of developing liver injury from nitrofluorantoin, diclofenac, fluoxetine, and tetracycline. Ethnicity, of course, very little is known about the risk of DLE as far as the ethnicity is concerned. But uh, some of the studies group that they have been found that chronicity and this is defined as elevated liver test for six months after the presentation of liver injury was more common in African and Americans rather than other races. Medical commodities and pre-existing liver disease, there's very little data to suggest association, but uh, diabetes along with obesity has been one of the risk factors. Once you see methotrexate uh, induced liver injury uh, in uh, these kind of patients. So co-infections with HIV and CV has also been one of the major risk factors for hepatotoxicity of anti-tubercular drugs as well. So we must, must be very careful while prescribing that. So DLE can mimic all known forms of acute and chronic liver uh, diseases. A particular drug may be associated with more than single biochemical pattern of liver injury. And there are different phenotypes of presentation once we talk about liver injuries. The form of liver toxicities can be very many. It can be in the form of zonal necrosis in which the liver injury is confined to a particular zone of the liver, hepatitis, where there's inflammation of the liver, cholestasis, bile cannot flow from the liver to the duodenum because of which the cholestasis is there, steatosis, building up of excessive flat within the liver, sometimes triggering the inflammation in the later stages, granuloma, which is localized nodular inflammation, vascular lesion due to uh, the, the drug-induced liver injury, or the neoplasm. So these are the different clinical pathological phenotypes, as I already discussed. They are of various types, as I have uh, discussed. Acute hepatic necrosis, hepatitis, cholestatic and mixed hepatitis, hypersensitivity syndrome with liver involvement, different uh, severe cutaneous adverse reactions, drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis, and they have their own different kind of presentations every time. Hepatic steatosis, uh, that is sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, nodular regenerative hyperplasia, neoplasia, granulomatous hepatitis, acute fatty liver, vanishing bind duct syndrome, which is another important entity which we'll be discussing separately, and pileosis hepatitis. So this is the cellular mechanism which has been actually linked behind causation of any liver injury. There, there are reactive metabolites which cause covalent binding and oxidative stress, which cause massive mitochondrial injury, intracellular stress, sensitization of tumor necrotic factor alpha and altered re immune response as a result of haptin. In the end, it might result in different phenotypes or different forms of liver injury, maybe in the form of necrosis, 
because of intracellular cell, even apoptosis, due to the sensitization of tumor necrotic factor alpha as well, and similarly with altered immune response. So if you talk about the signs and symptoms, it may vary from uh, yellowing of the skin and sclera, fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, nausea and vomiting with the patient might come up, or passing with a dark or tea-colored urine. So how will you proceed towards such kind of cases? We need to have a pre-planned LFT while evaluating a drug. Once drug is initiated, careful history taken has to be taken once you are suspecting a liver injury. Why? Because you are ruling out other etiologies and evaluate the type of liver injury. What kind of liver injury is it? If it is DELI, then you have to proceed towards the diagnosis of uh, DELI, whether it's a hepatocellular or mixed type or a cholestatic type. In case of cholestatic, careful monitoring is important and you have to discontinue the drug if you're suspecting it is related to a drug. In cholestatic type, the symptoms are related to liver such as jaundice and the total bilirubin is more than three times the upper limit of normal and PTI in our are more than 1.5 times. In case of a hepatocellular or a mixed type, the ALT levels are, the <coughs> are more than eight above the upper normal limit or five upper normal limit for more than two weeks and to total bilirubin and INR are sometimes often raised in, uh, in uh, association. So diagnosis. So the International Daily Working Group has suggested that any one of the following laboratory criteria of serum analytics are indicators of Daily once the other causes of liver injuries have been excluded. So the ALT equal to greater than five and ALT uh, than the up upper limit the ALT equal greater than three upper than upper limit or the total bilirubin value more than two times the upper limit, upper normal limit and no or minimal elevations in alkaline phosphatase level and alkaline phosphatase level equal to greater than two times the upper normal limit when the source of increased ALP is the liver, of course. The <coughs> there are other studies of uh, DELI which are the post-marketing studies which have use different kinds of biochemical criteria to identify potential daily causes. Again, they've been taking different kinds of tests like ALT and OST, which are uh, said to be significant if they are more than five times the upper limit of normal, or ALP is more than two times the upper limit of normal on two consecutive occasion. Total bilirubin, which is elevated 2.5 times, or INR, which is more than uh, 1.5 times, along with the altered liver profile uh, as you just can see over here. So the grading of severity is another important factor. Once we go and managing the uh, drug-induced liver injury, it is important to grade the severity. Only then we can treat it. Various approaches have been uh, seen to assess the severity of the drug-induced liver injury. An ALT of more than eight and the upper limit normal or more than three and along with total bilirubin, hospitalization for the liver injury and death or liver transplants are categories ha which have been studied. There are various categories which are basically given by different kind of study groups. These are US induced liver injury network and international daily expert working group. They have categorized into five categories, mild, moderate, moderate to severe, severe and fatal. The mild ones are having only elevated ALT or ALP, but total bilirubin levels and the INR levels are less than 2.5 and 1.5. In the case of moderate, the elevated ALT and ALP are total bilirubin are elevated more than 2.5 and INR is more than 1.5. Moderate to severe having elevated ALT, ALP, total bilirubin and INR and hospitalization or ongoing hospitalization due to DELI. And of course, elevated ALT and ALP and the total bilirubin levels along with the hepatic failure and other organ failure due to DELI uh, which has been marked by ascites and encephalopathy other form of severe liver injuries and fatal are the ones who are proceeding towards the death or candidates for liver transplantation due to the liver injury. So this is one of the law which has been uh, actually used in case of liver injury in order to diagnose it, which says that amongst those who are having enzyme elevation three times the upper limit limit, some with increased total bilirubin limit more than the two times upper limit limit with no cholestasis, so that is with or without normal alkaline phosphatase and no other reasons can be found to explain the com combination requires clini uh, clinical adjudication to determine probable cause of the liver dysfunction. So this is very important law which has been linked uh, to DELI 
clinical management of suspected DLE is actually foremost is the drug discontinuation. So automatically stopping drugs which is causing the liver injury. So liver can adapt and become tolerant and close observation is warranted in most of the occasions. Preventing progression to the functional impairment is very important. You have to withdraw the drug if the ALT and ST levels are more than eight times upper limit normal. If it is more than five times for more than two weeks or if it is more than three times and alongside there is a rise in the total bilirubin levels or INR coexistingly or whenever it is more than three times along with the symptomatic phase, you need to follow them, these, uh, these patients very closely until the enzymes return to the normal or the baseline and the symptoms enzymes may progress even after discontinuation and the re-challenge can be considered as well in certain cases but not for patients with significant rise enzymes and not for patients with accompanying signs of immunological reaction. So you need to be cautious in these categories of patient. You should not re-challenge. So gathering more information is another important point. Why? Because you have to rule out other causes which is causing the liver damage in the form of acute viral hepatitis, alcoholic and autoimmune hepatitis, biliary tract disorders, cardiovascular causes and other uncommon causes. So you have to also look at the drug and exposure of the dietary supplements, occupational exposure to the toxic agents, and of course, remembering the Heis law, once you have uh, been really confirmed, then you actually label it to be a drug-induced liver injury. Vanishing bile duct syndrome is another important phenotype of the drug-induced liver injury, which is rare, serious outcomes, and complication of drug-induced liver injury, which is marked by clean, clear, very chronic cholestasis and histologically by loss of intrahepatic bile ducts. It is typically occurring in the bout of severe cholestatic hepatitis, often with immune allergic features. And the, it's a complication of acute drug injury, generally becoming manifested one to six months after the onset of injury. So the typical symptoms might be in the form of pruritis, fatigue, jaundice, sometimes with severe dyslipidemia, hypercholestemia, skin xanthomas that can be painful and interfere with the ex everyday activities, particularly when the present in palms and soles. There's persistent elevations in alkaline phosphatase levels and bilirubin, which is often occurring despite of the decrease in the seven serum amino transferase levels with the normal or near normal range. Serum cholesterol levels are often raised in these patients and they have been linked to drugs like amoxicillin, clavulanic acids, penicillin, macrolide antibiotics, fluoroquinolones, sulfonamides, antifungal agents, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, phenothiazines, TCAs and aromatic anticonvulsants. So persistent elevation of the alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin for more than six months after the onset of drug-induced liver injury is one of the diagnostic criteria. Absence of clinical or any serological evidence of primary biliary cholangitis, sclerosing cholangitis, and graft-versus-host disease, and liver biopsy is one of the gold standard in all these cases of because of you have to uh, look at whether there are any uh, vanishing small bile ducts in the sample taken at least one month after the onset of the injury. So it can slowly resolve on its own and ma major focus on our management should be avoidance of the further injury. We can use nutrition and vitamins and other mineral replacement in the form of ADEK and are important in the managing patients, uh, which is although a rare condition. Corticosteroids are often used in severe form of uh, cholestasis who are not responsive to the conventional treatments. These are my reference, and uh, with this, I would like to conclude. And I would love to welcome any questions from the audience. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek Karun, for that excellent lecture. Before I open this for discussion, I, I have a couple of queries. One of the most important cause of drug-induced liver injury in India is ATT-induced hepatotoxicity. Yes. It's very common, and the problem with ATT is that uh, we, it's a prolonged course, six to nine months, and we often have to reuse the same drugs after the injury is subsided. So I would like your comments on ATT-induced hepatitis. And the other drug which has um, very much implicated, especially in last two years during the pandemic, was uh, this Ayurvedic uh, drugs yes. like uh, Kadha and Giloy. Especially we had heard a lot of Giloy-induced liver toxicity. So I would like your comments on both these aspects, and then we open this for discussion. Uh, Drug-induced liver injury uh, due to antitubercular drugs is basically a, actually another huge topic but as you rightly said, sir, uh, because uh, the antitubercular drugs are the leading cause of liver injuries, and we need to be cautious. 
Once we initiate AT tree ducts, we need to evaluate the baseline liver function and then reassess these functions periodically in all these patients who've been initiated on anti-tubercular therapy. And alongside, if we found that the ALT levels and AST levels are increasing and alongside the serum bilirubin levels are increasing and the patient is clinically uh, symptomatic, we need to taper the dose of the drugs or sometimes even stop it. And after some time, after giving a break, maybe give a re-challenge to these patients. So carefully elevating because every patient is different. Every patient is different and the management and approach to every patient is also different. Sometimes we use a triple combination rather than a quadruple combination which is available for the, uh, the, uh, the management of tuberculosis because of the same. That's the reason why these combinations are there in the market. The second question, as you rightly said, the herbal drug supplements. The her herbal drug supplements, they have got no threshold upper limit and which are the guidelines which are the, the, the things which have been laid by the government of India. And the variety of the drug-induced liver injury which has been caused by these herbal supplements can vary. And it can mimic any sort of liver injury. And we need to be very cautious while giving all such herbal supplements because the patient can be taking these things in any amount. What about those herbal supplements which are supposed to be protecting the liver? A big market from all the alcoholics. For example, Liv 52 is promoted as protecting the liver from uh, alcoholic liver damage. So, but what again, is your sir, opinion it has on to that? Be, it has to be seen how, in how, what amount they need to be taken because everything is related to the amount of the drug which they are taking. If they take, the patient is taking a huge amount, that good thing might damage the liver as well. So you need to be cautious the amount at which we are giving and they, that is how we will elicit whether the drug okay. is harmful or not. Any questions from the floor? Any from the audience, please? Sir, you want? Thank you very much you, for your uh, excellent lecture, Dr. Arun. Uh, we thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity. Along with my co-chair, Professor Ashish Kumar, we would like to conclude this session. Thank you, sir, for that lucid presentation. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, sir, and Dr. G.R. Sridhar, sir, to please uh, continue the proceedings with the Dr. A. Muruganathan oration. Welcome all the attendees, delegates, and faculties for this very prestigious session of our conference, which is in the name of our living legend, who has been the governor before me of this American College of Physicians India chapter, Dr. A. Muruganathan. Dr. Muruganathan has worked very hard to make this India chapter visible on the world screen on the world map, and uh, I'm trying my best to keep that legacy continued, although you can understand how difficult it is to continue the work what Dr. Mugnathan has already done. So keep all these things uh, continued year by year. We thought that we should start an oration with the name of Dr. Muruganathan, and uh, 
this is the second oration. First oration we have started in Goa last year in, our, in last year in our conference, and we are very happy, very uh, renowned personality, a gastroenterologist of the well-famed gastroenterologist, Dr. D. Nageshwar Reddy, has agreed to deliver this oration. He took the time for us. He traveled from Hyderabad, although he is very busy person, but still he could some time for this oration, and he came here. I will request my co-chair, Dr. Jia Shridhar, to introduce himself, uh, to introduce Dr. D. Nageshwar Reddy to, all, uh, to this August House. Uh, good morning. <coughs> Looking at uh, his brief uh, curriculum vitae, to introduce Dr. D. Nageshwar Reddy would need a half an hour's oration to start from his uh, graduation to his current uh, accomplishments. You see his degrees themselves, they fill in a whole line. He's the chairman of Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad, the past president of World Endoscopy Organization, starting his career in Karnul Medical College, then to Madras Medical College and PGI. Ever since, it has been a series of uh, accomplishments in terms of both academics as well as administrative capabilities. And uh, I'm not, I'm not a gastroenterologist per se, but I'm not aware of any important gastroenterology awards which have not been graced by Professor Nagacharadi. Before all of us are awed by his accomplishments, there's one small thing which uh, I have uh, received from his former roommate who said uh, his first publication, if not one of his first, was as a result of peering through his father's uh, microscope at home. And he published the letter in Lancet. That's the news I got from Dr. P. V. Rao. And uh, as they say that uh, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. And that has been the first uh, step of uh, Professor Nagar Sharedi. <coughs> Professor Reddy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sridhar, for that very kind introduction. I'd like to thank uh, Anuj and the ACP for giving me this opportunity to give this uh, oration. Uh, can I have this slide? For me, it's uh, not only a honor, but actually a double honor, because uh, this oration is the name of uh, Dr. Murugunathan, who's been an iconic figure uh, in this society. In fact, um, he's well known as a physician all over the country, but the way he created a wholesome physician uh, practice, oh, can, it's on, no? Uh, can you hear me there? In the, okay. So, and also subsequently the way he then sub, sub specialized into teaching, especially into hypertension, and the way he created this awareness and built up ACP, I think it's a real iconic figure, and to me, uh, it's a big honor. Thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. It's a big honor to be a part of this uh, meeting and oration. Uh, I'm going to talk on a subject which you would have heard from a diabetologist or, a, or also from cardiologists. Generally, gastroenterologists don't talk about metabolic syndrome because uh, it was felt that it was diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, which are the most common problems with uh, metabolic syndrome. But in recent years, for the last five or six years, there's been a dramatic insight into the etiopathogenesis of this disorder. And we discovered that not only most of it resides in the gastrointestinal tract, the whole starting point is from the GI tract, and I'll explain to you how. And that's how, how gastroenterologists and hepatologists have now got uh, very involved with this disorder. In fact, uh, we seem to have come, uh, come to the dead end of our evolution uh, with the resultant metabolic disease, but we start, have had to de-evolve now to become, get rid of these problems. Of course, to audience like this, the definition of metabolic syndrome, I wouldn't like to talk about, but the three most important concepts of uh, metabolic syndrome, the diabetes, obesity, and NFLD, are the three 
things that bother us as clinicians. We keep seeing these patients when they come to us. And these are the three pandemics affecting hundreds of millions of people, three chronic diseases poorly managed, all dramatically increasing prevalence. So any physician, I think it's very important to have a strong grip on this disease. And fortunately for us, we are now understanding how this is evolving. In fact, for the gastroenterologists, not only the metabolic syndrome is associated with uh, NAFLD, the gallstones, steatosis, uh, and then of course, GERD and so on. So a lot of problems. But the most important problem is liver related. In fact, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome are almost synonymous. Uh, you in, in, uh, it starts with simple steatosis, goes into NASH, then fibrosis, advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, and finally, a significant percentage of these patients turn up with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So the whole spectrum evolves along with this metabolic syndrome they have. So what is the gastroenterologist's view? Of course, we have some role in the pathogenesis. The affected organs are involved. And of course, increasingly, GI drugs and GI methodology are being used to treat this syndrome. Uh, I'll come a little later into the pathogenesis because we have some very, very interesting data and concepts of how metabolic syndrome occurs. The affected organs are, of course, uh, everything right from the esophagus to gallbladder to pancreas to colon and so on. In fact, marked increase in colonic cancers in these patients. And of course, in addition to the diet and exercise and drugs, we have an important component which I'm going to spend 10 minutes on, which is metabolic endoscopy. How we can reverse the whole metabolism with endoscopy. Very interesting concepts. So our role is now in managing this, but let me come first to how we understood now what happens in these patients. What happens is normally our concept as physicians has been that the whole metabolic process in the body is controlled by the pancreas, right? So we think pancreas secretes uh, insulin, pancreas secretes so many glucagon, so many other hormones controlling whole metabolic syndrome. But this is wrong. This concept is wrong. In fact, the whole metabolic process is controlled by second, third, and fourth part of the duodenum. In fact, it's a nature's mechanism because when we eat food, the first organ that comes into contact with digested food is the duodenum, right? So it's nat natural that the duodenum should be the head of the orchestra controlling the whole metabolic process. And this we have discovered now. Now what happens normally when you have food, the food passes, digested food passes through the duodenum. As it's passing through the duodenum, in the duodenum there are enteroendocrine cells, the so-called neuroendocrine system of the duodenum, which gets stimulated by the food. So this stimulation results in a variety of hormones. Those which are pro-insulin are called incretins, anti-incretins are called anti-incretins. So two sets of hormones. There are now a variety of these have been actually identified. I'll come to that a little later. But with this, the anti-incretins are now getting better identified because they become very important. The one of them is the insulin resistant factor and other one is the diabetic intestinal peptide. So this balance of incretins and anti-incretins results in euglycemia and eumetabolism, normal metabolism, right? Now, when we eat food which is containing highly refined products, now this is happening. Look at the sugar consumption in our country, markedly increasing. A variety of ways how we are actually tempted with this high refined sugar food. What happens then? This is what happens. You take this highly refined food and as the food passes through, the anti-incretins increases. The reason why this happens in nature is that if you give refined sugars, it goes into the body, stimulates high amount of insulin, then you're going to reactive hypoglycemia. To prevent that, body starts increasing the anti-incretins to try and balance. So what happens because of this? Because of this, insulin resistance develops. The whole central concept of metabolic syndrome is insulin resistance. This insulin resistance not only gives rise to increased blood sugar, TGL, NASH, and so on, the whole system now goes into a different gear. And this insulin resistance is responsible for rest of the things that happen. So you see there's a fine balance between uh, incretins, and so-called anti-incretins, and this balance is disturbed because of this um, um, hypermetabolic state that occurs. So it's a primarily the Westerners' diets, lifestyles, of course, there's a genetic background, 
and in, we know that the Indian population has got certain genes which make it more prone for this, then you get the insulin resistant syndrome and this, actually the name of metabolic syndrome should be changed to insulin resistant syndrome and then you have the various disorders, type 2 diabetes, then you have of course NASH, uh, PCOS and so many other diseases that are consequence of this. So this is the central mechanism and the consequence comes this. This is again very interesting now because the duodenum is the center of all this. What are the studies? In fact, 50 top laboratories in Europe and uh, US which are, are studying the neuroendocrine mechanisms of the duodenum now and I think the next few years the Nobel Prize would be from that area. They have extremely well studied how variety of hormones are produced and there is evidence now this is insulin resistant factor. They're trying to identify what this peptide is but this insulin resistant factor acts on the glucose pathways in the cell giving rise to insulin resistance and the variety of these have been very clearly identified. So there's a huge amount of research. There's other research also to support this. For example, if you take biopsies from the duodenum from normal people and those who have type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome, you'll find a markedly increased neuroendocrine cells. Similarly, if you take rats and feed them the western chow, western diet, they develop uh, typical features in the duodenum of this markedly increased neuroendocrine cells producing insulin resistance factor. So the huge amount of experimental evidence to support that. So in other words, if you're treating these patients with insulin resistance or metabolic disease, it's like treating patients NF. So treatment is same for NFLD and for metabolic syndrome. And again, I'll show you there are a variety of treatments that are now available. Diet, exercise, drugs, and of course, surgery. Exercise is something that we've been, uh, I think, very clearly shown that exercise, um, through its mechanisms of decrease of weight, but also through other mechanisms, actually has a very positive impact on decreasing the insulin resistance and increasing insulin sensitivity. That is well known. Uh, diet is more interesting because there's now a lot of uh, noise about diet that's coming in. Um, what is now becoming more and more obvious in the literature is that the so-called change in the food type the, or the quantity of diet, the Atkins diets and so on, are not very useful on long-term basis. Some short-term benefits, but long-term they're more. The time-restricted diet, which commonly is called intermittent fasting, is becoming much more commonly used because it's easier to follow and therefore the so-called time-restricted diets are now becoming very popular. In fact, way back, this was a very important paper, in 1997 published in New England Journal of Medicine, we showed that um, calorie restriction uh, in rats resulted in prolonging the life of these rats. So we restrict the calorie. But the problem is calorie restriction is a very difficult thing to follow for humans because of so many other things that are coming in. So when rats were forced, it's okay, but not in human beings. So the alternative in, is concentrate on the type of food and the type of feeding. There's again a lot of uh, articles in gastroenterology. For example, American Journal of Gastroenterology, whole issue was food as a medicine, how we can use food as a medicine. And this uh, Mediterranean diet has become more and more commonly used. In fact, uh, we did a very interesting study uh, in our institute recently where <coughs> our hospital kitchen made the typical Mediterranean diet in conjunction with an Israeli company. And then we divided our residents into two groups. Those uh, were given normal diet and one group was given Mediterranean diet for a period of three months. And those who took the Mediterranean diet had a dramatic decrease in their um, lipid profile, weights, and also the fats in the liver. The whole metabolic process was called. Again, this is not so easy to follow because cooking Mediterranean diets in a house are not so easy. So this is now uh, regarded as one of the best diets. And but more important now is increasing the gut microbiome role in these patients. Increasing evidence that certain types of microbiome can actually produce alcohol in the small intestine and produce liver disease like alcoholic liver disease. But the patient is not taking alcohol. So we call it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but actually the bacteria are producing alcohol. So it's called the auto-brewery syndrome, where sometimes patients even have got intoxicated and you look at the blood levels, they have a high alcohol. But they're not taking alcohol. It's just that it's the microbes in their gut which is producing the alcohol. So this is again becoming very, very important based upon the diet now. For example, we know that when you eat a heavy lunch, you want to go and sleep, you feel drowsy. 
we feel that's because the stomach is getting all the blood supply, the brain is, that's not the case. The reason for that is the certain amount of substances which microbes are producing in the gut, which are going into the brain, producing this intoxication. So these concepts are coming in. So coming back to the intermittent fasting, I think this has now become an important component of treating these patients with metabolic syndrome. For example, uh, you know the window period, uh, there are two types of intermittent fasting. Uh, daily fasting, at 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of food, or in the ratio of 5 is to do 5 days you eat and 2 days you do alternate days. So the variety of things are there. Again, I won't go too much into this. Uh, but what happens with intermittent fasting is a metabolic switch. Liver-based glucose burning is going to adipose-based burning, and you can see it very clearly how fats from ketones are getting burnt rather than the carbs. So this is, and uh, the effect is there. You can see it in all the organs, including a decrease in the increase in the antioxidants that's occurring in these people. So there is a very nice review in New England Journal that I'll recommend you to read uh, recently. So intermittent fasting includes all aspects of metabolic syndrome, including the fatty liver, including A1C. But there are several hurdles. You know, as Indians, we are used to this three times a meal, morning, afternoon, evening. Very difficult to go into intermittent fasting. So although exercise and intermittent fasting or diet is supposed to be helpful, it's not possible in all these patients. So we come to drugs as the next effect. And uh, recently, Dr. Rashish Kumar in Varanasi gave a brilliant lecture on this. So I borrowed this, some of the slides from him. Uh, th this is the new drugs that are coming, GLP-1 agonists, GLT-2 inhibitors, and PIPA. So let me just talk a little on this because as physicians, I know your interest would be on this. GLP-1 agonists, for example, uh, they are, I think, now coming into the market in a big way. They have several positive effects on the metabolic syndrome, including a decrease in hepatic insulin resistance. This becomes a very important factor, decreased hepatic uh, deposition of fat. Uh, of all this, a lot of noise and semaglutide, which is now available in oral form in our country. Uh, of course, oral form is not recommended for NFLD in, by FDA, but we are using it in our country now. It, this is the uh, injectable form, which New England Journal article very clearly showed its efficacy in decreasing steatosis in these patients and also decreasing uh, the inflammation. Of course, the fibrosis does not come down. The cost is considerable. This is a tablet available in our country. You can cost is about 260 rupees per tablet. So it's considerable, but probably people who develop the metabolic syndrome, many of them can really afford this tablet. So this is one. Uh, so this is the guidelines, even in our American Journal of Gastroenterology, which recommends this as the most effective may way of decreasing the body weight. The other drugs are GLT-2 inhibitors. Again, I don't have to tell this audience the various mechanisms in the kidney, in, in the intestines. But I think there is increasing evidence uh, that these can also be used in this situation. Uh, most important is they've been shown to reduce fibrosis in the liver. This is one of the few drugs shown to reduce fibrosis in the liver. There are risks and benefits that you must actually look at before prescribing these drugs. And finally, we have PPAR agonists, of which I think India is proud to have actually uh, been first to evaluate and uh, publish articles on this, which shown to be very clearly uh, given as a 4 milligram single day tablet has shown to definitely decrease uh, the thing. And again, this is Ash's work, which has shown clearly how useful it is in these patients. And even in our institute, we have done a, actually a blinded study where we've shown that uh, PPAR agonists are very helpful in this group of patients. But look at this. There's so many drugs coming into NASH that it's a big graveyard. So drugs are not our answer. Drugs is partly our answer. Diet is partly our answer. Exercise is partly our answer. Do we have something else uh, more? Because if you withdraw the drug, they start gaining weight, start getting back the metabolic syndrome. So the answer seems to be either endoscopy or surgery. We know from several experiments, and this is a very famous experiment I'll show you about. These are spontaneously diabetic mice. Now, in the spontaneously diabetic mice, you put a tube in the duodenum. Uh, one group, a tube is put in. One group, a tube is fenestrations are put in. And when you put in uh, a whole tube without fenestration, the glucose is controlled. But when you put in fenestrations or no, no tube, you see how they're spontaneously diabetic. So that means any food coming in contact with the duodenum is secreting insulin resistance factor, giving rise to the metabolic syndrome. And again, shown very clearly in this experiment that if we do a gastrojejunostomy, the food passes both through the jejunum and the duodenum they continue to have diabetes. But if we do a gastrojejunostomy, cut off the pylorus, then this completely goes off. 
this was evident even for our bariatric surgeons. When they do a ruin by bari bariatric surgery, within a few days, there's a dramatic decrease in the need for insulin. Some of these patients even go into spontaneous hypoglycemia third day, fourth day after surgery without any hypoglycemia. Why does this happen? It can't happen because of the reduced weight. It happens because of a metabolic phenomenon. This was proved recently in this very elegant experiment published in Annals of Surgery by Cummins. So what they did is they did, did a ruin and bypass surgery for obese patients. And of course, these patients were hyperglycemic. They started feeding. Because this, the food was bypassing the duodenum, it was going directly into the jejunum, uh, these patients became normal glycemic. Right? So this is expected. But look what they did. They put a feeding tube, gave food through the stomach also, and food started passing through the duodenum also. They became hyperglycemic. Just introducing food into the duodenum, they became hyperglycemic. And when they removed this tube and started feeding, they became, became normal glycemic. Very phenomenal experiments to show that it's the food in the duodenum which is stimulating the metabolic syndrome process because of this resistance factor. So this is, I think, now very clear from all this uh, evidence that we have. So how can we, surgery unfortunately can't be done everybody, most people are resistant to it. Can we do it endoscopically? There is some endoscopic evidence that if you put a tube bypassing the dead duodenum going into jejunum, then you can actually, these tubes came in South America, these are the tubes called endobarriers, and these tubes I'll quickly go through. The results of these tubes showed a control of diabetes, but unfortunately these tubes had some complications, and therefore they have been withdrawn. In fact, we created our own tube along with a company in US, and this metamorphic tube was also useful, and uh, the, some of the results are there. Again, pictures to show how this tube can be very easily put in endoscopically. And this was an example of a patient who actually came from this part of the country who had very severe, doctor who had a very severe type 2 diabetes, not controlled with high dose of insulin. We put in this bypass tube, food was going into the jejunum, and dramatic control of the whole uh, diabetes occurred. But unfortunately, these tubes migrate a lot. They can't be put in for long periods of time because of return. So can we have something more permanent? This more permanent came in terms of these experiments where you can ablate the duodenal mucosa of the rat and then show a very clear response. And this was done in swine. But I'll quickly go to the human experiments in this. There was a very interesting, uh, what is called the duodenal mucosal resurfacing, where you can put an endoscope inside quickly ablate the duodenum using hot water, hot water in a balloon. Once you inflate the duodenum, the new mucosa that comes does not contain these neurohormonal cells, and therefore these pa patients respond in terms of decreasing uh, their A1Cs and all. And then again, these are some early results that are coming from this area. See, so the duodenum is burned but retains normal mucosa and all the neuroendocrine cells go. There are a lot of studies for this duodenal mucosal resurfacing, very exciting studies that are coming in, showing effect in diabetes, affecting in, uh, in fact, INSPIRE study showed that these patients can be taken off insulin completely once you do this procedure, NASH and so on. Again, glycemic, you can see A1C is improved dramatically, ALT improves, uh, the, and then what is important is the whole metabolic process seems to improve in these cases. Uh, again, I don't want to go too much into these results, but there is sufficient evidence here that glycemia is reduced, hepatic indices are reduced, insulin sensitivity is increased, and all the metabolic parameters are improved by this. So again, I said insulin, you can actually take them off insulin after doing these procedures. Uh, newer techniques are coming. Again, a paste is coming which can be given in the duodenum, which decreases absorption. But I think the problem is... Um, this is a big challenge for us, especially for physicians type 2 diabetes. We don't have adequate drugs for this. So the, any of these new procedures are very encouraging. So if I, if I had to conclude, I'd say that metabolic role of duodenum in causing insulin resistance is very clear here. Uh, I think we have now physiological role that it plays in signaling. We also know that there's evidence that hypertrophic hyperplasia occurs in some of this population, and this signal we can cut off and therefore reverse the metabolic syndrome. So the answer for the metabolic syndrome now seems to be a simple endoscope. So I think Murugnathan actually started his career with endoscopy, being a physician. So I think maybe it's a lesson for many that just many of you should start thinking of learning Apogee endoscopy so that we can reverse this whole syndrome and coming back to normality. Thank you very much for your attention. Exciting times, <coughs> Professor Nagesh Reddy. Just when most of us thought we are having a grip on diabetes, insulin and diabetes, 
you have said that all the while the tail has been wagging the dog. Diabetes is duodenum, which is surrounding the pancreas. You presented very informative, evidence-based uh, uh, data, and you have also shown the path. So thank you very much for uh, your uh, illuminating, exciting, and simple presentation of a complex com uh, concept. Thank you, sir. This is now this is a time for felicitation. So I request my co-chair to join me felicitating Dr. D. Nageshwari D. We also request Dr. Murunathan to join us on the dais. Thank you, sir, for that very inspiring uh, oration. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nishant Kanodia, sir, Dr. Rajiv Kishore, sir, and Dr. Akshay Pradhan, sir, on stage to please continue with the proceedings. Uh, there has been an explosion of knowledge in recent years, you know, especially regarding this uh, hormone replacement in menopause, and uh, and a lot of knowledge in has there, but uh, real wisdom lies in filtering that knowledge, you know, and using that information, which is really relevant to us clinicians, and getting the right information and getting it properly filtered. That's a secret. As far as hormonal replacement in this is concerned, this has had a lot of roller coaster ride over the years, you know. Fifty years back, there was a different perspective. Perspective has changed over the times, you know. And what better person to expound everything rather than Dr. Sharath Kumar? And uh, I'm going to just introduce Dr. Sharath Kumar. Dr. Sharath Kumar is... Uh, uh, MD, DM, DNB, uh, even diploma in yoga from BHU, professor in ERA Medical College, Lucknow, vice president of Indian Menopause Society, consultant endocrinologist, diabetologist, and nutritionist, uh, and joint secretary ICSBMR and president Lucknow Menopause Society. He's a referee for Indian Journal of uh, Midlife Health, International Journal of Preventive Medicine. He's an expert in writing panel on Lipid Association of India, Lie Indian Menopause Society guidelines and contributed many peer uh, papers and peer-reviewed journals, many articles. Of course, the list can go on and on, but uh, let me not come between you uh, uh, and Dr. Sharath Kumar. So over to Dr. Sharath Kumar for his uh, exposition.
College and Physician and recipient of the Eugene T. Davidson Public Service Award, uh, President of India Pac uh, Asia Pacific Society for Endocrine Research, is an editorial board member, Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, and received Dr. Headgiver Rising Star Award from IMA Centenary Conferences, received the Diabetes India Award in 2019, and received the Research Excellence Award in 2020 for his study on hypogonadism. Of course, the list goes on and on, but let me not come uh, between uh, Dr. Shirvastav and the audience. So over to Dr. Abhishek Shirvastav for his uh, exposition. Over to you, sir. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Anuj Meshwari, sir, Dr. Narsingh Verma, sir, for inviting me in this prestigious conference. And today I'll be speaking on a bit tricky. I think so. Slides ni are presentation mode pe. Okay. Aage isse jayega. This is jayega aage. So I'll be speaking today on uh, a bit tricky, complicated topic that is actually the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal anxiety, which is an uh, HPA axis. We all know. Basically, we have, more importantly, uh, hypothalamic pituitary uh, thyroid axis, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, and then one we have it is hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And to define this actually is, what is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis? It actually controls the reactions to stress. Apart from stress, it also regulates digestion, the immune system, the mood, the emotions, sexuality, and energy storage and expenditure. But most importantly, it actually controls the reactions which actually we do uh, when there is stress in our body. And uh, this, the signs, the HPA axis dysfunction actually is one of the most important yet unstudied uh, problems in, in most of the patients because uh, Mostly, uh, most of the patients are actually right now suffering from uh, either uh, metabolic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, anxiety. So all these uh, diseases does actually di uh, disrupts the HPA axis, basically. Now, what I'll be today speaking on few of the uh, untouched causes of uh, HPA dysfunction, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal dysfunction. Now see, in uh, trauma, uh, the lifestyle factors are actually trauma, the depression, the anxiety, whatever we have, the abuse, the physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, yes, up to, these are the things which actually uh, uh, possess, uh, uh, does actually uh, uh, possess a lot of stress in our body. And most importantly, what we don't discuss is what are the other right now the, in the recent times factors which actually can disrupt the HP axis. One is noise. Hum, we actually, uh, right now, we are very fond of the metro cities. And uh, one of the most important factors that various studies have been done that the noise pollution actually uh, is uh, uh, becoming the major problem uh, in HPA dysfunction. And because of noise pollution, the, the, the uh, problem of anxiety, irritation, depression, all those symptoms are actually being seen in most of the patients. Other could be nicotine or attention, uh, ADHD uh, medications, caffeine, <coughs> insufficient quality sleep, and media exposure. That is most importantly. I'll be discussing on media exposure later in the slides, uh, uh, basically. Now, HPA axis dysfunction actually could cause most, m most of the diseases. One of the most important is see the, the prevalence of uh, the cardiovascular disease when there is an HPA dysfunction, around 44%. Then what we, we can see then the next uh, most prevalent disease is the sex hormone imbalances, <coughs> then autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorder has rarely been encountered in the uh, OPD system. Then IBS symptoms such as constipation, diarrhea, both irritable bowel syndrome, be it constipation or be it diarrhea, does actually hampers the HPA axis. And, and that is the reason why we always tend to say, does do control your uh, emotions, do control your stress, whatever stress you are, do control us, because most of the things stress does is actually the metabolic diseases. Now, what HP axis does, I've already told you, 
the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis actually controls reactions to stress. Uh, yeah. Now, stress can be, in our body, stress can be defined as an acute stress or the chronic stress. Acute stress, we all take it occurs rapidly and have an obvious onset and offset. But most importantly, what is the problematic thing is actually the chronic, chronic stress, which is sustained stresses and are considered to be the most deleterious contributing factor to immune and endocrine dysfunction, altered mood, and several neurobiological and psychological diseases. Acute stress comes, uh, the hormones release, and the person forgets. But most, uh, what, what is more important is the chronic stress, because most of the chronic stresses, the public do not forget. Our body, any chronic stress comes more than six months of time, this stress never says anything. That is most important. Another most important thing is, see, as I have told you, the autonomic nervous system is uh, short acting, hai, bhi shock lagta hai, whatever shock you, uh, you, uh, you actually have gained, activated, hota hai, adrenaline, not adrenaline release, hota hai, and patient actually uh, does have uh, an episode of anxiety or uh, depression, but it is short lived. It actually subsides sp spontaneously in a, in a span of time. But HP axis disruption or dysregulation actually is a, is a very slow process. It has, uh, it, before actually this HP axis dysfunction occurs, patient might have been suffering from either anxiety or depression, and this uh, pre-existing anxiety depression does actually hampers this HP, uh, HP axis, and it, it possesses more of uh, the uh, stress, more of the uh, anxiety, and more of the depression in the patient. Because of its, uh, 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 because of its uh, long acting, the, or we, we can say the short, uh, HP axis actually, uh, what I've told you is, uh, 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 where is the? I don't have the slide there. I'm really sorry about that, where the slides on? Now, if, if, if you can say, when exposed to a physical, I, I'm really sorry about the slide, which uh, actually I've, I've lost that, but, uh, but most importantly, SAM actually, autonomic neuropathy is a short uh, acting uh, uh, dysfunction and HP axis is actually the long acting dysfunction. That is the thing we actually want to know, wanted to show you. Now, when exposed to a physical, environmental or social stressor, the HP axis is activated and prompts the fight or flight reaction. This is actually the short acting where adrenaline, not adrenaline gets released or the short acting hota hai. But when there is a continuous exposure to physical, environmental, or social stressor, then this HP axis gets disrupted more importantly, and this uh, uh, continuous exposure does actually leads to the uh, uh, actually leads to the uh, uh, disruption of this HP axis. Now, what happens is the hypothalamus releases corticotropin releasing factor. We all know, and uh, arginine was present to stimulate the anterior pituitary to produce and secrete ACTH. Now, ACTH does what? ACTH causes glucocorticoid or cortisol synthesis and release from the adrenal gland. Hamariko, what our body needs actually is cortisol to fight against the stress, trauma, to fight against the depression, to fight against the anxiety. Cortisol's main function actually is actually to increase blood glucose and modify fat and protein metabolism to fuel the fight and flight reaction. That is the reason why HPA dysfunction in diabetic patients or in metabolic patients is problematic hota hai because the most first thing what cortisol does is actually increase the blood glucose levels, increase the oxidative stress, increase the inflammation, and thereby predispose patient to uh, uh, another complications related to type 2 diabetes. Now, uh, it also modulate immune and brain function to effectively manage status. What happens is cortisol release hota hai, aapki body ko uh, 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 modulate immune system karta hai, brain function karta hai. First of all, what this does actually it gives uh, glucose to the brain, cortisol first thing is, is because energy chahiye hoti hai. So that is how it, uh, it, it actually manages uh, stress and the trauma. Actually, uh, what happens initially, cortisol initially causes a potent anti-inflammatory response which allows the organisms to react to stressor without being in pain. Ab kya hoda? What happens is whenever we are in stress, body doesn't know that whether it is a traumatic stress or because of, of, of abuse or because of depression or anxiety, but what happens is, initially, cortisol causes a potent anti-inflammatory response. That is the reason why, if there is stress or uh, uh, abuse, hota hai, 
Initially, we don't tend to feel that pain or fatigue, but a few days we actually feel that when the anti-inflammatory response subsides by the cortisol, ka, then we actually feel, uh, feel a, a bit of pain or fatigue. Just like you go to flight, there is a phobia of flight. When you go down to the flight, ka, jab aap flight se niche jate ho, to, uh, uh, kuch baad you tend to feel uh, fatigue. When you go down to flight, se ho, to, you don't feel that fatigue. That is because of the initial anti-inflammatory response of the cortisol. Achha, what, is, what happens, another thing is, glucocorticoids interfere with the retrieval of the traumatic memory. Uh, as cues of the threat vein, the body increases inflammation by releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines to accelerate wound immune. Body doesn't know that whether this injury is due to uh, a, a trauma or any other thing, but what body sees is actually the threat. As, as the cues of the threat, jab hamari body se threat chala jaz, we actually, when we relax a bit, then body thinks that, okay, the threat has uh, uh, subsided. Now what happens is body increases the inflammation by re releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines to accelerate wound healing. And, this, and at this point, body is actually at a very risky phase when a patient actually is suffering from either type 2 diabetes or either uh, metabolic diseases or obesity or uh, uh, diseases which actually hampers the immune system. Now, what is uh, the response of an individual to stress depends not only on stressor characteristics but also on factors specific to the individual. What we see actually is uh, stress response individual ko hota hai, but how do we see that response actually matters a lot. One could be proximity to safe zones, similarity to the victim, degree of helplessness, post uh, prior traumatic experiences, all these things. Hum, I actually take uh, the trauma in a different way and you might take that trauma in a different way. So that is the reason why stress response are totally different in different peoples. And that is why the levels of anxiety and levels of depression are actually different in different peoples. And compared to positive events, negative events or stress causes greater awareness and recall of event details leading to stronger encoding of negative or stressful events. Because of the stress response, because of the uh, cortisol response, hamlokan, we actually tend to uh, memorize negative events rather than the positive events more often. Mostly five times negative uh, memories we actually keep in our, in our mind as compared to the positive events because of the stress response. What is emotional balance? I've already told you. It is actually the recapitulation. It is actually, what is emotional balance? It is the never model of emotional balance. It is actually negative emotional balance in answer recapitulation. As it's that the greater the number of stimuli related to the unpleasant event that are remembered, the greater the likelihood that the person will encounter reminders of the event leading to increased, capital, uh, increased capitalization. That is the reason why we always say, do not actually uh, uh, try to uh, repeat those incidents in, in, in those patients who actually have suffered uh, uh, the kind of trauma or any abuse or anything because of this emotional balance. Because patients tend to remember those uh, uh, <clears throat> events more often and, and gets traumatized more and, and that is how the, uh, the, the dysfunction or, or the HP axis dysfunction actually uh, aggressivize and the patient actually uh, is susceptible for greater mortality disease. Now what happens is recapitulation in initially leads to repeated HP axis activation. Now what happens is HP, HP axis activation I have told that cortisol release hota hai, but over the time the continued stress prolongs the inflammatory response via continued activation of HP axis leading to glucocorticoid resistance. Now you have trauma ho hai, bar -bar chronic trauma ho hai. what happens is initially to cortisol release hota hai, but persistent trauma ki se what happens is there occurs a glucocorticoid resistance. And because of this glucocorticoid resistance, we actually suffer from low cortisol levels. And we all know low cortisol levels at the time of exposure to psychological trauma may predict the development of post-traumatic stress disorders. Up, initially, patient was having a higher level of cortisol, but due to the repeated uh, 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 traumatic conditions or situations, there occurs a glucocorticoid resistance and lower levels of cortisol. That is also no, could also be termed as hypocortisolism. Now, sustained HP, HP axis activation causes persistently high levels of CRH, which eventually causes a blunting of HCG response to CRH stimulation, that is chronic corticotropin releasing hormone stimulation. Now, what happens is exposure to additional stressor produces stronger trauma-related symptoms in part due to the exaggerated HP axis response, causing the stressor to have a stronger negative emotional balance. Exaggerated elevation of cortisol during exposure to acute stresses increases the sensitivity of NDM, 
NMDA receptors, which makes the brain generally more vulnerable to excitotoxic effects of stress. A, a few uh, quick physiological changes due to hypocortisolisms, the volume of hippocampus, which controls not only the HP axis and stress responses, but also declarative memory, is reduced due to excitotoxic environment. Amygdala activity, amygdala is basically what is, it is a, it, it is a fear uh, uh, thing, fear hormone. Amygdala kya karta hai, fear uh, excite karta hai. So amygdala activity increases because of hypocortisolism, because of chronic persistent uh, HP axis dysfunction, dysfunction, chronic persistent uh, uh, trauma, uh, traumatic situations. Now amygdala activity increase hone karna, what happens is, reduce prefrontal cortex volume impairs. Prefrontal cortex does what? It actually calms you down. Amygdala fear badata hai, to prefrontal cortex aapko calm down karta hai. To hypocortisol, persistent chronic hypocortisolism does actually reduces the prefrontal cortex. That is the reason why uh, a patient who is actually suffering from anxiety or depression, uh, depression, chronic depression, chronic anxiety is actually recovers very hardly because of reduced prefrontal cortex. Now, reduced anterior uh, cingulate volume impairs the extinction of fear responses. And most importantly, thyroid hormones becomes imbalanced leading to the abnormal T3-4 ratio and increases in anxiety. We all know uh, thyroid hormones actually does also has some uh, uh, important functions in maintaining the uh, mood also uh, along with the HPA axis. Now what happens again, now then what happens, neurochemical factors, in, uh, there is a disruption, GABA activity is decreased and glutamate activity is increased. In the same way, GABA is an inhibitory hormone, GABA kya karta hai, Aapke, uh, uh, actually is, GABA is a relaxing thing and glutamate is actually excitatory. So in the same way, GABA activity decreases and glutamate activity increases. And GABA actually has profound anxiolytic effects in part by inhibiting the CRH any circuits. And actually, we need to reduce excitotoxicity in order to reduce distress, improve stress tolerance, and enable the acquisition of new skills. Then increases dopamine and norepinephrine levels. Uh, uh, we all know what is actually dopamine and norepinephrine. And because of increased dopamine and norepinephrine levels, there is an increased arousal, startle, startle response, fear memory encoding, and increased HPX activation in response to recapitulation. Bar bar, uh, uh, we also, we actually what happens is, uh, uh, the repeated uh, uh, the the repeated traumatic conditions, the situations, uh, whenever a patient actually faces, uh, this act uh, happens what? Recapitulation hota hai and uh, this recapitulation actually disrupts HPA axis and this HPA axis disruption causes increase in dopamine norepinephrine and dopamine norepinephrine is actually in flight and fear uh, hormone uh, and because of increased level of dopamine and norepinephrine, there is always a uh, state of arousal or startle response. If you see any person, if he is physically abused, hai, if a wife actually is physically abused, you would find that she actually most of the time is in, is in a very arousal state, startle response. She will be scared of her. If you give her a little voice, she actually gets feared. And be, why? Because of the increased levels of dopamine and norepinephrine. And changes to the ratios of estrogen, testosterone and progesterone also occurs, which impacts the body's ability to monitor cortisol levels. Now what happens is one more thing is serotonin levels are simultaneously decreased. What happens? Dopamine norepinephrine to bar jata hai, but serotonin le level actually is decreased. What is serotonin? Serotonin is a feel good hormone. Whenever there is a uh, uh, kharab lagta hai, then serotonin levels are increased and it, it actually gives you a feel good uh, thing of kind of thing. So serotonin levels are simultaneously decreased in parts of the brain, disrupting communication between the amygdala and the hippocampus, which leads to increased vigilance. There are various serotonin receptors. We, we actually don't have time to think. Now, uh, there are what, why this is happening in the recent times, there, there could be some modifiable factors, modif uh, cognitive factors, problem solving things, distress tolerance, emotion, regulation, mindfulness, vulnerability prevention, revenge. all these things are actually modifiable, which a patient has to ha handle himself. Uh, 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 if you have to make that patient uh, aware about these things, uh, uh, how he can actually overcome all these things by actually making uh, himself or herself more strong. Media. 
why I'm taking, talking about media? Because according to the social signal transduction theory of depression, perception of social threat by exposure, social symbolic or imagined threats, and adversity of regulate the HP axis, modern media recasts social, cultural, and political events and highlights our current vulnerabilities to terrorism and dystopia 24 hours a day. Our <laughs> media shows uh, negative things in 24 hours, and media actually has become one of the most important part in disruption, disregulation of the HP axis. Why? Because most of uh, two, three major studies have come in the recent times where they have shown that media actually has uh, uh, plays a major role in actually increasing the levels of anxiety and depression. And chronic HP axis activation can trigger depressed mood, anhedonia, fatigue, psychomotor retardation, and behavioral withdrawal. And persistent exposure to the negative media, what we does is we actually tend to find the, the negative things uh, into the Google. Why? Because we negative things rather than the positive things. That is what I have told you, the recapitulation uh, uh, phenomena. We actually tend to memorize negative things more rather than the positive things. And media actually does this. Media actually shows you the negative part rather than the uh, positive one. And these messages are of increased concern regarding youth who actually, depending on the developmental level, may not be able to discern something that is being recast. And because we should actually keep our children away from these uh, social media things because social media has become uh, one of the most important hazards. And in 2016, 98% of young adults use approximately 7.6 uh, different social medias regularly. Rose, one uh, patient, kya karta hai? Facebook, Instagram, Google, all these things. Uh, and actually, individuals who spent more than 120 minutes on social media per day or who visited social media sites more than nine times per day had significantly increased odds of depression. And increased time, I'll take two minutes, and increased time already is actually associated with decline in communication with family. Because of this uh, disruption, what happens in uh, young kids are actually they decline in communication with family members, reduction of the interest user social circle, reduction in sleep, and increased feelings of depression and loneliness because of this social media negative impact, which actually seriously hampers HP access. Sleep, proper sleep actually, uh, uh, according to the CDC, one in three adults does not get enough sleep, and actually sleep, sleep depression or deprivation can impair, uh, lead to hyperactivation of the HP access and circadian rhythm di disruption. And studies have actually shown that improper sleep increase the levels of uh, norepinephrine and decrease the levels of serotonin and melatonin. So basically, per day, eight hours of sleep actually is required for, a pay, uh, for any, any healthy individual to actually uh, 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 have a feel-good hormone in your body. Less than seven hours, less than six hours of sleep does, could actually hamper your HPA axis. So nutrition also, one of the most important thing. Uh, uh, and Last, what I'll do is light and snoring. Lack of access of natural light, shift work, and overnight work, which prohibits the body from receiving cues from the environment, which would regulate a 24-hour circadian rhythm. This also has impacted mostly in our young adults. And that has caused insomnia at night. And because of insomnia, there had, we had seen actually the increased level of frustration, anxiety, and depression. Daytime drowsiness causes people to use stimulants, contributing to even more HP access. We do what we do? Alcohol use, karte hai, certain drugs use, karte hai, where people are awake. Sa and 26% of adults have sleep apnea, which is associated with HP access activation. Alcohol, one of the most important things, we, act we actually know this. Nicotine. Recent nicotine use and lower dependence is actually associated with increased activation of the HP axis. Then caffeine, nutrition, and sedentariness. So, so to summarize, some levels of activation of the HP axis is necessary for motivation and energy. And when the HP axis is activated in response to stress, it actually impacts the balance of dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, and glutamate. And T3, T4 ratio thyroid hormones. It modulates the release of inflammatory cytokines, estrogen and testosterone and impacts insulin sensitivity and the balance. And sustained activation of these bidirectional systems results in brain changes, which actually alters hormones and monoamines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shivas, for the very exhaustive uh, talk on very this. <laughs> and any the house open to questions? Anyone wants to ask any questions? He's open. If there are no questions, we can carry on to the next one. And uh, I think Dr. Sharad Kumar's slides are now ready, and now uh, we've been waiting for Dr. Sharad now. So over to Dr. Sharad.
very good evening, sorry, a very good morning to everybody here. I'm sorry for some glitches here. And uh, first of all, I must thank uh, the organizers of this conference who have given me an opportunity to visit this wonderful clean city, I would say. We, I think we have all noticed how clean and lean the city was. The traffic was hardly there on the roads. So it was a pleasure driving through the city. So coming back to the topic proper, this is menopausal hormone replacement. Actually, we have seen in medicine, there have been so many U-turns in our understanding and pra practices that we become so much confused sometimes what to do and where to go. So this is something which is one of the very important topics that uh, we have seen coming and going in last two decades or so. And my senior colleagues would recollect that uh, we had been in the practice of prescribing hormone replacement and the guidelines were for a universal hormone replacement previous 2002. But in 2002, the WHI study just reversed everything. So we have to see where do we stand now. So this is something in this August gathering, I do not want to spend much of the time about what is menopause, what is perimenopause, postmenopause. Suffice it to say that postmenopause is any time which is after the passage of one year of the last, that is final menstrual period. And this is the definition of menopause is once a woman does not have a period for 12 months, that was called retrospectively the FMP, the final menopausal uh, period, we call it menopause. And anything beyond is postmenopause. Of course, that has now again been uh, divided into several categories by straw criteria that is minus three, minus two, minus one, like that. And uh, we call uh, premature ovarian insufficiency, which is anything before age of 40. Previously, we used to call it premature menopause, but now we call it POI. So menopause is not an event. This is a process. You would understand that as ovarian follicles continuously continuously decline in the ovaries, the production of estrogen also continuously comes down. And this is, you can see, continuously it is coming down. Only in the during of menopause, there is a rapid decline in the menopause. And this is what is, it is important for. So menopause results from the decrease in the ovaries production of the hormone estrogen. So initially, we are concerned more about symptoms for which the patient is more bothered. And these symptoms gradually become pathologies and which in the elderly person, a woman gets so many complications. So ultimately, what we want is we want to prevent most of these complications. So time to start preventing them should be somewhere here around menopause. So HRT, as far as symptoms are concerned, you see the woman at the age of 50 is not interested whether she will have an osteoporotic fracture or not. She is saying, I am having very troublesome symptoms. I can't sleep. I can't concentrate. So her thing, problem, uh, the priority is the symptoms. And HRT remains the treatment of choice for women with menopausal symptoms and urogenital atrophy. And this is much after the WHI fiasco. Also, we are concerned about cancers. It decreases the risk of colon and rectal cancer. This is the meta-analysis which has um, told us, which has made us wiser in the decade after the WHI study also. Then Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes some of us have seen a woman becoming incapacitated in her elderly age by Alzheimer's. So if something can reduce the risk of it, this is menopause, um, this HRT. Then osteoporosis prevention is something which is very, very important. And probably most of us know about it, that sequential estrogen and progesterone, it improves BMD. 
So we had been talking about a continuous decline in the BMD, but if something which can increase BMD, it is only the estrogen, and the data is there at both at the lumbar spine as well as femoral neck, there is continuous improvement in BMD. So, yes, in different dosage, whether it is 1,5, that is, this is estrogen progesterone, so in whatever dosage, you can see both at lumbar region and femoral neck, there is a decline in the um, osteoporosis and increase in the BMD. This is about the BMD improvement. Now, what about CVD risk? We'll come to that in a moment again. HRT has also been associated with improvement and cardiometabolic risk, and this is again much after the WHI. So this was a light trial where it has proven that early, that is early versus late intervention by estradiol supports the notion of a window of opportunity. Now this is something which is very important and this is what we have learned later on that how distorted or uh, our uh, therapy with the uh, study with WHI experience was little disturbing. So this is what I was talking about, that window of opportunity. So we have to individualize the medical hormonal therapy. Say, if we give a, a woman having MHT, if she is having premature ovarian in, insufficiency till natural age of menopause, this is something which is very much recommended. Between 40 to 50, we have learned now the benefits are far more than the risks. But yes, between 50 to 60, if she has still has 10 years of menopause, the benefits are more. But certainly, if she is more than 60, and if we are now considering starting of ERT, the risks are definitely much more. And this is what we have learned from WHO as well. So there is always a balance that we have to look into. So this is what I was talking about, window of opportunity that is about the, uh, in this era where 25 years of her life she silently suffers an estrogen deficiency with menopausal distress. So what are the symptoms? They sometimes struggle at work because of symptoms. They feel social life uh, takes a back seat, decreased sexual drive, decreasing BMD, and twice increase in the risk of coronary heart disease. So this happens after menopause. This we have to remember. Yeah. Similarly, early initiation of MHD reduces the risk of CHD, fracture, and definitely all-cause mortality. There is evidence there is a reduction in the all-cause mortality, and this is again after WHI 2015. So we have to give in the right dose the right medication at the right time. So if a woman has a, has a uterus, if she has a uterus, we have to go for estrogen plus progesterone and it's scheduled in such a way that the menstrual bleeding continues. And if woman does not have a estrogen, we have not to have, we, we can go even without progesterone. But if woman is having a continuous combined cycle, she is well into postmenopause. She does not want a recurrence of periods. We can go estrogen and progesterone in a continuous fashion, and in about 90% of such women do not have a vaginal bleeding. So sometimes they are afraid of resuming vaginal bleeding, and most of them will not have if it is given in continuous fashion. Yes, if woman has a hysterectomy, we don't have to give progesterone, it is not required. We can give only estrogen. So how to approach? In premature ovarian insufficiency, we have to give treatment till the age of natural menopause, something like 50 years of age. If she is entering menopause, we have to go in such a fashion that we regularize the bleeding. But if she is into well, post-menopause, well into menopause, we have to choose a combination therapy where there is a no bleeding. And what were the controversies? So the controversies came with the WHI study 
and which showed that it increases the risk of a stroke, venous thromboembolism, CA breast, CVD in more than 60 years of age. But we tend to forget at that stage we were not, we were probably neglecting that it is something good for all these problems. So what was the model? So in WHI, the average age of the woman was 63 years, 12 years since menopause, 50% of them were smokers, 50% were overweight, and 30% already had an MI. 26% of women had prior HRT use with only combined estrogen therapy and MPA have, have been studied. Only these two were studied in this. Then there was also controversies about who was the investigator who wrote the paper. And then hazard ratio was sometimes misinterpreted mostly in the lay press and the further results were then thought of. So what was the, the critical appraisal of this WHI told us that the average wa age was significantly much more, the average BMI was much more in those selected patients and several were then already on lipid lowering medications, antihypertensive, they had prior heart attacks, prior history of angina, stroke, underli underlying subclinical coronary artery disease were there. Many of them were smokers, so it was a high risk population itself which was chosen for that. And if we again study, dissect the data further, then the risk of breast cancer with MHD, not more than general risk factors like obesity, you see, the obesity gives us so much of risk factors more, while combined MHD, this gives us only this much of risk factors. So this is something we, which we have probably overblown in the WHI. So the current guidelines, risk of breast cancer is not the same with all MHDs. So the guidelines of International Menopause Society, NAMS, this is North American Menopause Society, NICE guidelines, and American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, they also show that do MHT cause significant risk of CA breast? Small risk, rare risk, with little or no risk, alone does not initiate or promote breast cancer. Similarly, so what is important? Does progesterone matter? Yes. Risk primarily associated with the synthetic progesterone, that is medoxyprogesterone acetate, and this is, uh, continue, this is uh, equine estrogen. So the risk is more because of progesterone, and that is why I was emphasizing if the woman does not have a uterus, probably we don't have to give progesterone, so the risk is much less. So which progesterone is safer? Risk may be lower with newer progesterone, that is didrogesterone, or maybe micronized progesterone. So the risk may be lower with didrogesterone or micronized progesterone than with a synthetic progesterone. This synthetic which was used in the WHI study and not the newer didrogesterone or natural progesterone. About the VTE risk and stroke, <coughs> so the transdermal estrogen is less likely to produce VTE and stroke because it does not pass through the liver and does not change the lipoprotein profile. So is VTE risk is high with MHT? VTE is less frequent among Asian non-obese less than 60 years of women. These are again the guidelines which are saying in the women who are more than 60 years and more than 10 years of menopause, and that is what I was emphasizing about the window, are at higher absolute of CHD and VTE and the stroke. Similarly, the risk increases with the age and BMI, so this is again the, so we have to choose our patients carefully. Again, the progesterone, the MPA increases risk, not the didrogesterone. So oral estrogen increased the risk. So that is why we say that the parenteral use of estrogen probably is more safer. This is, par, this is transdermal estrogen. Sometimes the availability is a problem, but this is more important. So this risk may be lower with transdermal MHG containing natural progesterone like didrogesterone and micronized progesterone. So what estrogen is important? So 17 beta estradiol is much better. We're not talking about estrogen and valerate anymore. This is uh, unconjugated, hence rapidly uh, goes through the liver, puts minimum liver load and changes the lipoprotein to the minimal degree and prothrombate effect is also again less with this 17 estradiol. 
This CEE was the estrogen which was used in the WHI study, which lead to prothrombotic, prothrombotic effect and stroke and VT increased. So CE is now out. It has uh, more staying power in the uterus because of the less enzymatic degradation there. So this is more important for contraceptive purposes. So why EE is bad now? There is a strong effect of EE on hepatic protein, which results in greatly increased magnitude of effect of VT and cardiovascular risk. So equine estrogen is now no more recommended in MHT. Similarly, progesterone which is more important. If we go with didrogesterone, which is more important now, available now easily, it does not have an androgenic effect or estrogenic or steroidogenic effect, while MPA, which was used there, has a progesterogenic effect, which is more detrimental to liver and uh, lipoprotein. Also, it has a glucocorticoid effect, which leads to more weight gain and fluid retention, while didrogesterone had, does not have such an effect. So synthetic progesterone, there is increased risk of CVD, VTF, stroke, and breast cancer in comparison to natural progesterone, which we can consider now. So didrogesterone versus micronized progesterone, bioavailability is more with this, so it stays less in the liver and produces less, bio, less lipoprotein changes. Didrogesterone requires only 10 to 20 times lower oral dose than the micronized progesterone, providing clear benefit. So post-WHI study, the MPA turned from hero to zero. So now MPA is not mo no more recommended. MPA acts as a potent progesterone, androgen, and glucocorticoid receptor. This we have just shown. So stroke and CVD risk. So now we have different dosage which are available. One milligram, this is what we are talking about, 17 beta estradiol, natural, and the didrogesterone. So small dose for perimenopause women, Postmenopause, again, we have to go for a very small dosage, which is quite sufficient. This is what, and in premature ovarian insufficiency, because we want the cyclical bleeding, we want a little better dose. So sequential estrogen progesterone, it gives excellent endometrial safety because of regular bleeding in the premature ovarian woman patient. But well into menopause, we do not want any bleeding and we can give continuous bleeding, uh, so continu continuous estrogen progesterone. So this, again, you can see the total cholesterol goes down, HDL goes up, LDL. So this is definite beneficial advantage which if we have chosen our agents rightly. So oral route is preferred. The question is, but the risk, of course, is uh, availability, yes, is a challenge. Sometimes uh, this, um, uh, this is transdermal. Transdermal availability is sometimes a challenge, this transdermal, but oral, sometimes, yes, definitely we can give. So different combinations are now available, and uh, we, I think, take this opportunity to give more and more advantage to our women who have to leave a long, post-menopausal life with many chronic dreaded complications and probably the current understanding, I'm not talking about what the future is holding us for here, but presently probably it is uh, wise to advise HRT, provided we have chosen our patients correctly in the correct time window. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Sharat Kumar, for this uh, very wonderful presentation, masterly presentation on this very complex and very controversial topic. Just had a lot of roller coaster arguments over the years. Last 30 years have shown a uh, lot of roller coaster, I mean, ups and downs, pluses and minus, pros and cons. But finally, we presented a very rational approach which we can practically use. Thank you, sir. Any? Uh, it's open for questions. Anyone wants yeah. to ask a question? Yes. Yeah, so all those women who are having a premature ovarian insufficiency, that is menopause before the natural age of menopause, we should give it for about uh, uh, till the age of natural menopause. This is non-controversial. But then we have to, th there are different guidelines which are stressing it for a period of 10 years sometimes. Or, or we can, we can, 
sort of uh, withdraw it and see if the symptoms are coming after five years or so. If symptoms are there, we can again start the treatment, at least for 10 years, safely. Beg your pardon? Yeah, that's what I was saying. In postmenopausal, we can give it for a window of around 10 years because this is what I said, that if you start after 60 years, so we are not starting after 60 years. So if we are going beyond 60 years, we have to be cautious and individualize the requirement and the benefits versus the risks. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, here we close the session. Thank you. Just, just a minute. She wants to ask something. Can somebody give her a mic, please? So in case of natural menopause, we should advise uh, this HRT to every uh, woman or only those who having vasomotor symptoms. If vasomotor symptoms are not there, should we advise them? See, the, what I was coming to that is uh, what I was already discussing that prior to WHI, that is before 2002, the recommendations was advising HRT to every woman. That was universal HRT. Then the WHI fiasco came, so it became choosy. Then for several years, the guidelines were that we have to give HRT only for those women who have intractable symptoms and for minimal duration of time. So this was the understanding. And probably this is the understanding even today. But certain evidences which have come up in last two, three, four years that yes, these are beneficial, they can be given even to those women where we want to prevent long-term complications, but guidelines have not very clearly expressed that whether they can be given to every woman or not. But we have to individualize. If certainly if there are risk factors are more, we, we are more likely to give, but if there is, say, history of premature uh, Mm, cardiovascular disease or family history of CA breast or lipoprotein altered, then we have to be very choosy. Thank you, sir. Yeah, close the session. Thank you. To take things forward, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Huck and Dr. Satish Vasuri uh, to come and chair the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. So, straight away to the speakers. Uh, we have two speakers in the session. Dr. Vinod Mittal, he will be sp speaking on the topic anticoagulant therapy in hyperthyroidism and arterial fibrillation. A very important to topic to discuss. And over to you. Doctor, you know the method. Uh, a very good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's my proud privilege to be here to uh, share my knowledge on anticoagulants uh, in patient uh, with hyperthyroidism and atrial fibrillation. Uh, I convey my thanks to uh, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari and the entire team for inviting me. Now, it's a very important topic. You know, uh, my main emphasis uh, would be basically uh, hyperthyroidism and AF, which are you know very very commonly coexisting conditions and how we go for it. 
we treat AF first or hyperthyroidism or both, and which conditions uh, we start with anticoagulants also. So basically, uh, atrial fibrillation is, uh, you know, is a very common complication. Uh, we are, I think, missing it a lot. Uh, we have to be more conscious and, you know, uh, looking for it more oftenly. And it's, it's very common in hyperthyroidism in almost half of the patient. And uh, like overall, and uh, more than 65 years, it's 5% even as isolated and 10% in more than 80 years. Uh, in hyperthyroidism, what happens because of the, uh, the um, uh, you know, T3 and T4, there is an alteration in um, beta-1 adrenergic and M2 muscarinic uh, receptors, which are there in the cardiac muscles. And once there is, a, you know, disruption or alteration, it leads to enhanced uh, sympathetic activity, as well as uh, there is, uh, you know, a short atrial refractory time. So more, uh, you know, beating of atria and which is erratic. Atrial fibrillation, uh, we all know, is an independent predictor of uh, chronic, you know, and future uh, morbidity and mortality. And it has got a negative impact on quality of life. It is associated with a lot of, you know, thromboembolism, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular mortality, especially in elderly population. So it's very crucial to uh, diagnose as well as to address this issue, especially if there's a hyperthyroidism, including subclinical hyperthyroidism, which again, I think, you know, we miss generally on test. We generally, you know, go for the uh, patients who have frank symptoms of hyperthyroidism. So overall, other important point is that atrial fibrillation, it is not only a hyperthyroidism, uh, like even excess of alcohol intake, advancing age, as I told you, more than 65 years and more than 75 years, uh, this gender is, you know, again, uh, it, it varies from population to population. Then inflammation, sleep apnea, family history of AF, CBD, and other cardio, you know, echocardiographic abnormalities. So if patient has got hyperthyroidism and AF, it is not necessarily, it is because of hyperthyroidism. It may be because of other disorders. So that also point has to be understood. And overall, uh, hyperthyroidism is one, then heart failure, endocarditis, even respiratory problem, OSA, and thrombus in left atrium, all, uh, you know, especially is one of the cause uh, for atrial fibrillation, and then thromboembolism. Now, excess of thyroid hormones lead to uh, ionic currents in atrial myocyte, and that, you know, uh, leads to a decrease in atrial potential duration it decreases atrial refractory time and there's more beating of atria. So overall, as I mentioned earlier also, there is an alteration in B1 and uh, B1 adrenergic and M2 muscarinic receptors which are present in the cardiac muscles. So uh, uh, hyperthyroidism, you know, leads to uh, uh, AF because of, you know, one is cardiac structure abnormalities, then iron channels, inflammation, then even, you know, grave disease directly, you know, because of the autoantibodies, uh, they can be atrial fibrillation. Even hypothyroidism sometimes may cause. Now, other important point is if patient has AF, we should also be looking for hyperthyroidism or other thyroid disorders because when patients with AF are given cardio, you know, uh, 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 amiodaron, then amiodarone over a long period of time can lead to thyroid dysfunction, which again we may, we may miss. So that is another important reason that when patient has got AF, so go for autoantibodies, go for other, you know, if patient has other autoimmune disorders. So it is like when we talk of cardiometabolic diseases, when we talk of NAFLD, we always say, find out even cardiovascular other risk factors. So similarly here, both are coexisting if one is there, try to find out for the other one. So basically, you know, in thyroid, you know, thyroid hormones, they, there is a sub, substrate uh, altered conduction. There is a, you know, triggering of ectopic, uh, you know, uh, say action potential uh, in uh, basically atria. And then also, you know, uh, say RAS uh, stimulation is also there and leading to ultimately atrial fibrillation. Now, autoantibodies, like in Graves' disease, I told you, 
can also be some time responsible for atrial fibrillation. So that is another, in especially in Graves' disease. So that may be directly, you know, related to atrial fibrillation. Now this is to show that, you know, this is overall uh, cumulative uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation. And this is, you know, basically how we, you know, decide on subclinical hyperthyroidism when TSH is between 0.1 and 0.44. Euthyroid when it is between 0.45 and 4.5 and clinical hypothyroidism when it is more than 4.5 and less than 20. So that's how we decide for, you know, treatment. So overall symptoms are nonspecific. They're not really related to AF. They are in the form of dyspnea, palpitation, chest discomfort, dizziness, and exhaustion. Now, the diagnosis is very simple. Uh, besides clinical features, uh, you know, a 12 lead ECG or a single lead ECG, but more than 30 seconds of tracing. And, uh, you know, uh, non discernible repeating P waves, irregular uh, PR interval. I don't think, you know, we need to. This everybody knows. Now, how we decide, uh, you know, whether patient uh, is to be, you know, what treatment is to be given. So basically, the first and foremost thing is. If patient has a new onset of atrial fibrillation and patient is hemodynamic unstable, it needs an urgent cardioversion. So that one point is totally, it should be clear. The second is when patient has overt hyperthyroidism, then, and it is not an emergency, then you make this patient as youth thyroid by starting antithyroid medication. So this point is again has to be understood well and then obviously rate control treatment and rhythm control treatment we always give an atrial fibrillation so those that goes as per the guidelines uh, we, we already know now other is if patient is got a, you know a, say a severe you know a subclinical uh, phase then again you know anti uh, uh, thyroid treatment is started and rhythm and uh, this you know rate control uh, treatment are also started now if AF is within 48 hours, the onset when patient comes to us, then we should be starting, you know, straight away, uh, basically the cardioversion is to be done, whether it is pharmacological or electrical. And after cardioversion, then oral anticoagulant should be started within three weeks or immediately and should be continued four weeks later. So this, again, an, is an interesting point that when patient comes with AF, what to do. Now, if patient has got youth thyroid, then definitely, you know, then nothing to be done for uh, thyroid. We treat AF as per the guidelines, as I told you, you know, chronic AF or acute onset AF. Now, if atrial fibrillation, now here we can see is there, you know, with hyperthyroidism and it is, it is just, you know, basically mild. When there is a mild, uh, 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 say, uh, hyperthyroidism, subclinical, then we may not be in a hurry to decide for antithyroid medication. Then it will depend on other features. If patient is elderly, having other, you know, features, then we will start. Otherwise, you treat only AF. So that's how, you know, this is an important thing to be understood well by all of us. Now, recommendations of AF management uh, in subclinical, you know, so, so, Basically, the goals of treating atrial fibrillation remains the same. It is only the thyroid, you know, which makes it a little different. And it has to be prevented for future complications in terms of thromboembolism, leading to cardiovascular and especially cerebrovascular uh, accidents in terms of CVAs and, uh, you know, uh, uh, say other neurological disorders. And to alleviate the symptoms, patient is also having symptoms. That also should be you know, uh, the treatment to be given to stop that. So basically, you know, overall uh, management of AF is based on 4S, stroke risk, symptom severity, severity of AF burden, and substrate severity. So all these four things are important. It has to be individualized. Now, subclinical uh, hyperthyroidism is a correctable cause uh, uh, of atrial uh, fibrillation. And, uh, you know, target should be to, you know, make the patient in a youth thyroid state and prevent recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation. Cardioversion of AF, uh, if there is a persistent subclinical uh, hyperthyroidism. In case of if the symptoms are invalidating, then obviously rate control 
and rhythm control. Both are important and for that, you know, generally we give beta blockers. I'll be discussing that uh, and anti-ergamic agents. Uh, Holter monitoring uh, is generally, you know, uh, required to evaluate the recurrent AF if patient is symptomatic. Now, patients who have long duration of AF, long standing chronic AF, they are generally, you know, uh, likely to have persistent AF and there, you know, uh, like uh, sometimes there's a spontaneous cardioversion, but most of the time we need a pharmacological or electrical uh, way of doing it. Now, beta blockers are one of the best medications for the rate control uh, and as well as for, you know, heart failure. We already know that. And uh, so they improve better, you know, uh, quality of life uh, uh, is improved. And metoprolol, bisoprolol, cardvidilol, and nebivilol are, you know, are, are equally important here. Uh, propranolol is a non-selective. So basically, uh, you know, for only for thyrotoxicosis symptoms, palpitations, then only. Otherwise, all other specific conditions, we need selective beta blockers. That's an important thing. Again, uh, we have to. Now, what are the factors which favor uh, rhythm control uh, treatment, like young age, first episode, short history of AF, rate control target, unachievable, tachycardia mediated, cardiomyopathy, no or few comorbidities, and atrial fibrillation uh, pre precipitated by acute illness. So, you know, kind of young patients, reversible causes generally, you know, are favorable. A patient is hemodynamically unstable. I think, you know, uh, that we do in all the cases, we need immediate uh, cardioversion, either with a pharmacological mean or, you know, with cardioversion, uh, electrical. Uh, then if AF uh, is within 48 hours, cardioversion without starting uh, anticoagulation first, and then, uh, you know, if patient is having uncertain onset, uncertain, then three weeks of uh, anticoagulation uh, you know, uh, is required if, if we don't know the duration of atrial fibrillation. And, uh, e and other important thing is uh, TE uh, echography uh, to exclude basically thrombus in atrium. If we exclude, then we can be a little liberal. If there's a thrombus, then it has to be urgent uh, anticoagulation. And then correction of hyperthyroidism uh, is again very important and like we, we, we uh, have to get it less than uh, Point uh, one zero. Now, amiodarone is very commonly given, and we have seen many cases. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it is very common, but it is not that rare. Also, that uh, you know, especially uh, like the choice of amiodarone is only where there is a structural heart disease, not plain and simple at atrial fibrillation, or when there is a left ventricular diastolic, uh, 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 diastolic, uh, systolic dysfunction. So here, you know, in the patients where we start amiodarone, do thyroid functions. It is always advisable, even otherwise, so that we know the baseline uh, thyroid, uh, you know, levels, and and later on we can come to know. And approximately 70 to 75 percent of these patients remain euthyroid. In 20 to 25, you know, 25 percent of the patients we may they may have symptoms of, of you know, uh, say either uh, say hypothyroidism or hyper. It is it is both. Now, management is withdrawal of the medication, we already know, and antithyroid treatment, and then uh, steroids, if sometimes required. Now, it is of two types, basically, this uh, amiodarone-induced uh, thyroid dysfunction, type 1, when there's increased synthesis of T3 and T4 due to the excess of iodine, which is there with amiodarone. That's one. And type 2 is a destructive process, which is because of excess release of T3 and T4. So this is, you know, uh, I know the two different types of uh, hypothyroidism with amiodarone. Rate control treatment, beta blockers are the best. If not, then calcium channel blockers and digoxin. For rhythm control, flicanide is important uh, with beta blocker. And other medications are propafenone and uh, uh, vernacalant and uh, ibutilite. <coughs> So basically the guidelines, you know, we see, go by the, uh, uh, the level of evidence. B is uh, beta blockers recommended for rate control response. Uh, le evidence B and level of evidence B. Circumstances where uh, beta blockers cannot be used, it's cal calcium channel blockers. Non-dihydropyrimidine. 
and then oral anticoagulants uh, you know uh, once they're given then uh, INR to be kept between uh, two to three and uh, once we achieve euthyroid state then antithyroid uh, thrombotic prophylaxis are the same as with hyperthyroid state so basically you know uh, uh, anticoagulant treatment is uh, like you know uh, if euthyroid state cannot be achieved then decision of anticoagulation will depend on this is the you know these two scores are very openly used by cardiologist uh, chat 2 ds2 and uh, west uh, c score and has blood score so you find out this score this when you use the net for this and if it is high then you start straight away start with anticoagulation and if the risk is low when the score is 0 to 1 then if there is a persistent of subclinical hyperthyroidism is persisting with AF, then only you give, otherwise not. So that's how we go for anticoagulation. So these are, you know, basically the scoring system. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, this is just to calculate the risk uh, for, uh, you know, uh, say thrombosis. And if it is high, then straight away we go for uh, anticoagulant. So choice of anticoagulant, uh, vitamin K uh, antagonist are preferred. And definitely PT, INR has to be done. Uh, NOEX are the first choice if patient can afford. They're relatively a little more costly. And initiation of oral uh, anticoagulation, as I told you, is three weeks prior to undertaking. If you're planning a cardioversion, three weeks prior and four weeks after cardioversion, anticoagulation should be given. So to conclude, I would say that atrial fibrillation is uh, quite a common problem, especially if there's a hyperthyroidism, maybe subclinical hyperthyroidism, we have to have a very high index of suspicion, a good proper, you know, history, even minor symptoms, especially in elderly should not be neglected. We can always go for a, you know, some small test like ECG and, uh, you know, if required, Holter monitoring to uh, prevent morbidity and mortality in terms of thromboembolism leading to you know stroke and also heart failure so cardiovascular assessment uh, so first is clinical then 12 uh, lead ecg and holter monitoring prevention of stroke and heart failure events uh, with oral uh, anticoagulants is a priority uh, in these patients and this uh, is also going to improve their quality of life uh, so with this i uh, conclude my talk and i convey my thanks to all of you Thank you, Dr. Mittal, for an illicit presentation, well explained. And uh, any questions? Questions are open to the audience. Please. In the meantime, uh, any role of evabradine in controlling the heart rate and all that? Evabradine is always, you know, uh, you know in general, uh, when beta blockers are not able to control the rate. So first is always beta blockers in general or beta blockers are contraindicated, then only. Oh, so a patient Followed by calcium channel blockers. The second so is calcium as per the recommendation. Okay. Yeah. No role of evabradin. No, it's not mentioned. Okay. Sir. <coughs> uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, sorry. Good morning, sir. It was a very nice talk, sir. And we got a lot of information from you regarding this. Uh, I have actually two questions. Uh, first question is like, uh, in a country like India, we have a lot of periphery uh, patients right now where we don't have uh, this cardioversion facilities uh, and we cannot <coughs> cardiovert patients in the peripheries. So what is your comment on this? And the second question is, as you mentioned in the last uh, slide of yours, that if you're planning for anticoagulation, you have to give three weeks prior to cardioversion and four weeks post cardioversion. So usually, uh, cardioversion will be not as elective as we want. It may be an emergency procedure. So what is the comment on that? So uh, uh, yeah, there are two questions, you know. First is the resource, as you're saying. Uh, we cannot treat and have, uh, you know, everything in uh, the remote areas. That's only primary care. For secondary and tertiary care, we have to refer these patients to, uh, you know, uh, the nearby cities. So that's one point. But ECG can be done, I think, you know. My, my, my emphasis is not the treatment, at least you pick up those cases. 
what we're doing is we are probably missing and we are coming to know when patient develops CVA, that patient is also having EF. Is that okay? So what I want to say in periphery, you can do at least ECG and you send to a uh, you know, nearby place and get a holter done and then start treatment. These are not costly treatment. And regarding uh, 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 cardioversion, emergency cardioversion is emergency, ca emergency cardioversion. There you start treatment within three weeks you know, and continue, I mean up to four weeks, sorry, up to three weeks of cardioversion it has to be continued. If it is an emergency cardioversion. If it is elective, you start three weeks before and four weeks later. Continue. No. Yes, sir. Any more questions? So we conclude the part one of this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Mittal. I would like to call Dr. Ramesh Arora to come on uh, the dais to join Dr. Hak as a chair. So the next speaker for today is uh, Dr. Minal Mohit. Welcome to the dais. And uh, the topic for today will be male obesity associated with secondary hypogondism. So uh, Dr. Minal Mohit is MBBS MD, FD, FAP, FRCP, UK, FICP, and so on, FACP US. And she is currently consultant and head of department of endocrinology at Manipal Hospital, Jaipur, and director Sashkat Endocrine Center. She is mentor of Team India, won Osler Cup in ACP 2 2021, pioneer of Cloud Clinic, editor Medibeats, reviewer JP. JAPI, MC Miller, Founder Secretary of Metabolic Club Jaipur, Founder of Women Practitioner Forum, and Founder Member of MOS, Governing Council Member of RSDI Rajasthan Chapter, Scientific Convener of Epicon 2022, and she has, uh, she has been National Faculty of API, RSDI, Diabetes India, Diacon, Dipsy, and co-author of the first ebook on diabetes. Welcome, Dr. Minal. Thank you so much, sir, for all the kind words and a detailed introduction. A very good morning to all of you. And I must thank, before I begin, my governor, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, sir, the secretary of the conference, Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Anubha, and Dr. Narsingh Verma, who has done all the efforts to organize this wonderful conference. And the topic that has been assigned to me by the scientific committee is male obesity associated with hypogonadism, the secondary hypogonadism. Obesity, as we all know, is the biggest villain today, and it's a multifactorial state of uh, body, I should say. Should I really call it a disease? I don't know. But it's multifactorial. Besides the environment, besides the behavior, it is also sometimes attributed to genetics. So we have a multifactorial state which has been blamed for diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, and many more things. And now, ACP Scientific Committee wants to blame it for secondary hypogonadism as well. So are we really right or are we really wrong? Let's see. So hypogonadism, as we understand, is a state of androgen deficiency. And this androgen deficiency, besides having other factors, mostly affects the psyche, the mind, the quality of life. So it has two components. Either we talk of sperm count, which is either reduced, or the sperm motility, which is again affected. Or secondly, we talk of the testosterone, that is the male hormone. So deficiency of male hormone or some alteration of sperms. Both will be labeled as a state of hypogonadism. So what are the types of hypogonadism that we are talking? First of all, we will talk of anything going wrong at the testicular level. 
So anything going wrong at the end organ level, at the gonadal level, we label it as primary hypogonadism. Then anything going wrong at the central level, hypothalamus or pituitary, we will label it as secondary hypogonadism. And obesity has been blamed or charged with secondary hypogonadism. So just a brief to complete the forum or complete the protocol, we have a list of causes of primary hypogonadism, which we are not interested in this session. We are only interested in secondary hypogonadism. So secondary hypogonadism, it can also be genetic or congenital. So when we talk of congenital secondary hypogonadism, which we will not be discussing here, basically has a lot of syndromic etiologies. So when we talk of a lot of syndromic etiologies, we do talk of Kalman syndrome. We are not interested today. Then we have some pituitary disorders. Most commonly, we have the hyperprolactinemias. Then we have the inflammatory disorders, which may go and infiltrate the pituitary. Again, we will not be talking of these two conditions. We will only be talking of something new, and that is obesity also causing secondary hypogonadism. And this etiology labeling, I have not done. It is there in the books, very well recognized and accepted. So we have a lot of papers going on. We have a lot of studies already going on. And there are people already studying this topic. And one of the latest article which I have picked up is obesity as a serious etiological factor for male subfertility in modern society. Again, another topic picked up recently from the Willi uh, Journal, hypogonadism and male obesity. Let us focus on some unresolved questions. So my scientific committee is very much on the right track. We have something new which we are discussing today. So now for the house. Please be very alert. We have Mr. A. He's 50 years and BMI is 40 kilograms per meter square, right? We have Mr. B, he's 75 year old. He has a BMI of 35 kilograms per meter square. No other medical condition existing. Only difference is 40, 35, 50, 75. We have another person, Mr. C sitting somewhere in our, uh, in our clinics, 50 years old gentleman with a BMI of 35 but he has a type 2 diabetes of 10 years, which is uncontrolled. So he has HbA1c of 12. We have another gentleman in our chambers, Mr. D, 60 years, BMI 35, history of diabetes same, 10 years, but a controlled diabetes. All four coming with the same complaint of low libido. You send which sample? Serum, testosterone. Agreed or not? Yes. And what is the result you are expecting? Any guesses? Keep your homework ready. I'll come back to this question. What will be the testosterone in all four cases? So what are the other terms which we shy away from maybe? But there are terms. We do talk of, sir talked of menopause and HRT in women. But we do forget male menopause. We do forget the terms like male climacteric or andropause. There are conditions like Adam, partial Adam, or aging. And now we will soon be adding obesity. So what are the unresolved questions that we really are going to learn today before we leave the session? What are the chances of HPT excess suppression with obesity association? To what extent do these men actually have the symptoms is it bidirectional? Is it obesity causing hypogonadism or hypogonadism causing obesity? How does it all happen? How should we manage? And do we have some role of SERMs or the aromatase inhibitors? So I will just explain how it actually happens in one slide. You'll have to stay with me for the slide, please. So this is a very simple and interesting slide. What really happens? there is obesity. It's a stage of chronic inflammation. There is accumulation of adipose tissue. And what does adipose tissue do? It will metabolize your testosterone to estradiol. And there is estradiol accumulation, which will cause hypogonadism. This will also cause gynecomastia. Then this chronic inflammation 
will lead to oxidative stress. This oxidative stress will denature your sperm morphology. Then it will denature your sperm motility. Finally, it will kill your sperms. So the sperm count will fall. So there is decrease in sperm count, motility and morphology, right? Then there is something called scrotal fat. We have learned since our very initial years as biology students that why is the scrotum outside the body? Because testes is one organ which requires low temperature. Heat damages it. But what are we doing? With the increase of intrascrotal adiposity, there is increased lipogenesis, there is increased local heat production which causes destruction of the testes and which causes destruction of the sperms. So there is change at the testicular level, that is the local milieu is altered, systemic milieu is altered. As a result, there is sperm dematuration, decrease in sperm functioning and sperm count and sperm motility. That is not all, the story is not over. There is another interesting concept and that is epigenetics. Now these altered sperm, when passed on, to the next generation, the inheritance is also passed on. So entire metabolic syndrome is gifted to the next men or the next generation males. So the next generation males also grow up to be obese, prone to cardiovascular diseases and hypogonadism. So that is the entire story of obesity and hypogonadism. So what is the clinical picture? How will these males present? Increased BMI, increased fat mass, and decreased muscle mass. They will have smaller penis, smaller scrotal size. They will have low hair, pubic hair growth will be less. There can even be regression of the pubic hair and the axillary hair. Loss of libido, stress, frustrations, conflicts, quality of life impaired, gynecomastia, and they will come to any one of us. And the set of investigations that we all know what we will be prescribing, LH, FSH, testosterone, prolactin, a standard set of tests. So we look for the clinical signs and we look for the lab values. The clinical symptoms and signs, it can be a prepubertal uh, boy also. So you can have that the child is not developing beard and moustache. Or if there were beard and moustache, there has been regression. The shaving frequency has been reduced. There is development of gynecomastia and the uh, parents are running from pillar to post to find out the cause and treat it. And the answer is mostly cosmetic. We go for plastic surgeries. Early morning testosterone levels, LHFSH levels, prolactin levels, and in older uh, males, we are also using PSAs. If the child is prepubertal, it's mandatory to rule out the congenital causes also. So we have to look for the primary causes as well, and we have to look for the secondary causes as well. And we are also looking for, in case of postpubertal, again, we look for signs and symptoms along with primary as well as the secondary causes. So this is the algorithm, how do we go about it? I'm not much interested in this algorithm because this is something I understand that we all know. As a protocol and as just to complete the forum because it is secondary, we are not much concerned with karyotyping, but in prepubertal boys, if they're coming to you, just go for one karyotyping as well. Then radiological imaging becomes important. You are looking for pituitary, you might find some mass or in cases of uh, uh, MRI pelvis, you might find some undescended testes. So these are all causes just to complete the picture of your investigations. Then comes your most important thing in oldies, in the older generation. We were talking of fractures and osteoporosis in women. We cannot forget osteoporosis in men, and testosterone is one of the important causes. So we have to look for all these things. Then also again, we have to look for prostate, there is change in cognition, intelligence, and mood. So your psychoanalysis again becomes very important. Now I'm coming back to my primary question in the four cases, the serum T. Which of the four ABCD will have the minimum testosterone? 
D. You want me to go back to that slide? Interestingly, I'll just disclose, open the card. Interestingly, the testosterone levels will be low in all four, irrespective of the values here and there. This gentleman, though young, is morbidly obese. This gentleman, though not morbidly obese, but is aging. This gentleman is having middle age, morbid, like moderate obesity, but a comorbidity which pre disposes things and accelerates the things. This gentleman has controlled comorbidity, but a moderate BMI and aging. So all the four scenarios clinically are almost the same. So that becomes very interesting to understand that obesity alone may not be having that big a factor when obesity is combined with the comorbidities. And those comorbidities are aging and metabolic conditions. So you are accelerating your own vehicle. Okay, coming to the second important question, is it bidirectional? How much is it bidirectional? So there is hypothalamus, there is hypopituitary axis, there is something called sex hormone binding globulin. So in cases of moderate obesity, there may be some decrease in testosterone, but that total testosterone fall is because of the fall in SHBG. The free testosterone is still normal. So patient may not be clinically having severe symptoms of hypogonadism, but he will have some symptoms of hypogonadism clinically. And on evaluation, you will find that the free testosterone is still normal. It is only the total testosterone which is falling initially because of the fall in sex hormone binding globulin. It is only when the patient is severely obese, there is severe rise in adipose tissue that there is higher conversion of estradiol and this adipose tissue because of the leptins and the adipokines is causing secondary hypogonadism. So the gain in adipose tissue because of hypogonadism is less. So though the case is bidirectional, but it is the obesity which is causing hypogonadism and not vice versa. So how do we manage? I have five minutes. I will just rush through it. So how do we manage a case of male hypogonadism because of obesity? The goal of the therapy is to restore the sexual function and the quality of life, to maintain virilization, and more importantly, to maintain bone density and prevent osteoporosis. We have to possibly normalize the growth hormone levels as well. We have to decrease the cardiovascular risk and restore fertility in cases of young males. So how can we do that? Number one is always lifestyle modification. Though lifestyle modification may not restore the body weight, but it will increase your lean muscle mass. It will decrease the fat mass. If the total fat, the total weight may not change drastically, but the whatever change happens positively will affect the fat loss and increase the muscle mass. So there will be symptomatic benefit with lifestyle modification. If you want a definite answer in terms of weight number, then the answer is bariatric surgery because lifestyle modifications are difficult to maintain on the long-term basis. So if you want definite answers in terms of your numbers, or number of the weights, the kgs, or the BMI, you need to work with bariatric surgery and then follow the LSM. And of course, the testosterone replacement therapy is the mainstay. You need to replace testosterone and testosterone replacement therapy is a mainstay of the treatment of hypogonadism with obesity or without obesity. If you are looking for fertility, then testosterone is not the answer. If you are looking for fertility, then you can go for HCG. If a boy is coming to you pre-pubertal and you need to induce puberty, then the answer is again HCG or you can even go for GnRH analogs. The newer molecules like the SERMs or the aromatase inhibitors, the anestrozoles, they are not having much significant proven role so far. So this is about male hypogonadism and obesity and the management. Any questions, I'll be happy to take.
Thank you, sir. Pioneer in treating female diseases, but now she has started helping male doctors to treat male menopause. So, any question from the audience? Uh, two, two parts of the question. First is the investigation part. Should we go for free testosterone or total testosterone, number one, for the workup? And second is the treatment part. Should we go for the injectable versus the oral uh, testosterone? So, uh, for the sake of time, I did not go into the details of the treatment part because the topic was not dealing with the treatment part. But coming to your first part first, there is a big debate between free T and SHBG because whenever you are assessing free T, you also have to assess the SHBG. You cannot have the analysis of free T alone. So, whenever you are free assessing free T, you also need to know your SHBG. And total testosterone again, because most available and dependable investigation still is total testosterone. Most of the labs are not so much well advanced and well equipped that oh, they are doing free testosterone. There are errors, chances. Otherwise, if you can trust the lab, free testosterone is definitely giving you a better advantage, it's giving you a direct value. Otherwise, total testosterone will have confounding factors. You'll have to correlate, you'll have to calculate, and you'll have to find out if there's any other complication going on, which is affecting the SHBG. So in that light of SHBG, you'll have to interpret the total testosterone. So if you can depend upon the lab, if you have a good lab, you can definitely go for free testosterone also. Your second part, injectable or oral. Injectable increases compliance, number one, because it's either once in a month, oral is twice in a day, thrice in a day, or even four times in a day. So compliance become an issue. A male patient who's around 60 is already having a huge list of drugs maybe uh, cardiovascular, maybe diabetes, maybe some other things. Sometimes there are osteoporotic medicine, some calcium supplements and all. And then we add another tablet or a capsule, testo cap, which is to be taken four times a day. The patient is bound to miss or get exhausted very fast or very soon. So injectables increase compliance. Though the availability is again, bioavailability will fluctuate depending upon the patient might miss a dose or might delay the dose by two, three days or a week or so. But then definitely the only benefit we find with injectable is that it makes sure that the patient is receiving it and the patient is compliant with it. Oral you can use definitely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, in, uh, madam, excellent deliberation. In relation to his questions, uh, oral testosterone, will it work? Like that of because they do hepatic, work, sir. hepatic fast pass metabolism is very much, or it is to be given uh, uh, sublingual. Sublingual preparations are also available, yeah. gels are also available, intra subcute pellets are also available. Everything is available depending upon how you can ensure that the patient is receiving it. Yeah. That's and the only and second part of my question is so you have said how uh, gynecomastia is common, common in obesity person because of the estradiol conversion. <laughs> And whether it is lipomastia or gynomastia, which is more common in obese person? Pre-pubertally, we come across more of lipomastia. So fat accumulation is always the first to begin. But if untreated, if not looked into it, it might turn into even the, uh, so, um, what you call the breast tissue might also develop. Because to begin with, it's always lipomastia. But it is very embarrassing for young children, especially the young males going to hostel because I come across such children very often. They come to us and the very simple question is, Madam, if I go and stay in a hostel and the boys are taking a shower together or moving out together, swimming out together, so we feel very embarrassing. So lipomastria is definitely the first thing to begin. Pubertal lipomastria is also a known entity and that is uh, doubled or multiplied because of obesity. So the answer is, uh, exercise, especially we ask them to do muscle strengthening exercises, the pectoralis muscle exercises most commonly. Cut down on the diet and a regular exercise we do try for six months or a year, but otherwise we do offer them the uh, cosmetic surgeries, the liposuctions are conducted, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you for that outstanding oration on talk. Yesterday only I came across a meta-analysis, systematic review on meta-analysis published in this year itself which says that clomiphene citrate for men with hypogonadism is probably useful. So what are your final comments on this? So they are the, as I told you, the SERMs, the clomiphene citrate has been used in males, but the results are, the 
whatever the study or the meta-analysis you are quoting actually had a very less number of data, very few patients, and the results are still not definitive. They are still not approved as of clinical indications. Even your anastrozole for that matter and clomiphene citrate both have been having very small number of patients who have been tried. They are still in the trial phases with no proven results. Yeah, I have read that paper, sir. Just it's, one question. Yes, Thank sir. Thank you, ma'am, for your excellent deliberation. Uh, by doing uh, only testosterone laboratory test, is sufficient or it should be done with LH and FSH? Because without LH, FSH, how can we differentiate no. a primary or secondary hypogonadism? That is what we talked, primary and secondary. To differentiate, you need to have your LH, FSH. Even your radiology imaging is required because we need to know the pituitary status. Is there any mass which is affecting? Then if the LHFSH is low, if it is a secondary hypogonadism, is it isolated hypogonadism or are we dealing with a pituitary suppression? We have to look for the growth hormone as well as the thyroid and the cortisol excess also. So there's a huge thing. There are a lot many things. Of course, we need to differentiate the primary and secondary definitely. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, and thank you, thank you Dr. Anut, sir. Thank you for the nice session. Okay. We shift to another session now. Take things forward. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Anuj Maheshwari and Dr. JJ David to chair the next session. Dr. Anuj, sir, and Dr. David. Over to you, sir. So this is a very another very important question, uh, session after a very stimulating talk of Dr. Minal Mohit. I think the full house is there in this talk and uh, many people have been stimulated to ask the question. I believe that next topic is also going to be the similar stimulating topic. And uh, this is a topic in which we are going to talk about uh, an antibiotic which is working against the MRSA and available in oral formulation. So oral formulation antibiotic available, which is working against MRSA, is really a boon for India kind of the country. But at the same time, we shall have to be very much careful that uh, we may not be misusing this kind of the antibiotic, which is available in oral. And very soon, the, again, it may develop the resistance kind of the things what has happened with other antibiotic which have come. So for this uh, particular talk, we have got a very eminent person of the infectious disease, Dr. Mohan Maharaj. Dr. Mohan S. Maharaj is a director of the critical care and pain management services. He is currently practicing as an anesthesiologist in Medicover Hospital, Vishakhapatnam branch. So good to have one speaker from Vishakhapatnam also. So Vishakhapatnam is also actively involving in this conference. Over to Dr. Mohan. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure for uh, with in front of August gathering and uh, on the platform here. And uh, I'm basically intense list. Uh, almost last one and a half decade, I'm not practicing anesthesia, but I do only critical care, and I'm thankful for that. And even though if it is a uh, disclaimer that I'm not sponsored by anything, but still even though I'm giving, I would like to give a more of uh, what actually going to be on this aspect. We all know that any new drug comes and we are interested, but at the same time, we will talk about theme of this back to basics. Why I'm talking on this is as an intensivist. In the ICU, we get a lot of hypotensive patient, and we get multi-drug resistant organism. And we are not talking about that particularly. As you said, basic, back to basics, I mean, back to basics. Here, what is the percentage? As of we know that the gram-positive infection is much less in India is a theme on what we think till now. When I started two and a half decade back, it was only one to two percent we used to think. We all know that hand hygiene, hand washing is one of the important things to stop. And we think about MRSA is not there most of the places, but it is there. If you see South India, it is almost gone to 45%. If you see North India, it is around 30 to 25%. That was the presentation, even if you see 2019 guidelines on Indian AMR as per the data, it has been shown. So to think about all these things, we need to understand why it is important and 
At the same time, I'm not going to promote saying that you give it as servers. Thank, thanks to Anil sir, saying that you need to have this and uh, we have to understand. Everybody nowadays, we started with the leave of Loxlin and now we are worried about to give and sparingly we are using it for resistance. This may also get resistance. So we should be more careful that we agree for that as a physicians. And so this is how it is going to cover 360 degrees of uh, the gram positives. We all know gram positive, gram negative as a basic of cell wall, cell membrane, whether it's a ticoplanin, it is having going to be peptidoglycan. So those things we know the differences, whether it's going to be color, differentiate in violet color or not, then we know as a microbiology from that side. But identification of this is important in the ICU, suspicion, because 30% of the patients in ICU will go with the renal failures. And particularly surgical ICUs and medical ICUs are different. So with this, I will go with what is the importance of this. And in 2014 itself, we come to know about glycopeptide intermediate streptococcus aureus, what is important. So this staphylococcus is because if you have a clusters, you call staphylo. If you have a streps, you call it a strepto. Next. So as I told you that already given the interim saying that factor myth, it's definitely, it's a fact that saying that it's a percentage is definitely an average 33% is having a gram positives and in even medical ICUs. So please do not go by the percentage 72%. 72% is not just because of MRSA. If you compare the line, because we all know that the value of Lancet importance and in 2000, 22 it has published, but 2019 it has given. It is not that only MRSA. When you have given that comparison of these drugs utilization of with third generation cephalosporin using this, that is the percentage. Please do not go by the mistake that suddenly going this number this much, is it possible? No, it is not. It is comparing this. So we all know, see, as every one of us here more than 50 years or 60 years, I mean, many of us. So the age and the quality of life and expect, I mean, the expectancy of life has been increasing. Even in India, it has come to 70 plus. So with this, we are having the infections because the comorbidities are going to be high, as Madam was telling about diabetes and other things. And most of us, every fourth person of the world is going to be Indian person of having a diabetic. So with that, the percentage of this is going to be a little high. And what is going to be MRSA widespread and the resistance is because of long-standing disease, age, and renal failure and having admission in the hospital more times and having a dialysis catheters, those kind of things are going to be more and more. That's the reason that you're going to have a more resistance. We all know about it. So we should be more careful about these type of cases. And as I told you, it's an average of 33% in India you're going to have. And that's a, a difference from particularly if you see from 2016 to 21, and there's a very steep rise as per this uh, ICMR. And nowadays everybody, I don't say everybody, at least 20% of the people are going for a knee replacement and having a, uh, when particularly in after COVID, we learned more and more about hand washing, more and more about infectious diseases, much better even antivirals. So we have very less likely to have a MRSA and having endocarditis, but it is only less than 1%. But if you look at this, the important point I would like to make here is that war and IV, because most of the antibiotics, both bioavailability is not the same. So whereas here, with the doses, what is they have given, the bioavailability of the tissue is going to be much better. We all know the soft tissue infection we are going to give more. But at the same time, to start with an ICU in a shock patient, you don't have to change the dose and the drug. That is the main importance of this, why we can do this. So that's the reason the long, because how long you can use it, because there is a better tissue distribution. And this is what Indian uh, staphylococci in the problematic infections requiring prolonged therapy because any one of us, if you think about an example of candida, after, because we don't give a candida treatment unnecessarily unless it's been uh, shocking. So that time, once it becomes negative of antifungal, you need to give for 14 days. So the duration of therapy is important here. The long duration also can be because you don't need to monitor that either therapeutic level or the drug affection of other organs. So this is what we get particularly for the patients who are being diabetic or uh, CKD and prosthetics, immunosuppressive malignancy. One of the thing most is a malignancy where they actually is more particularly if it is, if it is non-MDR, if it is MRSA, this is one of the important drugs which can give. This is the percentage of it in India, what we are going to have. And uh, you require a high efficacy of IV or oral drug is required with, to know, uh, to have a better clinical outcomes. So we know we have a lot of 
like yesterday I was talking to one of the senior internists in Delhi. He said, why MROC, man? You have a lot of uh, antibiotics have come you now with uh, good sensitivity and you can actually have go with the, all these things. So what are the important of this? What, why we can actually, we need to choose, we need not to choose. Particularly in ICUs, when we have, because as I said, it is a nephrotoxic. And if you see that, uh, vancomycin and ticoplanin, we know, because we cannot give more. The issue here is that, you need to have a therapeutic levels at least two to three days. The shock patient need to recover fast. So you cannot wait that much time. That is the reason I would like to think about this. And look at vancomycin. When there is minimal inhibitory concentration creep is there for this. So because understand that there is an intermittent uh, sensitivity is there. And at that time, when you have the drug levels of monitoring when you are doing that, you require more drug to act on. Because if you have a sensitivity, it will come down. So that is one thing which you have to think about it. So. If you look at uh, the linozolid, we all know that this is one of the important aspects of thrombocytopenia. So you cannot use for a long time. So you keep it in mind in that. And serotonin syndrome, not regularly, but we can think about it. So even though it is working for these kind of things. So then you go for the next drug, think about adaptomycin. Here, when you are using adaptomycin, you need to monitor CPK levels because it has a skeletal muscle atoxicity. So after some time. So that is another important point, what we have to keep it in mind. When you think about adaptomycin, you can give it. So then think about a tigicycline. It is a bacterial stactic activity, and uh, there's no oral formulation, even if you want to change once the patient becomes stabilization and you want to shift the patient. So this is why even clindamycin, it has its own C. diff, because we know one of the important aspects in ICU for long-standing patients, the development of C. diff is important. You have to think about it when you have the area more than three times a day. Then keep it in mind and more than a week of the hospital administration. So that's the reason that why I'm thinking about this. Otherwise, it's not that other drugs are not useful. They are very good. They can be used. But keep these points in the mind before you choose. So the advantage of, see, whenever you want, I know, we know everybody wants ideal things. But what is ideal? Ideal means these are the things we wanted. We want to have a rapid bactericidal killing we need. And we need an excellent tissue penetration. We need a pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics, which allows the predictable dosing of the patient for the drug and low potential for the development of resistance while on therapy, because that's one of the important in AMR, which has been and studied in 2,204 countries for more than a year. And uh, they have been published more than 12,000 patients. And the AMR is important, which has been published. I think all physicians know about it. So the, you need low side effect profile, and you need to demonstrate clinical and microbiological efficacy, and they should have excellent biofilm penetration. We all know the formation of biofilm, when you put a center line, when you have a lines, the formation of biofilm, you cannot break it. So what is useful, beneficial, the breaking of biofilm is important to act the antibiotic at the site of infection or where the pus is there. So and the availability of oral and IV. So, and if you see in MROC, they actually had a three phases of trials, particularly in uh, India. And whereas US, they have done, for some reasons, they did not do phase two, phase three trials. I have come to know later on when I talk to them. And with this, it is definitely the first ever IV oral bactericidal, and it's going to be one of the good anti-MRSA antibiotic, and I'm maybe definitely sure in future, because if you see any ICU in, in other countries, gram negative is more, more percentage, and the death is going to be, uh, mortality rate is high. So that is why they don't focus on gram positives much. And I don't want to say this is Vajrayudam, but at the same time, I would like to say that it's going to work on all these pathogens, except because these are important to keep it in mind, because if other antibiotics do work, I'm not saying that, but at the same time, you look at it, because in pause of time of only 10 minutes, I would like to say that this is going to work on everything about, like you have a resistance mechanism and staphylococci, what is having, and if you have enterobacteria, because you go from the gut to the community acquired, because we know the atypical, whenever you are giving atypical organs are going to be there for pneumonia, those kind of patients you want to start and immediately to start most of the times, whether you have a therapeutic, you have a prophylactic, you have a duration of time, all these things when you do. So this is why the importance of anywhere, whether you can come from the streptococci and you can come from the staphylococci. So what is going to be there? All these pathogens are working better than levonorofloxacin because in that also another important point is that the metabolite, when it comes to the active metabolite, how much time it is going to say, how active it is going to be there. I think every, as a physician, we know the pharmacology, how it is going to be there. So this drug, which is having, it is having a unique structure, 
and it is a broad spectrum coverage of gram positive. I would like to keep with a pinch of salt that I am telling again and again, stressing that in multi drug resistant gram negative, it is not going to work, but all other is going to work because that's what I want to say. That I don't want to say that this is going to work for everywhere, but that keep it in mind. But the other way, everywhere it will work. And it has a dual action on DNA gyrase, and uh, so you see that it has an easier switch to OIV to oral. And the same thing I'm reiterating that, saying that it eradicates biofilm. And I'm not talking that it's going to eradicate MDR or gram negative, but it's eradicate this. And rapid bactericidal action, and it has a better tissue penetration, and dose adjustment in hepatic and real reproductive is not required. So this is what another important point to keep it in mind. And please understand, it is a superior safety, particularly whenever you give a drug, you look at the drug-drug interaction, you look at other organs effect, and uh, there is no QT prolongation like other, what I previously told you when you are thinking about don't need to keep it in, because previous, just two talks before, they were talking about atrial fibrillation and the cardiac problems the other senior doctor was talking about. So it is suitable for long-term use. So this is a coverage of uh, vancomycin for gram positive, and uh, there is a global surveillance was done for uh, um, almost uh, more than 4,000 worldwide isolates. And you look at it, leave on, I just want to say that minimum inhibitory concentration of 90 and 50. Normally there's something called, this is, we have a U-cost and L e CLIS. So this is where the European level of the antibiotic microbial will, they look at the MIC, they decide, in India we don't do it. They will decide, they will test and they will manage saying that what is the MIC level of that. Because if the more than minimum inhibitory concentration of 90% growth is being stopped or and it's been either sidle, it's killing. The size of, like when you see the growth, no, the size of should not be increased when you put an agar plate. So BHA plate, like brain uh, tissue perfusion where you have to put agar plate. When you put one ml or uh, this vancomycin when they studied also, whether it's less than 10 ml or less than 19 mm, that's what decides and says that whether this growth is being hampered mic, mic level. So the MIC level and breakpoint, it gives almost five times of the MIC level is given to the breakpoint. So when the breakpoint is there, most of the times it is guaranteed that it is going to work on the tissue level and penetration. That's what the, how it says about mic level and uh, breakpoint. And this has been studied in America also in the first phase itself is what is going to be the benefit of uh, levels of this one. So this is the sensitivity level and the intermittent sensitivity and resistance levels. So the, when it's more than eight milligrams per liter is there, then it's going to be resistance. So that's what you say that, so you have, you know, like look at the MIC level and requirement. It's only double, that means 0.5 to one is required to have a 90, whereas here you look at levofloxacin 0.25, that almost 16 times more is required to have a 90% of uh, MIC. So this is what our uh, Dr. Balaji Viragon, one of the famous uh, microbiologists, has been studied from CMC Vellur. The potency evaluation of MROC by Dr. Balaji. And uh, you look at it here that when you have that, again, as I told you previously, there's only two times, like 0 0.5 to 1 or uh, 0.25 to 0.5. The susceptibility is 100 compared to any other drug. What is I understand people will talk about others, but depends on, it is not any uh, isolate study. It is not any, uh, I don't talk about a randomized control study, but this is what has been studied by themselves and which is actually uh, confidential. So the broad spectrum activity, as I told you that it, 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 it works on most of the organisms here, what is going to be working. So look at the organism, what is going to cover. It has been published in 2016 and 2020 and by 2019, all three have been, because they have studied how important it is and the susceptibility of this organism has been shown. So please understand if the term has come from more than uh, six to eight years, so the vancomycin resistance or glycopeptide uh, intermittent sensitivity, when they have against working about this one, you look at the gyrase, as I told you, the mechanism of action was working, and you look at the vancomycin resistance and how much it is going to be different from the levonorbloxlin of 0.5. So this is what I would like to say. Other things have also been working, but the level of this VRSA and the vancomycin sensitivity is much, much better. And there's no impact of vancomycin non-susceptible on MRAC activity. So this is just to reiterate the, what are the important points of the MRSA for MR, MROC. So these are the things which are very, very useful, including the anaerobes. And because I'd like to give two minutes of talk at the end of the questions for shared persons also. And you look at it, the highly active agonist, difficult to diagnose atypical respiratory patterns. Because when you cover, you need to add other for the atypicals, but you don't need to add atypical again another drug. The single drug is going to be effective and useful. But 
I'm, I'm worried, even though they say that it is not going to have a resistance, maybe uses of more and more times, it may develop a resistance over a period of time is the worry, but they have their intermediate, they are not sending it, it's not over the counter drug. That's the one thing I believe that at present of time, I do not know much, maybe you have more practical experience. So it's superior to that of levofloxacin, that is actually 100% guaranteed. So if you see the lung penetration and it's going to be, what is there, they have shown it here, we'll go back. So the extracellular, extra lung fluid, where it is there, achieves best in class lung, extra lung fluid concentration, that is more than the three times of the levofloxacin. That is what is going to be useful, particularly if you have a pneumonia. So the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, I was telling you, this is what is how the absorption occurs. The Alanivonadafloxacin is absorbed with the help of amino acid transport in the intestine short, that is, the, you know about the CMAX, and rapid complete conversion active drug by the action of esterases. Approximately 90%, and uh, that's another important point, whether first phase or second phase, it's going to be in crossing oral IV. So the excretion is uh, through blood and urine, so, okay, so both urine and feces, okay. The minimal role of renal pathway, that is why we can use it in uh, a renal failure as well. And there's no change of the dose as can be done also. The volume distribution is good because particularly in sepsis, in hypotensive patients, the volume distribution changes in ICU. That's another way of it's going to be useful. And the hepatic phase two conjugative metabolism. As I was telling you previously that the level of eight milligrams per liter, whatever dose you give, whether you give 1000 milligrams BAD oral or 800 IV BAD, so the, the level in the serum is above eight always. If you look at it, even if the peak concentration has come in, but the level is above. So that means the, the action on the, all this uh, gram positive organism is going to work much better because it's going to be sidal as well as more than mic levels of my 90 is going to affect work better. So it is 90% bioavailability and there is a better intestinal amino acid transportation mediated efficient absorption happens. So the unique combination of high lung concentration, I was telling you previously how it's going to be extra lungular fluid and important of this. And it is going to work through this and it's been 2018 February they have been published and how important it was. And the MROC level, if you look at the percentage of how much is going to be staying in the lung and that's what is important. So there is no alveolar macrophage because when you are working on this in infection conditions, that is important here. The other clinically relevant features of MROC are, the another one important on this slide would put into your mind is that most of the antibiotics, they work as antibiotics, it's okay, but it has a very good inhibition of pro-inflammatory cytokines, so anti-inflammatory also. This one point I would like to put into saying that, okay, this is important. So when you look at it, the eradicates MRSA biofilm, this is what they studied and shown that the other antibiotics has been shown in microscope showing how much the eradication has been happening and the, how reduction of the bacteria has been coming to this. So this is what infections when uh, in a diverse support infections of clinical features strongly, the clinical and non-clinical features are, these are important particularly when you are using it as I showed you in the defective way of uh, previous also. So the national surveillance program has been done in MROC by previously ICMR has been done, in GIPMR they have studied and they've shown almost 23 major hospitals across India has been submitted to the regional cephalococcal isolates to GIPMR and isolates to be categorized using the approved MROC susceptibility breakpoint. This is what a study in Pioneer, uh, that's called Pioneer study when in the event of monitoring multicentric MROC uh, retrospective study has been studied. So they have shown that indicators for the prescribing MROC and how much percentage and what is the effect of the frequency, how important of bloodstream infections and uh, septicemia cases have been studied. And this is what the study details are in almost major, all the uh, bigger countries, bigger cities, they have been studied over 98 sites and 117 investigations with seven chief investigations with 1,229 patient data. So this is what the, the benefit of success and failure, you can see that it's not the even we have seen only zero to 100 is properly done. The difference between the resistance or the clinical outcomes in the percentage was much, much, much beneficial. And the adverse events are very, very, very less because the only nine subjects received only, only reported that the commonly things are this is the one. So this is what, this is my last slide. So the no infusion related with excellent GA tolerability and no need of uh, duct, I mean therapeutic monitoring and ease of administration and 95% susceptibility and no dose changes required for renal hepatic. So this is what, again, reiterating of this. And this is important thing of timeline. We all know that getting a new antibiotic is not easy. And 
gram negative antibiotics uh, may getting some but gram positive antibiotics since many many years it has not come after 2007 now only we got it uh, emroc so levonorgestrel which is a uh, uh, patients definitely are benefited but choose the patient right as we all know that pharmacology right dose right route right patient that is one thing we should be saying and contemporary solution for contemporary patient this is what is doing thank you very much for your patient listening and any queries chair persons thank you dr anish sir thank so you dr mohana mohan maharaj for excellent presentation on a novel antibiotic particularly covering the mrsa and all other atypical enerobes and susceptible in uh, susceptible gram negative bacteria but it will not cover as i said it will not cover uh, multi drug resistant gram negative infections but it will cover uh, 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 all the spectrum of the icu infections any questions from the uh, audience yes gram negative to cover the gram negative what uh, medicine would you suggest that would act if synergistically it is, with it if it is a gram negative not multi drug i still start with gramerox what i am telling is gram negative multi drug depends on your last normally whenever we start antibiotics we look for last 6 months of our gram how what is the growth of uh, in that if i am getting particularly acidobacter uh, klebsiella then i think about normally most of the times we start with carbapenem then go for the higher antibiotics depends on the consistency but to start with if we have the patient desired medicine without even if they have a clinical failure i mean real failure doesn't matter you can start with this then go for it oh. because gram negatives all doesn't cover but definitely gram negative Some. it has sensitivity along with the atypical that's what is issue sir one sir sir tissue penetration except lung yeah. uh, because in antibiotic tissue is also important sir particularly any particularly skin and soft tissues the tissue penetration that's what is important of this emrox sir because if you see that uh, the bioavailability is more than 90% it reaches the that's the reason i have shown the micro uh, microscopy picture when it is it the reachability of the tissue because it's particularly gram positive is more into the skin and soft tissue and even into the deeper area of like you know arthroprosthetic those areas this is going to work very well sir Yeah, Dr. Maharaj, one sir, question from sir, my sir, side. Please, please. Because uh, this drug is um, mostly uh, we have been seeing in uh, India because yeah. in your studies and these things, it is not FDA approved till now. I it think is. So. It is. I mean, I think you see that. I'll just show you this. Is it FDA approved? Yeah, yeah. That's what the first drug shown, no, sir. If you see the first one, the, you see the early because like COVID time, most of the things were having a uh, fast phase, the mechanism. So look at it. i have just shown this yeah qdip yeah. because that that's the reason i would like to say that because the qualified infection this is product based on the coverage of six cdc identified threat pathogens it's been approved so that's what i would like to tell you again yes recently i was using in my hospital but the hospital <laughs> it is a whether there is a question whether fda approved or not that's what so I, because medically approved? whether we can stand if we go to the court yeah that's important point for any physician sir particularly not in india particularly in abroad because uh, india at least antibiotic that i can take the permission from from patient attendants but in abroad that's a very important question but it is usa approved for qidp because if you see that there is a fast track review normally any antibiotic phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 trial it comes but whereas in 2 years they could do the fast track review and accelerate the drug and government has been asked for it that's what i have gone through it and i have know from the company that's the reason i thank, thank you thank you sir thank you please 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 Definitely, sir. Me happy and simple is important. But patients sometimes confused that this patient is suffering from a previous STD, and he he has in your hand both neuropenic as well as Embrox, and he was thinking both of the drugs could be acting for the same patient. So, what is your option? Doesn't matter, sir, because you give both to start with and send the cultures because now we have a biofare which comes in few hours. that's what before giving the blood cultures you just give the drug because you, your patient life is more important for you maybe you can every patient more than 72 hours you should not give any antibiotic if i see because last month i was in abu dhabi the doctor has authority to give only one dose he doesn't have authority to give second dose infection disease come has to come and approve it to give second dose of meropenem 
That is what the people are practicing. Particularly the resistance is happening to tell you we are writing the antimicrobial resistance is one of the important aspects of the death of the patients and mortality. But to tell you frankly, the maximum antibiotics are used not by human beings. It's by the fisheries and animals. And if you see other countries, how do they test the antibiotic resistance level? They check the feces level of the, um, uh, the soil. Then they look at the antibiotic level, how much using. That's how normally it should be done, but which you are not able to do it. What is its uh, utility in CNS infections like meningitis and all? Sir, even the, the it, no, it is not. Because of this, it is not going to cross the blood-brain barrier. Please understand. It is not approved for the CNS not infections that, and not approved for yeah. the bacterial endocarditis. Please, Rest of them fine. we can use. Sir, please. Yeah, we can have a discussion at lunchtime because of time constraint. Uh, Last question, David. Yes, sir. With sir, your permission. Sir, what is the role of this oh. uh, antibiotic in infective endocarditis, prosthetic bitter wall endocarditis? We don't start with this, sir, because uh, no. Yeah. no role in uh, endocarditis. No, it is not approved for endocarditis. There are no studies on that. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, for audience uh, active participation. Uh, thank you, sir. We could close the session. Thank you. It has really been a, another stimulating talk after. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Minal Mohit and Dr. Uh, Mohan Maharaj both has generated a lot of questions. Thank you, sir. Here is a keynote lecture. Uh, and uh, for that, uh, I would uh, like to again invite Dr. Anuj and Dr. Narsing Verma to come on the stage to chair this session. Dr. Murthy is not here, so I'll be requesting Dr. Anuj. And Dr. Narsing Verma as well to come on the stage and kindly chair this session. I think Dr. Shashank uh, does not need any introduction. Somehow he is not uh, being able to travel, so he is speaking uh, virtually. So would be requesting to uh, start his uh, uh, virtual talk. In the meantime, they are preparing. We can say that Dr. Shashank is the consultant endocrinologist at Mumbai. Apart from that, he is chair of IDF Southeast Asia. President of the Indian Academy of Diabetes. He has been the president of API, Endocrine Society of India, Research Society for the Study of Diabetes in India, and the All India Association of Advancing Research in Obesity. So I think over to Dr. Shashank. Hello, everybody. <coughs> Today we are going to discuss a new landscape in the management of adiposity medicine and a concept called ABCD, which is adiposity-based chronic disease. You know that chronic care and chronic diseases are on the rise and mother of all diseases uh, lies in the adipocyte. And the ABCD model of adiposity-based chronic disease has a direct implication on CMBCD, which is cardiometabolic-based chronic disease. So we all know that the NCD explosion or non-communicable disease explosion has the underlying root as obesity. And we all recognize that all the chronic disease clusters which we see today in modern medicine are all related to obesity. What is obesity? It is a chronic relapsing progressive disease process characterized by abnormal and or excessive adiposity which impairs or adversely impacts health. So the first recognizable thing which we need to recognize is obesity is a well-recognized disease. It's chronic, it's relapsing, it's progressive. It has abnormal or excessive adipose tissue, which is impairing or adversely affecting health. It has several factors like sleep, food, 
biology, mental health, food marketing, genomic risks, life events, stigma, so on and so forth. It is associated with 200 plus complications. It cuts short the lifespan and increases mortality and it impacts quality of life. We have probably a very large proportion of people who live in India with obesity. And the approximate estimate is around 135 million because we are thin fat Indians. And clearly, if you see, multiple complications are associated with obesity. You can see here, the dark blue is grade 4, the lighter blue is 3, 2 and 1, which is the strength of evidence, very strong, strong, moderate or weak. So currently, you can see that more than 229 complications are affecting every organ system and medical speciality, starting from de novo type 2 diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, cardiac failure, fatty liver, venous thromboembolism, gout, stroke, depression, endometrial cancers, breast cancers, colorectal cancers, atrial fibrillation, incident heart failure, you know, even C-sections or osteoarthritis. Then, of course, we have GRD. We have even congenital anomalies of the abnormal a newborn which are associated and renal cancer and so on and so forth. So what is driving this ABCD or CMBCD? It is the phenotype. Now uniquely, uh, you know, geographies like China, India have a phenotype which predisposes them to ABCD or CMBCD. We have rapidly urbanized our environment. We have become a global village, particularly with the internet explosion. We have a lot of socio-cultural factors and as the affluence has gone up, as people have become more and more affluent, likelihood of adipose tissue depositing at abnormal sites has gone up. And of course, there is a genomic predilection and our food habits have become worse by the day. So in the Asian population, which is what I represent from the country of India, there is a natural selection and there is a clear genetic variant which influences obesity-related traits. This leads to higher thermogenic activity of the brown adipose tissue, which leads to an increased non-50 alleles in the ancestors of East Asians and South Asians, which leads to a predilection to central obesity. So clearly we are thin fat Indians and the Asian phenotype carries more fat with the same BMI compared to the non-Asian phenotype. So we have as Asian Indians more fat, more total and abnormal region, with less lean mass, less skeletal muscle mass and bone mineral density compared to other ethnic groups and which is why there is an explosion of type 2 diabetes and non-communicable diseases in this geography of South Asia. So for the same BM of 32, let me illustrate patient A, patient B and patient C. Patient C clearly represents the Caucasian phenotype while patient A is a typical Asian Indian living within or outside of India which is the thin fat Indian phenotype, where in the body composition, there is more fat. And clearly, therefore, for different BMI also, the lean mass can remain the same. So, we are seeing a new phase of malnutrition today. And this new phase of malnutrition we are seeing is called as low lean mass, which is present across all body weights and all BMIs. And this is the new modern phase of Asian malnutrition. And this is called as sarcopenia. Sarcos is muscle. Sarcopenia is less muscle. And across the whole Asian geography, right from East Asia of Japan, Korea, Taiwan, from Singapore, Malaysia, to India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and various other countries, we can clearly recognize a less muscle mass and a low lean mass in our population. Current type 2 diabetes comes in clusters. Here you can see these clusters are based on the BMI, the waist, the hip, the fat, the insulin resistance, the triglycerides, the beta cell function, the insulin resistance, the area under the curve and the HDL. And we are now recognizing different clusters because there's a lot of heterogeneity in type 2 diabetes. So, for example, we, in these various clusters, we have some people which are overweight with normal insulin sensitivity and normal insulin resistance. And mostly they are normal, which is low risk. The cluster 2 is very low risk, where there is good insulin sensitivity, adequate beta cell mass. Again, they are not. Then we have the third cluster, where there is a beta cell failure. They are overweight. Their insulin sensitivity is moderately low, but the beta cell output is poor. And they get mostly prediabetes, and they have an increased susceptibility to various abnormalities which we see. 
and recognize. So clearly we can see that this cluster 4 is low risk obese, which is again having good insulin sensitivity and secretion and they are normal. Cluster 5 is highly insulin resistant fatty liver phenotype, which is clearly seeing a lot of type 2 diabetes with high liver fat. And finally, we have the visceral adiposity with obesity, with low insulin sensitivity, normal or borderline uh, you know, insulin secretion and predominantly a renal sinus fat and renal failure. So when we look at the chronic conditions, the first stage is genomic predisposition and family history. The second stage is pre where there's increased overweight, abnormal distribution of fat, abnormal function of fat, and all the biochemical abnormalities, insulin resistance. So in the first stage, there is only insulin resistance. As the disease moves, you get pre-diabetes. But in the third stage, the BMI, if it is used as a threshold, you get obesity. If you use anthropometry as a threshold, then you get thin fat Indians. And if you use biochemistry as a threshold, you get type 2 diabetes. And the four stages complication, which are cardiometabolic or biochemical, and ultimately macro and microvascular. But BMI is a very, very poor measure. The reason I am asked to give this talk from a clinical standpoint is BMI is a very poor measure of individuals' adipose-related disease burden. It is the fat quantity, the fat quality, and the location that matters. So therefore, it is best to avoid the term obesity and instead to use the term adipopathy or ABCD, adiposity-based chronic disease. The ABCD or adiposopathy is a key pathogenic driver of many conditions and represents a disease continuum. And therefore, based on the goals, the treatments and the outcomes will differ on the disease stage. So here you can see in the ABCD, clearly the primary drivers are unhealthy lifestyle and epigenetics. In the stage 1, in the stage 2, there is overweight and abnormal adiposity. Stage 3, there is abnormal adiposity. And finally, you have the outcomes. We have also a term called DBCD, which is diabetes or dysglycemia-based chronic disease, where you get pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and microvascular disease. Then we have HBCD, which is hypertension or high blood pressure-based chronic disease, where there is pre-hypertension, hypertension, and hypertensive complications. Then we have LBCD which is lipid-based chronic disease, where there's abnormal lipids, dyslipidemia, and lipid-related complications. And finally, we have the actionable one, which has been derived, and this was all devised, these terms have been devised by Professor Jeffrey Mechanic, who is a direct medical director and past president of the American College of Clinical Technology, a good friend of ours. And the CMBCD is chronic, chronic cardiometabolic-based chronic disease, which is a metabolic syndrome in the older terminology, where you have subclinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular dysfunction, asymptomatic CVD, and symptomatic CVD. Well, in the DBCD model, glucose is the primary target. In the ABCD model, and overall, it encompasses obesity as a primary target. And therefore, we need to recognize that. So fundamentally, when we are looking at cardiometabolic-based chronic disease, we are looking at metabolic flexibility because it has an impact on lifespan. And clearly we recognize that the disease burden is huge because we know the global burden of deaths are all being driven by cardiovascular disease. Even today, the largest cause of death on planet Earth is cardiovascular disease. And these deaths are clearly driven by an ABCD, DBCD and CMBCD model. You can see that cardiovascular rates in India have exponentially grown up. The mortality has grown up. And particularly in the post-COVID time, we are seeing a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease, stroke, and ischemic heart disease due to lack of recognition and follow-up, which is being lost. Well, the clock of macrovascular clock of heart disease starts ticking very early in life. We know atherosclerotic plaques start at the age of 6 and 7. And by the time diabetes becomes overt, okay, macrovascular complications have already set in. And by the time the microvascular clock starts ticking, already there is de novo diabetes, which is overt and obvious. So fundamentally, the metabolic driver of cardiometabolic-based chronic disease needs a strategy for early interventions. And we need to control the metabolic drivers, including adiposity, dysglycemia, and hypertension, A, B, and C. And therefore, it's A for the adiposity and the A1C, B, for basically blood pressure and C basically for the dysglycemia part and the dysinsulinemia part. 
So what is CFDC? It is ABCD plus DBCD. So ABCD stands for adiposity based chronic disease. It has two parts, which reflects, as I earlier told you, adiposity based reflection of mass function and distribution, and the chronic disease, which reflects the risk, the presence and severity of complications. Then we have the DBCD term, which reflects the different spectrum of diabetes, from pre-diabetes to insulin resistance to over diabetes to diabetic complication. And finally, a combination of ABCD and DBCD results in a medically actionable model where we have a complex interrelationship between obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, which go hand in hand. And therefore, it's very, very important to have primordial prevention, primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention to prevent development of end-stage disease complications. So when we merge the ABCD, DBCD, and CMBCD models, I'm reiterating this graph again. You can see that in the ABCD model, it is the abnormal amount of weight, the fat distribution of ectopic fat, and the abnormal function of adipocyte, which drives cardiomechanical and biomechanical complications. Similarly, the glucose model of insulin resistance drives diabetes and micro microvascular complications. And similarly, when these two are merged, you get development of metabolic syndrome traits with glucose, dyslipidemia, and hypertension driving heart disease, heart failure, and atrial fibrillation. So clearly, adiposity and dysglycemia affects cardiovascular disease. We know that ABCD model increases the prevalence and the progression of coronary artery calcification. It also increases preserved and reduced ejection fraction and increases the prevalence of atrial fibrillation. Similarly, you can see that DBCD leads to more reactive platelets, higher risk of first myocardial infarction, decrease myocardial perfusion apart from micro damage in the myocardium and cardiac lipomas. And overall, the metabolic CMBCD model will lead to more coronary plaques, more incidence of prevalence of first acute coronary event and higher prevalence of all coronary artery disease, a heart failure and atrial fibrillation and death. So obviously, it's a combination of beta cell defect, insulin resistance, lipotoxicity, glucotoxicity, and that contributes to DBCD, ABCD, or CMBC. And therefore, it's very important to recognize whether it is metabolic or mechanical inflexibility. We need to have metabolic modulators for good health, and that is so crucial. So obviously, today's treatment of type 2 diabetes, the reason we are talking as clinicians in this ABCD model is we need to move beyond a glucocentric approach to a weight-centric, cardiocentric, cardio-obesity-centric approach. And if you see the latest ADA ESD guidance, the latest RSSDI ESI guidance, the proportion of type 2 diabetes which needs a weight centric approach is much more than those who need a glucocentric approach. And that is why this ABCD model has become more actionable. So, obviously, things happen because we are driving chronic disease models of adiposity, dysglycemia, and cardiometabolism. Adiposity and dysglycemia are the key drivers for the number one cause of mortality worldwide. And therefore, weight control is as important as a primary target as glucose control. And it's just not weight. It is the adipose tissue reduction and shrinkage, which will mitigate and prevent complications and death and prolong life, particularly to cardiovascular. My last mantra is always lifestyle. We are in best of times, but we are in worst of times. And therefore, if we have to make a difference on ABCD, DBCD, or CMBCD, we need to eat slowly. We need to eat less. We need to eat on time. We need to eat right. We need to do a lot of physical activity, including 10,000 steps a day, do a lot of walk, build some muscle mass because we are sarcopenic, do some yoga and meditation, do ensure that you sleep on time, sleep well, and be stress free and smile. That's really the core essence of the mantra to prevent ABCD models. It's equally important that when we are reducing glucose or DBCD, adipose tissue or ABCD, or the cardiometabolic risk, we need to be happy and healthy. And we are in digital times, and therefore we are into a digital meeting. We need to do one hour of digital detox every day because that has truncated the physical activity. And that's really been the challenge. So I hope from the exercise I have told you 
you have understood a little bit about the term ABCD and recognize that obesity, though is a recognizable disease, ABCD is much more granular in its depth. It's closely married to DBCD and is closely having a medical actionable model called CMBCD. So what you have listened, <clears throat> I hope you have learned. What you have learned, I hope you will adapt and you will follow a healthy lifestyle and sleep well. Thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Shashank. As always, he is excellent in his uh, oration, in his lectures. Uh, whether he is virtual, whether he is physical, I can't ever perceive any difference in the quality of the talk and the uh, things what he tried to uh, give us, what he tried to message us. Even on the virtual talk, it's really a proud privilege to see that hall is full. People is stuck to their seat to listen him. And this makes him deserve for this keynote lecture. So with a round of applause for Shashank, even in his absence, I will request the uh, coordinator to take the another session. I think uh, uh, one chairperson is missing, I think. Is there? You just check. Dr. Jalil Chaudhary from uh, Bangladesh has not traveled. So I will request Dr. Narsingh Verma to stay back here and you call the another chairperson. Thank you, sir. Um, that was quite an enlightening session. So now to carry out our scientific sessions further, I would like to invite Dr. Mal Meenal Mohit, madam, to chair the session along with Dr. Narsingh Verma, sir. Thank you, sir. Very good afternoon. It's a pleasure to invite Dr. Arvind Gupta, sir, on the dais. Dr. Arvind, sir, is my senior, my mentor from Jaipur. Sir is a senior diabetologist physician with Rajasthan Hospital. Sir is the chairman of our Rajasthan chapter RSSDI. There is no limit to what I can go on saying for Dr. Arvind Gupta, sir. But in the lack of time, I hand it back to Dr. Arvind, sir. Sir, please. Thank you. Dr. Meenal, thank you, Professor Narsingh Verma, <coughs> for inviting me, and Dr. Anuj, and all the scientific team for inviting me for this beautiful city of Vizek. After listening a brilliant and elegant lecture from Dr. Sashank Joshi on obesity, I will take back to you the real theme of the uh, conference, Back to Basics. And I'll invite so much of uh, your queries regarding what we are thinking, what we are actually advising our patients regarding the fats. The moment patient comes to us, they say, or we say to them, Ki fat band kar do, diabetes hai, aapko hypertension hai, coronary artery disease hai without thinking, even our dietitians, most of the time, they do not understand uh, regarding what to be advised and what is the reality behind the dietary fats. So I'll be taking you to the journey from basics to the recent controversies regarding the dietary fats. Uh, my disclosures were nothing particular about this topic. This is David Kessler author of the end of the overeating, taking control of insatiable American appetite. And what he said, we are hardwired to hunger for fatty, sugary, salty foods because back when our ancestors were foraging for every meal, palatable eats meant extra energy and a leg up survival. This is the Dr. David Kessler. Do any one of these look good? I think this is a lunch time and I don't want to show this much of time. So what is fat? In the Greek, lipos is a fat. Lipids actually are regarding the organic uh, substances, relatively insoluble in water, and we know this thing very well, but and they are soluble in organic solvents and potentially related to fatty acids and utilized by the living cells. This is the fat. 
it is not polymer mostly they are very very small molecules and they constitute about 15 to 20 percent of our body weight fat has a lot of function in our body if you see it is a source of energy vehicle for soluble vitamins otherwise we will be having a deficiency of most of the vitamins if we don't have the good uh, amount of the fat in our diet it supports viscera it actually acts as the insulation palatability is always with the fat not with the other uh, uh, other uh, proteins and uh, carbohydrates it we require fat for the growth structural integrity of the cell membrane and it decreases the platelet adhesiveness these are the all the roles of fat on the other side we need fat for vascular homeostasis kidney functions secretion in stomach gastrointestinal motility lung physiology reproduction and what not we need fat for all these functions but yes it is a concentrated source of energy and we know that every uh, gram of fat contains nine calories so that is the, the the fact so what we used to think these days and even little earlier in last decades dietary advice was based on premise that high intake of fat cause obesity diabetes heart disease maybe cancer dear friends this is the paper published by ludwig in science you can understand and they have actually potentially asked the questions regarding the dietary fat it is from foe to friend don't think every time fat is a foe it is not a foe it is a friend and you have to actually choose your friend uh, uh, very meticulously that is the important point in 1977 actually this all debate starts in us when the us senate reports and recommends to all the us citizens that they should reduce the uh, consumption of total and saturated fat and later on in 1988 surgeon general's report they are not medical people even senate and surgeon general says that uh, reduction of fat consumption as a primary dietary priority this was the actually in 1977 and 1988 more so not even in us even our indian diet has much of issues because we are taking too much of carbohydrates too little proteins high invisible fat every grains and other things have invisible fats saturated fats and total fat that is the, the reality and very poor omega 3 omega 6 ratio that is again a very very important issue in our indian diet and it is a fibropenic hardly we take uh, fibers in the form of salads fruits vegetables so what are the evidences in favor of low fat <coughs> and high carbohydrate diet what earlier it, uh, the the effects were humans preferentially oxidize carbohydrates over the fat that is the first point a process that helps to maintain a blood glucose within homeostatically homeostatically controlled or uh, ranges that is the first thing oxidizing the the carbohydrates that is the important thing and of course fat is a very highly palatable and may have a weak effect on satiation that is again fat has very so how much amount of fat you can take but satiety we don't have any satiety potentially leading to passive over consumption and if not coupled with increase energy expenditure results in weight gain that is the the basics why we take too much of fat and diet rich in whole grains which are low in fat and have a relatively low glycemic load promote satiety and reduce over consumption hence uh i think uh, possibility by increasing the concentration of glp1 after eating so that is the points in favor of low fat and high carbohydrate what are the facts in favor of high fat and low carbohydrate a dietary carbohydrate is replaced by fat 
the postprandial spikes that is the basic thing the postprandial spikes in the blood uh, glucose concentration uh, and insulin reduces glucagon secretion increases and metabolism shifts to a greater reliance of fat oxidation so that is the point the in favor of high fat and low carbohydrate but dear friends views have changed now fats are an important part of healthy diet eating a very low fat diet is not good for us and of course what is good food and good fat and bad fat i'll i'll take you to now so these are our new friends it's a, i have already told you it supports cell growth energy source of energy it absorbs nutrients and of course regulate hormones this is the very re recently published papers uh, i mean in 2017 by uh, malotra and what it says saturated fat fat does not clog the arteries coronary artery disease is a chronic inflammatory condition the risk of which can be effectively reduced from healthy lifestyle intervention this is a paper published in, again uh, in the, the, the british journal of sports so dear friends there are several pleiotropic effects of uh, the low carbohydrate and high fat diets fat is actually needed for the substrate oxidation anabolic signaling in adipose tissues is required postprandial oxidative stress and inflammation uh, reduction we require uh, the fats and of course various metabolic uh, syndrome components uh, the fat is actually needed and of course for ketone uptake brain and heart muscles that is important beta hydroxy butyric acid signaling for this also we need the fat and for reactive oxygen species membranes highly unsaturated fatty acids and of course it is anti seizure and neuroprotective that is again an important thing and of course for insulin hormone sensitivity and appetite uh, reduction we require the fat and this is what is done in a day to day basis there is a whenever we take food the energy balance deviates and if your energy balance is normal you have adipose tissue hyperplasia uh, i mean it is increases then you have the adipose tissue hyperplasia normal angiogenesis normal adipogenesis small insulin sensitive adipocytes and ultimately it leads what dr shashank has told us the metabolically healthy obesity but if it is in the other direction then of course everything is opposite the adipocyte hypertrophy takes place there is inadequate vascularization increases the hypoxia apoptosis increases adipose tissue stress increases the immune cell infiltration and increases neurosis and fibrosis and the result is increasing ectopic fat and that leads to metabolically unhealthy obesity so the fatty acids what are the fatty acids uh, they are we know that they are saturated and unsaturated mono unsaturated and poly unsaturated fats and the saturated fat means there is no double bond and basically they are all animal fats the saturated fats and of course like butter breast milk the uh, dairy products and meat they all contains the the saturated fats what is mono unsaturated fatty acid it has a single double bond if you see here in the structure single double bond is there and that's why this is mono unsaturated fat and of course we have these type of olive oil canola grape seed oil they are all mufa and what is mufa poly unsaturated fats they are a more than one double bond they are protective against the insulin resistance and protects from cardiovascular disease all evidences are there and of course more vulnerable for the lipid peroxidation mostly found in vegetable oils except the uh, the fish oils and <coughs> based on position they are different n3 n6 n9 etc and like ala alpha linolenic acid ecosa pentanoic acid docasa hexanoic acid they are all the varieties of omega 
three fatty acids and actually we require omega-3 fatty acids for various functions. And of course, omega-6 fatty acids, this is the first double bond from methyl and exists as a 6 cc bond. And we have the linolytic acid, arachidonic acid, and uh, DGLA. These are all the, the, the N6 fatty. So we require both N6 and N3. But the ratio is very, very important. And if you see the ratio, if the ratio is less than 4 is to 1, this is very good for our endothelial cells as well as the beta cells. But if the ratio is more than 10, then it is not a good thing. And if you what dietary oils we are taking, if you see here, we have a very poor month's oil that is mustard oil has the best omega-6, omega-3 ratio. And I think this is very good for our uh, endothelial cells of the coronary arteries as well as the beta cells. They are very, very sensitive to the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. But on the other hand, trans fatty acids. What are the trans fatty acids? They are the geometrical isomers of the unsaturated, uh, cis unsaturated fatty acids. So this is the actually, and why the, it was developed? They are developed because uh, partial hydrogenation used to increase the shelf life of the PUFA. That's why these transfers develop. That's why we know all the packaging chips and everything, they contains the the transfers, and that is, if you see here, the transfers are everywhere. And actually, they, they, they preserve, actually, as a, uh, and increases the shelf life of the fat. Third thing, other than the choice of the food, the cooking of food is, uh, fat is very, very important, and cooking, how we do the cooking in our kitchen, that is, again, important. And first thing is the regard, regarding the refining, Refined oils, they deplete most of the nutrients. They are the source of oxygen-free radicals. More of the trans fatty acids and contains the, the size of lipoproteins always de, uh, A is de reduced uh, as it decreases the insulin secretion. On the other hand, the frying, what we are doing the frying. So for the frying, which oil is good? It depends on the smoking point of that good, uh, of that oil. So if the high smoking point uh, oil is there, they are very, very good. And two things I want to tell you, dear friends, reheating of the oil and reuse of the oil. And what we do in the morning, most of the, our uh, mothers and they do, they, they actually they use the leftover oil. And what the leftover oil does, the grains which are present in the, the leftover oil and when, when reheated, it develops the VDP, that is volatile decomposition products, and the chemical known as acrolein. So whenever we reheat and reuse this oil, we actually consumes, consumes more, consume more these VDPs and acrolein. And ultimately, it irritates our gut, and there are no evidences as present, but few studies, anecdotal studies, they say that it may lead to chronic use of VDPs lead to the colon cancer also. All fats are equal. If you see this study, very elegant study, and this says that on the, uh, this side, the change to the total mortality and incremental energy from the specific type of the fat. And if you see here, the trans fats has the highest mortality. Saturated fat next, monounsaturated fat next, and polyunsaturated fat in the last. So, you have to use judiciously what type of use and uh, what type of oil. It is very, very important. So that is the important thing. And we have certain uh, studies, meta-analysis, which says that the PUFAs, N3 PUFAs especially, if you see here, the, they are all hazard ratio. If you see here, this is shift to left. So cardiovascular disease mortality and even total mortality concern. If you see here, these are good oils and trans fat is the very, very bad oil because it is hydrogenated. And if you see here, the type 2 diabetes incidence also have this type of uh, studies and all the fats are related to diabetes, incidence of diabetes and especially this polyunsaturated and in total fats. And dear friend, this is my almost last, that the lifestyle intervention. So it is the holistic. What 
Shoshank has told just now, it is a holistic approach. So don't have to actually choose the, or blanketly uh, say to our patient that diet mein fat nahi lena hai. Don't do like this. And if you see here, the high fat Mediterranean diet here, and what contains the vegetables, extra virgin oil, nuts, oily fish, moderate intake of cheese and yogurt, low in sugar and refined carbohydrate, this is the Mediterranean diet. Even our Indian diet is near to that particular thing. And if we combine this thing with the regular exercise, yoga, stress reduction, and smoking suggestion, if we combine this uh, diet with this uh, exercise, then we can think of the reducing the systemic inflammation and insulin resistance. So some fats are good, some fats are bad, controversies are always there, but consensus says that replacement of saturated fat with naturally occurring unsaturated fat provides health benefits to the general population. So that is the first and foremost thing why I am here. Industrially produced, the trans fats are the most harmful and should be eliminated from our food. That is the, and especially to our children. The young children are always taking trans fats in the form of these packaging chips and everything. Metabolism of saturated food may differ <coughs> from carbohydrate restricted diet, an issue that requires a study. Of course, we have published few studies on omega-6, omega-3 fatty acids in our diet in around 10,000 patients. And we have published this study already. People with insulin resistance, hypersecretion of insulin, glucose intolerance may benefit from low carbohydrate and high fat diet, but choose the fat, that is important thing. And of course, I don't want to give here which type of diet is good, but ketogenic diet may confer particular metabolic benefits of some people with abnormal carbohydrate metabolism, a possibility that requires again a long-term study and we can do in a pan-India study of these type of things. Thank you very much for igniting some of their thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvind Gupta, sir, for giving a very good insight about fat. Fat is not bad, especially if it is in natural form, but the refined fat is bad. And because we, we cannot get essential fatty acids without fat. So if we are taking from in the natural form, it is good. Uh, only one question we can ask, because I know that there are plenty of questions, <laughs> but we are running very late. And, uh, <coughs> Thank you. My good, my good. Yes. And that basic question is, what should be the ratio of macronutrients? What are the latest recommendations? How much carbohydrate we should consume? How much protein and how much fat? And second addition is, uh, blended oils are in use. So yeah. what is your recommendation about blended oils? So first, I'll answer your first question. Uh, as per, there are differences in the, the guidelines. The Anup Mishra's study, which says that we are all Indians are sarcopenic we take less proteins. Earlier, 15 to 20% of the total calories should be from the pro uh, proteins. But now we, I mean, the guidelines say that 15 to 20%, but from our point of view and for our study, I think it is more than 30% uh, of total calories should be pro pro the, from the protein. That is the first thing. Carbohydrate should be around 40 to 60% and rest of from the fats. And fats again, what we advise, one third saturated, one third monounsaturated, and one third polyunsaturated fats. So one third, one third, one third, moderately and gradually blend your oils, like our ancestors used to do, the predecessors used to do. Don't cook on a one oil, change the oil on a regular basis so that you will get the best omega-6, omega-3 ratio. So this is how the high protein, little bit on the 25 to 30% proteins, 40 to 60 percent carbohydrates and rest of the amount, the calories from the fats. That is, and fibers, 25 to 30 grams fibers are needed from the vegetables and uh, the the, fa uh, the fruits. That is important. And uh, you said oil. Ah, uh, branded oil. I I don't have any answer for. 
No, no, no. I have given you the ratio. Safola and sunflower oil and these all contains the 150 to 160 per uh, ratio, omega-6, omega-3, very high. So probably, uh, I think we should not recommend the, these type of branded oil. Yeah, that's why I'm, I told. No, no, I don't want this type of mixture or, of oils, but it is, should be the, the, the blended, like few days you can use the mustard oil, you can use soya bean oil, you can use the other oils. So that is, you can blend. Like kuch sabji hum log kisi cheez mein banate hain, kuch sabji kabhi bhi dousri cheez mein banate hain. And that is how we blend. Our uh, uh, mothers and grandmothers used to cook like this. They never use one sort of oil, always. Thank yeah. you, sir. Sir, we are, excuse me. This hall is running 35 minutes late, so I'm so sorry. We'll catch up, sir, over lunch. Sir, thank you so much. It was really great hearing facts from you. And with that, I give it back to the moderators. Thank you very much. Thank you, chairpersons. Now, to continue further, I would like to invite Dr. Tiffany and Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, sir, to chair the session. Thank you. Uh, for the next session, I invite Dr. L. Srinivas Murthy and Dr. Anubha Srivastu, and they will be presenting a very important survey that was done, Pan India. It was a survey on well-being and lifestyle of Indian physicians. It was a sp study done by ACP India chapter, and I invite both of them to present this. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here before lunch. So until you listen to us, uh, lunch will not be served. So please don't leave the hall. <laughs> so this is going to be about the state of health HCPs in India. We did an online survey in a simple Google form to look at the burnout. And Anuj sir is the principal investigator. Myself and Anuba are the co-investigators. Of course, we acknowledge Mediva for doing this analysis and backup support. And this was the structure of the study where this is what going to be the flow of the study, uh, introduction, results, and conclusion, which both of us will share. And the rationale for this study was, you know, as doctors, we are highly rewarding career. I think all of you will agree this was once upon a time. And uh, however, medical training and practice are very demanding and adversely affecting doctors' mental and physical well-being. Especially we saw this during the pandemic. And Physicians now confront the stresses of increasing government regulations, malpractice, the business aspects of medicine which are very poor, increased clinical demands, and less time with patients. All of us are busy practitioners. We cannot dedicate enough time to most of the times in our busy OPDs. Rapidly expanding knowledge base, and that's what we are trying to do today to disseminate this knowledge and updates, and how to balance the personal and professional lives. And this is another aspect which is again neglected with most of our family lives. 
And the dimensions of physician's distress include the fatigue, the changes in the circadian rhythm, depressive symptoms, disordered eating, dissatisfaction with the work-life integration. And many of these aspects, all of us neglect. We think it's part of our lifestyle, you know, late nights, late dinners, and late early working hours. These are all the points which we wanted to investigate, literally take opinion from doctor's perspective, how are they suffering with these, which is, again, not disclosed by any one of us. And the objectives of the study was classified based on this Copenhagen burnout inventory and to map the Indian physician's burnout levels through these uh, uh, democratic factors, work-related factors, lifestyle-related, and medical conditions and BMI. So it was a very simple Google form which we had created covering these aspects. And this was the study design. It was a cross-sectional study, online survey. It was a, like a snowball sampling. And the survey link was shared through the official email and WhatsApp. And most all of you has uh, filled these Google forms. So we are just trying to uh, brush up what uh, you've already filled. So this was the methodology we used. I think you're very good. Yeah. And this was the period of data collection. For about three weeks, we rolled out this, and it was spread across India. Yeah. And the inclusion criteria was healthcare providers, both the practicing doctors, PGs, UGs, and doctors who are practicing modern medicine, modern and we excluded yeah. Ayurveda, Yunanians, other, allied uh, other uh, native practitioners. The processing was done with these uh, uh, methods, which we will not get into the details for want of time, statistical analysis. It was ethical approval was taken from the Independent Ethics Committee. And just to talk about the Copenhagen burnout inventory, it just started in late 70s, and then it had a lot of improvements, and ultimately this was developed to measure personal burnout, work-related burnout, cli client or patient-related burnout. These are the three angles which we looked at even in this our workup and three separate parts of this questionnaire. Yes, These are the three parts, the personal burnout, which included six questions, the work-related burnout included seven questions, and patient-related burnout included about six questions. And these are all the scaling system used. When you say 100%, it means always 75 often, and sometimes means it's like 50-50, and seldom is 25, never or almost is a zero. And then the degree-wise, it's again to a very high degree correlation, it is 100, and to high degree is 75, and somewhat is 15. This is how we have done it. And these are all the six questions which we were talking about. The personal burnout, you can see in the first column, and the work-related burnout, and the patient-related burnout. These are the three sections which were addressed basically in this study. And this is the sample profile you can see across India, well Pan represented, pan-India pan study Pan basically. India study. And these are all the physicians' profile. Of course, males, 76%. Age, you can see, it is reasonably well. And more than 60 years, you can see 11% of the individuals. And specializations, you can see internal medicine internists were more in this, um, diabetology and all these practitioners who are about 2% of the population were picked up on the right hand most corner. And this is the highest medical, most of them were post-graduation with 60% of them, and about 80% of them were practicing doctors. And of course, the marital status, the married people were more, there were a small chunk of diverse patients, and majority, uh, good spread of uh, uh, sample in the years of experience, you can see there, less than two years were basically post-graduates, and uh, two to five years, and of course, over 25 years, 21% of the individuals were there. We have a moreover uh, a regular spread of uh, data collection across all the ages and across all the professional groups. This is an interesting slide. You can see the number of patients seen in a day, 26 to 50. Yeah. About 40% of them see about 50 patients literally every day. Yes, and 51 to 100 are 17%, and more than 100 or 4 percent. I think that 4 percent is here only. That's why you're all in the conference. <laughs> so the number of hours working in a day, you can see you. about 60 percent of them work more than eight hours, which is what most of us struggle to come out with, uh, you know, this burnout point. That the is Human one Rights of the Commission also yeah. recommend uh, lesser than or flexible eight hours. See? For all professions all except us, you know, <laughs> it's more than eight hours. And five to eight percent is only 30 percent and less than five hours. Is very less component. Number of hours, time spent treating. And look at that again, more than 60% of us spend five to eight hours at least treating our patients. Now the working in a day includes these academic activities in a medical school, 
these kind. But look at the chunk of people, number of average hours is about 7.3 hours. And 43% did online consultation. I think that's what pandemic has taught us. There are a lot of technology users here. And that's a good point because at least some stress buster can happen sitting at your home or sitting at your know, clinic in a relaxed way. You can do that online consultation. Lifestyle and social habits, again, the good point, most of us are non-smokers. Most of us are non-alcoholics. Mm, yes, yes. I don't know that is true or not, but this is what all of us you have confessed. That is what we have filled the forms. Whatever the self-assessed questionnaire we got, this was the data. And the good thing is about exercise. 40% yeah. of them have said regular exercise. And that's something pleasing to look at the data. And about 30 minutes a day, they're exercising. So hopefully, this is what is going to be the root cause. We've been looking at from morning the lectures involving the lifestyle modification, all these. And that is what we should look at. At least the average time, I, this is, should be eye-opener for all of us that most of us are non-alcoholics, non-smokers. And exercise is something we need to pick up where we can reverse most of this metabolic syndrome being uh, practicing doctors ourselves. And these are the comorbidities seen. And this is something disheartening. More than 50% of us have something or the other apart from you know, treating your patients, but we are not treating ourselves properly. That is where we have ended up with this lifestyle related disorders. And that's something we need to look at. Of course, hypertension and diabetes are the commonest ones which we have seen along with dyslipidemia. So I think the findings, my colleague Anuba will take it yeah. further. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shinivas. So we, uh, actually I just wanted to ask because most of the ACP members are here and everyone has contributed uh, in filling these Google form. Anything we can assess because the data what you have shown is the profile of the doctors. 50%, more than 50%, not only they are suffering from the medical problem, but the burnout problem also. Uh, so if you see the prevalence of physicians burnout, uh, around more than 50% are having uh, some or the other burnout. Around 50, uh, 45 to 59% had a physical and a psychological burnout out of this. 35% had a work-related and the patient-related alike burnout. So uh, a huge percentage of uh, our colleagues are facing uh, burnout in the either front. Next, please. Seeing the individual uh, demographic profile, th this is something which is alarming to all my medical f colleagues who are in the uh, teaching setup. I would recommend the younger physicians are exhibiting a higher level. This is a higher level severity of burnout. So they are the uh, younger physician, the early care physicians, uh, which are exhibiting a higher level of burnout. And the females, obviously, there are many factors which are governing, so they are uh, significantly hi higher burnout. This is as seen in the literature also and in our study also. Definitely the, uh, the marriage status fared better when we compared within the groups uh, uh, which we've created. So they had, uh, this was correlated with age also. The so you're saying married people are happier? Yeah. <laughs> so at one front they are satisfied and they have a supporting partner or a spouse and that would, uh, I think, be one of the reasons with the early career physician face a, phys uh, a personal and a professional imbalance. And that may be one of the reasons. Yeah, I think when you go back home, you relieve all your stress on your wife, yeah. right? So <laughs> that's the message. Yeah, you, have, you need an uh, understanding stress partner buster. also. <laughs> the, the working status, if you see, there's an association between the working status and all the three burnout. The undergrad and the postgrad uh, exhibit higher burnout than the practicing doctors. One thing more can be there. These are the, uh, as we classified, they are the one who has practiced uh, medicine career for less than two years. So they find a real mismatch between, or you know, the coping mechanism once they enter into the medical field. And I think the, uh, the later age groups may have coped up or they have adapted, acclimatized to the, the scenario of the pressure which is creates. So we'll, we have uh, 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 in detail gone and analyzed. So there was an association between number of years of practice and all three burnout. This I was uh, telling you, uh, the less than two years they faced more burnout. 
and there's a highly correlated with higher burnout among the undergrad and the postgrad students and this is a matter of concern and i think all the acp meetings they are emphasizing uh, to highlight this issue of earlier care physicians which are definitely having burnout especially after the post covid era and you have to find more avenues to give them break uh, including the the drawing room, uh, sessions or the painting sessions or the music session in between or the cafeteria session in between their working tenure of 8 hours or night shifts so roughly it takes about 20 years for you to mellow down and then have less burnout that's the message uh, when analyzed for number of days in a week there was an association of number of days in a work in a week and a patient related burnout so less than five days work is uh, associated with burnout. No, not much associated. Uh, if we see the time spent in a day of treating, so uh, as we have told, more than uh, eight hours. Eight, uh, we eight hours more than sixty percent of us were more than eight, eight hours, hours in a day. So any patients having uh, any doctors who are treating for more than twelve hours, we're having. A burnout, if we uh, see, and this was a statistical significant across the, the three groups. That was, it was work-related burnout or the patient-related uh, burnout. And you remember, more taxing days are the days where we try to commit mistakes, you know, in, in, in diagnosis, management, etc. More than that 150 should remember OPDs. It's a taxing day. Yeah, like epidemics and epidemics are coming. The COVID has gone now. We are infectious epidemic, dengue. Uh, the number of burden in treating the patient and obviously the patient care, the thinking of it keeps you more taxing on your mental health also. Uh, word about the night duty in past month. This was also significantly seen, especially in the physical and the psychological burnout, the work-related burnout, if they were doing more than three duty uh, in a week. So uh, uh, in spite, uh, if any in, uh, student is working more than three uh, nights, in a shift night, they had a significant workout in all the three domains. Yeah, unfortunately, the Copenhagen inventory did not have the late night parties, so we could not include. I'm sure <laughs> that would have been 100%. So that would be a stress buster or a yeah, stress we could user. have studied. Maybe in the next study, we'll plan that. Yeah. <laughs> next slide, please. Night calls, huh? Yeah. Did you talk about night calls? Uh, night duties. Yeah, night, night duties calls. and night calls, calls. even have uh, been shown more times a week. More they're statistically times. significant. Yeah, they're shown see. as significant yeah. burnout. Social habits mm. and lifestyle. Uh, so, smoking, as we saw, there was though the percentage was lesser, but still it was associated with more a burnout among the smokers, or we can say that it was associated more burnout, more smoking incidences were there. Like our patients say, you know, smoking relieves my stress. That's a stress so buster. I think doctors are also doing that. This we don't know, but this is what all of you have confessed. Uh, yeah, that what he was saying. The exercise can be one of the mechanisms to elevate our burnout. So the, uh, those who were having no or little exercises were more burnout. And those who were exercising for more than 30 minutes a day had a significant association with a lesser degree of burnout. So this can be one of the emphasis in the study that this can be as a, a stress buster, more endorphins, and I think more happy hormones and reducing the burnout levels. Yeah, Dr. N.K. Singh, sir, is around. I think he's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's a very strong proponent of exercise, so you'll feel happy about this. Uh, we, we actually wanted what relieved your stress or what relieved your, um, uh, the burnout levels. And it was shown uh, there was an association between number of times in a year you go on a holiday or the vacations and being with family and friends was what this was what has been found in this study that was able to reduce your burnout. So definitely Jensen, we can agree to this. Yeah, last two days I think all of you have expressed that you know spending time with uh, friends has given us in, at a good side everybody are complimenting Anil sir for choosing the conference in this location, City of Destiny. view, the beach view yeah. is uh, yeah, required. Fact, we require more or less burnout. One of our colleagues said he traveled about nine hours to reach this place, yeah. and when he saw from his room the view, all his stress travel reduced. stress got you know, relieved. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, association with hours, of, uh, so the sleep, because the sleep questionnaire you filled, this, if you see, there was more burnout in most of the domains, all the categories which we filled. So the reduction in the number of hours of sleep, obviously, 
the organizing committee uh, had reduced sleep for the last uh, few months and definitely i think this uh, will alleviate our burnout after presentation we say that uh, yes but this has significantly associated with decreased burnout no comments from me anush sir is looking at me <laughs> <laughs> yes abhi present first and sir <laughs> so we will we'll ask you to comment at the end no, 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 you want my comment in between that <laughs> no, i am speaking otherwise i wanted that to speak in the end in the uh, so you prefer finish it yes, yes sir. i prefer finish it so anything more than 3 times a week patients if uh, because of the sleep disorder the doctors themselves are self medicating medicating for medications uh, for the sleep induction this is a matter of concern about 60% or 70% of them indulge in taking tablets on their own and trying to you know medically treat themselves to come out of this burnout that's something pretty bad matter of concern because we are not trying to look at the root cause and like yeah, what we preach we are not practicing yeah. that's something a matter of worry and we are succumbing into the the habit of popping up the pills like most of the patients do so that's something bad though we didn't survey the mental uh, questionnaires it yeah. was just a burnout inventory the sleep attributed attributes most of the questions of the sleep we were able to get quite a numbers the feeling tired upon waking up in the morning came out as one of the most common symptom which was correlated with the burnout in all the three categories and in the severity across the categories uh, uh, this all uh, questionnaires significantly showed to the problems uh, the sleep, uh, the sleep questionnaire uh all the medical condition was equally divided but the one anxiety which comes out is coming out significantly associated with the burnout so you may be on like uh, if we go and analyze ourselves on the anxiety scales we are on uh, getting diagnosed with some medical condition so this is a need of concern which was there so when we asked about how do you manage your stress look at the results spending time with family, family listen to music tv friends 51% movies walking reading singing running and painting so there are alternative professions seen also in our colleagues about the singing and so this running this is a painting. good stress buster they are uh, coming up so we are planning to keep running tomorrow morning in the beach 5 uh, kilometers then you get your breakfast <laughs> so this is the same thing uh, how to manage your stress and that we have shown the In the, the p value significance yeah. so If to conclude compared with the other data the other global studies which has been done similarly we found the younger age students and females have more burnout which was uh, similar to the other studies the number of working hours in a day and whether though we were able uh, taking a nap or resting in between what not uh, was not shown any association with burnout but time spent treating patient is associated with burnout so in we between naps no no, no significance. significance that's what is the, the study, study came shows. out yeah. and even the uh, the the patient care was the one thing which was critically associated though the teaching and the academics i think that uh, is a life saver we can do contribute it's more it's kind of a stress buster in yeah. academic i mean medical school where people are working yeah. so as per the study disruption in sleeping patterns a lack of sleep was directly proportional to the burnout which is expected and with less experience or early career physicians i think that's something a strong message more prone to burnouts so ecps are definitely more uh, prone to burnout as compared to those who have experience as i said that about 20 years to your burnout to come down so by direction relationship with the anxiety we have discussed and this was seen in the similar studies and all the proof you have shown in the bottom it is comparable to so it's a global phenomenon like global warming this is also burnout is a it's common a phenomena across the healthcare workers, healthcare workers. Yeah. so it's directly proportional we see there burnout sleeping patterns smoking working hours and night duty calls number of holidays with friends and family amount of exercise experience age are the stress busters, stress busters. please remember these these are the things these, which you should yeah these are the stress busters which we were able to analyze in the self assessment questionnaire which was being filled thank you thank you very much thank you. Uh, before i give anything any comments i would request uh, dr tiffany to give his comments
uh, give her comments on this. Thank you. So I think what I took away from your presentation is that I should make sure to have two vacations per year yeah. with friends and family, right? <laughs> well, so, a summer break and a winter break would do. <laughs> you well, attend the ACP India conference every year. Yes, yeah. yes, that's the recommendation. So, so thank you very much for a very enlightening presentation. As you said at the end there too, this is a global uh, burden of physician burnout. Um, and definitely you have identified and looking at the data, surveying your um, uh, members about, you know, what are those factors? And we always need the data first to understand the scale of the problem. It seems like you've also identified some really uh, important opportunities, particularly for early career physicians, also for female physicians who are at risk, higher risk for burnout symptoms. So. Um, Congratulations to you both as well-being champions of the ACP India chapter for the work that you've done so far. Um, I, I am very interested as you're thinking ahead of what you're thinking about. Uh, now that you have this information, this very, very valuable information, what are the, some of the opportunities you sort of see ahead uh, in terms of being able to support um, those who are at highest risk, such as your trainees, early career physicians, uh, women physicians, and so on? to the female uh, colleagues of ours who are uh, trainees and we should look more to the trainees, ECPs who are being trained under us. Uh, I must congratulate uh, both of you and Dr. Anuj for conducting this excellent survey. Uh, one of the alarming feature which you uh, summarized was that in early care uh, physicians, they are having more burnout. What we expect from burnout is that pe uh, people who, are, uh, who have worked uh, for long years, they must have been uh, 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 experiencing burnout. But this, this is a bit alarming. And what, is, what are the reasons for this? We must analyze. Is it that uh, because of a lot of competition in early care, where they are trying to establish their practice and what they are not getting the returns uh, as per the inputs they are making. Maybe that is the, the one of the important cause of burnout in the early uh, physicians. So we must address that uh, in our subsequent surveys, and I hope these surveys continue so uh, we see how these burnouts and uh, these things evolve further. Thank you, and congratulations. In fact, uh, uh, this was the just beginning. Burnout was one of the topic. When we started a new journey with the ACP, we decided that ACP should be an organization which should start generate data for this country. Because anywhere we go in the world, we see and we hear that India is having so many number of diseases and patients, but no data comes from there, which is very much uh, strong and having robust data. Most of the data either coming from the Western countries or US or China now has con started contributing a lot of data. So uh, it was our endeavor and we are what we thought. Last year we, uh, we, uh, we developed a data on the COVID diabetes and uh, that has also been generated very nicely. This year we thought that we should generate the data on the burnout and doctor's health. In India, actually no one remains uh, uh, of this thought that doctor's health should also be taken care. Neither doctor himself, nor government, nor uh, any, any organization never thinks that what is happening with the doctor's health. It is because we don't think that. Until this, we, we shall not be careful for our own health. Nobody will be taking care of your health. All the organizations always remains uh, uh, in a thought of using the doctors not to help them. They always want your help. They always teach you, you do the social service, you do the uh, night, uh, ni night uh, uh, duties also. You don't uh, sleep in the night duties while you are doing the night duties. Our residents are taught like that. Our residents are many of times getting scolded of the, uh, that. So all these things are making them very uh, difficult to handle situation. Uh, myself also, when I was in an early career, had to receive a call midnight. This patient is being serious. You rush there. Lot of adrenaline rush was being inside also, uh, although it is definitely being with the patient. But doctor is also having a lot of adrenaline rush at that time. So these are the things, who is going to take care of that? Doctor themselves has to take care, but only when this can be brought to notice and knowledge of everyone. And this was the st study was the only uh, way 
through which we could come out with the data, exact data of the India, whatever the data with us that was of the Western countries, now we are having our own data. But I am little disappointed that only 700 doctors participated in this study, although many more could have done, but many a times probably many doctors could not believe, might could have, could not have not believed that it will remain anonymous, so many people did not give their uh, opinion or did not give their so whatever has happened but i wish that in next year or next to next year whenever we come out with the extension of this study please be a participant of that give your true opinion this is absolutely anonymous no one would be known that who has given what data or who has given what opinion about that so please be there this is my humble request uh, to all of you i think that this study has come out very nice and we shall definitely be doing the publication so that it remain an eye opener for all the medical fraternities of the country as well as to the policy makers too so that they can choose something very good for our doctors and they can be little sympathetic to the doctors too. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Mulnathan, you wanted to tell something. I think you were uh, willing to speak. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, uh, Anuch Mageshwari was the uh, first AP, ACP India chapter wellness champion, followed by Narsing Verma. So, I think uh, as a champion, he thought about this. I am very happy and I congratulate um, Anuj for uh, bringing this theme. And then we should continue about this. And one more thing for the Srinivas Murthy, there is one aspect called empathy. If the doctors are more empathetic, the burnout is less. I'm going to talk to you in, in the evening. That's one thing you should add. Thank you very much. Dr. Mohanathan is going to talk about the empathy and be there to listen him also so that we can be a little more empathetic too. Now, for, uh, further, I would like to invite Dr. S.K. Gautam and Dr. Narsing Verma, sir, to chair the session. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now this important session is regarding the home blood pressure monitoring. And is it really new normal for modern days medicine? Because in the modern days time, the clinic measurement of BP has gone down and we are believing more in home monitoring. To talk about that, we have with us Dr. Bijay Patani. I will ask Dr. Gautam to introduce Dr. Bijay Patani. So again, a very interesting topic and very useful for clinical practice. So for this topic, we have a Dr. Vijay Patni. He's a consultant physician and cardio diabetologist. He's an endocrinologist and diabetes. He's a fellow of American College of Physicians, Indian Society of, fellow of Indian Society of Hypertension. He's working as a head of the department in the Diabetes Wellness Clinic, Kolkata. He's a founder of Diabetic Research and Welfare Associations. He's a scientific chair persons of seventh, seventh annual conference in Diabetes Update 21. He's a faculty and uh, is a scientific chair persons in various uh, programs. And now uh, he's a life member of various professional bodies also. Uh, so now over to Dr. Bijay Patni for enlightenment. Thank you. Thank you, chairpersons. And thank you, ACP India, for giving me this opportunity. And in particular, Dr. Narsingh Varma, sir, Dr. Anuj Meswari, Dr. LSM, and Dr. Anuba. So obviously, this topic uh, may be looking a little simple, but the impact is huge. The reason being, the concept of whole blood pressure monitoring has actually come in the last decade or so. And whether it's going to overtake the office blood pressure monitoring or can 
uh, it still will be lagging behind the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. That is what we need to realize. Blood pressure monitoring is essential because one need to be in targets. The office blood pressure monitoring, the way we usually do, uh, we hardly take those five millimeter difference or the five millimeter up or down as important figures. But what we have recognized that even a two millimeter increase in diastolic blood pressure can a huge impact on stroke and CVD. So is that important? And Indian Society of Hypertension, I being a part of it, has given a lot of importance on this particular topic. And thank you, Dr. Verma, for giving me this opportunity. So why do we measure blood pressure? Obviously, it's the whole idea is to diagnose hypertension, to titrate the antihypertensive drugs. But what is more important is stability of control, whether we are able to achieve that or not. And that could be the one particular idea behind home blood pressure monitoring. This is the situation, a worrying situation, because one in five is under control only globally. So most hypertensive patients, even if they bring, they come with a very high stage two, hypertension may not be having symptoms. That's, it could be a casual or just about a finding which you see in your office. And the importance is again under diagnosis and under treatment. What the situation in India is, that despite the heavy burden of hypertension and associated morbidity and mortality, you will see only about one third of the population is aware of hypertension, that they are hypertensive. And the surprising part is that only less than 10, 11% are controlled as far as the targets are concerned. So one in three is hypertensive and 10% of urban population are having hypertension, but association hypertension to death is about 57% as far as stroke is concerned and coronary artery disease about 25%. And these are the various modifiable and non-modifiable factors which are responsible for the reason behind hypertension. And if you see, we are all genetically prone, but add to that, just now what we heard the demographics of healthcare providers, uh, that how many of them were hypertensive. It was sub something to 10 or 25 percent, what I could recognize from the, uh, what LSM uh, presented. Now, that is almost similar to what we are getting as a, a totality in our population as well. So we are equally susceptible to hypertension. And the modified factors are the one which we should concentrate on whether it is smoking, obesity, too much salt in diet, too much alcohol, and the most important being the stress factor. So you need to confirm diagnosis of hypertension, and at office probably you have to have two visits, ideally at one to four weeks apart, and you have a systolic 140 by 90, and you can diagnose that as hypertension. But the treatment is based Basically, if you have grade two or one, more than 160 by 100, you initiate with some treatment even on the first assessment. So if you regularly monitor your blood pressure at home, probably you can pick up this uh, hypertension much earlier. So that's extremely important. And that is how home blood pressure monitoring can help. Now this is the classification of blood pressure. One of the classification, the variable classification. So instead of that, what we know is that you can divide them into optimal blood pressure, normal, a little bit of high normal, or then you can grade them accordingly. But more so important is what are the instrument or what is the mechanism of monitoring which you are doing it. So even that can lead to the different kind of modalities for diagnosis hypertension. Whether it is office blood pressure, yes, it's more than 140 by 90. If it is home blood pressure, 135, 85 uh, can be accepted as hypertension. And ambulatory is variability as far as the dynal variation, and you can define accordingly what is the, the, the blood pressure level. So you need to screen and diagnose hypertension. What is more important, once you come up with a 140 by 90, you need to reconfirm, particularly with the out-of-office blood pressure measurement. Once you do that, and once you're confirmed, probably you have to initiate the modalities for management of hypertension. 
Now these are the disease why we are worried about hypertension because of the diseases which are attributed to hypertension which increases the mortality and morbidity in patients of hypertension and it practically impacts cardiac, uh, the CNS system, the kidney system and uh, that is why we, we, we need to be worried about uh, the, the, the uh, management of hypertension because uh, both the mortality and morbidity increase because of uncontrolled hypertension. Now, why home blood pressure monitoring? There, these are the few uh, areas which I'm going to uh, take you in. And if you look at the chronobiology of the mortality associated with hypertension or the morbidity, what are the complications, cardiovascular complication, they all are seen to be increased in that time frame of 6 to 12, a, uh, 12 noon. Uh, 6 a.m. to 12 noon. So would you be attending your office to diagnose yourself or to know your status of hypertension in that particular hour? Probably home blood pressure will help you out to understand what is the status of your blood pressure control so that you can be aware of it and adequate measures are taken uh, to control the blood pressure. This is the study which I've clearly showed that 38% of increase uh, MI occurs during this particular hour, 6 a.m. to 12 noon. Similarly, the stroke as well occurs in this V hours of 6 to 12 noon. So why I'm trying to stress upon this, you need to monitor your blood pressure during these hours so that you know what is your blood pressure status uh, during these hours where maximum uh, mortality or uh, maximum complications can occur. So white coat hypertension is another factor where home blood pressure can come for, uh, uh, of importance because it can be about 10 to 20 percent of whatever you see, uh, hypertension. But more so important is 50 percent of the patient with white coat hypertension carries a high risk of cardiovascular disease and tar target organ damage. So again, this white coat hypertension uh, along with mask hypertension are important cardiovascular risk and they can again be picked up by home blood pressure monitoring. The morning surge of blood pressure, as already explained, but what is so important is even a 10 millimeter increase in the morning blood pressure surge results in 22% increased risk of ischemic stroke. So again, reiterating the fact that your blood pressure monitoring at particular hours where probably you won't have the access to office blood pressure monitoring will be very important and uh, thereby you can cut down uh, on the cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular factors and uh, because they do sh are the independent risk predictors of uh, uh, fatal and non-fatal um, uh, stroke, MI, peripheral arterial disease and heart failure. But then you have two modalities, ambulatory blood pressure mo monitoring as well as home blood pressure monitoring. Now why would you consider as the topic said, which is more important, now home blood pressure monitoring obviously uh, can pick up most of the stuff if properly done. Proper um, uh, measurements are done because it is less expensive and more available. And uh, also, not, uh, also not very uncomfortable as ambulatory blood pressure monitor may be. But definitely there are certain errors, but the most of the errors are because of the lack in precision or lack in uh, uh, use of validated machine or improper measurement. So that is what I'm going to touch upon because that's so important that you need to monitor your blood pressure, be it at office or be at home in a very proper way. And then why do you measure? Obviously, as already suggested, you, there are lots of issues which can be managed if you can manage, uh, if you measure your blood pressure at home. Early diagnosis of high blood pressure. Wherever you have a risk of uh, hypertension in, uh, and the chances of you getting hypertension, if you keep on measuring your blood pressure at home, you might be able to pick up early uh, the high blood pressure and to identify the white coat hypertension to alert your doctor about unexpected changes in your readings. Some question will definitely come up. It's a very common phenomenon you monitor shows about uh, one particular reading about 200 by 100 and you, you actually uh, call your doctor at midnight. Very common phenomena that my blood pressure is showing this. Be careful because you need to understand at what the way you have measured uh, uh, 
has been accurate or not, has been properly done or not, so don't panic. Tell the patient to re uh, measure your blood pressure using all the stringent way how to do it. Help them to make changes or to adjust your medication is another reason why you want to measure blood pressure at home. And these are the various indications. One such indication is obstructive sleep apnea. And even resistant hypertension can be picked up because if uh, uh, this probably patients may not be coming for regular follow-ups, but if properly counseled, they might be doing a proper measurement of blood pressure and they will realize they are probably falling in the group of resistant hypertension and, uh, uh, and can seek the medical help from the healthcare providers. So pregnancy is another area where probably you one need to have a home blood pressure monitor and they need to monitor your blood pressure extensively as advised by the healthcare providers. Obviously, what are the characteristics of a home blood pressure monitoring? Monitoring is performed by patient themselves. They need to understand how you need to measure. Measurements are performed at home and an automated oscillometric blood pressure instrument are usually used which are validated and uh, the whole idea of validation uh, is easily available on a website which I'm going to show in the next slide. And the characteristic obviously has to be, it should be simpler. In consequence, allow for multiple measurement, reproducible averages, inexpensive and good acceptance by the users. So these are the major important simple characteristics of a home blood pressure monitoring. If they satisfy these characteristics, probably these are the right monitor to be used. And one can get an idea about which are the validated blood pressure monitors. You can get to the website and you can just type in the name and number of the monitor and you can get it whether they are validated monitor or not. But the most important is the process. The process need to be explained not to not only to your educators at office, but to the patient and caregivers. And this is how one need to educate the, it, it actually is not a one minute job. Whenever you are planning out uh, education for a blood, uh, about how to measure blood pressure at home, or even uh, the, you, you have to teach your uh, educators, it takes some time and it should go, probably I, uh, we, we are doing a lot of educational tool uh, with uh, uh, the academy and uh, it takes about 20 to 25 minutes for a proper education on blood pressure monitoring. So it's very extra, extremely important but roughly overview, yeah, you need to blood, uh, monitor your blood pressure twice daily as advised by your healthcare physician once in the morning and once in the evening. Two consecutive seated measure at least one minute apart. Record for at least four days and preferably for a week. Discard the measurements recorded on the first day, calculate the average. Along with that, you have a proper way of measuring as well. You sh in the morning, you should relieve yourself as the blood and bowel is concerned. Sit tight for, sit quietly for 15 minutes, uh, five minutes, and do not consume any uh, uh, drinks for 15 minutes, like uh, anything which containing caffeine, etc. And then you measure it. And uh, even at night, you might measure it again at the time of, uh, 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 at bedtime. And you get an idea about how well you're controlled uh, in, the, in the whole day. And uh, likewise, if you do it for a few consecutive days, you might get a better idea about your average blood pressure control. And this is the correct posture while taking blood pressure measurement. How many of us we do at office uh, is a big question mark. At least uh, I have seen in different uh, uh, chambers not been practiced properly. So this is what we need to teach not only our educators but even to the uh, uh, to our patients uh, so that the correct measurement is made and we get an optimum blood pressure uh, measurement. So even uh, so you get a, uh, the, uh, the idea about how to manage if the blood pressure is high and uh, what are the modalities which you are going to use it as far as the pharmacotherapy or non-pharmacologic measures are to be reiterated. So uh, I'm not going to go into it, but this is what actually is uh, uh, the most important where the fallacy problem uh, lies is most of the uh, people who measure at home uh, or even at the office, uh, they do not place the instrument at the right place. Number one, it should be placed at the level of the heart. And number two, the legs are usually dangling or cross-legged. So these two should be avoided 
and obviously five minutes of rest and all those stuffs are obviously there and the cough measurement that is also important uh, a reasonable good cough should be used appropriate cough rather i would say but now there are a whole lot of factors which could be responsible for inadequate or inappropriate blood pressure measurement and these are the various factors you can see how much is going to impact the blood pressure if that huge is the impact on the blood pressure probably the whole modality of management goes haywire. So one need to be very, very aware of the fact that ki these are the factors which need to be taken under control before the proper measurement of blood pressure is done. A patient is pain, is in severe pain, and you ask him to place, uh, uh, measure the blood pressure, probably the blood pressure will be very high. If you can go, uh, the systolic might rise up to 20 to 60 millimeter Hg. So these are the various factors which need to be attended before coming to what the blood pressure is for that particular individual. Now, even for these various factors which are showing a situation which can affect the correct blood pressure measurement, whether it's activity, whether the cuff size is appropriate or not, whether the legs are crossed or it's on the uh, ground, and uh, as I suggested, the pain or the patient talking. Very, very, very frequently we see you are just chatting with the uh, patient while taking the blood pressure in the office and that can impact the blood pressure measurement and you might be uh, compelled to modify the pharmacological uh, management for that individual. So these are the factors which need to be taken into consideration and practice adequately. Uh, uh, yeah, it will take some time, but if you teach your educator or your support staff, probably this can work. So what are the essentials? Patient training is important. Knowing of the devices and the cups and the mode remain very important consideration which should be taken into consideration. Casual approach. If used casually, it will not only cause unnecessary anxiety, but unnecessary pharmacotherapy as well. Home BP monitoring offers advantage over clinical measure, uh, BP mo measurement provided the calibration, the validation, process, readings, data processing, and interpretation are performed as described. And home blood pressure monitoring should be part of a tool for all blood pressure, all hypertensive uh, patients. This should be what we have realized in COVID era, we have seen, ki yes, most of them had this at home and we were able to do teleconsultation. But if you have not properly trained the patient, then obviously the, those measurements may not be adequate for us to uh, plan out our pl management tool. So again, uh, it's important for home blood pressure monitoring, important who have been diagnosed with high blood pressure Starting with high blood pressure treatment to determine effectiveness, chronobiology is important in necessary blood pressure measurement, monitoring early morning, and so is white coat hypertension and this, uh, uh, mass hypertension. Advantage, obviously, multiple measurements in series can be done, expensive, less expensive, annulling the white coat uh, uh, hypertension, improving patient compliance with treatment, possibility of digital storing of readings, and teletransmission of blood pressure is important. Now let's go into some important points that self-monitoring or blood pressure monitoring is a validated approach to measure out-of-office blood pressure. Higher self-measured uh, blood pressure associated with increased cardiovascular risk independent of office blood pressure. And though there is a lack of strong evidence showing that self-measured blood pressure monitoring is superior to ABPM, and for indication, obviously, as we already said, and 2017 hypertension clinical practice guidelines considered the self-measured BP monitoring to a more practical approach than ABPM in clinical practice, and that we have realized. And technique and de device accuracy is so very important, so one need to be uh, vigilant about it and use a standardized protocol for BP measurement and monitoring, and definitely use a validated devices, and it definitely cost effective as well. Uh, yes, I'm just ending. And the prevalence and frequency is also important, already uh, described by me. But there are a whole lot of barriers to the widespread use of self, last slide, sir. Uh, widespread use of self-measured uh, uh, BP monitoring. There is a patient barrier, which include performing over, uh, overly rigid protocols over a long period of time, lack of education about benefits of self-measured uh, BP monitoring, lack of feedback and recognition from providers and out-of-pocket cost. 
Providers barriers include concern about inaccuracy of devices, not very uncommon, low adherence to self-monitoring, -monitor and concerns over patient anxiety associated with self-monitoring, increased burden of practices and staff, all those stuff, and healthcare system barriers, definitely lack of systems for self-measured BP. But let me tell you, all these barriers can be overcome by simple education and counseling, and that is the whole uh, motto, and probably and uh, Dr. Verma has planned out a study probably will just give you, give you an idea about the home blood pressure gu me measuring guidelines in India. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Padni. And uh, we are running very short, but Dr. Murugnathan will definitely like to enlighten us because he is a man of hypertension from India. Hello. Padni, it was a very good uh, presentation. Uh, in fact, uh, good, uh, good, uh, good point you brought out. So I, I request all of you to promote home blood pressure monitoring because myself, Narsing Verma, were talking about home blood pressure monitoring for the last four many years. But how many of you promote home blood pressure monitoring? You only promote home blood sugar monitoring. So promote home blood pressure mo monitoring, number one. Number two, uh, in the 2022, out of three uh, office BP, home BP, and ambulatory BP, all the guidelines say home BP is the best. And now one more good news is we have a night view BP monitor. So even the early morning surge, nocturnal hypertension also can be diagnosed with uh, home BP monitor. There are some special home BP monitors where you can take the reading of 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. So it serves the purpose like ambulatory blood pressure monitoring also. So that is also going to come into the market. And uh, there are some uh, wrist band like, watch, I mean, newer versions also have come. So home blood pressure monitoring kindly promote. And even uh, out of your indications, you can also add, even children, home blood pressure monitoring is useful. Only thing, children and the pregnancy, you should have a separate validated home BP monitor, uh, unless, I mean, unlike the other regular monitors. So it was a good presentation. The message to all of you is, please popularize, promote home blood pressure monitoring, which is very good in every setup. And, uh, you know, in India, if you see the statistics, less than 1% only use home blood pressure monitoring. So I think in many countries, the control is better because they use home blood pressure monitoring. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, I know that a lot of questions are there, but because of lack of time, thank you, Dr. Patni. Uh, you can ask to Dr. Patni uh, during lunch time. So moving ahead uh, for the next talk, I invite uh, Dr. N. K. Singh, and he will be talking about a very difficult topic: challenge long-term weight loss. You all will agree that weight loss initially can happen, but to sustain this weight loss is very, very difficult. And how to overcome all this? For this, we are inviting Dr. N. K. Singh. I think everybody knows Dr. N. K. Singh. He is uh, he's also popularly called as the WhatsApp CME uh, bank, and he's running a very successfully CME India, and is MD, FICP, FACP, Director of Diabetes and Heart Research Center, uh, at, and the Chairman RSSDI Jharkhand, ex-Governor Body Member National API, and ex-chairman API Jharkhand, CCDI, and edited Millennium Book of Medicine, and over 330 national and international publications. And he is also editor of so many uh, other organizations, books, fellowship of WHO, Diabetes India, and is also one of the governing body member of the RSSGI, Central RSSGI, Dr. N. K. Singh. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, chairpersons, and uh, Dr. Anuj, Dr. Burma. Actually, as you introduced me, you told that it is a difficult topic. So just before lunch, this difficult topic I am going to present. Uh, challenges of long-term weight loss and how to overcome. Uh, I will not repeat that the evidence base for the benefits of weight loss and maintenance is substantial. Everybody is aware about that. And why we are concerned about this, the weight loss and the weight maintenance, that is also quite clear to us. We want to improve the health of liver, muscle, adipose tissue, pancreas, kidney, dyslipidemia, and CVD. So there is a multi-organ therapeutic effects of the weight loss. And why physicians? Physicians are in a unique position to educate their patients about the challenges of weight maintenance and the positive residual effect of weight loss and to emphasize the need to maintain weight loss over the long term. But the uh, question again comes whether the physicians could be a role model or not. It depends. 
suppose I am a very obese doctor and I am uh, preaching someone to weight loss and to maintain, it is not going to work at all. Uh, what, is the what are the challenges? You see here, there, this graph itself tells you substantial weight loss is possible across a range of treatment modalities, but long term sustenance of weight loss is much more challenging. And if you go for a meta-analysis of 29 long-term weight loss studies, they say more than half of the lost weight was regained within two years. And by five years, more than 80% of lost weight was regained. So this is what we are facing. And what is the definition of the weight loss maintenance? It could vary, but remember, just see here, maintaining the new weight, if you maintain the new weight for two years after weight loss, or gaining no more than 2.27 kg or 5% of the weight after weight loss, that is four years, and maintaining weight loss of 5 to 10%, that is okay, and remaining within 2.27 kg of goal weight and weight change of less than 3% of a designated weight, body weight under standardized conditions, so this is how they have defined. And what is happening? This is very interesting. <coughs> the research has found that the levels of leptin, the hormone produced by the body fat, that signals your satiety, change the changes with the weight loss. The 13% if you lose your weight at 10 weeks, that led to 64% reduction in leptin levels. And even with some weight regain, when weight loss was down to 8% at 62 weeks, the leptin level was still reduced by 35%. So when the leptin levels fall, Energy is conserved via reduction in the resting energy expenditure and body acts as, it, as if it is in a starvation mode. So this is a big problem you see here that in increase in subjective appetite that increases with weight loss. So you lose weight, your appetite is increasing. So patients with weight loss have a double whammy that they have changes both in appetite regulation and energy expenditure and that favors weight regain and this is a very, very important issue if you want to maintain your weight. So let us see what are the challenges you are facing. So I told you that approximately 20% of those who obtain weight loss maintain it for one year or longer. And many terminate weight loss efforts, efforts in an early phase and weight regain is frequent. This means that long-term maintenance of weight loss via life a style changes is possible but difficult. And even with the best lifestyle interventions that are associated with weight regain, usually beginning after one year. So one year is very, very crucial. And adding physical activity produces more weight loss than diet alone, uh, everybody knows. So there is, what are the factors? There are some sources of tension. You have got the old habits, your impulse age, then you manage the, those tensions, thought and beliefs about the weight management, the tension of maintenance, modifiers of the tension and there are many unmet needs. So there are many things which are going at the same time. And so this is a National Weight Control Registry which found that the particip participants with larger initial weight loss, remember, participants with larger initial weight loss have been most successful in long term. And successful participants regained more rapidly but regained very little after five years. And heavier participants followed the same pattern. And maintaining weight loss for two years or longer was associated with maintaining larger weight loss at five and 10 years. So initial behavior changes correlated with outcomes one to nine years later. So this the study has shown a very, very important message. So successful weight loss, those who lost the weight and maintained that was associated with a range of factors and mostly with high levels of physical activity, low calorie weight there and fat intake, high levels of restraint, low levels of distribution and self-monitoring. And one paper showed that successful weight loss maintains, maintainers settle into a new profile of behavior, attitudes and psychological profiles. So let us see this a very important study which appeared in 2021. This study, so 
that there is association between the participants behavior and the number of weight loss attempts so behavior is very very important your psychological behavior and also this is interesting that there was a significant relationship between weight loss attempt and hereditary factor so this is also came from this study and there was significant relation between psychological factors and number of weight loss attempts attempts so this is again very important important that participants who were taking a special medications for weight loss had more successful weight loss attempts so weight med role of medications here so this concluded that the psychological factors were the most important factors on repeating the weight loss attempts followed by the behavior related factors and practices related to self control mental control stress reduction and behavior modification should be considered at any weight loss management program body weight loss programs need a strict follow up by the dietitian in order to avoid the fluctuations in the body weight so this is again a very important point now i will tell the why it is so difficult to lose weight and keep it off because the, our environment is so oxygenic you know that the long term weight management is extremely challenging due to the interactions which you are getting every day your biology your behavior this environment and the psychological factors i told about and i mentioned there and the so the weight loss is accompanied by persistent also endocrine adaptations that increase your appetite i told you and decrease satiety thereby restrict resisting continued weight loss and conspiring against the long term weight management this is a very very important issue which we need to deal so the exponential rise in the calorie intake from its initially reduced value is the primary factor that halts weight loss within the first year so i think this point is quite clear you have lost your calorie and this is a primary factor that there is whatever you have reduced initially there is exponential rise in the calorie intake later on so this becomes a very very important so you can see here in this graph that in contrast to the modest drop in the calorie expenditure of less than 200 kilo calorie per day at the weight plateau appetite has increased by 400 to 600 kilo calorie per day it is very difficult to challenge, challenge this one so patients perceptions of ongoing diet maintenance despite no further weight loss may arise because the physiological regulation of appetite occurs in brain regions that operate below the patient's conscious awareness so these signals are very very important so a relatively persistent effort is required to avoid the overeating to match the increased appetite that grows in proportion to the weight loss i already showed you but i will repeat it that it has been estimated that for each kilogram of lost weight the calorie expenditure decreases by about 20 to 30 kilo calorie per day whereas appetite increases by about 100 kilo calorie per day above the baseline level before the weight loss so so how weight regain versus maintenance if you go prevention of weight regain requires about 300 to 500 kilo calorie of increased persistent effort to counter the ongoing slowing of metabolism you know and there are likely many factors that account in unveiling the biological psychological educational environmental determinants of such individual variability will be an active area of obesity research whereas long term diet trails now whatever the diet trails they have not resulted in clear superiority of one diet over another with respect to average weight loss this diet those those diet your traditional diet low calorie diet high low fat diet high protein diet ultimately some of this variability may be due to interaction between diet type and patient genetics or baseline physiology such as insulin sensitivity unfortunately the diet biology interactions for weight loss have not always been reproducible and likely explain only a fraction of the individual variability so this is the these are the challenges now let us see whether this can be overcome or at not at all so this is the conceptual model of the dynamics of weight loss maintenance time pressure family friends season social occasions neighborhood food availability life events many things are working in your life the most important point is that the long term benefits requires long term attention graph itself shows this study weight loss interventions should include long term comprehensive weight loss maintenance programs 
that continued at least for one year. So then you have the role of the dress, physical activity, low calorie diet, eating breakfast regularly, self-confidence, satisfaction, health concern, low level of depression, but here many traits are there, the therapeutic alliance and so many things are there. So ultimately, frequent self-monitoring and self-weighing, reduced calorie intake, a smaller and more frequent meals and snacks throughout the day, increase your physical activity, consistently eating breakfast, more frequent at home meals compared with the restaurants and fast food meals, reducing screen time, you know everyone knows that, and use your portion control meals to meal substitutes. So these are the things of the exercise, diet, and the behavior. But still there are many problems comes. A strengthen satisfaction with the outcomes, replace, relapse prevention training. This is important, relapse prevention training is needed. And the cognitive restructuring is needed. And developing cognitive flexibility is needed and appeal to patients, deeper motivations needed. So manage also the expectations of your patients and the providers. This is again very, very important point. And with, you must escalate treatment as needed. Like, you should consider referral to a registered dietitian like Dr. Poonam is here, obesity medicine physicians, or comprehensive weight management clinic. It is not always the domain of the physician. And for patients, suppose your BMI is greater than 30, uh, then the obesity pharmacotherapy is needed. And for patients with BMI greater than 40, bariatric surgery is the well-studied and available option to have to consider when to escalate your treatment and how to explaining the weight plateau of not going details, but motivating by, suppose patient is regaining weight again and again, after doing all these things, you must motivate also that even by losing whatever the weight you have lost, there is some other effects will be coming like preventing the type 2, future type 2 diabetes, shown by the DP4 study, and even from the look study, look ahead study, you can see that the participants who maintained their weight loss after four years reported more favorable physical activity and food intake and attended more treatment sessions than those who had not maintained their weight loss, indicating that the importance of a sustained lifestyle change in successful weight loss maintainers. So this is quite important. So my point is that the lifestyle intervention continues to be critically important for achieving treatment goals. And then you have many newer tools and the role of the primary care providers like several effective and well-tolerated pharmacotherapies are there today. And the new treatment options have enabled the, the development of more robust approaches to the medical care. Like we have got now available the semaglutide tablet. And this step trials one to five, they have provided data on the efficacy and safety of a new treatment of semaglutide, which is anticipated to provide clinically meaningful and the durable weight loss beyond what is currently achievable with the available agents for the obesity. So this is one point which would be, this will also you have shown this step one to step five trials that the reduce this semaglutide reduces the future risk of diabetes by over 60% in patients with the obesity. This figure is similar what whether a patient has pre-diabetes or normal blood sugar levels. Also, this drug is doing wonder. The trigepatide type, you are well aware that a 15 milligram daily dose leads to a 20% of total body loss, a scale that is only possible through the surgery. So these things you can do. So what works? Some clinical trials and commercial weight loss programs have shown that the meal replacements are highly effective in producing significant sustainable weight loss. But other studies have found that behavioral changes involving diet, like you are taking more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, the self-monitoring of caloric intake, self-weighing, planning meals in advance, and moderate intensity physical activity are important factors in maintaining a reduced body weight over the long term. And uh, there should be a stage approach to the weight management, including the monitoring weight fluctuations and uh, having a clear signal for a weight regain that triggers immediate action is also a common characteristic of successful weight maintainers. Like the physical activity, I say my patients, make your mitochondria green. And research is showing, a what it looks like the 
mitochondria of sedentary and exercise trend becomes green. So this is how you can motivate your patients. And if you see in our Vedic Sahitya, there are lots of things which we can adopt also. You can see here some of the quotes here about even the intermittent fastings and the dietary interventions. And meta-analysis of long-term study have suggested that the low-fat weight loss diets are slightly inferior to low-carbohydrate diets, but the average difference between the diets is too small to be clinically significant. So I will not go in details of those different type of diets. This is just this. Uh, if you go for the average difference, that is clinically uh, very uh, not much much significant. So equivalence does not necessarily imply that a calorie is a calorie. Remember, when it comes to diets with different macronutrients proportion differently impacting weight loss. You can see here that altering the diet macronutrients, manipulation of diet composition can result in differences in the endocrine status. And any change in the body overall energy stores must be accompanied by changes in calorie index or expenditure. So is it theoretically possible that a particular diet could result in an advantageous endocrine or metabolic state that promotes weight loss? So in recent years, there has been the re-emergence of low carbohydrate, high fat diet as popular weight loss interventions. I will not go in details of those, uh, but uh, long-term success with a weight loss diet may have less to do with the biology that factors such as patient food environment and socioeconomic medical comorbidity and social supports. You can see here this is very important. You must have seen this, how we can uh, check signals by just giving 1,400 calories of vegetables. So here the stress receptor, role of stress receptors and satiety signals are quite clear. And Dr. Narsing Barma is the either the father of, I'd say, of the chronomedicine. So apply chrono nutrition to lose weight to maintain. This is also some studies are showing. And bariatric surgery is the most effective method for the treatment of several ob obesity. You will see the details of how and when to suggest about the bariatric surgery. And still there will be a vast unexplored world in this field of weight loss and weight maintenance. Uh, people's li <coughs> life experiences can give you rich, rich examples to, do, to help understand long-term weight loss in concrete ways. So this way, uh, what is it like for people with severe obesity to lose weight and keep it off for the long term, uh, you can get from the many life experiences. So this is a never-ending story losing and keeping weight off. So concluding my talk, this is a new self, the old self, and the image that presented itself in the mirror, there is some sort of message in that. So final points are that the all guidelines agree that obesity is a chronic disease that requires long-term management. The goal of obesity treatment is to improve the health of the patient. It is not intended for the cosmetic purpose. The counter corner store of the therapy is comprehensive lifestyle intervention from informed health care professionals. An initial goal of therapy is weight loss of 5 to 10 percent, and consideration should be given to use of a weight loss medication or a possible bariatric surgery as in addition to these treatment modalities. So lastly, the weight maintenance with lifestyle modification, although challenging, is possible but requires long-term support to reinforce diet, physical activity, and behavioral changes, and addition of pharmacotherapy to lifestyle interventions promotes greater and more sustained weight loss, and the degree of weight loss and its maintenance should be the sole metric of obesity treatment success. So biological, behavioral, and environmental factors conspire to resist weight loss and promote regain. So the realistic long-term weight loss may achieved is significantly lower than patients and healthcare providers' expectations. So however, even a small amount of sustained weight loss lead to clinical health improvements and risk factor reductions. Thank you very much. Mind management is the super key to maintain the weight. Thank you. Excellent talk, sir. You have nicely covered the topic, and you have nicely explained about the how you can overcome the obesity by manage lifestyle management, diet, and the uh, pharmacological therapy. It's important to sustain the uh, weight loss. And if you wisely use the uh, anti-diabetic agent also, so that can be a one point to sustain the uh, weight uh, loss. So I think with these comments, uh, we are running short of time. Is there any one question we can take? Otherwise, we'll wind the session here. OK, thank you, sir. Thank you so much.
थैंक यू सो मच Uh, it is my honor to invite Dr. Sir Shane Dupal. He will be talking about early cancer screening in vulnerable population. Thank Dr. Maheshwari. Dr. Narsingh Verma for the invitation. Early cancer screening in vulnerable population, that's a vast topic. Uh, uh, difficult to cover in 20 minutes, so I'll try my best. Remember your lifestyle can lead to cancer. Lead a healthy life to beat cancer. As per the distribution of diseases, cancer comes only second. A short while ago, you found Dr. Shachang Joshi had said that CVD was the commonest cause, but cancer closely follows and is the second both in males and females. Key facts in cancer prevention. Please remember most cancers develop as a result of exposure to modifiable risk factors. Most cancers have a long detectable preclinical phase which allows for early detection and effective treatment. And who estimates that 40% of all cancer deaths are preventable? Prevention we all know is primary, secondary, or tertiary. Primary directed to the susceptibility stage. For example, using disposable needles to prevent AIDS or the human papillomavirus vaccine for prevention of cervical cancer. Secondary prevention directed to the subclinical stage, screen for cervical cancer with pap smear to prevent long-term cervical cancer. Tertiary prevention is directed to clinical stage. We may go for primary tumor removal to prevent metastasis. Primary prevention includes vaccination, avoiding tobacco, skin protection, avoiding alcohol, keeping a healthy weight, a healthy diet, decreasing exposure to environmental carcinogens, rather on asbestos, etc. Selected cancer screening recommendations for the average risk population as propounded by the American Cancer Society. For breast cancer in women aged 20 to 39 years, they may go for breast self-examination regularly or we may go for the clinical breast examination at least every three years. For women aged 40 years or more, breast self-examination should be done regularly, clinical breast examination annually, or the mammogram annually. For cervical cancer in women aged 21 to 29 years, pap smear examination, either the conventional one or the liquid cytology every three years. For women aged 30 to 65 years, pap and HPV DNA test every five years, or pap alone every three years. Women aged more than 65 years, no screening required if there are already three negative PAP tests or more than two negative HPV and PAP co tests within the last 10 years. And the most recent, obviously, occurring in the last five years. No screening, obviously, is required for hysterectomized patients. For colorectal cancer, we usually start screening above the age of 50 years. We may go for the fecal local blood test 
or the fecal immunochemical test annually or the flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years or the DCB every five years, colonoscopy every 10 years or CT colonography every five years. Lung cancer, we usually screen men and women aged 55 to 74 years, current or former smokers who quit less than 15 years ago in good health and more than 30 pack years of smoking history. Discussion with healthcare provider about screening may be done with a low dose helical CT scan. In prostate cancer, usually screen men aged 50 years or more with at least 10 year life expectancy, consideration of direct rectal examination and the PSA does a prostate specific antigen after informed clinical decision making process with the healthcare provider. Coming to lung cancer screening, the five-year survival rate for stage one disease is to the tune of 50 to 90 percent, while it drops to only three to six percent in the stage four disease. This suggests the possibility that lung cancer deaths could be greatly reduced if the primary tumor could be found and treated before it has spread. Who should be screened? Low risk patients aged less than 50 years or less than less than 20 pack years of smoking need not be screened. Same for the moderate risk ones, 50, less than 50 years or 20 or more pack years. No other risk factors, you need not go for screening, but you should screen those in the age group of 55 to 77 years of age, having 30 or more pack years of smoking and has quit in the last 14 years or a current smoker. And the other group would be 50 years of age or older, 20 or more pack years of smoking, and having other risk factors. And both these groups should be screened yearly. Lung cancer screening, the benefits are, is reduces the mortality, obviously, quality of life benefits, and may prevent more than 12,000 premature deaths due to lung cancer per year. Risks, false positive cases may be up to 10 to 43 percent, may lead to unnecessary testing, unnecessary invasive procedures, increased cost, and decreased quality of life due to mental anguish. There's also the risk of radiation exposure. Now coming to the randomized controlled trials of elder city, you'll find that the power studies, that's the famous NLST study or the Nelson study, both showed that the low dose cities reduces the lung cancer related mortality. But the unpowered studies do not show the same and so it's still debated. Though the, the um, usual recommendation is now that we should go for the low dose CT as the randomized trials have proved. For colon cancer, screenings may be done with the scope. You may go for the CT scan or the CT colonography or you can go for the stool test. Colorectal cancer again increases sharply with age, especially up the age of 50. And the development of the disease is known to progress over years. You'll be stunned to know that it has a 90% relative five-year survival rate when it's localized. And it drops to only 14% when there is distant metastasis. Thus, early diagnosis has a large impact on survival. Risk assessment score is based on whether the patient has a personal history, there's history of adenoma of a, or a sessile serrated polyp, history of colorectal cancer in the family, history of previous colorectal cancers, history of inflammatory bowel disease, that's ulcerative colitis or the Crohn's disease, or a positive family history. Screenings beyond the age of 45 years, usually after the age of 50 years. Screening procedures include the all pervasive colonoscopy, it's done every 10 years. It's a tier one recommendation. Sensitivity for adenomas more than six millimeters is to the tune of 75 to 93%, while the specificity is 94%. And for adenomas more than one, sensitive, one centimeter, the sensitivity is to the tune of 89 to 98%, and the specificity 89%. Merits include prevention by treating the malignant lesions at an early stage, high sensitivity for the colorectal cancers and precancerous lesions, and long screening intervals of 10 years. 
demerits, obviously the tedious bowel preparation, operator dependent, maybe risk of perforation, bleeding, aspiration, or even splenic injury. The other T1 tier one recommendation is the fecal immunochemical test, which however should be done annually. For colorectal cancer, the sensitivity is 74% and it's 96% specific. For advanced abnormal detection, it's 24% sensitive and 94% specific. It is non-invasive, relatively low cost, reasonably high one-time sensitivity, but the demerits include a frequency of testing, colonoscopy needed if positive and low sensitivity and for precancerous lesions. The other tests, that's the multi-targeted stool DNA test, CT colonography, flexible sigmoidoscopy. These are tier two recommendations. I'm not going to the details of those. Coming to the prostate cancer screening, the two common tests are the PSA and the direct rectal examination. The European randomized study of screening for prostate cancer enrolled more, like, more than 162,000 patients between the age of 50 and 70 year, year, 74 years of age from seven European nations and found a prostate cancer specific mortality reduction to the tune of 20%. PSA screening leads to increased prostate cancer diagnosis, but unfortunately, there is no reduction in mortality even for prostate cancer or even for all-cause mortality as per the studies which I'll sh show later. Screening as per the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines, baseline evaluation, history and physical examination, including a family cancer history, family or personal history of high-risk germline mutations, history of prostate disease, African ancestry medications. Risk assessment, start risk and benefit discussion, with a baseline PSA, strongly consider baseline digital rectal examination, divided into three groups for patients age 45 to 75 years and average risk, or age group 40 to 75 years with those having African ancestry, germline mutations, or suspicious family history, go for the prostate-specific antigen. If it's less than one, AM, one nanogram per ml, repeat testing at two to four year intervals. If it's between one to three nanogram per ml, repeat testing at one to two year intervals. And if it's more than three nanogram per ml, with a suspicious direct rectal examination, you may go, off, go for the biopsy. For patients aged more than 75 years, go for the PSA. If it's less than nine, four nanogram per ml, and the direct rectal examination is normal, repeat testing is select patients may be done at one to four year intervals. If the PSA is more than four nanogram per ml or very suspicious direct rectal examination findings, you may go for the biopsy. If the patient is older or having a life expectancy of less than 10 to 15 years, they may not be screened. These are the recommendations of the European Association of Urology, the American Urological Association and the US Special Task Force. And you'll find all of them say that we may not go for a screen if the life expectancy is less than 10 to 15 years of age. Also do not screen if the age is more than 70 years, preferably to be screened between 55 and 69 years of age. A risk adaptive strategy should be taken with follow-up intervals of two years. PSA more than one nanogram per ml at 40 years of age, screen at two years. PSA more than two nanogram per ml at 60 years of age, you may screen every two years. Postpone, postpone follow-up to eight years in those not at risk. These are the studies for prostate cancer screening and mortality, and you can find all these studies show that PSA screening probably has little or no effect on all-cause mortality. I'm not going to the details of the study, a very busy slide. Also, the study on the quality of life, that also showed that PSA screening may have little or no difference on the quality of life. Breast cancer screening, one in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime, is the second leading cause of cancer death among women, second only to lung cancer, and survival rates with early detection are high. That's why we should screen. Recommendation, according to the American College of Surgeons, yearly mammograms at age 45 to 55 years, every other year thereafter. According to the American College of Obsgynes, yearly mammograms beginning at age 40, and as per the US Task Force Biennial Screening Mammography for women aged 50 to 74 years of age. 
limitations and challenges. Obviously, patient education, health literacy, especially in our country, our language barrier, especially for us. We have more than 200 languages. Transportation, scheduling, fear of being built for services, patient follow-up, return to the clinic, limited funding through partners. This is a world map showing the estimated age standardized incident rates as per 2018. India remains somewhere in between 11.5 to 18.5 age standardized incident rates per one lakh population. Life course approach to cervical cancer prevention and control. For girls aged 9 to 14 years, we should go for the HPV vaccination. For girls and boys as appropriate health information and warnings about tobacco use, sex education tailored to age and culture, condom promotion and provision for those engaged in sexual activity or male circumcision. For secondary prevention, in women aged more than 30 years of age, we should try to screen and treat in a single visit. That improves compliance, that improves screening, point of care HPV testing, followed by immediate treatment, on-site treatment. For tertiary prevention, go for ablative surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, followed by palliative care in cases of invasive cancer. Targets for 2030, we visualize a world without cervical cancer. Our goal would be to below four cases of cervical cancer per one lakh woman years. 90% of girls fully vaccinated with HPV vaccine by 15 years of age remains our aim. 70% of women screened with an HPV test at 35 and 45 years of age and all managed appropriately and 30% reduction in mortality from cervical cancer. This is the age standardized mortality rates for cervical cancer in 2018. You can see again here also, India is somewhere in between with a rate of 5.5 to 9.4 age standardized mortality rate per one lakh population. Strategy towards elimination of cervical cancer as a global public health problem, increase HPV vaccination, increase screening and treatment of precancerous lesion, and increase coverage of diagnosis and treatment for invasive cancer and palliative care. The guiding principles, life course and public health approach, social justice and equity, integrated people-centered services to attain these goals. Coming to carcinoma cervix, in India, there are 1,25,000 new patients per year, incidence between 15 to 48 per 1 lakh population. It is preventable if screened early through health education or screening programs. Risk factors include the early age at intercourse, repeated frequent births, multiple sexual partners, HPV infections, low socioeconomic status, especially in India, or the high incidences of smoking. Prevention, mainly through health education to prevent the factors in the, given in the previous slide, and also screening programs. Results of screening, if you screen for cervical cancer and it's detected in stage one, there's an 85% survival rate. If it's detected at stage four, the five-year five survival rate drops to 15%. Coming to head and neck cancer, which is very much present in India, it also affects 50,000 people in the U.S. each year. It's curable 50% 50, 50 of the time. The causes include tobacco and smoking, alcohol, sexually transmitted viruses, the HPV, environmental factors, and the hereditary factors. Mainly detected by visual examination. So I'm showing you the slide. The first one, the top left one, is showing the submucous fibrosis, the carcinoma tongue. The first one, picture is, involves the anterior two-third of the tongue. The next one, the lateral surface of the tongue. The lower left corner shows the cancer of the buccal mucosa, and the lower right shows the carcinoma of the buccal, uh, of the lip, carcinoma of the lip. So, so these are relatively common major public health importance in India. In world over there are 10 million new cancer cases and half of the patients die. In industrialist countries, 
three to five percent people are affected. Developing countries, it's 40 percent. In India, it's 12.6 per one lakh population, the standardized incidence rate. About 2.5 lakh new cases are detected each year in the Southeast Asian nations. In India is the leading cause of cancer and among males and amongst ladies it is the third leading cause. As compared to the developing nations, the oral cancer is 2.5 times more common in Indian males and four times more common in Indian females. And the tongue and buccal mucosa are involved in the males, while in the females it mainly involves the palate and the buccal mucosa. It has been remarked that buccal mucosa, lower alveolus, retromolar trigon, and all these are grouped together as the gingivo buccal complex. That's the typical Indian oral cancer that we see over the years. They constitute more than 60% of the cancers. Mostly squamous cell carcinomas, 98%. And the intraoral distribution revealed buccal mucosa to be the most common, followed by anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Prevention, mainly avoidance of the known etiological factors. This is particularly important because oral cancer is one of the few cancers with a high potential for prevention. And 65 to 80% of oral cancer is environmental. So lifestyle modification is a must. Screening method is oral visual inspection. That's why I showed you all the pictures, mainly screened through visual examination. Age, all age groups above 15 years. Frequency, one to three times in lifetime, every five years or every two years, depending on the resources. If you have huge resources, you may go for every two years. But in India, in the rural areas, usually one to three times in a lifetime. Try steps. OVI negative, follow up in two, uh, 12 months, OVI positive, evaluation by doctor, and go for the oral punch biopsy, or in high resource settings, we may go for the excision biopsy. Treatment, surgical excision, or laser excision in tertiary centers, post-treatment follow up, up to 12 months. Approach, education, regulatory, and service approach, legislation, prohibit sale of tobacco to minors, place health warning signs, prohibit advertising of tobacco products, Till a few years ago, most of the Bollywood films showed smoking screens, not the same today. And please remember, cancer cure smoking. If you do not leave smoking, if you have oral cancer, you won't be able to smoke, and you will be forced to leave smoking. Oral cancer among the young, grant proposal is, this is a grant proposal to bring together a group of international researchers from US, Europe, and Asia through collaborative partnerships to conduct Last slide. According to a common protocol to address the rising incidence of cancer of the tongue and mouth among youth in different parts of the world. So we all have to move together. Please remember, cancer screening detects cancer before symptoms appear. Remember that it's the second common cause of death after the cardiovascular diseases world over. It reduces morbidity and mortality if cancer is screened early. And of course, if you screen early, it also improves the quality of life. Thank you all for kind attention. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much for such an and. Of the R at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful insight on cancer screening. Now, I would like to invite upon stage Dr. Mudit Mohan, sir, and Dr. Haider Abbas, sir, to please continue with the proceedings.
Hello, good afternoon. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Devendra Bhushan for his talk on basics, boon or to be broom. Dr. Devendra Bhushan. So, uh, Namaskar to all of you. A warm regards on behalf of uh, Ames Patna. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say thanks to Dr. Uh, Anuj Mahasri sir and uh, Dr. Srinivas Murthy who give me this opportunity to be here. And the topic he has given is very interesting actually. I told him my area of interest is uh, critical care, infections, and little bit of endocrinology. But he says, no, you have to speak on the basics. So how the basics are related to uh, medical field. So I asked why the topic is, uh, why the theme is back to basic. So are we forgetting our basics? Are we leaving our basics? And we are uh, going towards something else. So what the exactly basics means? Basic in, uh, if I say in Hindi, it is neev. Hamare, hamari jo neev hoti hai, that should be a strong one. Hamari makan ki neev ho, hamari intelligence ki neev ho, ya kisi bhi cheez ki neev ho, that should be a very much strong. And this basic is different for, uh, basic is different for everyone. D different for uh, everyone. So, we have must have listened in our uh, in your time or in, in fact abhi bhi hume, uh, we, we must be listening that you don't know this many times in our rounds that we ask our uh, pg students jr1 jr2 and jr3 that you don't know this this is the word then this what this is this is the basic we are supposed that he that person should know this much if a first year student of undergraduate doesn't tell me about the what is the definition of diabetes, then it's okay for me. But if the final year student is not able to tell me what is the definition of diabetes, then it is not acceptable. Then yes, he is forgetting his basics. So then I will say, yes, you have to read it. Then you have to read it. If the new postgraduate who joined the uh, uh, department, he says, I, I don't, uh, I'm not able to recall all the definitions of continuous fever, remittent fever, intermittent fever, then it's okay. Then I still go and read it. But if third year postgraduate is not able to tell me about the uh, definitions of fever, then it is not acceptable. So this basic is different for your level of education, your level of experience. And it depends upon if if I'm a gynec if I am a, if I'm a physician, then I may not be able to know the complications of gynecology. I may not be able to understand the statics part. But we I must know to, um, my my basics. So basics is a different for everyone else. So among the clinic uh, medical fraternity, we divide our life in three categories in clinical, research, and academics. When we joined medical colleges, I think nobody of us uh, thought of ki we will do, we will teach also. The idea of most of the undergraduate who enter in the medical college still is, we will serve the society. We will serve the society, we will see the patients. No idea about the research and academics. No at all. So let's see how the things are changing in this era. So in the clinical, I will go first in the history. So till recent past, many of our teachers used to say yes, history is the art. And you will get 90% of your diagnosis from the history itself. This we used to listen in our uh, uh, UG days, PG days, senior residency, but we say no, manab, we do the, we, we, our thought is about the investigational part. But it is true, 
as I am getting experience, I am getting this experience that yes, they were telling very truth. Now the a, a detailed, detailed history from the patient can tell you the diagnosis. So history taking is an art by listening to the patient and noting the way in which they describe their symptoms. Physician gain values, insights, inflictions of voices, his way of talking, his way of facial expressions, his way of walking, give us very important clues to the perception of clues towards the patient's disease. Although, sorry, the cursor is not cursor me ka kare. So if we are not, uh, if we are not able to listen to the patient, if the patient lose faith in us, if he feels that the person, the physician is not listening to him, then he can hide many things. So history taking is very important. So I, if, uh, now I will give few examples. So a lady come to us with 28 year old lady came to the emergency department with a history of pain, abdomen and shock. My second year PG was there. He, say, uh, he thought of about intra-abdominal infection and he started good antibiotic with fluid resuscitation and he also started, as that lady doesn't responded to the uh, fluid resuscitation, he, he started on the noradrenaline also. So next day when we went and uh, see that lady and I just asked, she was so pale, she was so pale. And then I just asked the lady what the, about, the, about her menstrual period, menstrual history. And she told that she is 10 days overdue. We stat got her UPT and we sent that lady to the ultrasound. That UPT was positive and ultrasound shows hemoperitoneum. So it was a, some, one of my teacher has told, if a young, if a young lady comes to, come to your emergency with such a, sh in the shock, always rule out ruptured ectopic. So that helps. And that lady, we, we saw that lady to a gynecologist, they just uh, take the patient to the OT and that patient discharge in three to four days. So we forget to take the basic history in this case. Another case, this was a 45 year old lady, this was just a uh, fix, a 45 year old lady who gave the history that he went out, he went out of the home in the morning and then come back. And then when she come back, she was feeling lazy. Then she took her breakfast and she slept down. After that, her family members noticed that it, she was unconscious. She, they brought the patient to the emergency and she was not responding. We did the NCCT's brain to rule out any, uh, any CVA or anything else. So that CT was normal. What else we keep in mind? We keep in mind about the toxicities. Yes, anything poisoning, etc. The next day, his profile was almost normal. Planter was also normal, mute. Next day, the patient become conscious, but he is not able to comprehend. He is not able to speak. She, she is not able to lift her arm. And on taking history, her son told us that she had similar kind of history in two, uh, episode, uh, two episodes of similar episodes in the past, which recovered by itself. Then when we, we were talking to the patient, she was trying to little bit opening her eyes, but not completely. So one of my residents told us, sir, why not we test for the myasthenia? It was having quadriparesis, so why not to do this? So what we do, this is a simple test, ice pack test. We take out the ice pack and we put on the, around the eyes. And let that lady start opening her eyes. Then after a few, after a few hours, we did the neostigmine test. And she improved markedly. We sended her investigations and it was found to be positive for the, uh, positive for the myasthenia gravis. So that lady, that family, got the diagnosis, she was treated well, and she is in the follow-up till now. It is about one year. Now, a few words about the clinical examination. Fever is the pain for physician. Jitne bhi a physician and the fever is the most difficult task to treat. 
So a 45-year-old male patient presented with fever since past one month. We did all basic investigations, CBC, malaria, Vidal, blood cultures, X-ray, even CECT chest plus abdomen, echo. Then one day, uh, one day that's why a dark complexion male. So one day we, uh, we saw that there is a madrosis, that is the eyelashes are less and the, uh, eyebrows are less. And just what we did, we did a, we palpated his ulnar nerve. And what we got, it was thickened. There was no anesthetic patch over the, uh, over the arms or the body. But we send a call to this, our dermatologist. And what they say, ki it looks like a pure neurotic type of leprosy. And they took the skin scraping. And it was found to be positive for mycobacterium. We treated with MDT and that patient responded very well. Now, this patient, one, another patient, he's a 61-year-old male. This, is, this was a very interesting patient. Uh, he was shown, there was a 61-year-old male patient, he's shown to BHU with a history of fever, with no localization since past two months. And he remained in BHU for around one and a half month. And he says there is nothing happened. They, they tried multiple antibiotics. They did all investigation. All investigations means they even tried PET scan also. They did a PET scan also and it was negative. There was nothing, no source was coming out. So it was a challenge for me before taking the patient. It was a challenge to me ki what to do. That man is used to lie down in the bed whole day. The one day we take why he's lying down. He's, he's a lean and thin person. Why he's always keeping down, lie down there? So we take the, his uh, blood pressure. We showed that it might be orthostatic hypertension. And we took out, uh, we checked for the orthostatic hypertension. He was having vast, vast variation in the blood pressure while lying down and standing. We sent the patient for tilt, tilt, tilt table test. And our physiologist, Narsil Verma sir is uh, here. He will, he will definitely give a uh, light on this. He was not able to do this. We, we talked about uh, with our physiologist. And he says, you know, he, there is autonomic dysfunction. And then his son gave a typical history. When he was in BHU, sir, in the general ward, he had to fever 1 did not 2 aata tha, 1 not 3 aata tha. But when he was in ICU, mein karte the, due to low BP, then he didn't fever. Nahi aata tha. So what does it mean? It means a temperature dysregulation was there. So what we do? We treated the orthostatic hypertension only. We, we don't have much, much, much of the medicines. We give fludrocortisone, but he developed hypokalemia. So we stopped it and we give midodrine only. And he responded well. And as our ward, our ward was centrally air conditioned, he don't have even a spike of fever during the whole course of uh, stay there in the hospital. He remained there for about 20, 21 days, but there was no fever at all. And he responded very well. He, he, since six months, last six months, he is in the follow-up and he is doing very well. So we kept uh, the possibility of primary autonomic failure in this case. Although it is very difficult to treat this case, but make this diagnosis, but uh, provisionally I kept this diagnosis. Now, investigation part. What are the basics of the investigation? The day one of a patient shows SGOT of 2540, SGPT of 1760, and bilirubin of 12. The next day, we sent the sample and we found this, 15, 32. And what, what will be our reaction? The reaction of a physician? Oh, our lab are bullshit. What they are doing? Huh? Then, before saying this, I talked to my biochemistry person, who is in charge of lab medicine. The explanation they give, it is very beautiful. They say the SGOT and SGPT level are so much high that they consume all the reagent. So th that will not be picked up. There is a two-step test. It will, it will pick up if we do it in the dilution. Then only I will be able to give it. Somebody has done it directly, so you are getting this low value. So there is no issue in it, but we have to understand what process is going through it. 
So it is very, very important to talk to your biochemist, talk to your microbiologist, talk to your pathologist before interpreting something. And the most common thing, what we face in the, our clinical practice, TSH is low normal, FT4 is low and FT3 is low. Classical picture of sick youth thyroid syndrome. We have to be very cautious when we are interpreting it because it can be a central hypothyroidism too. So classical SES can be a differential of central hypothyroidism. So we have to be cautious about it. In the treatment part, I am a little bit uh, skeptical about uh, this treatment part. Yesterday, Dr. Uh, Agrawal says there is no role of diabetic diet, explaining, focusing on diabetic diet. I am 102% uh, disagree with him. Because if the first step is not done, then how can we step further? So diabetic diet, we have to focus on it. We, don't, we can't say that we don't have time. So we, uh, th this is like this only. But we, when we have to treat the patient, we have to focus about the diabetic diet. We have to tell them, we have to keep the dietitian. If we, we are overburdened, we have to increase our tea. And another thing, very important thing, is de-escalation of therapy, especially in antibiotic. When a patient comes to you with sepsis, we give three, four antibiotic along with anti-malarial, along with antiviral. But once we got the diagnosis, the next day we got the diagnosis of anti-malaria uh, is positive. Please stop the antibiotics. Please stop the antivirals. So this practice should come in the mind. The, the thing which is not there, please stop the treatment for that. These are the three shaktiya for uh, the physician, samvad, sparsh, and samvedna, T, three sa. So samvad is communication, sparsh is touch, and samvedna is empathy. This is must for any clinician, and it increases the patient and doctor relationship. We, 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 we all are clinicians here mostly, so we know the power of these. Now a few words about the research. So I am First of all, I think well, I would like to say thanks to Dr. Anuj Mahashuri who has inclined to our research in the undergraduates. We can clap for him, at least once we can clap for him because today also we have seen undergraduate to present research work. I have, I have never thought of this till my post-graduation when I did my thesis. Before that, I have never seen. So research, yes, it should be incorporated as soon as possible. We should do any, whatever we can do, surveys, registry, do observational studies, report, rare presentations of common diseases or rare diseases, do non-intervention, do non-intervention analytical studies. And sensitization, as the ACP is doing, it is a wonderful job. So this is the NMC's guidelines to do BCBR to every postgraduate student and the faculties also. Good clinical practice guidelines, our work also be done by the faculties. This, this make us sensitized towards the good practices in the research. Now this Google make this very convenient. The Dr. Murthy and uh, Madam has presented this study. This was quite, quite simple and it is done quickly because of this Google. They make the Google forms, make the action sheets. They are so simplized, simply formed nowadays drive, classrooms, so we should thank towards to the Google. And furthermore, online prescription, writing made it more easy. You just write your prescription, you can turn into the actual sheets. Now academics, now the third pillar is the academics. Academics, so teaching a adult is a very different thing. So the adults are not, yes, this is right, this is wrong. No, they will not understand. So there is totally different sets. There are various training sessions for the teachers, for the medical fraternity, the ways to teach, ways to learn in the, in the adulthood. There are various ways. Feedback, how, you do, how we used to give feedback to our teachers? Pahli class mein 40 log the, second class mein 80 log the. So this shows ki teacher achcha padhata hai. Pahli class mein agar 60 log the, or second class mein 20 reh gaye. Iska matlab hai ki this is the feedback that no, teacher maza nahi aara. So this, this used to be the feedback at our time. But now, this is very important to take feedback. 
when I go to the medical, when I join the AIMS, this become the routine to take the feedback from the students. Develop their interest in teaching. Ask them what, what we are lacking. Doing the evidence-based practice, critical thinking, how to critically analyze the things. So these are the various courses we are running. And now in the last, we know that Teaching others make you the more inte most intelligent. So teaching others say, aapko learning hota hai. So since past six years, I am there in the AIMS, and I think sabse zada maine isi mein padhai kariya. Not in our, my UG days or in the PG days. This is the, my last slide. So teaching others is the most important thing. Practice, and you can see that lect giving lecture is only 5% is the fun. So basics are boon for future to boon. This is my last slide. So thank you, thank you all. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Devan Bhushan, for your excellent talk uh, relating to the role of good history taking, clinical examination, and interpretation of results with interdisciplinary coordination also. Yes, sir. Yes, that's important. You uh, stressed upon several cases. Uh, that reminds me also of the American drama series, Dr. House, in which he, he uses all these things uh, for good uh, clinical di diagnosis and decision making. Plus, from back to basics, because we always think that uh, basic scientists and clinical specialists should, should sit together and interpret it interpret epidemiology and clinical research for diagnostic accuracy and better treatment strategies. Yes, Thank sir. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, we move on to the next talk and uh, we have uh, a very well-known figure, Dr. S. V. Kulkarni, with us today. Yeah, he has been always a long-term uh, techno savvy and uh, techno enthusiast, in fact, and he has been delivering talks uh, on topics related to digital medicine in various forums all over the all over the country. And it's always been interesting to uh, listen to him and learn about uh, newer advances in in tech and what uh, tech has to do with medicine. So uh, I would ask, uh, I'd request Dr. Uh, Kulkarni to begin his deliberations. Thank you, Chairpersons. Thank you, Dr. Narsingh Verma, for giving me a bit the difficult topic, because it's something uh, quite odd to discuss uh, artificial intelligence after a uh, heavy lunch. Friends, fusion is accepted and appreciated everywhere in the world. Whether it is dance, whether it is music, whether it is a combination like this, imagine what would have happened without stethoscope. So why not to combine clinical medicine with digital technology and give the best part of it. This is briefly about me and I don't have any disclosures. For everybody of you, please don't take down any photographs. Concentrate on my last slide. There is an email ID. I'm going to give this presentation to you. This is your presentation. This is not my presentation. And for the next 15 minutes, you are going to listen to a very, very concentrated stuff. And I'm sure either you might not have seen these type of things in your life, or you might not have imagined in these things of this type. Why digital technology? What is the use of artificial intelligence in clinical medicine? Number one, saves time, saves earns money, reduces the burden of travel, trouble, torture, and waiting time for all our patients. And what about you? What about all of us? It increases serum levels of confidence, competence, enthusiasm, and mostly acceptability. I'm very happy to see people who are around the age of 50, 60 in this group. Actually, they need to adopt technology much more faster. Friends, everybody will agree that healthcare patient care is a complex process. It is sensitive and it is high risk activity. Patients come with different symptoms, doctors spot the patterns, identify the variation from the normal, manage the disease with different treatment options, sensitive and high risk 
huge variation in disease presentation. One HIV can present in a different way, another can different way. Human beings capacity is challenging for all specialties. So AI is not only for clinical medicine, AI is there for all the process. So is the process very complex? I don't think so. Disease prevention, disease diagnosis and treatment and rehabilitation of various diseases and various professionals have got a standard way of going down. Doctors undergo extremely rigorous training in honing the clinical knowledge, skills and individual experiencing with the patients. So the question is asked, if the things are so variable, can a digital algorithm will help you? Basically, we are all intelligent, all the medical professionals are intelligent, nourished by experience and by mentoring. So I won't call it as artificial intelligence, I will call it as an augmented intelligence. Now let us go back to the streets or to some 40 years back when you had this kind of uh, dabba telephones where you used to dial and now you have got a whole world in your hand. Your desktop is gone, your laptop is gone, nothing is there, one smartphone is sufficient. But there are obstacles. What are the obstacles? Number one, time frame, learning. WhatsApp learning school kabhi dekha hai kya? How you have learned WhatsApp? You need to be more attentive, you have to have a learning capacity, avoid distraction, the patient should not feel that the computer in front of, on your table is a competition, but it is a com companion. And it, at the same time, it is just a, not an ornament or not a, a just uh, a decoration piece. It is up to us to change our mindset into that. Friends, artificial intelligence is all around you. What mobile you are looking? My wife is in Nasik for a pediatric conference. She knows that I am in Isaac delivering this lecture. My son in Germany knows that what are the things are going on. So let us go from 12 o'clock position. Number one, diagnosis of disease. Medical image diagnosis. Drug discovery. Personalized medicine. Let us, all of us dream together that my cancer patient will not lose a single hair. My cancer patient will never have glossitis, stomatitis. I will have a drug, I will have a device which will work only on the malignant cells. This is personal medicine. Medical robots, medical robots are going to be the part of the future. Electronic health records, everybody is using it. Clinical trials, clinical trials are going to be obsolete. There is something going to be lab on a chip which will take the blood sample of the person the drug in nano quantities and it will tell you what are the likely to be the problems associated with. Outbreak prediction, everybody is very, very, very keen that you don't want to face another second corona. And again back with that outbreak prediction, we go to the clock turns to the uh, normal place and diagnosis of diseases. Is it a very new thing? It, AI is a, a, as old as me, 1956. John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence in the first AI and United Nations conference. What it is? Friends, it uses computers and machines to process, to simulate human intelligence. It performs complex automated tasks. Check the example of the conveyor belt. If conveyor belt would have not have been there, you would not be driving a car on the road. It seeks to reflect the abilities of the human mind. AI-enabled machines are also capable of exceeding in number of ways. It is the speed which matters. How many of us, suppose we are 100 people here, how many pages we can read about one rare disease? Particularly by shifting to the large volume of big data, efficiently to order, to identify patterns, anomalies, trends, and finally the treatment. Imagine, identify the patterns, anomalies, trend and treatment that is all possible uh, with AI in a very, very faster way. Now, there are four major healthcare uses of artificial intelligence. Disease diagnosis, developing drug faster, personalizing treatment and improved gene editing. This is absolutely exciting. There will be not a single person of hemophilia or sickle cell anywhere in the world 
if this CRISPR technique works. What does this CRISPR technique does? This is called as a clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Is the name for CRISPR. There is a system called as a Cas9. It can edit gene cost effectively and precisely like a surgeon. So the defective cell leaves the gene has gone and the patient is free of that disease forever. This is a whole spectrum. This is a whole spectrum of current applications of AI and, and machine learning. And what is the most important thing? Analysis. For analysis, what you know, what you need is the data. And please believe data is the currency of the next year, next generation. I am using four gadgets on my body right now. The data which is generating, that is going to help me to improve my physical capacity. These are lot many new terms which you will uh, know, that is ML. What is ML? It is machine learning. What is DL? Deep learning. And there are lot many other things. It just uses the same concept. How we are taught how to take a history, how to go for examination, how to interpret investigation. So these are the something called as a artificial neuronal networks. So please remember, AI is nothing. AI is machine learning, deep learning, and artificial neural learning. You must have seen this machine. Alive car, cardia, mobile, six lead ECG, one lead ECG, which is the first instrument which has been uh, cleared by FDA. If I got a patient of acute myocardial infarction recovering six weeks, he has got a ventricular tachycardia. I will be detected, I will be alarmed with this. And it can check the heart in 30 seconds. No battery, no wire, no jelly. And for the same patient, if you need Holter monitoring, this is available. This is, I am using day in and day out. 6,000 rupees for seven days Holter, very cheap. If you have got some contacts in Israel, go and get this watch. This is like a private detective for you, but it will improve your life. And if you have got 79,890 rupees within your pocket, and if you want to spend, get this ring. This is called as Aura Smart Ring. It is for fitness, stress, sleep, and health. What does it do? It picks up the signals and gives you the right commands. What all can be monitored? A cricket team of signals can be monitored in our body. And there is going to be a dabba. My signals is the center, and then you ask for anything. You can prepare a lie detector. You can prepare any instrument. You can prepare a, a sleep monitoring system with this. And these are going to be do-it-yourself kits for now. So there is no company which is going to manufacture it. You buy and you order for anything. Friends, how do you think? And can we augment our thinking? So decision making, increase accuracy, solving complex problems, but at the same time, higher level of computation. That computation has to be at such a level that there are very, very, very few chances of making an error. Error reduction is one of the greatest boon of artificial intelligence. So the four umbrellas I told you, it is an umbrella that covers variety of distinct but interrelated processes. These are not separate processes. They are all interrelated. You have got a Fitbit in your hand and it tells you at the end of the day, 10,000 steps you have walked. So there is something called as a narrow AI. There is something called as a general AI and there is called as a super AI. We are in between general and narrow. So the real boss is yet to arrive. Machine learning, what it does? Pattern recognition. Imagine there are 1,000 cats in this room and there is only one tiger. Just one scan and it will pick up the tiger. Deep learning, natural language processing. The world is one. It's not a new channel. But the, any natural language who is speaking by the phonetics, it will be interpreted in the language what you want. I got an example in front of you. You have got a Google Translate. You go anywhere in the world, put that word in Google Translate and tells you back into your natural language. And most important, robotic process automation. Robots are going to be of great help for everything. Machine learning, this is a training algorithm using data sets, health records to create models capable of performing such tasks as a categorizing information or predicting outcome. 
it may tell that you are likely to be likely to have a hypoglycemia. I am wearing a uh, uh, sensor which is available in the exhibition hall and it has told me that if I, I, now your sugars are reaching 70, it's time for you to have lunch. So these are different muscle uh, machine learning experiences. Suppose somebody has done a crime and he is driving a black Tesla and he is in the next square. Identify the black Tesla at this signal can be done with the help of machine learning. What are the deep learning? It is a subset of machine learning, but it has great volume of work. They never tire, they don't sleep only. It is the producer's neural networks capable of co more complex job, and this is one where you can have a real-time behavior analysis, and it can do a server optimization. NLP, it is, uses machine learning to understand human language, whether it is verbal or written, in healthcare, NLP is used to interpret documentation, notes, reports, audio notes, clips, videos, and publish research. So these are the important ways. Whatever advertisements you get on your mobile, they are of the NLP. Robotic process automation. To automate administrative and clinical workflow, to improve the patient experience and the daily function, and it is a self-improving process. In geriatrics, there is a robo, if you are falling down, the robot becomes a very strong man and he holds up you and keeps you in a seat or your bed. There is something like a clinical decision support system. I am going to take you back to 2009. It was a havoc news in the, in, in, uh, the country. In India, we will not have any HIV patient. My teacher, Dr. R.D. Lele, just took five sentences, middle-aged male, undergone CABG, eight transfusion, before February 2009, weight loss, high grade fever, loose motions not responding to the routine treatment. And tap came the answer, transfusion induced HIV. It was a shock to the country. This is clinical decision support system. And this we are getting every on all the apps which we are having. AI develops drugs faster, that's called as a lab on chip. Don't ask this question, where is the radiology department? Radiology department is in the cloud. And what is the branch? It is called as a teleradiology. It is a branch of telemedicine in used to transmit images from one location to another. Huge work. You, everybody must have seen how the CT scans were during. My friend, Dr. Amit Kharath, has got an organization called a D Deep Trek. So what he does, he is attached to 200 hospitals in this world and imaging centers, helping governments and other things to diagnose tuberculosis. Just a feed a chest X-ray, and he will tell you there is something called as a Genki. It is an AI-powered public health screening solution. It is an AI plus expert in the loop, and it shows an end-to-end imaging flow. If you send him an image, he has to give some diagnosis. He will not say, I don't know. These are the three classical highlights, classify, localize, and quantify. And we will be in a position to eliminate tuberculosis. And in addition, it can cause 17 different pathologies. All the 17 different pathologies will be covered. You will ask me why I have said unclassified. That doesn't cover hydrated cyst. So there is something else. If you feel like hydrated cyst, that is the pattern seven. Now, you must know this word, Watson. This is from IBM. I will not go into the details because it is better that you experience it on the net. It combines AI and sophisticated analytical software and the processing speed is absolutely super fast, 80 teraflops. And it, it can read 200 million pages within the shortest possible time to give a result out of it. It processes against 6 million logic rules. What are the key components? Apache, distributed component, and SUSE. It has got 280 processor cores. Can you imagine how fast it is? And it has got a 15 terabytes of RAM. Our mobile has got only 4 or 5 GB of RAM. 500 gigabits of process information, and it combines NLP, machine learning, and with different combinations. This is the digital diagnostics. This, there is one branch which has been maximally benefited with this is medical oncology with the help of. Forget oncology, radiology. Pathology, electronic transmission of digital images for diagnostic consultation. 
need not go to Boston or need not go to San Francisco. My own niece from in Kolapur, it is her lab. The child is playing around and she is sitting in the lab and doing her telepathology tele -radiology work as an oncosurgeon. Teleophthalmology, go and visit the stall. You will get your AI based report of whether you have got a, a, any diabetic retinopathy now. The big question is asked by everybody. Is AI going to replace doctors? It is very unlikely that it will, will replace doctors outright. AI systems will be used to highlight potentially malignant lesions, dangerous cardiac patterns for the expert, allowing the doctors to focus on interpretation of these signals. But one thing is certain, AI will replace the doctors who do not use AI. It is 100%. So start adopting technology. If you don't adopt technology, you will be definitely replaced. Don't be VP. Rona nahi. Mujhe abhi kaisa karne ka ye kya mujhe malum nahi hai. If you have grandchildren in the house now, unko pakdo chocolate de do. They are the best teachers. AI will never replace human doctors or clinicians. It can never replace empathy. Physicians have a non-linear working model. Complex digital technologies require competent professionals and there will be always be task algorithms and robots can never be complete unless you examine the patient. So these are the pros and these are the cons. It reduces human error, never sleeps, never gets bored, it is fast. Cons, it is costly, it can't duplicate human creativity, people can become overtly reliant on it. So this is another cricket team of technologies beyond uh, AI and apps that needs a separate half, an, uh, half a day workout only. And this is what the blockchain and healthcare technology is going to do. There are going to be a lot of new things. The future anatomy halls will be non-smelling. You will be using augmented or virtual reality. Just go look through the Google map and it will tell you where is the McDonald or where is the dosa chap. Or, or, and coming last, that will be the glimpse of the future. It is artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud computing, data mining, electronic health record, future readiness, and don't forget 5G. These are the patient simulators for the examination as well as procedures. There is something called as a mixed reality or immersive reality. This gentleman is drilling a bone, but he gets a feel of what the bone he is drilling. Virtual reality, and the gear is called as oculus. I have experienced this in the Kolkata conference of Bengal API. And you can practically lift a skeleton from here, liver from there, and you can feel the organs with your fingers. And this is something absolutely great. Abolish the word plagia in your dictionary. No paraplegia. One minute. No paraplegia, no hemiplegia, no quadriplegia. This is, a pers this is a boy who is a quadriplegic. He is wearing something called as exoskeleton. And that map, the he helmet he has got, he can think and he can walk. Suppose there is a coffee machine there. If he thinks that I want to have a coffee, he will, he will look to this because there are sensors which are on his head, which are, there are powerful muscles which are going to help him with the supporting, helping. The goggles which you are seeing, they are called as the Google glasses. Digital biological twinning is going to be the keyword. Take any metabolic disorder and you have got a digital twin. Non fungible tokens, NFT. If you want, you can start in your hospital. If your patient has a fantastic diabetes control, tell him that I'm going to give 500 NFTs so that you will get a 50% concession in your next workup. So this is, they are going to be. Uh, blockchain assisted devices and the future is going to be full with all this. There is going to be electronic skin which can monitor your sodium potassium. The pendant what you see is a, actually a fall detector and the waste you are seeing here, that waste is a holter monitor actually and a man's reach should exceed his grasp. That is what Robert Browning said and we should always try to reach to the best. Friends, who is going to benefit with all of this? Everybody. Medical professional at all ages, from students to deans, vice chancellors to medic of medical college. Actually, they are my students in my digital class. Investors, 
स्टार्ट अप एंटर प्रोग्रामर्स टू द पॉइंट प्रैक्टिकल सब्जेक्ट्स एंड एवरीथिंग विच अवेलेबल ऑन नेट आई कैंट फॉरगेट माय 1974 बैच ऑफ मिर्ज मेडिकल कॉलेज आई एम ए वेरी ओल्ड मॉडल एंड माय टीचर डॉक्टर आरडी लेले प्रोफेसर एसवी सोलटूर एंड माय टेक्नोसेवी फैमिली व्हिच अलाउज मी ए कंसेशन ऑफ 80 डेज एवरी ईयर टू टर्न अराउंड टू टॉक अबाउट टेक्नोलॉजी इन द कंट्री एंड अब्रॉड सो आई जस्ट एंड विथ दिस फ्रेंड ऑफ माइन स्टे हंगरी स्टे फुलिश at the same time stay ignorant ready to learn stay idiotic to pretend that you don't know this grandchildren are the best examples they are teachers good return it is a good return on their investment it can same thing we can do from your students learning technology is the only proven vaccine and treatment for fitness and your prevention of alzheimer If you want this presentation, this is email ID. Very simple to remember: S V Kulkarni 1955 at readypmail dot com. Please learn, identify, entrepreneur within yourself. Innovate, incubate, integrate, invest in IT infrastructure. Sri Nivas uh, Murthy must be here around. He has heard me when he was a student 40 years back. So you need a passion for this, and you will definitely get benefited. So friends, finally, please be optimistic. please be informed empowered futuristic build a bridge of knowledge clinical acumen experience artificial intelligence and technology in your clinical practice you will be immensely benefited by the way this is the longest bridge in the country 23.8 kilometers connecting navi mumbai and mumbai and my uh, this is just in front of my home so next time when you will come to mumbai you will be in a position to fast uh, travel faster Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. That that was great. Uh, as usual, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. Thanks. Sir. And uh, we can we can talk at length. We can go on for the whole day. It needs actually a. a uh, half day workshop or something like that probably in the next <laughs> meeting uh, we can we can stop here thank you thank you for such an informative session <clears throat> now proceeding further <clears throat> i would like to invite professor r k sharma sir and dr shivain singh to chair the session thank you sir good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen <coughs> uh, the next session or bada full full we are privileged to have uh, professor tripathi <coughs> who is an old friend and uh, he has a very impressive uh, cv he started out uh, in nephrology under dr johnny who was one of the stalwart and <coughs> continued uh, in internal medicine and he was the yes, sir, head sir. of uh, uh, internal medicine in uh, banaras hindu university he is a great professional a great teacher and for his uh, contribution in medicine he has been recognized as national level by the president of india and awarded padma shri even today i am told that uh, he runs a totally free uh, outpatient service uh, which is really very commendable and today we are going to uh, listen to him on a very important topic uh, which is about the mitochondrial uh, abnormalities especially in diabetes which is very 
relevant to the theme of this present meeting. So I think uh, I'm privileged thank you, to Thank you, Sharma ji. To Sharma ji. Sharma ji is session. my thank you. batch met, position met, met several times, together enjoyed the journey. So nice of you for all the nice words, taking us back to the history. And then the Dr. Shivan Singh is our another colleague. Before me, ye, ye vakt nikal usme ga nahi. Before my presentation, there was uh, from Patna, Dr. Bhushan. And he was talking that he learned research and appreciated only when he became uh, associate professor. Paul Langerhans, during his third year MBBS career, was writing a dissertation on the histology of pancreas. And he stained this slide, misinterpreted it as a lymph node, couldn't understand what this slide is. The innovator of islet cell, invited by Workoff, Workoff's lymph node. Workoff's gave him the lab. He did the study, completed the study, contacted tuberculosis, died. The work of who named islet cell of Langerhans didn't include his name. So they were, these are the teachers. Hazaro saal tak nargis apni benuri pe roti hai. It takes thousands of years and thousands to be produced, to be born as Paul Langerhans, as a student who discovered islet during his third year MBBS course and work of his teacher who gave the name though discovered and, and, and finally published it. So thank you very much and you remember these great people. Uh, we talked today of the mitochondria and one of my teacher, Professor D.P. Verma, who taught me biochemistry exactly 55 years before in first year MBBS. Uh, he was the associate postdoc working with at that time, Nobel Prize winner in Boston, Har Govind Khorana. And he said, this is the seat. This is the seat. It is a reactor. And this reactor of the evolved from the endosmic biotic theory concerned the origin of mitochondria and plastids, which are organized of eukaryocyte cell. Actually, the cell, the nucleus of the amoeba, a single cell, which is called the eukaryocyte has a lot of power to regenerate. It has some DNAs of about few billions. But the mitochondria is a separate one. And you look at the figure here. It was the organelle which was engulfed as an endosymbiosis and developed proteobacteria in particular to close relatively and close chloroplast from the cyanobacteria. So it's like the, this is the tubule, proximal tubule. We all learned in third year MBBS doing the proximal tubule histology from the distal tubule. And look at these, these black spots, which have a shelf life structure. And these are the structure with the seat of the energy, which is the currency of the energy. Why we need a separate mitochondria? Why our nucleus did not do the job? Because when the simple mitosis occurred, there was no question of transferring energy. It was only legacy was being transferred. But when there was more cells, the meiosis, the halving of the cell DNAs, and then subsequent binary fission advanced, then the energy also has to be transferred. So mitochondria came into existence from the symbiosis, and they are the intracellular organelle responsible for producing most of the ATPs which would be used. So mitochondria is like Bansi Shabu and Anuj Maheshwari uh, who keep the money reserved. These are the good Gujarati Marwaris who try to preserve the money and don't lose it during the division of the further progeny, whereas the nucleus remain the legacy. People like me, Nursing Verma and Dr. Sharma, who remain only simple teacher right from the beginning of the career, they keep the legacy. So nucleus, many billion of the genomes capsulated into the mitochondria by per phosphate bond, and then this is the mitochondria, which makes the great show. It's to generate energy in the form of ATP using series of redox reaction, and the process is known as oxphos. We'll use these two words subsequently when we talk the pathogenesis. 
because kidney is a highly metabolic organ, require a amount of energy to maintain its normal function. And concretely, kidney are rich in mitochondria. And in the proximal tubule, we in histology get the slide to identify, compare the number of mitochondria into the cell, into the endoplasmic reticulum, then the distal tubule. In reduction of mitochondrial content, increase in mitochondrial DNA damage. Hyperglycemia increase the tricarbolic acid cycle and altered glycolytic pathway via elevated level of advanced glycation and product. Because uh, this is called the ER mitochondrial coupling. This is between the release of energy, the endoplasmic reticulum is stressed in the pathogens of the diabetes. When it is loosely bound, it decreases calcium uptake and decreases energy formation. When it is the moderate bound, that increases calcium uptake, increases reactive oxygen species, energy production, improves mitophagy, mitochondrial fusion in stress, and in a very tight situation, increases calcium intake, fission, in apoptosis, and LRP3. We'll talk these two signals before. So the activity of protein kinase C the hexamine also contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction and have been found to have a pivotal role in the progression of diabetic nephropathy. Hence, therapies that target mitochondrial function would be beneficial to elevate diabetic nephropathy progression, which has been verified by several mitochondrial targeted antioxidants, including coenzyme Q10, mitoquinone, and TP3131. Uh, this is popular diagram to all of us saying that it is the basement membrane in diabetic nephropathy. It is the fenestration between the two epithelial cell and the endothelial cell in the space which gets damaged because of the inflammatory cytokine, which gives the permeation to the albumin, which is a larger molecule with almost 19 Armstrong unit and get the space into the Bowman's capsule. It's the mitochondrial fitness, which is primarily regulated by the energy production, inflammatory cytokines, senescence as you at your age advances, you also get changed into the mitochondrial fitness, the mitophagy, calcium homeostasis, we talk in the redox signaling. This is the two word, the fusion and the dynamics into the different two situation, and I'll talk in a moment what these situations are. And, and they are responsible for the fusion and fission. It's like the nuclear reactor I said in the beginning. You try to divide the mitochondria, retain the energy to shift into the next of the cell. And during this shifting, some of us would lose the functional integrity of the mitochondria. This is the primordial germ cell. As I was talking to the meiosis. Meiosis is the genesis of the mitochondrial power sustaining energy into the shelf. And during oogenesis, when it divides, divides into the two, and these major mechanisms of mitochondrial DNA genotypes during the oocyte development, purifying selection in the mitochondrial DNA generic production. The reprogramming, mitochondrial reprogramming, is responsible for the genesis of the diaptic nephropathy. We all believe that it is the beginning, is that the basement membrane, the endothelial dysfunction, changing the concept uh, character of the podocyte and then making the protein to seep out. But it is the mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, fragmented mitochondria, then Christi formation, mitochondrial membrane, potential changes into the potential of the membrane in mitochondrial biogenesis. This is what would happen from the beginning in the early part of the, this is experimental model of the diaptic Red, in which from the few days to the middle and the late, you get complex energy, initial the ATP, which gradually slows down in the complex activity and then comes down to the baseline. This was the initial observation, though published 2021 uh, in the antioxidant Basel journal, but there's excessive enlarged mitochondria in the kidney of diaptic nephropathy. That was the first observation to be made, why these patients have such a large swelled up mitochondria. And the reason was ultimately found, it is the tubular epithelial cell podocyte damage, also the mesangeal cell damage, also the endothelial cell damage, 
which is responsible for the mitochondrial dysfunction in those patients who tend to develop nephropathy much earlier than other clinical manifestations. So the, all the three, it is the endothelial cell damage, the apoptosis, the inflammation of the mesangial expansion, that was the response for the increased size of the mitochondria, the podocyte damage, and also the tubular cell increased apoptosis and autophagy together responsible. And look at the pathogenesis. One is responsible, the autophagy of the endothelial cell is responsible for the change into the fibroblast, uh, enhancing the fibrosis of the kidney. Other two is responsible for the proteinuria and the mesangial expansion. I talk to you this, and then I'll quickly go to the, some of the functions of the dysfunction and mitophagy, which is the beginning and end of the diaptic nephropathy. This is important. This is 2013 publication, but the current pharmacological therapies used to individualize the diaptic nephropathy do not prevent the invariable progression to the diaptic and distrait renal disease. What all we learned from our beginning, that it would continue to do so. You have a diabetes, you would continue to deteriorate. Only drugs would retard the progression, slow the proteinuria, may not revert you back, and therefore, what we have developed, or the scientists have developed, the molecules. This is the first molecule, thioredoxin interacting protein, TXNIP, which regulates tubular autophagy and mitophagy in diaptic nephropathy through mTOR signaling pathway, and which is the important pathway for the mitochondrial regeneration. Then, pyruvate kinase activation may protect against the progression of diaptic normal pathology. And this is the PKM2 mediated response activator, TEPP46, which reversed the hyperglycemia induced elevation of toxic glucose metabolites in mitochondrial dysfunction. So now this is very specific. We are not treating endothelial dysfunction. We are not treating protocyte. We are not treating protein. We are not treating the fibroblast growth factor. But we are directly referring to the mitochondrial health. And this is the activating, and these are the examples of the TEPP, which are used. In 2018, it is the very old molecule, chloroquine and amodiakine enhances AMPK phosphorylation and improved mitochondrial fragmentation in diaptic tubulopathy. We have adaptic glomeropathy, we have adaptic nephropathy, now we have adaptic tubulopathy. So looking at the beginning of the story of the podocyte damage in protein leak, this molecule, chloroquine, such an old molecule, and amodiakine, in enhances AMPK phosphorylation. CoQ10, so famous, so important, and many of us are using this molecule, improves the mitochondrial dysfunction through mitophagy, and, uh, and this is what the mechanism, look at the TEMPQ, look at the bottom, it improves mitochondrial uh, species targeted antioxidant action. Then this is 2022 February publication, SGLT2 inhibitors. Now we are looking, this is what we do. We look at the molecule, then we look at the basic science and then we try to get a proper answer. Metaformin or sodium glucose transporters have potential to inhibit the, provide renal protection to the improving mitochondrial cell. Empagliflozin, so another one, electronic, electron microscopy analysis have showed that mitochondrial fragmentation was decreased by using 8-hydroxy-2 deoxyregulation, content was low in renal tubule cells treated with empagliflozin. So we have a now answer which molecule is doing what at the mitochondrial level. Berberin, Anuj must be very happy now. This is berberin. Berberin has potential to improve the mitochondria of the tubule in a diabetic patient, hence improving the tubular health cell. Then this is the 2020 renal physiology publication, the dynamics and emergence of the diaptic renal proximal tubule with beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonist formatrol. What a wonderful news. So far we were using for the in bronchial asthma. And I remember my teacher, Professor Vike Shavastra, long, long back, that at that time he used beta agonist. It improves proteinuria. Look at those teachers, 100 years, 60 years back. And this was the teaching of Professor Smashra in KGMU Lucknow. That even deriphylin at that time, patient in a diabetes would prevent 
the progression of the tubular damage. This is the sum of the quick food item, a skin peptide from one of the fish have shown that it prevent the mitochondrial dysfunction and improves by BNIP3 NIX signaling. Look at the bottom red, improve the mitochondrial morphology, reverse the overproduction of mitochondrial superoxide dismutase and cellular reactive oxygen species. Then this is the mitochondrial kinase PM, PINK1 DAP inhibitor, which has a, a lot of function. And studies have suggested that targeting P and K may offer promising alternative for the treatment of adaptive kidney disease. This is Dr. Nursing Verma, popular belief, intermittent fasting. And you generate ketone bodies, which help the cardiac myocyte. It also improves m your mitochondrial function in the tubular system. And ketone bodies, they help in the autophagy, thereby delaying adaptic nephropathy progression. Fibroglass growth factor 13, sensitive alteration of Perkins safeguard mitochondrial homeostasis and endothelium of adaptic nephropathy by promotion of the mitophagy and inhibition of apoptosis. Atorvastatin, who thought it? But nephrologists did it. Nephrologists used from the beginning statin to retard the progression of nephropathy. And the answer was probably lying somewhere else. And this was the answer that inhibits adaptive nephropathy through upregulation of PKM2, which also improves mitochondrial function. That's one of the complex molecules, 1415 epoxy acid, which is tongue twisting, and it starts the progression of adaptive nephropathy through regulating PKM2. Taxofolene inhibits adaptive nephropathy through upregulation of PKM2, and then Sildenafil, better to invite Dr. Deepak Jumani, who uses a lot of Sildenafil and can improve your kidney function as well. So next speech by Deepak Jumani would be on Sildenafil, how it improves mitochondrial dysfunction and also improves your kidney. Aperlistat, another molecule. And these are the molecules which have come in last four to five years. And they are being still used, they have started and like aperlastron, we have started, we are using phenaronon. Now we are using the combination of the two to improve the uh, tubular function. And therefore, it improves on aldose reductase inhibitor used in the treatment of adaptic nephropathy by PMK pathway. So to conclude, mitochondrial dysfunction is one of the earliest event in the pathogens of adaptic nephropathy, much, much earlier than basement membrane damage occurs, much earlier than the tubular dysfunction sets in affects mitochondrial fission and fusion in a high energy charge metabolic milieu. It's oxidative phosphorylation, oxphos of mitochondria affects podocyte in with angel architecture of Bowman's capsule. This is what exactly we want. We wanted to hit both at one side. We wanted to take care of the food process, podocyte, and also take care of the mesangial growth factor, which is responsible for the IGF-mediated fibrosis. Mitochondrial stress affects autophagy, at apoptosis of mesangial cell, vascular endothelium promoting proteinuria and glomerulosclerosis, many new and old drugs like SGLT2 inhibitors, berberine, atorvastatin, beta-2 receptor agonist, pyridoxamine, and encidophil, else coenzyme Q10 have, been, have the potential to improve mitochondrial function. So thank you very much for your listening and uh, Nice to see these young nephrologists. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Tripathi, it's, uh, uh, for this excellent presentation. It's an area which would stimulate a uh, lot of discussion and questions, but since we are running late, uh, but I uh, would like to highlight that uh, these interventions and these new areas are very important because the diabetic uh, epidemic continues to really uh, go forward in a big way. So I hope that very soon we will have something more available uh, to control this epidemic. Thank you yeah, very By the much way, Dr. R.K. Sharma this. has a lot of publication to his credit on the tubular function. He's one of the earliest worker in the nephrology who took the basic science in the limelight. So it's nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank and you. listening this group of the physicians.
Thanks for inviting both of us. Now we'll move to the next topic. Uh, the lecture will be delivered by Dr. M. M. Prabhu. He is MD, FRCP uh, from Edinburgh and Ireland, FACP professor and unit head. He is also certified lipidologist at KMC Manipal. Uh, and topic is very important, nocturia treat or not to treat. Uh, at times, it is difficult to differentiate psychological and pathological nocturia. I think uh, we will uh, we request Dr. M. M. Prabhu to kindly deliver your talk. for giving me opportunity to talk on uh, nocturia. I have to speak after Padma Shri, Tripathi sir, and previously Kulkarni sir spoke on artificial intelligence, but, uh, Tripathi sir spoke on basic research. Before that, what is, is it basic or b b medicine? My talk is very simple. I think topic is very, looks very simple, and it's also very simple. Nocturia to treat or not to treat is the topic. So theme of the conference is back to basics. I would like to acknowledge greeting from KMC Manipal, where I come from. My topic is focused on this topic, recognizing across India only. Nocturia to treat or not treat, one slide I will finish. Based on the, all the studies, you have to treat. So I wanted to suggest you have got a well gift. So I will be focusing on one study, planet study, and octopus study, and conclusions. So if you see the definition of nocturia from the International Continent Society, is the need to void one or more times during the night. You go to the sleep, you have to get up to pass urine. Each void preceded and followed by sleep. If you see it's clinically significant, if it's more than two times, you have to get and pass the urine. Diagnosis is entirely back to the basics, patient's history. Patient has to tell the history. If you ask him only, he will tell or he will not tell. Severe nocturia is defined as more than three whites per night. So this is nocturia is like the story of a six blind man touching the elephant. So this is from the Kidney International. But what was shown was a ICU, you go, patient has got heart failure, all those things. But what I'm saying is a nocturia, it's different for a different person. If it's a urologist, it's maybe a prosthetic hyperplasia. For a gynecologist, lower urinary tract syndrome. For a physician, it may be diabetes. For endocrinologist, it may be still more diabetes insipidus. For orthopedic, patient has fallen in the toilet, it may be fracture. Cardiologist, it is a heart failure or a diuretic therapy. It's a psychiatrist may think it is a psychological illness. But it's not. It's actually, we need to be, who is this? He is Sherlock Holmes. He is sitting on looking at the cause. Okay. So Sherlock Holmes is a written by Arthur Conan Doyle, who is a doctor. So his guide was a bird, who was a physician. What doctors can learn from Sherlock Holmes? Look and try to find out what is the patient's problem. So I want to go back to the back to the basic that what William Masler has told. Good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has got the disease. So. Nocturia is not the problem. What problem patient has got, we have to treat it. And again, I go back to the, what Raslam has told. Observe, record, tabulate, communicate, use your five senses. Learn to see, learn to hear, learn to feel, learn to smell, and know that what practice alone you can become expert. Dr. Kulkarni has told, artificial intelligence is not going to replace the doctors. You have to adapt to artificial intelligence. There is no way doctors can be replaced. You have to touch the patient. You have to talk to the patient. You have to take the history. So, nocturia is a syndrome. It's a symptom complex, which you have to take a detailed history, do the clinical examination. We've got a lot of signs you have to see, obesity, rice GVP, fever, fetal edema, signs of insulin resistance, hypertension, all those things you have to see. 
LV environment, hepatomegaly, and diseases may be uncontrolled diabetes, congestive cardiac failure, it can be UTI, it can be chronic kidney disease, it can be hypertension, itself can lead to nocturia, it can be PPH in a old man, it can be overactive bladder, one more this thing is obstructive sleep apnea, and depression itself may be cause of this. We have to find out from the symptom what is the problem which patient has got. We have to treat the disease, not the nocturia. So you have to treat the nocturia. It's only tip of the iceberg. There are so many hidden things fall in the fractures. Elderly, the most common cause of fall is falling in the toilet. Sleep deprivation leads to lack of sleep, lack of uh, what you say, quality of life will come down. Quality of life, not only the patient, quality of the life of partner, economic loss and depression. So it's often underreported. If you don't ask the history, patient won't tell. Poorly managed and inadequately treated. If the incidence goes on increasing from the young age to older age, if the person is younger, it's 8.6 percent. But after 40, it goes up to 67 percent. Again, it's present in both sexes, males and women, and it's more common in blacks. Patient with three or more nocturnal voida, it's an independent cardiovascular marker of mortality. So if you see, these are all the statistics from US. We don't have much statistics. So it leads to reduced quality of life, poorer overall mental health, reduced work and productivity, increased fall and fracture, increased priority. So short-term daytime sleepiness, reduced energy, psychometric performance, long-term it leads to depression, somatic diseases, cardiovascular diseases. So my question is, nocturia to treat or not treat? Definitely you have to treat. So, it's a sleep efficiency, sleep latency, all these things are affected. So it's like a Raman with the 10 heads. It's a highly prevalent disorder with multifaceted consequences. So you've got so many studies shows that one of the most important cause of sleep loss is nocturia. So clinical implication, as I've told, most common diseases like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea, BPH, all are related to one of the manifestation can be nocturia. So patient have got more than three now nocturnal void, have got an independent increased risk of cardiovascular death, quality of life, and significant risk of fall in elderly. So this is a quality of life study from South Asia. I will not go in detail. So they found that nocturia significantly affects the quality of life, work productivity, and mental well-being. So potential causes, if you see, there are so many causes I explained. But what you also see is that the nocturnal polyuria then there's a peripheral edema, congestive heart failure, poorly controlled diabetes, excessive fluid intake, and also intake of diuretic substances inappropriately given, diuretic given in the night. It can be sleep-related, difficulty in sleep maintenance, sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, and hypertension. Hypertension, it, you know, it, those who are not non-nocturnal dippers, they have got an increased risk of nocturia. So there are three types. Global polyuria, nocturnal polyuria, and the last one is mixed etiology. Upper one is related to mainly prostate and urogynecological problems. So diabetes mellitus, diabetes insufficiency leads to global polyuria. Daytime also they will pass more urine. Night also they will pass more urine. Nocturnal polyuria is due to loss of circadian rhythm in water diuresis. As a person ages, it may be related to cardiovascular disease like hypertension and heart failure and sleep disorders. So evaluation, again, back to the basic, history and physical examination, focusing on the sleep quality, urinary complaints, cardiac abnormalities, medication timing, and prior urinary tract infection, surgery, and comorbidity that increases the urinary problem, maybe distress activity. So what you have to do is called voiding diary. We'll not go in detail what they have taken, drinking water or whatever, the coffee tea what time they have passed urine, how much passed the urine. Based on that, there are so many indices come. Based on that, you can see that what is the patient's problem. You have to do the examination, which I already highlighted. You have to go into the laboratory studies, routine urine examination, biochemistry, urine, and also electrolytes. You can do the nocturnal diary, and non-invasive urofluometry can be done, and ultrasound by patient. But most of the time, it is a basic history and examination. So these are the various types of finding which you get in nocturnal polyuria if you do what is called nocturnal urinary diary. So there are three types, I told polyuria, global polyuria is to diabetes related, diminished nocturnal capacity is urogynecological, which is treated by gynecologist and urologist. So the history, what are the things which you have to take again from the out to up to date? 
classification I already told based on the, uh, these parameters you can again classify nocturia. So more than 65 year old with nocturnal lower nerve intract system have showed important excess in the nocturnal diuresis and sodium loss in the night compared with patients with nocturnal lower nerve intract symptoms. Nocturia index is called more than 1.8 is this symptom uh, calculations I am not going to detail because of shortage of time. Again, frequency of polyurea, if you see that global polyurea, nocturnal polyurea, medical disorders, for other two are mainly urogynecological. So how do you evaluate this study called planet study? Planet study has got two things which you have to focus is on endocrine, sleep, renal, cardiovascular, neurological. That's called screening. You have to screen the patient. Coming to the management, so behavioral lifestyle, fluid intake, and also diuretics and global polyuria treatment I will be coming in one or two slides. Treat the underlying cause, lifestyle modification, and the yes, symptom progress, such measures may be insufficient, pharmacotherapy may be initiated. So lifestyle modification, minimizing fluid intake, decreasing the intake before the sleep, coffee, tea, or alcohol, emptying the bladder, increasing the exercise level, loss, decreasing the weight, what we say, weight, and keeping the good uh, support system in the toilet. Patients and diuretics, the dosage has to be adjusted. That should not be given in the evening. So limit drinking coffee, bladder and pelvic floor exercise, salt and protein restriction, weight loss, prevention of diabetes and obesity, sleep hygiene, limit drinking bladder and pelvic floor training, sleep, and again, physical activity. So antidiuretic agent is the most important. That's a desmopressin, which is noctopastor. Sometimes diuretic may be required to be used in nocturia. Beta muscarinic receptor, these are again more of a prosthetic problem. Beta adrenergic receptor, alpha adrenergic blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and plant extracts. I will not go into these drugs in detail. Desmopressin has been used for more than 30 years for the treatment of nocturia for diabetes insipidus and primary nocturnal enuresis. It is available in tablet form, inhaled form, and also this. These are other drugs which can be used for the nocturia, beta-3 agonists, or sulfenacin and other new anti-muscular agents who have got an overactive bladder. So if you can't treat it, low-dose des desmopressin and alpha blockers can be used as a treatment. Also low-dose desmopressin with telenodine. So how does the desmopressin act? I will not go into the detail. So these are the mechanisms where it can be act. It can act in the ear, it can act in the renal tract, and also in the brain. It's a drug uh, treated by posterior pituitary. So desmopressin in the long-term treatment in Noctopus trial showed that it has got a significant decrease from decrease from 67% to 37% in males, 67% to 46% in females. So coming to my last slide, summary and conclusion. Is it a common symptom? Definitely common symptom, which patient may not tell. Your patient may come with a fall. It's a distressing symptom, definitely a distressing symptom. It affects the quality of life. It is not a symptom, it's a disease, but not a disease. It is a syndrome. You have to find out the cause with a multiple etiology. Nocturia may be manifestation of BPH, urinary tract infection, diabetes, mellitus, osteos, obstructive sleep apnea, heart failure, hypertension, and depression. It has got a significant effect on general health, vitality and quality of life. Sleep disturbance can result in daytime sleepiness, fatigue. So my last thing is that to treat or not treat, you have to treat. When patients are appropriately evaluated with history and diagnosis, you can treat it suitably because the drugs are available. Lifestyle modification and drugs, antimuscarinic agents, alpha blockers, beta agonists, desmopressin in the refractory beneficial. So this is a slide which I think it's a summary of all the testing. I don't need it. These are my references. Coming to my last slide, neurologist famous, who is considered as one of the greatest medical writers, Oliver Sacks said that in examining a disease, we gain wisdom about anatomy and physiology of biology. But in examining the person with the disease, we gain wisdom about life. Nocturia is a one disease where you need to find out the cause and treat it. It's not a symptom which patient will come out openly. They may come with the fall, they may come with the depression. So many things are there, so many components. It's a single monster with the multiple heads. Thank you for the patient listening.
explaining such a complicated topic in simple words and it is a very important disease so as we are running short of time before concluding uh, dr prabhu i have one suggestion or maybe a one request is that the one slide you showed the nocturia interpreted by different specialist gynecologist as yeah, uti yeah, yeah, yeah. so you can add one nephrologist also yeah, he yeah, interprets as ckd yeah, yeah. it's actually from the kidney international yeah yeah, uh, yeah it so was you can to a my request in a icu i know that but i put the commonly where they, they want to go to the nephrologist as first they may go to urologist gynecologist definitely it's a nephrologic problem that's why i put that slide but it's called screen yeah look yeah. at the sleep look at the kidney look at the neurological problem look at the other components oh thank you thank you yeah i put a gyno what is that urologist and gynecologist separately because most of the time females will have a nocturia as a major problem and it is yeah yeah ckd yeah it's one of the important i didn't put more blind men so nephrologists are not blind <laughs> they can recognize also <laughs> professor tripathi also so spoke <laughs> this one or uh, this one yeah this one despopressin one thing is that it can be if you have ruled out other causes if the primarily global or what you say nocturnal polyuria patient can be started only thing is that problem is hyponatremia is a problem check the sodium you can use it because it's oral and uh, both inhaler problems are available so you can start after 40 45 years if the person children i am not because i am not concentrated on children as such mainly no definition it is one if it is more than one it becomes significant if the person has got more than two or three they have got increased cardiovascular mortality also by definition if it's more than one time you have to get up in the night get to this thing go to the sleep again if it is more than one you may have to this thing more than two or three it will be definitely affect the this thing one patient may not tell yes what is that sir exclusive cause that's what i told nocturnal polyuria it can be primarily as it becomes older decrease sensitivity to desmopressin or synthetic avp so that's the one cause which you may have to treat it that's what desmopressin yes Dr. Ashok Parik sir and Dr. Vishwa Unadkar sir to please continue with the next session. Vice President Indian Menopause Society, Consultant Endocrinologist, Diabetologist, Nutritionist, Joint Secretary ISBMR UP, President Lucknow Menopause Society, is expert in writing panel on lipid assessment of India guidelines, Indian Menopause Society guidelines. He has contributed many papers in peer-reviewed journals, many article chapters, and delivered many lectures. And he will be talking on the 
latest evidence is of New York lift test. Over to you, sir. So, thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. Once again, it's an opportunity to discuss some of the very important aspects in the management of a very common disease, diabetes. Whether we like it or not, but all of us have to be diabetologists. Sheer number of patients, the burden is such that we are sometimes really um, <clears throat> very much tight pressed to treat diabetes. And treating diabetes, we are all doing day in and day out. But there are certain practical, peculiar situations where you have to <coughs> deviate from the standard clinical practices. Sometimes there are your relatives, friends, neighbors, and quite often the patients, they will always come and say, I have lost the prescriptions, I do not know the medications, I was taking two medications, I was, there was one Neely Goli and one White Goli like that. So sometimes they will, know, ha, they will not have any report, so we have to go in a makeshift way. So at this stage, we need a medication which is primarily safe. It has to be an absolutely safe medication besides being effective medication. So, so far, for decades, we have medications, sulfonylurea, and we would never give a patient a medication where we are not absolutely sure about the values. So here there is a medication. I'm not so saying that we can give it to anybody, but certainly our safety index would be much more. Now this is a medication. This is evogliptin. About two decades ago, we had gliptin, so we were very excited that we have a medication now which we can give safely to our patients even in the middle of the night or even on telephones. So. So this is a medication which was developed in South Korea because not being developed in US, probably the amount of noise level is not so what we had been having with other medications. So this is a medication, this uh, evogliptin, it acts on S1, S2, and uh, S2 extensive zones also, and therefore it is, uh, the, the duration is much more of this molecule compared to other DPP-4 inhibitors. Now about pharmacokinetics, we all know that uh, this reaches the peak levels in sufficiently in a relatively good time, three to five hours. But what is more important that it, it uh, rapidly surpasses 80% in less than one hour after administration. The half-life is, as I, as I was mentioning, is quite high and the effect persists truly for more than 24 hours. It reaches to a steady state and the metabolism remains, the absorption remains unchanged by food, so we don't have to be really very much dogmatic that it has to be taken before meals like sulfonylurea and it has to be taken after meals like metformin. So it can be taken any time in the day. And it is not an inducer of cytochrome P440 enzyme system. So therefore, no dose adjustment was required because urinary excision is not the major, sorry, this is for urinary excision, but for avoiding interaction. So it has much less interaction because not affecting the cytochrome enzyme system. The renal clearance and fraction excreted unchanged in urine so the dose adjustment was not really very significantly um, required in the patients having major renal problems. Very important, the administration adjust adjustment is not needed in patients with mild to moderate hepatic impairment. You would appreciate that almost everybody walking into your clinic has a halter sound in his hand which is mentioning fatty liver or things like that. So you do not know which patient is having a hepatic problem. So there is a DPP-4 inhibition, inhibition which is very much high and this leads to a quite significantly increased GLP-1 levels and this leads to a very effective PPG blood glucose control and reduction and that is what we want quite often about renal dysfunction. 
You see, all our diabetic patients, whether we know it or not, they have some amount of renal dysfunction, and this drug was found safe in all grades of kidney dysfunction. So we have to be very much clear that we are doing no harm in all, any, on all our diabetic patients. They might be having some amount of renal dysfunction even otherwise. <coughs> yeah, continuing with the hepatic impairment, I was mentioning a lot many patients have hepatic involvement and in this, with this molecule, it is unlikely to adversely affect safety and efficacy because of hepatic involvement and therefore no dosage and administration, administration adjustment is needed in patients with mild to moderate hepatic impairment. So this is a uh, confidence building exercise for our patients who might be having some hepatic involvement. <coughs> yeah, this is ab about uh, after hepatic, uh, this is about uh, yeah, it significantly decreased the HBO. So this is what I was saying. We need a medication which is effective. So you see it is, there is a significant drop in HbA1c and this is primarily which is being given for. Now in the evolution of this um, finding the suitable dosage, the two, this uh, five milligram was found to be most effective and if we, if we increase it to 10 milligram, the effect was not significantly high. So this is the most optimal dosage that is being prescribed, 5 milligram, and we are getting a significantly good drop in HbA1c. Now this is an evergreen study. This is uh, about, this was uh, uh, just to prove that it is not inferior to lenagliptin and uh, it was monitored by CGMS and what did we found out here that the changes in HbA1c from baseline to 12 weeks was significantly there. So uh, from baseline to week 12, the drop in HbA1c was 0.85 here with evogliptin and with linagliptin it was 0.75. Of course it was not statistically different but you can say that it is not inferior to linagliptin. So this is just to give us the required confidence. So the glycemic variability also is uh, much less with the evogliptin as far as linagliptin is concerned. Comparison with, so it is, again we can say it is not inferior to linagliptin. So efficacy and safety, if we give it with metformin, so <coughs> yeah. So it was, uh, this was a Korean trial and we, what we found out that evogliptin versus cetagliptin if we give, this was an Evolution India study. So in both the trials it was found out that it is uh, not, uh, not uh, inferior to cetagliptin. Uh, so again, a randomized uh, clinical double blind active control phase three trial to investigate efficacy and safety of evogliptin when added to metformin and it was found that the effect was increased. This, uh, yeah, in this study, this evogliptin 5 milligram when added to metformin, that is 1000 milligram, it improved the glycemic control and was well tolerated in subjects with type 2 diabetes and thus was not inferior to cetagliptin. You can see this comparison between evo and cetagliptin, uh, it, it was not inferior. Now this was an Indian study and again what has been shown that it is not inferior to cetagliptin as an add-on to metformin along when it was combined with 1000 milligrams of metformin. So this is just to give us confidence that it has been found effective in Indian population also. So this was a multinational global studies when it was added to metformin 1000 milligram, EVO demonstrated non-inferiority compared to CETA in terms of HbA1c reduction at week 12. So this is, you can see it is not significant. So again, once we add EVO and metformin to insulin therapy, we find that there is a reduction, there is a reduction in HbA1c to the significant extent of up to 1.2% and this leads to reduction in the insulin requirement. 
it uh, we, we find improved glycemic control and reduces body weight also in elderly patients and there is reduction in glucose fluctuations and number of insulin injections also once the requirement of insulin goes down we can reduce the number of pricks also sometimes if the patient basically is on say uh, multiple dosage So this is just to give us the confidence of safety. It was data from six studies, and the therapeutic adverse uh, events was not statistically different in patients receiving evagliptin as compared to controls. And there were no reports of pancreatitis. They were reported. And again, patients receiving evagliptin did not have increased risk of symptomatic and asymptomatic hypoglycemia. Now, this is a very important safety net that if person is not receiving sulfonylureas or insulin, there is absolutely no chance of having hypoglycemia. So this is what I was mentioning that this is a very safe medication if we are giving even from a remote site. So this is about efficacy in NAFLD. This we have already discussed before noon. This is a very common problem that we are having. Approximately 80% of study participants had moderate to severe fatty liver disease as assessed by ultrasonography. And the results were with the use of this molecule, we found that hepatic fat contained quantified but MRI was reduced by evogliptin. So, so far we did not have a molecule to our armamentarium to give to the patients having hepatic involvement, but here is a ray of hope that we can primarily give it to the persons who are having fatty liver. So summarizing friends, it's a truly once a day gliptin. It has optimal renal and hepatic safety without the need for any dose titration. It is superior to placebo and similar to linagliptin and A1C reduction with three head to head studies in people with background metformin therapy. It has been found to be non inferior when compared with cetagliptin, including an Indian study. Of course, there are no dedicated CVOT which has been conducted, but there is data that it, Im it improves cardiac health, that is, it decreases coronary mortality. This data is not here, but it is proven. So, however, evogliptin is still an innovator product in the era of generic cetagliptin. When we are having so many less expensive cetagliptin, we have is still a specifically manufactured evogliptin to our patients. Thank you very much, friends. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, doctor. Evogliptin seems to be a good addition to the existing gliptin and it establishes its safety in renal and hepatic condition. So I think it will be a future gliptin. Now over to the next topic. I give my co-chairman the mic. Sir, I have one question for you. Uh, as this particular molecule evogliptin is very much famous in the Eastern Asia and there are I just going through the data that there are lakhs and lakhs of data of real world is also available from Korea and Japan. Uh, there is another gliptin which is already approved in Japan once weekly gliptin, omaric gliptin. So you have any particular uh, quick comments on this particular molecule? There are a couple of other molecules which are in the pipeline but uh, I have not gone through the detailed analytical data regarding those. I will not like to comment about it. Sure. Th thanks a lot, sir. Any any question from audience? Single question? No? Okay, next. Yeah, so let me invite the next speaker. <coughs> Dr. Sandeep Rai is going to deliver his talk on arterial stiffness, an early metabolic marker. Can you have the introductory slide, please? Yeah. So, as you can see, Dr. Sandeep Rai is a very senior physician, uh, practicing in as a professor and uh, unit head in the Department of Medicine and Diabetes, Navi Mumbai. The senior consultant diabetologist at the Aporo Sugar Clinic. Is also head diabetes specialty care at Advanced Diabetes Center of Diabetes Care and Research. Is a keynote speaker at United Nations WHO sponsored global health conferences. Is an uh, invited national faculty at various national 
conferences like RSSDI, Epicon, and also APJ Abdul Kalam National Award uh, for Teaching and Research Publications. So we welcome you, sir. The stage is all yours. Yeah, so thank you, Chairpersons, for your very kind words of introduction. And when this topic was given to me, I knew Dr. Anuj and Dr. Narsing have put a task in front of me. Uh, I knew very little about this. I'll, uh, I'll uh, confess this. But I learned a lot in the last 10, 15 days, trying to read, uh, heard a lot of seminars, and uh, would try to give it in brief whatever I learned from this. So starting from metabolic syndrome, we know it's a constellation of multiple cardiovascular risk factors. And all these risk factors, they come on the background of insulin resistance. And what does this do? That's the common soil. It gives rise to cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes. Now, cardiovascular diseases are the top, uh, is the top cause of death in India, with about 40% of the people dying due to cardiovascular diseases. And this is not a, I mean, this is a, a slide which is entrenched in our minds. Young, young people uh, who are going away with heart disease. And CBD statics, uh, statistics in India tell that 25% of all heart attack patients are under age of 40 years, with about 50% under age of 50 years. And uh, what we see peculiarly in India is earlier onset of cardiovascular disease, especially in Southeast Asia, four times more likely. And this inter-heart study, which was done in 52 countries with all ethnic groups, including South Asians, they showed that 90% of people with cardiovascular diseases have about uh, nine risk factors which are in common. And out of those, uh, now we know how to prevent heart disease, we have to target these risk factors and these were the inter-heart study risk factors in which the common ones were dyslipidemia, high BP, diabetes, abdominal obesity. Now we know all of these, we know all of these, we are trying to also uh, uh, treat them and prevent them. But what is happening is we see a lot of people without diabetes hypertension getting coronary artery disease and lot of diabetic hypertensive dyslipidemic patients, they somehow escape coronary artery disease. So somewhere, some things we are missing. And this is a study by Dr. Kasliwal from Delhi. He says that low Frangimum score patients, he found low cardiovascular risk score despite high prevalence of metabolic syndrome. So if you see the cardiovascular continuum, high risk factors of metabolic syndrome like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, these are the risk factors. So what it first leads to is endothelial dysfunction. So, and after that, it causes the arteries to stiff, then your atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, plaque rupture, and MI. In this cardiovascular disease continuum, what we are missing is the first two, three stages. We are missing the people at endothelial dysfunction stage. We are missing the people at, uh, at the arterial stiffening stage. And what is happening is, that we are catching these people. You see, what we are doing as clinicians, when person comes to your clinic, we get alerted only when we see a strongly positive TMT. We say, oh, so strongly positive TMT, okay. Now he is scheduled for a cath lab, and let us see his lipids, his blood pressure, his diabetes, or all those things. So it is, it is just like saying, Catching a person with risk factors at, uh, in a stress test is just like saying discovering pregnancy in a labor room. So there has to be a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is that you have to now target at abnormal vascular health. Abnormal vascular health and the two parameters that target it are uh, endothelial dysfunction and, and your arterial stiffness. Endothelial function. We all know so many risk factors for it. It is the first thing that starts in your vessel. That is endothelial dysfunction. We have an easy way to do it. And uh, we compress an artery, cause the ischemia, if, and then release it after five minutes. If your artery is healthy, your endothelium will release nitric oxide. And your artery should dilate more than 8% of the, of the normal arterial diameter. Now, this was done by the uh, ultrasound. Now, it can be done in an office procedure. Even in a village, you can take this instrument and do and see endothelial dysfunction. And the second measure after endothelial dysfunction, which is gaining importance, is the pulse wave velocity. Now, this is a measure of arterial stiffness. 
and this is the gold, the pulse wave velocity is the gold standard of measuring artificial stiffness. Now what happens is this pulse was a was an integral part of our examination with the Ayurvedic physicians, the Yunani physicians and the Chinese all were seeing these pulse waves. Jules Mary invented the smigmograph. He was also seeing the pulse waves on a smoked paper and he was trying to calculate the BP by that method. People were using it but then then uh, Riva Rossi and uh, Korotkov they established the blood pressure taking techniques and what happened was then these things went into your uh, these two simple numbers systolic and diastolic easy to use so pulse analysis felt into disuse and now 100 years later Europeans have started recognizing it they are now saying that pulse wave velocity should be done and in 2013 hypertension guidelines they have added pulse wave velocity measured by carotid femoral way to be a important measure as they realize that your brachial blood pressure is not equal to your central blood pressure your aortic central blood pressure is the pressure your heart your brain and your kidneys is experiencing and more the central pressure more will be the end organ damage and it may not correlate with your brachial pressure so this is a seminal finding this is how pulse wave velocity is done simple you see the pulse you see the aortic pulse you see the femoral and see how much time it takes to travel this is done on a background of an ecg the ecg tells you where the uh, where your contraction has started from aortic to femoral you have to calculate what is the velocity the basic principle is heart will eject uh, the ventricle will eject the blood into the aorta aorta will create a pulse wave it will be traversing to the periphery and then the important part is there is a reflective wave the pulse wave reflects back and in a in a in a healthy person there is an incident wave and then there is a reflected wave and the two domes will be like this one in systole and one in diastole now so this will be a summation uh, graph so this is the now what happens is if your artery is stiff your reflective wave comes very fast the stiffer the artery the faster the flow the earlier the reflection and what will happen is that your uh, the reflected wave will come in, in in systole only not in diastole and what it causes it causes an augmented pressure so there is a p1 and then there is a p2 this p2 is the augmented pressure and look here how the graph looks in healthy people and how in diabetic people where you find that you have an augmented pressure. So your reflected wave coming in the systole will call an augmented pressure which you can see there and what part of it is of the pulse pressure it is with the augmentation index. So very briefly what you will see is a normal wave like this two humps one in systole one in diastole stiff artery you will find one exaggerated dome because your reflected wave has come back in systole only not only it is causing increased pressure to your end organs it is causing less diastolic flow so it is making you more prone to coronary artery disease and this is what we are showing that clinical implications is various organs your uh, uh, your heart your kidney your brain and this is the again the same thing increase systolic pressure increase lv after load increase myocardial oxygen demand, decrease pressure during the diastole and decrease coronary perfusion. So both ways you are getting a problem. And it is not only in heart disease that you are seeing it, you are seeing it in metabolic syndrome, you are seeing it in diabetes. And measuring, I already told you, carotid femoral distance, how much the pulse wave travel, you have various instruments to do that. We have various instruments, these are the various instruments, I won't name the companies. Uh, uh, because of conflict of interest, but there are various instruments that you can do now on the bedside and measure it. The clinical implication is that your brachial BP may not be the same as your central blood pressure. You see two patients here, light blue and dark blue, both brachial BP are 140-80, but one central BP is 136-80, the other is 115 by 80. So what we can learn from the morphology of the central pressure? These are the various studies. This aortic stiffness is a risk predictor. This is a study in Journal of uh, American Journal of Cardiology. These are the various figures showing that aortic pulse wave velocity improves cardiovascular event prediction. So preventive. So the first use is preventive. If you are detecting a stiff artery early in the course of the disease, 
and taking proper measures, including lifestyle measures and treatment, you are going to prevent a heart disease. So every diabetic you see, every pre-diabetic you see, every hypertensive you see, and every person with a history of premature coronary artery disease in the family, I think you should be doing a pulse wave velocity. You should try to do endothelial function, and if not that, a, a stiff, as you should see for arterial stiffness. What are the various studies? This is a strong study which showed, I won't go into the detail of the study, they have shown that if your central pressure, if your central pulse pressure is more than 50, if it is more than 50, then you are twice as likely to get CV events as when it is less than 50. So the central aortic pulse pressure is very important and it may not be the same as your brachial pulse pressure. This is a CAFE study, again 2,000 patients. What they have shown, this is a drug effect, they have shown that if you are using vasodilatation, uh, like if you are using drugs like perendropil, the ACE inhibitor, and amlodipine, in patients with same brachial blood pressure, you have used atenolol and a diuretic, and perendropil, and uh, you have used amlodipine. You are finding that you are not only decreasing the central aortic pressure more, you are decreasing the cardiovascular events by 30%. So 30% you can reduce. And these are again the same studies showing. Another study, the BP guide study, has again shown that guidance of hypertension management with, cert with central BP results in significantly different therapeutic pathway than conventional cuff BP. And not only your heart, the brain also, the white matter lesions, uh, the white matter hyperintensities, which lead to Alzheimer's disease, dementia early, are more related to your central pulse pressure, aortic pulse pressure, rather than your peripheral radial pulse pressure. So, so what are the uses of pulse? What are the uses of pulse wave velocity or measuring arterial stiffness? The first is preventive. As I told you, as early as you get the patient, do do his arterial stiffness and endothelial function. And you will be very, you will be able to prevent his cardiovascular, his kidney problems, his brain problems by a huge magnitude. So preventive is one. Second is treatment. In treatment of hypertension, it's very, very important. It can tell you a, a therapy in a younger asymptomatic individual whether it is required or not. It will tell you which class of antihypertensives are better. Now let us see this case. This is a 41-year-old male. He has stage 1 hypertension. He has stage one hypertension according to peripheral blood pressure. But if you measure, this is a little, little hazy slide, but if you measure the systolic pressure, central systolic pressure, it is well within the range. So the central pulse pressure is less than 50. Although he has a little high peripheral blood pressure, so what you can suggest is only lifestyle changes at this stage for him. Brachial and central correlate very well, but there is about 30% of the patients whose peripheral blood pressure will be okay and central may be high. And the difference of central to aortic blood pressure may be till 40 millimeters of mercury. Means your brachial systolic pressure may be higher than 40 than your central pressure. The diastolic remains the same. This is the second case, 72 year old male, brachial blood pressure 135 by, by 59 or 60. Now you won't think much about this. 72 year old male, 135 by 60, to treat or not to treat? you do his central, you try to see his central pressure by pulse wave velocity. And all the parameters you get in those reports are that he has a central pulse pressure of 64, more than 50 is a problem. He has a high augmentation index, he has a high augmentation pressure, so his treatment with vasodilatory drugs are needed, ACE, ARB, or, or uh, amlodipine, or their combination is the drug therapy for him. Now this is another case. This, this is a 57 year old male. Brachial blood pressure is 146.92. But if you see his augmented, augmentation parameters, they are low. They are low. And his augmentation index is low. His central pulse pressure is low. Central pulse pressure is low. So in this case, if this guy is already on, on, a, on a ASARB, no need of maxing ASARB. No need of increasing their dose because that is not going to make much difference. These vasodilator drugs is not going to make much difference because his pulse pressure aortic is okay. Here you may, if you need, can add a diuretic. So now, just as the time is finishing, so we have this, uh, 
these risk profilers, which are everywhere in the market, you can find it in any conference with these people doing it, they are validated instruments, I will not name any. You can do it in your clinic. Now they are more and more sophisticated. This is IIT Madras, which has made one, where you just put a probe on the carotid and you will find what are the various, your central aortic pressure, augmentation index, augmentation pressure. And these are the various things which Dr. S. V. Kulkarni was just mentioning, the artificial intelligence. You know you have variable sensors. You have variable sensors, flexible pressure sensors, fingerprint like ferroelectric films, all these fancy names where you can just veer and find out this central aortic pressure. And now a number of researchers have proposed non-contact techniques for measurement of pulse wave velocity and pulse wave form. These include the laser Doppler, vibrometer and the optical vibrocardiola. So friends, what I want to say, pulse wave analysis, pulse wave velocity, central pressure, are measures of arterial stiffness and are additive risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Measurement and easily is easy and can be done in office clinic and it adds to cardiovascular risk factors and also clinically to stratify hypertension management. A man is as old as his artery is the saying by Thomas Indiham and I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Because I thought it's post lunch and people may be yeah. speaking. Thanks a lot, sir, for such a practical presentation and uh, finishing in well in time. So because of lack of time, we are avoiding questions. Please, next session, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I would like to call upon Dr. J.K. Sharma, sir, and Dr. Jayan Sharma, sir, to chair the next session. Good afternoon to all. So after listening to these important sessions, we have another important session and the speakers are doins of the medical profession. Dr. N.K. Soni, I think everybody knows about Dr. N.K. Soni. He is the Vice President, Association of Physicians of India, National and Following his talk, we have Dr. Murugunathan, sir. Dr. Murugunathan, again, re requires no introduction, but it is customary to introduce Dr. N.K. Soni. He is fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, fellow of American College of Physicians, senior consultant in head Department of Internal Medicine at Yathart Super Specialty Hospital, Greater Noida. Past president, UP Diabetes Association, past chairman, RSSDI UP chapter, past president, Indian Association of Clinical Medicine, and number of publications and articles in the various books. So Dr. N.K. Soni will speak on what to do when it's time to let go. Hospitalist overview. Sir, as you already know, your time has been reduced slightly by the organizers. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. No issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And thanks to the organizers, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, Dr. Narsim Verma, and his team who have got an expertise in organizing wonderful conferences, wonderful CME programs, and great hospitality. Well, <coughs> in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be talking about what to do when it is time to let go, a hospitalist overview. This is what according to the theme of this conference comes that back to basics that we go. Although we know everything what we do, but still it is better to at least revise once again and remember whatever points we forget while we treating the terminally ill patients. Well, uh, as we all know that the principles of critical care 
are usually done with the intensive care management and the cornerstone of intensive care management falls in three categories. That first is that we should optimize the patient's physiology, that how his organs are working, whether heart condition, is, what is the heart condition like, what is the condition of his GI, what is the condition of his lungs and others. So we should assess exactly the physiology of these patients altogether. And then we should have the provision of advanced organ support whether we want to provide a BiPAP, CPAP support or we want to put the patients on ventilator or there is a rice tube to be put in and likewise. And finally, we should also know, identify and treat the underlying pathological process that what the disease process the patient is having. But then in accomplishing all these, we should best achieve through the multidisciplinary team approach. Individual, you can't do all this. And the shared responsibility is between the admit, ad, admitting consultant in charge as well as the specialized critical care team. So the coordination between these two is all the more important for the betterment and the care of the patients. Well, the three goals for the medical care are once we try to cure the patients of the disease process and we want that the patient should be all right. The second is if we are not able to cure properly, we try to stabilize the functioning of the organs and we try to stabilize the blood pressure if it is hypotension and likewise. And third, if we are not able to do even that, then we prepare the patient for a com comfortable and dignified death. Well, end of life care is the term which is used to describe the support and the medical care given during the time surrounding the death of the patients. And this type of care doesn't happen only in the moments before breathing ceases and the heart stops. Rather, elderly people often live with one or more chronic illnesses and need significant care for days, months, or even years altogether. So naturally, it is a continuous process. It is not a momentous process which we should look for, and that is how we should treat these terminally ill patients. Now, caring for the dying patients, transition in the care from attempting to heal the patient to caring for them near death can be difficult for everyone involved. And that is why I say that three C's are very important for the care of the terminally ill or for any medical profession. First is the competence that the patient first see is the competence. That the, that the doctor should be competent enough to deal with these terminally ill patients and take a, a care of the patient in the intensive care. The second C is the compassion that the, patient, the, the doctor should have that zeal and enthusiasm to, to treat these patients properly and with a lot of care and sympathy. And of course, the third C stands for communication, that communication may involve even the verbal communication as well as written communication where we need to prepare all the drafts and consent is to be taken from the patients, informed consent, and other legal documents which must be prepared. So these three C's I think are very important for all the clinicians to practice and for the caring of the dying patients, <coughs> it is the transition in the care from attempting to heal the patient to caring from them near death and that can be difficult for everyone involved, maybe a clinician, maybe a nursing staff, maybe a hospital staff, maybe patient himself of course, as well as the relations. So healthcare providers sometimes feels that if their job is done, once the, they feel that the patient cannot be further cured and they drop out of the patient care leading to the patient and their loved ones feel abundant as near death. So patient and their loved ones wish for guidance on the complex changes that the patient is going through emotionally as well as physically and that is why it is all the more important for the, for the clinicians to be little more concerned about all the aspects of the patient's care once the patient is in ICU. The principles of a doctor's role in the terminal care, yes, the, there should be 
an attempt for the symptom control of the symptoms and the relief which we should give to the patients as well as we should communicate properly with the patients never isolate the patient as such we should not say the to the relations that we should talk outside as the patient will be listening patient should not be ignored and we should involve the patient in the discussion itself and explaining all the disease processes as well as the care avoidance of inappropriate therapy is very very important the support of the relatives this is a teamwork and the teamwork involves the hospital staff the physiotherapists the social workers as well as the team of the critical care medicine as well as the consultant in charge under whom the patient is admitted and continuity of care on the regular visits that is very very important uh, because it gives a moral support even to the patients as well as to the relatives all together so how should we share the bad news the f we should find an appropriate setting and the time one should be very well prepared about the disease process the outcomes because these are the questions which can come from the patient's relations and the doctor should be prepared enough to answer all these questions ask the patient we should one the clinician should ask the patient who should be present and we should take the advice of the patients also that which relative he wants that should be there for the discussion of his prognosis as well as the treatment part uh, be brief and simple align what do you know as well as one should be honest enough to explain about the disease process and the outcome one should have the patience to listen to the from the relations also and sometimes what happens that once we know that we are not able to cure the patient we lose our patience altogether we should support we should support day in and day out and of course we should offer the next steps also we should explain to the relations that this patient might be put on the ventilatory support or whatever is to be done next as well as the documentation need not to say that these are very important aspect in the terminally ill patients care where counseling of the relative relatives the family members of the patients who are in the intensive care units they encounter many psychological problems many psychological crisis they are under stress as well as depression and one study has shown that more than 43 percent of the relatives of the patient who had been uh, in icu in intensive care units had high level of depressive symptoms even a year after the discharge of the patient well advanced care planning should be done the, we should arrange a private setting and a sufficient time for the explaining of all the pros and cons of the disease process and the outcome it should not be a crowded setting where the patient may not like to discuss his disease process among other attendants so we should have a private setting determine what the patient and the family know about the illness and the prognosis and accordingly we should try to explain to them in detail we should not give them the false hopes but at the same time we should not you know dissociate ourselves from further management exploring what they are hoping for and what the team can and cannot do to meet the expectation we should explain in detail suggesting realistic goal and indicating how they can be achieved and explicitly addressing unreasonable and unrealistic expectation we should not put forward to them and respond empathically to emotional reactions and making plans and follow through whether the patients they they want to take him home even in the home care should be we should try to help them to arrange for the home care as well total patient assessment and the management must be done whether physical assessment for pain dyspnea insomnia nausea vomiting whatever symptoms the patient is having in the terminal stage we should look for and try to deal these symptoms very amicably psychological assessment of anxiety depression delirium art should be done and even social assessment whether relationship with their with their family members even their financial status that should be taken into consideration and of course a spiritual assessment and counseling is, is is must be done to these patients all together as far as the symptom controls are concerned ensure that the patient and the family are aware that play, pain will be controlled and there is a great fear of pain and painful death in the patient's attendant's mind so we should try to alleviate those symptoms sort uh, start energy early regularly and in appropriate dose don't afraid of 
using opiates and control other system, uh, other symptoms like cough, dyspnea, sleeplessness, or even constipation. Usually, these are the common symptoms which terminally ill patients they 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 encounter too. Even communication, as I've told you, that above all, give the patients time to talk of his fears and his problems. Be honest and truthful if the if you are questions and but you should not answer very pessimistically. It's a gentle truth that is generally the best way to answer <coughs> and adopt a kind and sympathetic approach, not refraining from touching the patients. Probably in the last two years after the COVID, we have gone back and we have avoided touching the patients, but touching the patients, physical touch gives a lot of soothing to these patients, respect his religious conviction, Never say there is nothing more can I do. This is the usual sentence or proverb which we use. But don't raise false hopes, but reassure the patients that whatever best possible can be done, it will be done. And patient, physical, uh, physicians and patient communications, the, does the making implementation as well as documentation of the treatment decision is the practice of critical care medicine the communication and interaction between the critical care physicians and critically ill patients involves informed consent and risk management, which should all be noted down and documentation is very legal. Legally, one should be strong <coughs> and documentation is a very important aspect. Well, avoidance of inappropriate therapy is a very, very important part because that makes all the more legal issues and, you know, the, the issues with the management as well as in the patients, consider the time and question the needed for any invasive palliative measures such as intravenous infusion, putting the patients on the ventilatory support, BiPAP or CPAP supports. So current medication assessment and non-essentials should be discontinued. Unnecessarily medication, higher dose of antibiotics, up higher up antibiotics should not be used. Blood test, even investigations, antibiotics, intravenous fluids, turning regimens, vital signs, these are all import important aspects which we know, but then sometimes we forget in our busy daily practice, we forget to follow some of these and we should always remember. And at the end, we should respect the patient's wishes. Supporting the family members is all the more important and five steps approach to improving the communication in ICU with the families starts with the value we stand for value with the family statement, acknowledge the family emotions, L for listen to the family, understand patients as a person and elicit family questions. So these are the values which one should practice while treating the terminally ill patients. As a teamwork, involve one or more members of the team, night nurses, health visitors, home help, occupational therapy, social workers or physiotherapists, they all should be involved in the terminally ill patient's care so that he can pass off peacefully and not very uncomfortable. Do not forget an appropriate religious help altogether. So ensure that the patient and the relatives know that someone will always be available in the night and day to help them and visit regularly to provide the support. Do not abandon the patients. So my dear friends, the Cooker Ross stages of dying involves five stages of the model where the, the, the doctor can help in the patients and caregivers by explaining five stages of response to impending death. First stage is denial and isolation where the patient says it can't be he that he has got a terminally ill. And second stage is anger that he says that why me? The third is the bargaining where the patient says that just let me do this first and then let me go. The fourth is the acceptance of the illness and the terminal stage and where the patient goes in depression with the withdrawal and crying and grieving. And finally, he accepts that it is the end of the life and a sense of peace comes to the patient. So these are the five stages where the patient goes from illness to the terminal stage. So my dear friends, my last slide, and I think I have, I have completed well in time, that a conclusion is that the physicians have a very important role in the later stage or last stage of the person's life. Free and open communication with the patient and his family are very important. 
every possible support will need to be provided to alleviate visible sufferings, avoidance of futile measures which increases the patient's suffering and drain the family's resources can be achieved by guiding the patient and his family by a physician who is perceived to be very involved and that is very, very important. Do everything from the caring family may sweeten be converted to do everything useful by a sensible physician. So in the end, I would like to say that let the patients know that why should he die before death comes. So naturally, if we give a very supportive role, we play a very supportive role and give a moral booster as well as physical support to these patients, they die a very peaceful death. And I think that is what a clinician is expected by the medical ethics also that a clinician should for perform. Well, with this, I would like to end my talk and would like to thank all of you for a patient listening. And thank you, Anuj, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your nice deliberation and properly complete the session in the respected time. Thank you. So as we are running shortage of time, as the, from the organizing committee, we have been decided. So without wasting time, I would like to request the next speaker, Dr. Mugranathan, sir, who himself is the doyen of this, our faculty and who does not need any introduction in, among the physicians in India. Dr. Morganathan, sir. Thank you, Chairperson yeah. Jain Sarma. I, at the outset, I congratulate, compliment, appreciate, and applaud Dr. Anuj Mageshwari, Srinivasamurthy, Narsingh Verma, and all the team for the excellent uh, scientific feast. With this, I, I, I now take my topic Empathy, the most critical skill in medicine. I asked Anuj why you have chosen me to give this topic. He said, Nobody else wants to talk to this topic, so you'll talk. I said, okay. So this is a very interesting topic because, uh, you know, m most of you are MRCP. I'm an MRCP examiner. Rajesh Ubadiya will agree with me. Empathy is a very important in the st station two and four. When you go for a stu as a student, you must know about empathy. Otherwise, they will fail you. Because, you know, once uh, last, last 10 day 15 days back, I was an MRCP examiner. Uh, the patient uh, gave a history. He said, my father, uh, I, I lost my father a, a week ago. And then uh, the, the candidate did not show any, any, any emotion. And you know, he was keeping quiet. Then you know, the examiner found fault with him. He said, you know, he didn't, he didn't show empathy or sympathy. So in the exam, you expect, and the students supposed to learn about empathy. So it's a good thing Anuj has uh, taken this topic. I wish a lot of postgraduates are there, but unfortunately not there. So next time, I think Veena, Rajesh Ubadiya, and myself, can do a skit, you know, how to train the students in empathy. We have a skit, like a role model acting. So that we'll do, because Veera is also an expert in empathy. Okay, the uh, background, if you see the medical education, literature on teaching, non-verbal detection and expression of empathy not covered satisfactorily. Non-verbal as aspects of communication become more crucial where langu language proficiency may be limited. And with the increasing cultural diversity of patients visiting hospitals, you should have non-verbal. Subtle non-verbal communication such as gestures, body position, eye gaze, including empathy, may be the critical entry point for important trust building element in physician-patient relationship. What is empathy? Empathy is action of understanding, compassion, and being aware of another person's feeling and emotions. Simply, Empathy is the ability to step into someone else's shoes and to feel and understand their needs. In medicine, empathy is sometimes defined as a communication skill or as an emotional experience in which physicians identify and transiently experience their patient's emotional state based on visual and verbal hues. The empathy and effective communications requires more than understanding. The understanding you have must convey to the patient so that they know you understand patient feelings. And then without judgment being right or wrong. Empathy helps patients come to trust as you as someone who cares about their welfare. It also helps patients understand their own feelings more clearly. In addition, empathetic response facilitates the patient's own problem-solving ability. 
If they are allowed to express their feelings in a safe atmosphere, patients may begin to feel more in control by understanding their feelings better. Every human being has a longing to be seen, understood, and appreciated. There are four key features of empathy. One is called understanding. It is cognition. The second one is feeling. It's affective. Third is communication, behavioral. And fourth is intention to help, altruism. Therefore, recognize, experience, demonstrate willingness to help. Four steps to, to foster empathetic, com, uh, com, empathetic com, uh, communication. I've already given you a short form. And why it is important to have empathy? It's an important social skill and clinical skill. The neurobiology of empathy. Empathy really activates the reward centers of the brain and neuronal hormonal effects, mirror neurons. Evidence suggests that it produces more enduring happiness. That is why if you are empathy, if you are empathetic, your burnout is reduced. That's why I told Srinivasa Murthy in the survey, ask about empathy because that will give you more enduring happiness, that there is a center in the brain. And WHO definition is, uh, I already told you the same thing, WHO definition. And then what is the difference between sympathy and empathy? People think sympathy and empathy are same. Differently, sympathy is understanding others' pain, whereas empathy is feeling others' own pain. I'll give you a normal example. You go in a car, in, you see a road uh, traffic accident. Some of us will see the accident and say, <coughs> and we'll drive. That is only sympathy. But if you have, like Rajesh Ubadhyaya, he'll at least call 1048 and say, bring the ambulance. That's action. So that is empathy. If not, you get down and you know, help the patient. So many people are sympathetic but not empathetic. And you know, this is the acknowledge someone is distressed. I'm sorry you are lost. But you know, you have to feel the patient's uh, pain. That is empathy. And there are a lot of differences between empathy and sympathy. I don't want to go into do much detail. Empathy is beyond sympathy. It is an intellectual attribute. Uh, this is again a, a diagrammatic picture. Why? What is empathy and what is sympathy? Now, please learn this skill. The, the Masters uh, uh, Boston Hospital has got a tool. What is empathy? E-M-P-A-T-H-Y. My friend Sony said value. I'm giving empathy as a E for eye control, M for muscles of facial expression, P for posture, A for affect, T for tone of voice, H for hearing the whole patient, U for Y for y, your response. So you should have a posture also. When somebody says something wrong, you should at least show your posture, must explain. And your tone of voice, you have to have modulation. Don't, don't do that. You know, you always say, I'm very sorry, I don't know. Like that, you know, your tone must be, you should not talk in a big way. And hearing the whole patient, that is the E-F-P-T-H-Y. This tool is used in Massachusetts Hospital. And there are Jefferson scale of empathy. You can scale. There are 20 statements are there. There are two versions, one for the medical students, another for the physician. I don't want to go into the details, but the, you please understand there is a measurement possible, Jefferson scale of empathy. And this important skill is addressed with a novel teaching tool for assessing non-verbal behavior using the acronym Randomized Control Trial of Empathy Training at Matthews Hospital in 2021, so 2010 and 2012. The practice points for empathy, non-verbal body orientation, eye contact, active listening. This is non-verbal. Verbal, paraphrasing and mirroring patients' words, recognize patients' feelings, asking clarifying questions. Our, uh, uh, previous speaker also said you should ask questions. So this is practicing empathy. Then uh, empathy is, uh, you know, example, I don't want to go into the examples. Now, three types of empathy. Please understand, there are three types of empathy. One is called cognitive. The second one is called emotional. And third one is called compassionate. The comp cognitive is simply knowing how other persons feel. Emotional, also known as affective empathy, when you feel, when you feel physically along with the other person. Compassionate or empathetic concern goes beyond simply understanding and offering. It actually moves you to take action. So empathy, three types of empathy, cognitive, emotional, and empathetic. The cognitive is desire to understand. Emotional empathy is desire to feel. And then compassionate empathy is desire to help and support. And you know, imagine a, person, a friend has recently lost a close family friend, uh, member. Your natural reaction may be sympathy, a feeling or pity or a sorrow. 
Sympathy may move you, may move you to express condolence or send a card and your friend may appreciate these actions. But showing empathy is different. You, you know, you, start, you must say, who did they lose? How close they were? Besides feelings of pain, loss, how will their lifelong life now changes? Emotional empathy, you try to connect with something else. Suppose he says, uh, my, I have lost my mother. You must think, when my, uh, I lost my mother, what was my feeling? So you have to compare your feeling with them. That is emotional. Finally, when somebody says his mother is lost, you not only feel all that, you should go to his house, see what you can do. You can give them a meal or you can support them for a mortuary van, etc., etc. So this is three types of em 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 empathy. So empathy, understanding, sharing, expressing, and reflecting and taking action, attitude. So this is empathy. Now, with empathy, we don't direct, we follow. Don't just do something, be there, that is empathy. Empathy, understanding, sharing. A patient is shown empathy more likely to feel emotionally connected to the doctor. How it is useful in the practice. A doctor's ability to establish an empathetic understanding of their patient situation is considered essential to the development of therapeutic relationship. When a physician like, you know, uh, Diora, Colonel Diora, if empathetic patients offer more detailed history, they are more satisfied with your care, they are more adherent to the treatment plans and they are less likely to sue malpractices. Empathetic physicians also benefit from better health, well-being, and job satisfaction. Expressing empathy is highly effective, powerful, which builds patient's stress, calms anxiety, improves health outcomes. So this is the paper which says occupational burnout and empathy influence blood pressure control in primary care physicians. They did a study for more than 3 lakh patients, about 400 uh, doctors. They found empathy definitely plays a role in reducing burnout and blood pressure control. Again, communicating empathetically in increases clinician job satisfaction, enhanced sympathetic empathetic care, also increases the physician, physician's well-being. Em empathetic clinical communication improves the quality of all interactions, not only with the doctors, with others, patients, families, colleagues, and loved ones. 82% of the medical malpractice claims are the result of breakdown in communication. The prevalence of somatoform disorders has been estimated to be as, as high as 30% and can only be diagnosed by a physician who is carefully attuned to the patient. Then I, the, the, the importance of empathy, it increases patient satisfaction, improve clinical health uh, outcomes, reduce clinicians burnout, increase reimbursement, improve team collaboration, reduce malpractice claims. It is good for the patient, it is good for the physician, it is good for the institution and be actively promoted, supported, and cultivated in the profession. And this is again another paper which says importance of empathy among medical doctors to ensure high quality healthcare level. And what are the benefits of connecting with empathy? When a patient recognizes both clinical competence and caring demonstrated by empathy, trust develops. When Bhattacharya talks to the patient, he's not only clinically competent, he also shows that he cares. So his trust with the patient improves. Uh, these are the benefits of empathy, better care, better workplace, better health, improved immune function also. If you have empathy, that also improves Im immune function, decreased health care and cost. And can empathy be learned? Because uh, now the uh, Divya is thinking, why we not uh, you know, train our his PGs, RPGs, empathy? You can train. Like the development of social skill, the key to empathy is learning experience, learning and practice. How can we develop and build empathy? Learning about the benefit of empathy, listening to the people's feeling, understanding your own emotions. Now, teaching and learning empathy. If you have an observation skill, you enhance the observation skill that make it easier for the uh, doctor to detect patient's emotional state. While improving communication skills should help a physician convey his feelings to the patient. The actual emotional process of empathy may be aided by exercise such as self-reflecting or writing, which helps an observer become more aware of her own emotions and subsequently improve her ability to be empathetic towards another. These physicians who practices deep acting technique may over time learn to be genuinely empathic, empathetic and thus teaching acting may be a method of teaching empathy. That's what I was telling you. You can have a skit. And teaching course, empathy and medical professionalism in a course 
the course uh, contains lessons in cultural awareness, ethics, discussions, role playing, in which we acted parts of physician patient. Several sessions were uh, taught, and they are asked to give a written self-reflection form. Medical college teaching, now it is disease-oriented. When it comes to patients, think with your head, not with your heart. Be objective when dealing with the patient. Do not let your own emotions. Keep your own emotions at bay, lest you become too involved. This is akin to alexithymia. Methods of teaching, audio, and I already told you, improving narrative skills, theatrical performance, role playing, valiant method, group discussions coordinated by psychoanalysts. The need of our, therefore, my dear friends, patient-centric rather than disease-centric area. This is another point which I would like to drive home. Now, empathy exercise. We have exercise for empathy. The models are there. In ACP, we have a modules. So if you want, you ask Anuj, he can get you the module of ACP, how empathy can be developed. If a physician regularly take time to reflect their practice and patient care, they can in sense refresh and reminded in the importance role played by the patients. These reflections can be the, the on being a doc on being a doctor and a piece of my mind. These are there in Annals of Internal Medicine and Journal of the American Medical Association. If you see the journals, these two topics are there. A lot of articles are there. You can read those articles about the empathy. And then uh, listen to the people. I always say this is my mantra. Learn to listen, listen to learn. Not only in the empathy, for everything. Learn to listen and listen to learn. Then listening with empathy. There are, uh, you know, we always uh, spend more time. Sorry. Some stuck. We always, uh, you know, say we don't have time. We do more paperwork than talking to the patient. So do less paperwork, talk to the patient. There are eight steps of listening. Listen with under, uh, underlying feelings. Listen for understanding the needs and values. And also look for the cues. Reflect on your experience. Eight steps for learning. And this is the listening with empathy. There are a lot of values you have add. And especially empathy, you always respect, acceptance, and support. And the largest barrier to emphatic care is not enough time. More pressing issues do not want to be a social worker. I am not a social worker. Why should be empathetic? So you should be also, to a certain extent, social worker, talk to the patient. Where does the empathy come from? Is it generic, genetic, or do we learn empathetic over time? Recent studies suggest both genetics and our environment play a role in how each of us develop in the process of empathy. Certain parts of our brain tend to regulate empathy. Therefore, some people's ability to develop empathy can be more difficult if that area of the brain is not properly functioning. Our environment, the majority of studies suggest our environment tends to make a largest impact on each of us in developing empathy. And we have learned from extensive research the capacity for empathy is not merely an innate trait. It is also a skill that can be learned and expanded. Empathetics was founded with the mission to expand empathy and compassion by teaching individuals and teams how to understand, appreciate, and respond to perspective and emotion of others. Understanding your own emotions will build the empathy. So you love yourself first. You do empathy for yourself. I want the organizers to be empathetic to me. At least two minutes you give me, because you know, you already uh, given me only 16 minutes, uh, that too last minute you said, so I, I rushed to at least. Okay, if you want to understand the emotions of others, you have to learn to empathize with yourself, which is, the, which is done by understanding and accepting your own feelings and expressing them. So the good news about empathy is what when it declines. Over a period of time, Bina was talking to me, it declines, so it can also be learned. Patients who don't feel cared about longer recovery rates and poorer Im immune function. Empathetics offer evidence-based educational tools and skills to build both individual and team empathetic capacities to create a more authentic emotional connection with others in every healthcare. So empathy matters in every corner. Let us develop important skill and create more empathetics. So the power of empathy. Don't say not alone, I see you. And conclusion, empathy among healthcare users and professionals significantly contributes to how both groups behave as well as to their therapy and overall well-being. The development of empathy skills constitutes an important priority 
in education of health, social care students and should be encouraged. Educational programs should primarily be performed in hands-on the way that will strengthen the students' personal and social skills and allow them to effectively communicate with their patients. Summing, summing up with this quote, be kind for everyone you meet is a fighting a hot battle. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, you know, in practice, everyone should practice empathy and we should have, we should uh, include this empathy in the curriculum of the students and students from the beginning, they should learn and over a period of time, they may develop compassionate fatigue. That also can be trained and we can uh, do this. If you are really empathetic, you get more practice and you get a more patient uh, relationship, uh, patient doctor's relationship also. So ladies and gentlemen, my dear brothers and sisters, I request all of you be empathetic, be sympathetic and be kind to everyone and uh, support our ACP for all these programs. Congratulations once again to Anuj. Thank you so much. If I'll, I'll be happy if you ask one question at least. I know the Charma will say no time, but it's one question on empathy so that I understand that somebody has got empathy because Veena is also there. She will also answer. Thank you so much, Anuj. Thank you. All. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, super. Very good. That is your experience. Good. Nice. So what he says, whenever you visit a patient, you should be a, like a patient. I, that's why I said you put, in, you put yourself into the soul of the, I mean, shoe of the other person. That is what you said. Good. That's nice. Thank you very much for that understanding. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your nice deliberation. Nothing to say. So now I request Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, sir, for the next the co-formulation insulin in Indian realities from published evidence to practical experience. So everybody knows about the Anuj Maheshwari sir, who is the prime person of this conference. So without any delay, requesting sir to start the Thank talk. you. Thank you, Chairperson, for the kind introduction. And this is the sponsor talk. So I had to be, uh, I'm bound to speak that. So agenda of this talk shall be completed in three parts. One is the type 2 diabetes in India, what are the key challenges? Another is the solution, innovation that suits best to Indian reality. And third is the simplifying insulin regimen practical recommendations. <laughs> so we all know that we are the carbohydrate eater in country. 61 to 70% energy intake of the Indian is through carbohydrate present in the diet. And because of what we are, <coughs> we are governed by the postprandial glycemia may it be the near to target or it is further to target of HbA1c. So whenever it is a time to addressing the key realities of the managing diabetes in India, of course the high intake of the carbohydrate is one of the important reason because of our high baseline postprandial glucose value always remains with the type 2 diabetes patients in India. <coughs> we are having a, a very uh, unique kind of the phenotype that is the Asian Indian phenotype in which we see that higher waist circumference, higher total and visceral fat, hyperinsulinemia and obviously likely insulin resistance must be there. Delayed initiation of the insulin therapy is another very important reason. Need for the simple and con convenient insulin regimen is the need of the hour which is required for the intensification of the treatment with same insulin which insulin regimen can address all these requirements what I just enumerated. Addressing the key realities of the managing diabetes in India, suitable for high carbohydrate diet, that should be offering good postprandial control. It should be suitable in case of the delayed insulin therapy and it must be very convenient and easily give the total control. Obviously the basal insulin does not fulfill all these requirements. Then co-formulation can be a choice in which we have the combination of the basal as well as prandial insulin. So let us now understand more about the co-formulation insulin. Come over to the second part of our talk that is the solution. So once we talk about the solution that IDAGS which is a combination of Diglutac which is a basal insulin or long acting insulin with the S part which is a prandial insulin. And this combination of the quick release prandial insulin with slow release basal insulin gives uh, the ideal uh, 
therapy which can fulfill the requirements of the Indians, those who are the carbohydrate eater, basically. What exactly happens in this particular type of the insulin, which is the combination of co-formulation of the deglutac and aspart, called as IDEG-ASP, once it is injected to the subcutaneous space, it breaks down into the IDEG hexamers and ISP hexamer. That is the deglutac hexamer and aspart, aspart hexamer. And what we see then, phenol diffuses quickly and it IDEG dihexamers link up with via single chain contacts to form long multi-hexamers and thus it uh, fulfills the basal requirement as well as the prandial requirement are fulfilled by the aspart component that is rapidly absorbed, fast onset and short duration glucose lowering action. So once a day IDEG ASP, once a day digludec aspart combination usually remains a ideal combination with distinct prandial and basal glucose lowering effect. This component has a insulin digludac component has a flat and an even evenly distributed pharmacokinetic profile over 24 hours while aspart component has a fast onset of the appearance and a peak covering the prandial phase. So once we go for the evidences insulin initiation in once a day dose compared with IDEG ASP or this co-formulation with the conventional basal insulin. Half of the patient has been included in IDEG ASP arm which has been given after the oral antidiabetic agents and remaining half has been compared with the IGLAR or Glargine U100 which was the conventional basal insulin. Obviously the fasting plasma glucose control <coughs> was similar in with 70% basal component but what we could see that 1.4% Superior HbA1c reduction could be achieved with the IDEG ASP and probably it was because of the better prandial correction. IDEG ASP provided superior long-term glycemic control compared to the IGLAR or Glargine with similar fasting correction. Once a day, I deglutac aspart combination when it has been compared with the basal insulin, what we could see that uncontrolled postprandial glucose excursion could lead to oxidative stress and endothelial dysfunction in the patient, those who were using the basal insulin, which was not supported by the prandial correction. So again, what we could see that when IDEGAS dosing is timed with the major meals of the day, the bolus insulin component safely curbs the postprandial glucose excursion. IDEG has significantly reduced mean self-measured glucose level and postprandial glucose compared to the basal insulin. What we could see that changes in the mean self-measured glucose, not only with the correction of the fasting, but also the postprandial glucose. What we could that highly, uh, uh, when, when uh, the glutac aspart combination has been used, it derived high higher time in range as compared to the basal insulin alone. It was associated with significantly greater with time in range, greater duration the time in range as compared to the without increase in the uh, duration in a time below range. So there was no hypoglycemia it was said. A smart study design in which what we could see that participants, those who received this IDEG ASP combination and they have studied for uh, uh, in 40 centers of the India for about 0, 3 and 6 and 12 months, around 12 months study data has been collected at baseline then third month, 6 months and 12 months and key inclusion criteria were that men and women with diabetes aged more than 18 years, those who are scheduled to start the treatment with this particular molecule, uh, this particular preparation which was including the deglutac and aspart combination. What we could see after initiation of this combination changes in HbA1c from the baseline and this showed effective control of the HbA1c with 1.8 percent reduction and this was much better than patient those who have been treated with the oral anti-diabetic agent. Change in the fasting plasma glucose from the baseline was, uh, was around 50.4 milligram per deciliter and change in postprandial glucose from baseline what we could see that post breakfast it was reducing 82.5 milligram per deciliter and post lunch it was reducing 74.2 milligram per deciliter. So we could see less number of the hypoglycemic episodes may be confirmed hypoglycemia or severe hypoglycemia we could not see even the severe hypoglycemia even a single episode in the visit 4. So RSSDI ESI guidelines also recommends that this 
I guess as a choice for the insulin initiation whenever you are uh, willing to start insulin. Avoid using insulin as a threat. Alleviate patient anxiety about insulin and insulin therapy should be considered in all patients failing to achieve glycemic targets on three oral agents. So initiate, optimize and then intensify with a single device and single preparation. So now come over to the third agenda that is simplifying insulin regimen, what are the practical recommendations? A simple and convenient solution is the IDEGS, the glutac aspired combination, which not only gives you a meal time and meal related flexibility, but this is the power of a single solution, two in one. So practical recommendation, if above fasting plasma glucose target, then add two units, if it is set the uh, target of the fasting plasma glucose, then you don't need to do anything, continue with the whatever you are doing. If below fasting plasma glucose, then can, can reduce to unit. Whenever we are uh, considering for the titration of the blood glucose, what we should do that for the basal insulin, we, uh, for the basal correction, we should look for the fasting plasma glucose. And whenever it is the prandial correction, it is pre-dinner or fasting plasma glucose next day could be a better. So whenever you are using the once a day, I guess it is better to uh, check the fasting plasma glucose whenever you are using a twice a day, I guess it is better to choose pre-dinner and fasting plasma glucose to check. So consider I guess in patients with type 2 diabetes, patient failing to achieve glycemic control despite optimizing non-insulin therapies, patient with postprandial glucose spike patient at increased risk of the hypoglycemia, including nocturnal hypoglycemia patient who may benefit from a reduced injection burden or a less complex regimen patient requiring flexibility in the timing of insulin dosing. So summarizing the talk, high carbohydrate diet re resulting in the high postprandial glucose levels is a common Indian reality. Insulin therapy if complex has its own limitation as a result and insulin regimen that fits into the patient's life can help offer better glycemic control through improved adherence and IDAGASP is a simple and convenient solution which offers total control of postprandial glucose and fasting plasma glucose in people with type 2 diabetes, those who are uncontrolled on multiple oral anti-diabetic drugs. Thank you very much for your kind listening. I hope no question you will ask me because uh, whatever you question, you are free to ask me any question outside the hall. I am available to give you all answers, <laughs> whatever you want, uh, because we are running late, so would like that. Thank you, all my speakers. So as we are running short of time, we're closing this session and requesting organizer to carry forward the next session. Thank you, all of you. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Uh, Mukulesh Gupta, sir, and Dr. Taraknath Banerjee, sir, to please come on to the stage and continue the next session. Hello. So I'm informed that in place of Dr. Heman Thakkar, uh, probably, yeah, Dr. Srinivas Murthy will be taking his talk. So I don't think uh, we need to introduce Dr. L. Srivast Murthy. He is the organizing secretary for this wonderful conference. So in, uh, in the interest of time, I'll straight away ask him to go on with this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mukesh, for the kind words. And we're going to talk about the glycemic variability and how do you come up in real world practice setting with the available newer insulins. That's the topic. And uh, because of this molecule, I faced in 2012 the first US FDA inspection in my center. So I cannot forget this molecule. So I think that's why, with absence of the Kremon Tucker, I've got this. Can I have the slides, please? Murphy's loss, you know, whenever we are late, all these things happen. You know Murphy's loss. When you're in a queue, the other queue moves faster. When you're in the other queue, this queue moves faster. And if you're in a queue which moves faster, then you're in the wrong queue. Thank you. So 
ameliorating the glycemic variability and staying in range with ultra long acting basal analog insulins. The financial disclosure was for Dr. Tucker. I am not getting paid anything for this. <laughs> so the glycemic variability, we're talking about the key concept, the implications, and the role of ultra long basal analog. We know the glycemic variability, the definition I'm sure this August gathering does not require any introduction as this. This is the disadvantage of the glycemic variability, wherein you see the peaks and troughs and which will not be measured in routine clinical practice without CGM. And the within day, <coughs> within day variability of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia is missed. You can see two patients profile which are shown here as patient A, sorry sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We are running a competition with our governor, so. <laughs> so the within day variability, the intraday variability will not be picked up as you can see there, the so much fluctuations with intraday and interday variability, which in routine clinical practice we're not able to measure. These are the measurement indices, the amplitude of glycemic excursions, the time spent outside range, and includes both, that is how you measure. So the amplitude is, as it's clearly indicated, the standard deviation and coefficient of variation, these are all statistical numbers, while most physicians in clinical practice are familiar with the use of standard deviation, <coughs> the GV-related research ut utilizes the CV, that is SG divided by the mean is something coefficient of variation. Now, the measuring the GV, how do you do it practically? the time spent outside the target, that is the time spent in hypo or hyperglycemia as a measure of glycemic variability. So the international consensus, what do they talk about this? Through the CGM, they've defined this incremental 5% increase in this TIR is associated with clinically significant benefits for both type one and type two. This is the international consensus published in Diabetes Care in 2019 where you have to spend 70 to 80, 180 milligrams target range and more than 50% in type one older or high risk type two diabetes or in type one and type two, in general it is more than 70% of the times you need to spend in the range of 70 to 180. That's called time in range or TIR. Time above range, there are two segments again, more than 180, more than 250, that is less than 25% less than 5%, that is what you should spend. So the people should have less in that. And of course, time below range, I'm talking only about the first bar, and that is 4% and 1% respectively, below 70 and below 54. Below 54 is called severe symptomatic hypoglycemia, less than 70 is a hypoglycemia. Amplitude of glycemic excursions, time spent outside range, this is the both one and two what we are talking about today. And let us look at why is it important? What does it result in, the implications? The glycemic variability and risk of non-severe hypoglycemia, which will affect the quality of life of patients, are, you can see the relationship there very clearly, the tighter control as a higher hypos because of higher variability with the treatment. If variability is low, you can still achieve the tighter control, but with the lower episodes of hypoglycemia. Remember, in practice, it's the hypoglycemia what we counter, counter and the efficaciousness or the safety is always measured in an insulin trial with respect to the safety that is in the form of hypoglycemia. So you can very clearly see there the hypoglycemia sound, what is it related? And this is the implication. The oxidative stress and eventually the complication risk worsens with your glucose fluctuations. That is why we should have an insulin which can reduce the variability to the minimal. So this is the pathophysiological illustration where the impact of excessive glycation of proteins, ac ac activation of oxidative stress, and the three components, the fasting, hyper, uh, postprandial and the glucose fluctuation eventually results in risk of complications. Again, glycemic variability and maize and all-cause all mortality, you can see in the slide where there is an increasing fasting glycemic variability means the patient will get increased risk of maize and all-cause mortality. Sorry. Reducing glycemic variability, the role of ultra-long basal analog. So what do we have in the basket now? for treating, we definitely have Degludac when compared to Glargin. And this is the evidence, we have a better insulin, this is a RCT, two year randomized crossover study, wherein it clearly showed the coefficient of variation, look at the drop, significantly lower 
with Degludac. The diurnal is comparable, the nocturnal hypoglycemia. Degludac has been always placed, it's compared with a nocturnal hypoglycemia better than the overall comparable 24 hour glycemia. Significantly lower GV with the degludac, and that is what happens. In this study, 12 weeks degludac showed lower glycemic parameters with coefficient of variation and SD better in this. This was, of course, a prospective pilot study which was conducted in the hospital, in hospital. This is again another evidence to show switch pro RCT study, which is degludac versus glargin U100 again. You can see the study design there very clearly, degludac OED. Uh, OD plus or minus OADs and glargine, similar, switched over after 18 weeks of exposure to each individual drugs. It's a crossover study and ended at the end of uh, 34 weeks. And what it show, superiority of degludac was confirmed and estimated treatment difference is significant of 20 minutes per day or 1.43%, the time in range, in favor of degludac when compared to the glargine. The time in tight glycemic control, again, the estimated treatment difference is significant statistically and overall tight, time in tight glycemic range that is between 70 to 140 was achieved in the degludac arm compared to your glargin arm. More patients definitely achieved the clinically significant improvement in the TIR and that's the best part. And of course, nocturnal time below range, time below range, that means hypoglycemic episodes. You can see the three levels are how much it is reduced with the degludac compared to glargine. This is the latest publication in April ATTD in Barcelona this year. It's called in-range study where degludac and glargine U300, which is supposed to be lesser hypoglycemic, they compared CGM-based RCT, multicentric, and these are the results you can see, TIR, A1C, and time above range, all of them had a positive effect. 44 minutes, 44 minutes, you can see there in the bottom, and the HB1C was lower in the degludac arm. So to conclude, Striving to achieve near normal glycemia and avoiding glycemic fluctuations are key main objectives of diabetes management. Increasing glycemic variability increases the risk of hypoglycemia, maize and all cause events. Options to reduce this risk of glycemic variability should be considered when you choose the right drug and ultra long basal analog like degludac definitely reduces the glycemic variability by improving time in range. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Thank you for your excellent presentation. You all, we all have heard of this, uh, how important is this metric in uh, uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnostic as, as, as well as prognostication of uh, adverse outcome. Here is the molecule which really addresses everything and it uh, has a great role in reducing this uh, glycemic variability. Thank you so much for excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, so we move on to the next session. We have saved, saved nearly 10 minutes. Thank you so much to our esteemed chairpersons. Let us quickly move on to our next session. And I have the honor of inviting the chairpersons, Dr. N.K. Soni, sir, and Dr. Muruganathan, sir. Sir, can we have you on the stage, please? Dr. N.K. Soni, sir, is a senior consultant and head of department of internal medicine at Yathart Super Speciality Hospital, Greater Noida. We all have just heard Dr. Muruganathan, sir, and he is the former emeritus professor at the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University and international advisor for the RCT Glasgow. Over to you, sir. Uh, uh, good evening, friends. Uh, my co-chairperson is missing, probably he will be joining me in a minute or so, but by the time I take this pleasure of introducing none other than Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay. Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay, I am associated with him for the last about more than two decades. And Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay, you, you must have gone through his 
uh, credentials and uh, it's a long, long list. To shorten it, I can only say that he is a stalwart, he is a pioneer in Association of Physicians of India. He is a wonderful gastroenterologist, wonderful person. And he has been the president of Association of Physicians of India. He has been the dean of Association of Physicians of India and uh, what not and what not. So without wasting much of a time, I would like to invite Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay for his scientific deliberation. Dr. Upadhyay, you are Thank you very much for a kind introduction. Now I presume the time remains at 16 minutes. Unlike Dr. Murganathan, I cannot plead on grounds of empathy to extend the time. But remember one thing, constipation does take time, no matter how hard you strain. So I think if there is a little overlap you'll have to excuse me. Uh, what I'll be doing during my talk is, first of all, coming to the point that how to diagnose idiopathic constipation, which is the topic. How to classify that idiopathic constipation and subsequently how to treat it. So it will practically be in three parts. And uh, let me just point out at the very beginning that patients describe their constipation symptoms in varied ways. And doctors have a different perception as well. You will all have seen patients who come to your clinic and say, Dr. Saab, constipation. And then you ask, what exactly do you mean by constipation? So he says that I go four or five times. Khul ke nahi hota hai. So you, the next question you ask it, but what is the consistency of your stool? Stool is either soft or it is sometimes liquid. Now from the doctor's point of view, this is diarrhea, more than three stools per day, soft or liquid. But the patient is saying that he has got constipation. So I think it is very important first to understand the doctor's perspective versus the patient's perspective. And so, there is a general consensus that Rome 4 criteria should be used for diagnosis of chronic constipation. The chronicity is for at least three months or more and includes at least two or more of the following which I have shown over here. So straining at stool, lumpy or hard stools, sensation of incomplete evacuation, and sometimes sensation of anorectal obstruction. Nikalta hi nahi hai. Then they are, the next is patients sometimes use their fingers to take out their stools. And if you look at the right hand side, the traditional definition provided by the West is less than three stools per week. So if you look at the Indian population, it is less than 1% of the population who has less than three uh, stools per week. 90 plus percent have got at least one or two stools per day. If, you, if we don't pass stool on any particular day, that day is practically lost. So I think there is a difference in percent. And therefore, there is an Indian guidance now. How should we really define constipation? It is on the basis of stool form. Is it a hard stool, soft stool, loose stool, etc., And includes the patient's perception rather than the stool frequency. So let us not say that stool more than three times a day is equal to diarrhea or stool less than three times a week is equal to constipation. So let's be very clear on that. And you should all be familiar with the Bristol stool chart. And if you look at the top two, type one and type two, this is classical of constipation. So if a patient has type one, type two stools, then no matter how many times he is going, it should be classified as constipation. Now how common is it? Well, up to 25% of the population at different ages can be suffering from constipation. 
more common in females, more common in non-working population. घर में बैठा है, बार-बार स्टूल की ख्याल आती है, he goes to the toilet, comes back, and so on and so forth. Those with poor dietary habits and fluid intake is very important. Those who take less fluid are more constipated. And those who have less physical activity, again, have more constipation. And one very important thing, there is a very strong association with psychiatric issues. So patients with psychiatric problems, depression, anxiety, they have constipation almost in 40 to 60% of such patients. So how do we classify and how do we diagnose idiopathic constipation? So first of all, if you're dealing with chronic constipation, which is constipation for more than three months, you will have two uh, issues. One is the idiopathic constipation, which means there is no definitive cause, or on the right-hand side, it would be secondary constipation, which may be due to certain medications or which may be due to certain disease. But we are now talking about this condition, and idiopathic constipation is the subject of today's lecture. So how do we classify that? Well, there will be three types, and it is important to recognize that so that you can provide proper treatment. One is the normal transit constipation, which is commonly called the IBS of the constipation type. The second is slow transit constipation, and the third is classified as fecal evacuation disorders. Now, I'll come to how to diagnose each one of them, but one thing you must remember that each one may not be a distinct disorder, that there's a lot of overlap. So a patient who has irritable bowel syndrome may also have slow transit constipation and similarly with evacuation disorders. So that is something which is important to know. And before you can diagnose idiopathic constipation, you must know the other causes, all these causes, which can cause constipation, and if your patient has one of these constipation causes, then clearly he is not a patient of idiopathic constipation. And it is also very important to remember in clinical practice the common drugs which can cause constipation. So if your patient is having any of these drugs, and there are some more, I have just shown some examples, then please take care to try and withdraw these drugs and do not just classify them as idiopathic constipation. So the standard algorithm for management of chronic constipation is to take a clear history and do a proper physical examination. And if you find any of the alarm features, alarm features I'll show you are features which are suggestive of organic disease. And such patients may have ulcerative colitis, malignancies, etc. So you must be very careful not to diagnose them as idiopathic constipation. And on the right-hand side, try to see whether there are medications or diseases which are causing the constipation. So once you have excluded the right and the left side, you are left with this group, which is the, what we are talking about today. Patients who have got chronic constipation without al any alarm features and without any secondary cause. So a clinical evaluation should include a good perineal examination. And a rectal examination is very important. One of the diagnoses which is very commonly missed is evacuation disorders. And for that, I think it is a very simple method. You put the patient on the left lateral position and do a per rectal examination. Keep your finger inside the anal canal and ask the patient to strain as if they were passing stool. And normally on straining, the anal canal should open up, it should relax. If it is on the other hand contracting and you are getting a squeeze pressure, then that is clearly anorectal dyssynergy or evacuation disorders. And you also look for pelvic floor descent, particularly in females who have born children. So very simple. Good history, clinical examination can tell you a lot about the diagnosis. And I've talked about the alarm features. What are they? 
if somebody is having blood in the stool, clearly do not ignore that. Most patients will tell you that piles are always bleeding. And I'll tell you, piles is the commonest cause of bleeding in patients with constipation. But you are still likely to miss other causes and you do not want to miss particularly a malignant disease in such patient. If there is a family history of colon cancer, if the patient has anemia, has fecal uh, occult blood test which is positive, has a history of weight loss, or on examination there is abdominal mass or fever. Or remember another class of patient, new onset constipation in a patient above 45 years of age always suspect that there might be malignancy, so they require further investigations. Now, broadly speaking, the treatment, certain things have to be taken into account. We have to look at the fiber intake of the patient and increase the fiber intake, ask them to drink plenty of water. Fluid intake must be high. If they're not exercising, tell them to exercise. Healthy sleep pattern must be maintained. Patients who are depressed, not sleeping, are more likely to have constipation. And they must have regular defecation times. And lastly, and most importantly, I'll tell you, Indian style of toilet is the best in the world. Squatting during defecation is the best way to provide the best pressure, and therefore, should be, patients should be advised about that. If, because in these days we have Western toilets, what we advise is to put a small stool in front and bend your knees so that you are in a squatting position. So how to classify? I have already talked about slow transit constipation. And I'll tell you simple. Bristol stool form, if you have one and two, that is a clear surrogate of slow colonic transit. So the harder the stool, the slower is the colonic transit. So you don't require any test. Just ask them. Do you get the urge to pass stool? Do you get uh, hard stools? And if the answer to these are uh, both uh, yes, then the patient has uh, slow transit constipation. Uh, and if you look at the sensitivity and the specificity of just this history, it is 80% sensitive and specific. So good history is good enough. <coughs> Remember one thing. Some of the patients will have methane-producing bacteria, and they are the ones who have very foul-smelling flatus. You can diagnose on the basis of breath test as well. Methane inhibits GI motility, and therefore in such patients, you might have to think of giving rifaximin, and removing the, these bacteria can improve the slow transit and therefore improve the constipation. And I'm not going to go into this because we hardly perform this colonic transit study, which is done with radio-opaque markers. And you, when you take a X-ray at 60 hours and find more than 20 pellets lying in the right iliac fossa, it gives you a clear diagnosis. So how do we treat slow transit constipation? The stool is hard. The bowel movement is slow. So we need softening agent or a pushing agent that is a stimulant. So osmotic laxatives are first used. Avoid isabgol and high fiber in such patients because they are bulking agents and they will cause more of formation of fecolates. So no bulking agents for such patients. Use osmotic laxatives. Now there are two. One is the lactulose and lactitol and the other is the PEG-3350, polyethylene glycol. Preferable to use polyethylene glycol because most of these patients have got gas and bloating and lactulose is likely to cause, more likely to cause gas and bloating. If they're not responding to that, you have to use the stimulants and these days we are using frucalopride in uh, probably as the next drug of choice and it is given in one or two milligrams at night. You have to be careful in patients who are elderly or have got cardiac disease, but if they're not responding, then the good old bisacodyl and sodium picosulfate, basically dulcolax and cremalax has been uh, going on for many, many years. You have to try, although you cannot give these drugs for a long period of time. If you suspect uh, methane-producing organisms, try rifaximin. 
and if nothing seems to be working, then you have to consider surgery because such patients are undergoing continuous almost fecolith formation and therefore they have a high risk of rupture also. So that was about the slow transit. Now we come to the normal transit, which is uh, uh, Rome 4 criteria, recurrent abdominal pain. Uh, and this is again for three previous three months associated with constipation in this case, in our case. Uh, and uh, this definition is accepted and how do you treat them? Constipation predominant if the fiber intake is low, increase the fiber or use the osmotic laxatives. If they're not responding, you are using either procalopride or lubiprostone, which is an intestinal secretagogue. And if they're not still responding, then go back to the good old drugs, Dulcolax or Crimalax, but use them uh, for a shorter period of time. But most importantly, many of these patients who have IBSC are more troubled by the pain in the tummy rather than the constipation. So address the patient's concern. Abdominal pain, if it is the major problem, then use the antispasmodics and mebeverine is the commonest drug which we use. Otilonium bromide or pinavarium bromide is also used and anticholinergics as the last choice because they have got their own side effects. If you are to use antidepressants, don't use uh, the TCIs, but use the SSRIs because TCIs uh, can cause uh, worsening of the constipation. And for those with gas and bloating, use rifaximin. Use a low FODMAP diet. Half a minute, if you permit. Not on grounds of empathy, but on grounds of constipation. Straining. <laughs> Uh, lastly, we have to subdivide into the third category, which is fecal evacuation disorders. And remember that this is not because we don't diagnose this very commonly. So 30 to 40 percent of patients with chronic constipation have got fecal evacuation. So there is an incoordination between the anorectal muscles, more common in females. And these patients are typically have prolonged straining, incomplete evacuation. Sensation of anorectal uh, obstruction and digital evacuation is very, very, uh, I would suggestive of you know, evacuation disorder. So digital examination, as I've already mentioned, is highly predictive. And then if you have suspicion, use the anorectal manometry, balloon expulsion, and MRI defecography, et cetera. And the treatment for dyssynergic defecation is pelvic floor muscle retraining, biofeedback. And then if you have a combination, treat dyssynergia first, add the prokinetics if they are unresponsive, and you have to consider surgery in very severe cases. So this are the, I've just told you that three categories are there to classify how to treat them. I will avoid this for want of time. Lots of people are using probiotics. What is the status? Well, they appear to be very useful probably, but the current data does not support their regular use. But I think in times to come, they will become an important drug. Lastly, what about these enemas and suppositories? Well, for patients who have got severe constipation, we all use them, uh, but usually as an adjunct therapy, not as a primary therapy. So what is the take home messages? The take home messages make a proper diagnosis of idiopathic or functional constipation, then classify the chronic constipation for management strategy, determine always the, what is the patient's main concern and address that. Treatment should always be aimed to target the main concern. So if the patient is troubled with pain, please address the pain first. Stimulants are used predominantly for slow transit constipation, secretagogues, osmotic laxatives, uh, fiber, etc., are all used in patients with IBSC, and biofeedback is the treatment for dyssynergia. Thank you very much. But before I close, I may be a little early in announcing, but I would like to invite all of you. Epicon 2024 is going to be held in Delhi. 
I'm not talking about the 2023, which is going to be held in Ahmedabad. 2024 is going to be held in Delhi. Two big events in Delhi will happen. One is the big election coming up, and the other is this Epicon will make it a memorable event, and I would like to invite all of you to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh Badia, for that excellent talk. And after the lot of verbal diarrhea, you talked about constipation. And I think your words will relieve most of the constipation now. And those of you who got questions, you can discuss with him. Even if he doesn't mind, in front of the restroom also, you can ask about constipation. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. <laughs> thank you. Now I request um, the next speaker, uh, ending the never-ending story managing IBS, Ashish Kumar. Ashish Kumar will also talk IBS constipation, IBS diarrhea. You can uh, talk less of IBS constipation than diarrhea so that you can take five minutes away. Right, Ashish? Yeah, please. Over to you, Ashish. Please welcome him with a round of applause. You know, whenever speaker comes to the stage, give him a round of applause so that he will get encouraged and talk. O over to you, Ashish. Thank you, Dr. Murugunathan. And uh, I would like to first thank uh, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, Dr. L. Srinivas Murthy, Dr. Anubha, Dr. Narsing Verma for inviting me for this uh, conference, important conference. So I'll be talking about IBS and after Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay who has set the bar so high, it's very difficult for me to match uh, the level of his lecture. So many physicians give a label of IBS to any chronic uh, intestinal problem once they have ruled out uh, other disease. So if the patient comes with gas, pain, abdomen, everything, anything like that, they say that it's just IBS. But this is not IBS. In fact, there's a big lot of uh, inter GI disorders which are known as functional GI disorders and IBS is a subset of uh, uh, disorder uh, among the functional GI disorders. So mo many patients will come with either heartburn, nausea, vomiting, bloating, gas, pain, abdomen, constipation, diarrhea. And there are many organic causes for these, including cancer, infection, tuberculosis, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, peptic ulcer. But once you have ruled out all this and there are no structural abnormalities, then you would label them as functional cause of uh, these symptoms. And then this is called as functional GI disorders. And lately in last uh, couple, uh, last one or two decades, uh, Rome Foundation was created, which constitutes members from about 27 countries. They are 144 experts, and they have devised various criteria to diagnose these functional GI disorders. So functional GI disorders are now uh, based on these Rome diagnostic criteria. And the Rome criteria actually lists the functional uh, disorders of various organs of GI tract, like there could be a disorder of the esophagus, then gastroduodenal disorders, bowel disorders, then CNS disorders, gallbladder and sphincter of odi disorders, and anorectal disorders, and the, uh, uh, the diseases uh, which represent these disorders, like functional chest pain, functional dyspepsia is the fun gastroduodenal disorder, then uh, IBS is the representative disorder of functional bowel disease, and similarly there are other diseases as well. But they are not only IBS and functional dyspepsia, they are a host of other diseases which are labeled as functional gastrointestinal disorders. So how common are functional uh, gastrointestinal disorders? In India, the most frequent symptoms of functional disorder is gas. Anytime the patients in any clinic, even be it cardiology clinic or a diabetic clinic, most patients will, in addition to complaining of their uh, symptoms, they'll also say that they are having gas and uh, they want to get rid of the gas. So if we see all the disorders starting from esophagus to gastroduodenal disorders, IBS, bowel disorders, many of these uh, disorders have gas as one of the important symptoms. So uh, a global study was conducted uh, where worldwide prevalence of functional GI disorders was conducted and uh, Dr. Ghoshal and Dr. Nitesh Prasta represented India and it was found that uh, at least 40, 20 to 40 percent of uh, population do suffer from some of the other functional GI disorders. And these GI disorders could range from dyspepsia, constipation, IBS, diarrhea, 
or uh, even just bloating, abdominal bloating and any other. And but most for, uh, common was uh, constipation as Dr. Rajesh Upadhyaya did mention, up to 11 to 12 percent had constipation. And also um, the IBS was uh, in around 4 percent. Dyspepsia or the upper abdominal discomfort was around 7 percent. In India, a good uh, large study was done on prevalence of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and it was found that at least 4 to 7 percent of population do have irritable bowel syndrome. So what is the pathogenesis of functional GI disorders? Uh, right from the 1950s onwards, people have been trying to discern the pathogenesis of functional GI disorders. And initially it was thought that functional GI disorders are only due to stress and uh, due to, it's uh, due to brain. But later other uh, um, pathogenetic disorders came into focus like meal was considered uh, one of the uh, causes, then visceral hypersensitivity uh, came. And in last few uh, years it is uh, being thought as, as the f it is a gut brain access disorder. So what is gut brain access? So in a person who is predisposed in early life, uh, early childhood by abuse or parental beliefs or behaviors or social learning and uh, they have, if they have genetic disorders, then later in the adulthood, because of uh, very psychological factors, uh, they may have, may develop a disorder known as gut brain uh, disorder. So they develop visceral hypersensitivity and in the intestinal they may have a certain low grade uh, immune mediated uh, inflammation and also there's uh, alteration in the gut uh, mucosa and there's alteration in the gut microbiome. So all these uh, disorders in the gut which leads to uh, action back on the brain is uh, defined as gut brain disorders. So there is a stress or anxiety on the sinus level and then there's low grade inflammation in the GIT level and that can cause the, these disorders. So brain gut access is very important and because the brain f uh, also there's inhibitory pathway in the spinal can canal and then uh, pain is perceived by the brain. So when there is visceral hypersensitivity in the intestine, it is perceived as severe pain by the brain. So about functional uh, gastrointestinal disorder, we, they are very common up and up to 40% of the general population are affected by it. And functional gastrointestinal disorders constitute functional constipation up to 12%, dyspepsia 7%, diarrhea 5%, IBS 7% and unspecified 11%. The pathogenesis are multifactorial, especially there is a role of brain gut axis, abnormal motility, visceral hypersensitivity, psychological factors, then there's role of gut microbiome, gut inflammation, and increased permeability, bile acids, and CNS processing and gate control theory. Now coming to the IBS. So IBS is basically pain plus altered by bowel habit. So I, in the diagnosis of IBS, the pain is an essential criteria. And usually the patients of IBS will have symptoms of more than six months, and following criteria should be fulfilled uh, within last three months that there should be recurrent abdominal pain and the pain should uh, occur almost every week. And uh, along with the pain, at least two of the following should be there. Either the pain is related to defecation or there is a change in frequency of the stool so th they may get diarrhea or they may get constipation uh, along with the pain or there's a change in form of the pain, uh, stool. So th they would get either loose stools or they may get lumpy or hard stools. So if there's no pain, then we cannot label as IBS. So for IBS, the pain is the most important symptom. If there's no pain, then we can definitely say that he may be having functional GI disorders, but it is not IBS. So this is a WhatsApp chat which uh, we doctors often receive early in the morning. Doctor, I need help. So when the doctor says, what happened to you? Then he says, I'm having very severe constipation, doctor, in, in, the, in the morning. Then uh, when the doctor asks, how many times are you passing stool? Then the patient replies, I'm passing three to four times uh, a day. When the doctor asks if you're passing stool three to four times a day, then why do you say that you are having constipation? Then, and the last he says, pet ne safora. That means he's having incomplete evacuation. This is a very common disorder where, as Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay also mentioned, 
that the patient's perception of constipation is different from the doctor's definition of constipation. The doctors define constipation according to uh, the well-laid criteria while the patient, even if he's passing stool three to four times a day, but if he's not feeling satisfied by, by passing stool, he'll still say it is he's having constipation. So to diagnose constipation, a Bristol stool uh, scale is very important, which Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay also mentioned. So the type one and type two, where they are a very separate lump-like stools or sausage-shaped stool, this uh, constitute constipation. Type three, type four, and type five are normal stool. Type six, where there's fluffy pieces of uh, stool, and type seven, where there's watery and no mm, uh, solid pieces, these are constitute diarrhea. So we, all the doctors, all the physicians, you all must have a Bristol stool, stool uh, chart in your clinic so that once the patient says, I'm having constipation, you can show this uh, stool chart and ask him what type of stool he's passing. So based on a Bristol uh, stool chart, the IBS is divided into either constipation predominant when he's ty passing type one or type two stool, or it is diarrhea predominant IBS when he is uh, passing a six, type six or type seven stool, and sometimes he has been mixed type. Sometimes the patient is passing uh, constipation type, type one or two, and sometimes type six. And then there's an unspecified type. So what is the clinical profile of our irritable bowel syndrome? This was a large study which was done, uh, published few years ago, with Dr. Rajesh Upadhyay was also a part of this study. And uh, the uh, IBS patients were divided into three types, constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, and indeterminate based on the stool frequency. And it was found that uh, incomplete evaluation or the, when the patient says, Pet nahi saaf ho hai, and he's not able to clear his stools is common in all three types, even in constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, indeterminate predominant, at least 80 to 90% of the patients complain of incomplete evacuation. Then the other common symptom is mucus. The patient says that he's passing a lot of mucus. And then the, even the patient is having uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, which is a disorder of lower GI tract, he still have, may have at least in 50% of patients have upper abdominal discomfort. Then these patients, at least 70, 80% have tiredness as their symptoms. So IBS leads to a lo loss of work uh, and lots of tiredness, inability to, and it can lead to depression as well. So how do we approach to a patient with a patient with suspected IBS? Uh, so once you've diagnosed the IBS, the according to based on the criteria of Rome uh, four criteria that there is pain, there's alteration in bowel habit, and then pain is related to defecation, then you have to rule out alarm features. Doc Dr. Upadhyay already mentioned these alarm features like if there is weight loss, if there's blood in stool, if the onset of uh, uh, symptoms is uh, may more than 50 years, if there's fever, any family history of colorectal can cancer, and if there's lymphadenopathy or if there's anemia, these are alarm features. If they have, we have ruled out, if the alarm features are present, then we have to investigate further because these patients may have certain serious disorders like GI malignancy, but if they are not there, then very limited uh, laboratory tests are required like complete blood count, C-reactive protein, fecal calprotectin and just celiac disease serology. Only these four tests are uh, important and then we can diagnose IBS. And once you have diagnosed IBS, you have to classify it uh, either constipation predominant or diarrhea predominant or the mixed variety based on the Bristol stool uh, chart. So uh, I mentioned about a test called fecal calprotectin. So what is fecal calprotectin? So stool calprotectin uh, is a calcium and zinc uh, binding protein uh, and it is mainly found in neutrophils and it is found throughout the body. But if the calprotectin is being excreted in feces, it means there is increased neutrophil migration into the GI tract and which indicates there's inflammation. So when stool calprotectin is high, then it indicates inflammatory bowel disease and this is not IBS. So fecal calprotectin is normal, then it is IBS probably, but if it is elevated, then we have to suspect irritable uh, inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. So how do we treat IBS? So once uh, you have diagnosed IBS, then establish a good doctor-patient relationship because it's a lifelong disease. So we have to acknowledge that it is a disease and the patient is not a psychiatric 
patient, he's not mental or like that, and we have to reassure the patient. We have to educate the patient. And then lifestyle modification is important. We have to increase the fiber intake. We have to decrease the FODMAP diet, increase physical activity, and avoid stress. And according to the classification, IBSC, uh, that constipation predominant, you have to give for pain in all three categories, you have to give antispasmodics, but uh, in the IBSC, you have to give osmotic laxative, as Dr. Padhya mentioned. For diarrhea predominant, we have to give loperamide. But if it is, it is not effective in uh, in the first stage, then you can uh, give, uh, give other drugs like linactoplide, rifaximin, and cholesteramine. And then you can also uh, add uh, antidepressant. For constipation pre uh, predominant, you have to add SSRIs. And for mixed type or diarrhea predominant, you have to add tricyclic antidepressant. What are low FODMAP diets? Uh, FODMAP means fermentable oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyols. And FODMAP diet leads to high osmotic load, and uh, it leads to high colonic gas production in the setting of visceral hypersensitivity. And multiple studies and uh, meta-analysis have shown that if you give low fat food map diet, then the patient feels better because the less gas is produced and th so there's less bloating and so patient feels better, especially those having high, high uh, visceral hypersensitivity. So they have less of abdominal discomfort. So uh, uh, you, we must have a low food map diet chart like for example vegetables certain vegetables have uh, are high fodmap we must avoid them like garlic onions while uh, lettuce and carrot are low fodmap similarly fruits proteins fats they are uh, we can divide them into low fodmap containing and high fodmap containing and we can uh, advise our patients so IBS is a, a specific form of functional GI disorders which is characterized by pain plus altered bowel habit Apart from pain, altered bowel, uh, many patients also have other functional symptoms such as dyspepsia, bloating, gas, and IBS has four subtypes, constipation predominant, diarrhea predominant, undeterminate, and mixed variety. And diagnosis is basically clinical with minimal tests, and treatment, as I mentioned, is mainly symptomatic. Thank you for your patient hearing. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashish and Dr. Rajesh Shubhadaya for enlightening us about how to regulate our bowel habits. And I think the audience, they are wise enough now to take the clue. As my co-chair person has taken a clue from Dr. Rajesh Shubhadaya's talk, and he has drunk a lot of fluid to clear his bowels, and now he wants me to close the session very quickly. Okay, thank you very much. We are closing this session. Let us give a big hand to both these speakers. It is at Vizak, both Sony and Dr. Murugnathan signing off from all of you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. We've had a wonderful session. We are moving on to our obesity symposia. And to chair the session, we have our very own Dr. J.K. Sharma, sir, and Dr. Amit Gupta, sir. Sir, can we please have you on the stage? So, good evening once again, and I request everyone to please have a seat. Very important symposia on obesity. And for that, we have our speakers, Dr. Jyoti Dev, Dr. Sunil Gupta, again Dr. Jyoti Dev, again Dr. Jyoti Dev, then again Dr. Sunil Gupta, and then Dr. Anjana Ranjit Pohan. So, I request the speakers to please finish the talks in 13 minutes' time, one three minutes. The first talk is by Dr. Jyoti Dev, 
obesity impact beyond weight dr jyoti dev please dr jyoti dev does not require any introduction to this, to this audience Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the nice introduction and uh, uh, hello to our respected chairpersons, uh, Dr. J.K. Sharma and uh, our dear friend, Dr. Amit. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anuj and all the dear friends uh, uh, for this opportunity. <coughs> so this is only uh, setting the stage. And you know that this is an obesity symposium and we will have it for around 45 minutes. And uh, this is just to set the stage. And uh, Dr. Durbi will be moderating the session. So thank you, Durbi. And uh, my co-speaker will be Dr. Sunil Gupta. So the discussion is all about obesity beyond managing the weight. So obesity is all beyond the weight management. <coughs> and if you look at the statistics, the statistics are quite alarming. The statistics are quite alarming, not only for above the age of 18 years, even in children, it is very, very alarming in our country. And most of us, even doctors, are not that aware of the magnitude of increase in obesity in our country. And the question is, are we as doctors, are we as a government, are we prepared for the obesity epidemic? The answer is, in terms of preparedness, we are only 99th in the global preparedness. So, so we are actually not at all prepared for facing this obesity epidemic in our country. And this is the economic impact of obesity, 2019, 0.8% GDP. And if you are again analyzing the children, 10.8% annual increase is now existing for childhood obesity. So there is a 300% increase in obesity and in adults it is going to triple from 2 to 6 crore in 20 years. And let us see what is happening with the scientific organizations across the world. So we have the World Obesity, we have Obesity Canada, so everywhere. They are all getting prepared and for a long time they are all existing. And for them the definition is obesity is a chronic, relapsing, progressive disease. And what about in India? Are we there having an organization in our country? Yes, in our country also we are having an organization. And uh, Dr. Dhruvi, Dr. Sunil Gupta, myself, we are all, most of us are members or uh, we are all part of the executive committee. And we are also getting prepared for India. And something unique about this organization is, this organization is a multidisciplinary organization. It consists not only of doctors, they are surgeons, there are physical fitness experts, there are dietitians, there are bariatric surgery experts, and all these are components of the All India Association for Advancing Research in Obesity. So obesity, if somebody is asking you what is the importance of treating obesity, uh, the answer should be very clear. If, if somebody, you are diagnosing obesity in a person in front of you, and if they have a question, why am I bothered and why should I be bothered about obesity? And there are some answers for you. And look at these circles. These dark blue ones are there. And these are those illnesses where there is a very, very strong association with obesity. Very strong association with obesity. And these blue ones, light blue circles are the ones which are having a relatively strong association. But I am, as a doctor, and I am pretty sure that you are all practicing doctors, we are all bothered about cancers. Apart from type 2 diabetes or apart from NAFLD, apart from hypertension, all of these are probably known to us. But beyond that, we are bothered about cancers. Look at this strong association with pancreatic cancer. Strong association with colorectal cancers, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, so many cancers, more than two dozen cancers having multiple myelomas, having either a very strong or a strong association with the presence of extra fat, adiposity. 
And what about the diagnosis? What is the current scenario with respect to diagnosis of obesity? And that is also quite shocking. If you have 100 people with obesity in our country, and this is a global scenario, out of which not even 50%, you are not even making a diagnosis of obesity in 50%, it is less than 40%. And even after making a diagnosis of obesity, how many of our people are getting treated for obesity? It is less than 20%. And this is a global statistics, and I'm sure that in India, it will be much, much more worse much more of us. Not even, maybe, not even 1% of us probably is getting treated for obesity. Just make a count on how many of us sitting in this room are obese. And that itself will be an alarming figure for most of us, the doctors. And are we recognizing it? We are not recognizing it. And this is a symposium where we'll be discussing on the science of obesity. And we'll be discussing on how you need to assess obesity beyond BMI. And we will also be discussing some of the clinical scenarios. And these are the major pillars of obesity care, starting with behavioral interventions. Of course, it's necessary for everyone, including those with overweight. And then you have the pharmacotherapy options. And if not manageable, some of our patients will definitely require surgical options as well. So in a nutshell, you require a multidisciplinary approach. And you may require the assistance of a psychologist. You may have to address sleep disorders. Many of our people with obesity, they may be having sleep apnea. They may be having a restless sleep. Sleep is also now measured, need to be measured, and it is now integrated in diabetes care based on the new guidelines on hyperglycemia. You need to address the eating disorders. You need to address multiple medical conditions which are part of obesity. So in a nutshell, it is beyond weight. Managing obesity is not only complex, and it is beyond weight management. So thank you very much, and next is over to our chairpersons. Thank you very much. Dr. Jyoti, please come on the dais and join us here. Here. Now, the next part will be taken by Dr. Sunil Gupta and he will talk about what is the science behind obesity. Sir, please. Dr. Sunil Gupta is the national president of Diabetes and Pregnancy Study Group, India. He is the national, immediate past national treasurer of RSSDI headquarters. He has got number of rewards and he has been awarded 19 orations he has created six consecutive Best National Research Paper Awards by RSSDI and he is the President of Diabetic Association of India, Academy of Medical Sciences. Dr. Sunil, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, respected chairperson. At the outset, let me ta take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Anuj and the team of uh, ACP. Uh, no, I have to go for it further like this. Okay. The science behind obesity, I feel the introduction has been made by uh, Jyoti very uh, optically and uh, I will be talking more into the etiopathogenesis of obesity, which is going to be a little, little difficult task for all of us to understand because we have never ever entered into this science very aggressively across. And someone has already said that uh, Obesity, some enthusiastic speaker or author has mentioned uh, obesity as an as a endocrine tumor of adipose tissues. So I feel uh, we, are, we have underestimated obesity because, and we have a financial disclosure that this particular session has been sponsored by Novo Nordis. So I'll be talking more on physiology of the weight reduction regulation, some slides on etiopathogenesis of obesity, and the benefits of the weight loss and the concept of weight regain. Now, energy balance equation is very, very simple to understand. For lay people, we say, whatever you eat, you should be able to spend. If you don't do that, you will have obesity. Now, this concept is very easy to mention, easy to understand for a lay person. And behind that, we have hunger, satiety, and the nutrient absorption, which are important when you talk about, when you consider intake as a calorie. 
and expense expenditure you need to understand the metabolic rate it could be the resting it could be the uh, uh, it could be some uh, so the basal metabolic rate thermogenesis exercise then the, you have the non exercise uh, activity thermogenesis that is neat so all these factors need to be considered when we talk about the expenditure versus the total food intake which is simple to understand and simple to calculate by most of the dietitians so energy balance means the energy intake minus energy expenditure ideally it should be zero and energy intake is simple as i told you whatever food you take but energy expenditure has multiple components we have our rmr which is resting metabolic rate which is in human is being referred to the energy required to sustain all essential physiological function of your body which includes your your breathing your respira your respiration your heart beats your all muscle activity your gi activity everything is being included as a resting metabolic rate why i am emphasizing you this because we are going to understand the importance of this rmr in later phase of our uh, understanding in the last part when we'll try to cover why there is a rebound and why we are unable to sustain or maintain the weight loss we have done with all your efforts for 6 month or a year so that will be rem so please remember this terminology which is resting metabolic rate then the thermogenesis or dit thermogenesis or uh, maybe may of different kind the psychological stress the environment the drugs the diet induced the thermogenesis when you take meal your diet also takes some of the energy is being utilized for the metabolism of these whether you take carbohydrate fat or or or, or the protein or whatever you take ultimately requires some energy which is being covered as dit then you have physical activity where you again spend energy or utilize some uh, some of the calories which is non exercise activ uh, activity thermogenesis which is neat which is being referred to the amount of energy which is being utilized uh, uh, through your physical activity which includes your muscle tone posture balance uh, fidgeting sometimes you have a habit of you know moving your uh, leg like this even that is being counted uh, which is not a very structured exercise and that is why it is called as neat but the exercise when you say exercise induced thermogenesis is, is a structured exercise maybe it is walking swimming or any of the uh, sports you play so all this all this together will measure your total ex energy expenditure and you need to have a balance between the energy intake and the expenditure now there are different locations uh, in your in your uh, in your body which are which are involved you have different anorexigenic uh, uh, hormones or the peptide or or exogenic uh, uh, hormones or the peptides which are responsible for your food intake and your satiety as well as your hunger anorexigenic means you you don't you have get anorexia of when when you have these hormones being secreted and you get early satiety your appetite is reduced when you talk of or exogenic that means it causes you hunger you eat more so you have few of the cent uh, locations in the central you have hypothalamus where you have the uh, the uh, pomc and some other oxytocin serotonin histamine urocortin gi tract our main focus will be on glp1 but you have the uh, uh, polypeptide yy or uh, or the oxynotomodium and then some other uh, gi tract uh, peptides which are also responsible and we are they are anorexigenic hormone pancreatic we have pancreatic peptide we have insulin and amylin which again reduces uh, your appetite and the adipose adipocyte which is leptin so you have different uh, body organs which are involved in the in the system and when you talk about orexogenic the main hormone here is a ghrelin hormone which is also called as uh, hunger hormone and then you have a uh, neuropeptide py and uh, uh, you have uh, the uh, agrp and mch and opioids and endocannabinoids so these are various uh, peptides which are responsible to reduce your, to increase your hunger now the ap appetite regulation you have some peripheral signals which modulate the appetite and energy expenditure via the hypothalamus i'll not go too much into into the detail uh, detail of this but you have the uh, arcuate nucleus and the hypothalamus in the center and then you have the uh, the pro 
opio uh, melanocortin uh, and and the uh, and the cocaine and amphetamine uh, 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 regulated transcripts now pomc is a hormone which is anorexic hormone here you have pyy pp glp1 especially glp1 which will actually stimulate pomc as a first order neuron and then you have ghrelin which will be responsible to stimulate the npy and the uh, and the uh, agouti related protein and then you have leptin and insulin which will have a positive impact on the pomc and cart while the negative on the uh, npy and from there then they will be responsible to stimulate the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the mcr3 as receptor 3 and 4 to improve your satiety while and it will improve uh, it will reduce your satiety uh, appetite and improve the satiety now for hunger you'll have the stimulation from the ghrelin which again through mp uh, uh, n uh, uh, n npy and there will also be a role of brain stem, brain stem where nucleus tractus solitaris and the area post trauma here you have vagal stimuli and the amylin and glp1 analog which glp1 pe peptide which will be actually re responsible for reducing your appetite improving satiety and uh, and helping you to reduce your to um, ha to reduce your appetite and uh, reduce your hunger and imp uh, and 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 maintain the weight now this particular regulation is a little complex to make simple little, uh, to make the things little simple we have three different ways which will be responsible for your eating behavior and brain actually controls them so we have one is homeostatic eating that is eating for hunger this is the uh, this is the behavior which is being controlled by the hypothalamus which i told you earlier you have the glp1 pyy oxm polypeptide p amylin which increases your satiety and you have ghrelin which increases your hunger then you have the hedonic eating we are eating for pleasure eating for hunger is like when you are empty stomach for a long period you are feeling hungry that is eating for hunger which will be taken care by the hypothalamus hedonic eating is basically uh, basically a area where you 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 feel good suppose if i had been to a temple today the simva temple narsimha temple where i have been offered uh, some uh, my wife has got some her got she got some uh, laddu there now if i am a laddu lover and my hedonic response will say, okay, you have the full laddu. Uh, though, I, though I had good breakfast in the morning, but they will say, you have full laddu. And if my hedonic eating is not in favor of the laddu, possibly I will not eat it. Now, presume that I have a, I have a love or affection for those laddu, but then, and this, this particular response uh, is, being, is being taken by, by do, dopamine, which actually controls your wanting. Someone wants to have it. While the opioid and cannabinoids receptors, they control the liking. So there is a difference between wanting and, and, and liking. Wanting means you want it. Like means you like it, but you need not be, uh, need not be too much for it. And here comes a role of an execu executive function where what, is what do you decide to eat? So if the laddu is in front of me, if my brain decides, no, it's too much of calorie, though I like it, and my brain, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, your, uh, uh, your frontoparietal uh, cortex has said that, okay, okay, Dr. Gupta, you, all, you, though you love it, but you're already overweight, so better you already had good breakfast, the, you can just have a, have a you know, small bite being a prashad, you can have it. So, that's, this, so this, is a, this is called a behavior which is being controlled by your, uh, uh, by your Cortex. So you have thought, behavior, and feeling. All of these are going to decide about your eating for hunger, eating for pleasure, and deciding to eat. On the basis of your habits and behavior, your, your brain is being regulated since childhood. So behavioral intervention empower the sustainable behavior in controlling the eating. Let's see the etiopathogenesis of it. So energy intake, energy expenditure, and you have, which is all being dictated by your brain, but there are different inputs which are coming from adipose tissues, the pancreas, the gut, I already told you the different hormones coming from leptin here. Here you have amylene and, and insulin, your gut hormones like GLP-1. Genetic and environment and medications might al also play a big, big role. And then you have, you are being influenced by the hedonic inputs, 
which increases the palatability or the pleasure and the environmental uh, risk factors like uh, passive lifestyle or smoking or psychological factors. We have some data to share about, about the genetics, uh, the high er heritability of the body weight genes in the hypothalamus, leptin, melatonocortin pathways, and, uh, and, and this is a data which has come from 334,000 individuals where they have seen that the BMI-related genes are expressed maximum in the nervous system. Environment, I won't go into detail of it, but we have our own traditions, beliefs, socioeconomic factors which are responsible. Benefit of the weight loss. Now, obesity associated with multiple complications, metabolic, mechanical, and mental. You have asthma, NAFLD, uh, gallstone, infertility, sub-infertility, hypogonadism, polycystic ovarian disease, pregnancy-related complications. You have cancers, cardiovascular disease, stroke, dyslipidemia, hypertension, coronary artery disease, pulmonary embolism, type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, thrombosis, gout, and you have mechanical problems. Uh, you can have functional uh, disability, urinary incontinence, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, chronic back syndrome, and mental disorders. And if you just reduce by uh, your, your weight by 5 to 10%, you will be able to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular mortality, uh, lipid profile can improve, blood pressure, severity of obstetric sleep apnea. I feel the six minutes less have been taken by Jyoti Dev. I'll take two or three minutes out of it. He stopped six minutes early. I'll just finish up in one or two, two three slides. So greater weight loss, uh, if you have more than five to 10 to 10 to 15 percent, you'll have another weight loss, uh, uh, another benefits of, of these complications. But despite you wait, this is a data which says six months trial where you have tremendous weight loss, but up in, uh, they have been followed for almost eight different studies. They have been followed for a minimum three years, and they found the rebound phenomena. Almost every trial has shown the weight has again, uh, uh, their rebound or relapse. And here, here it comes, ki why you are again going to go for regain? And we ha have a set point in your hypothalamus, which need, which, which is very difficult to change. So these are various factors which does not allow you to uh, to go for the adaptation, and and they go, they try to go back to the to the previous weight again because of want of time. This is the last uh, uh, one or two slide. The persistent metabolic adaptation. Very interesting. 16 participants which have who, have who have participated in the biggest uh, weight loser uh, reality show. And out of them, 14 have, have, been, have been followed. This is a 30 weeks uh, they have been participated. And the mean weight loss of 58 kg. But within few years, within six years follow up, they regained 48 kg, 44, uh, 41 kg weight, uh, weight. But the resting metabolic rate also reduced and the metabolic adaptation also reduced. That's why there is regain. So finally, this is my last slide, Amit. Uh, Energy balance is regulated by the brain through various sources of inputs. We already seen it. There are different inputs here. Brain controls appetite by regulating these three types of eating, hedonic, uh, uh, homeostatic, and the, and the uh, execution. And the maintenance of the weight loss is challenging due to the meta metabolic adaptation that your, your system, your brain doesn't allow you to remain in, in a lost weight. And it doesn't, it, it brings you back to the uh, to your original way uh, through various mechanisms that we have seen. With this, I stop here. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunil Gupta. Uh, now, since uh, we now know what is the impact of the weight, and we also now are wiser in knowing the science behind the obesity, so Dr. Jyoti Dev will now talk about how to assess the obesity, what, uh, what is the grading and how the staging is done, and then he will walk us through one case scenario uh, in, in which he will uh, talk about the obesity management also. Okay, done. So thanks to uh, Dr. Amit Gupta, thanks to uh, Sunil. So uh, Dr. Sunil has discussed the science of obesity and in the next 10 minutes, we will discuss on how we can assess obesity. It's very important, how to diagnose obesity. So probably many of us will be of the notion that we are all diagnosed with obesity and that is how obesity need to be diagnosed. But there are certain limitations to what we are used to for many decades. That is exactly what we are going to discuss now. So what are we going to do with the person sitting in front of us? First is diagnosis. Are we doing it properly? I am not certain about it. We need to be more certain and sure about diagnosing obesity with science, with emerging evidence. I think the second step is also very, very difficult. Rather than important, it is difficult 
to discuss that somebody is having obesity. And the language matters. You have to be very polite. You cannot scare. I cannot tell him that uh, it's all because you are eating more, you are not exercising. So such types of behaviors from a doctor should not be there. So the discussion part and how to have a conversation with the person with obesity is extremely important. And that will decide on whether you are successful in treating him or not. So all the three steps are of equal significance. And let us start with diagnosis because that is where I'm going to focus tonight. Diagnosis of obesity. So we have a traditional approach by which you are going to measure the body mass index. And now you have emerging evidence from USS. And USS I'll be discussing in detail because that is probably more important for us. And uh, we are all used to the traditional way of diagnosing obesity with body mass index. And uh, probably many of us are going to be either overweight or obese. All of us sitting here in this uh, particular hall if we are measuring the height and the body weight, and that is weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. So let me dissect, and all these numbers are known to you. This, it is only a recap for you. And for the Indian standards, these are the parameters for India. A BMI above 25 is considered as obese. And for waist to circumference, men and women, 90 and 80 centimeters respectively. And waist to ratio, almost same numbers, 0.9 and 0.8 diagnostic of obesity. And the body fat percentage, if you have a device or if you are using some investigations, if men above 25%, women above 30%, can be regarded as having obesity. And you can also grade, you can also have a grading of obesity and these are the Indian standards recently published by Nihal Thomas, Nidin Kapoor and the group uh, in one of the recent journals. And this is in 2018. Up to 18.5 is underweight. And then up to 22.9 is normal weight. And overweight starts from 23. And you have three classes of obesity. 25, then 30, and above 35. So remember these numbers. So now, are all the so-called normal weight people having normal weight or not? The answer is no. The answer is a big no, because all of those who are regarded as having normal weight need not have a normal weight obesity. It can, it can even be regarded as a normal weight obesity, and this can be 8 to 15 percent of those people whom you are diagnosing as having a normal weight. And uh, I think Dr. Anjana is here, and she is going to have a lecture soon after this, and they are having a, remember, reviewing that paper from your center on metabolically obese and uh, unhealthy and healthy obesity. And that is again an emerging concept. So if you are having a BMI, which is normal or above normal, overweight or obese, there can be a subclass of those individuals with normal weight having metabolically unhealthy normal weight. So you can have a normal BMI of 22, but still you can have excess visceral fat, and you can be a person who is having low lean mass. That means you can be a person having sarcopenia, low muscle mass. And these are those individuals having high inflammatory markers, prone for cancers, multiple cancers, which we discussed in the beginning in the introduction, pancreatic cancers, endometrial cancers, breast cancer, multiple myeloma, and so on. And the same risk is there in metabolically unhealthy people with obesity. So, the so-called obese individuals, 8 to 10 percent can be even metabolically healthy. So BMI will have lot of limitations. BMI will have lot of limitations when you are only considering BMI in your clinical practice because it is very easy. I know that many of you, including me, we are all assessing BMI in your clinics. We will measure the height and during every visit to the hospital we will be measuring the weight of the person and we will be documenting in the computer, in the electronic medical records. But there are a lot of limitations using only body mass index. Reason being, we are not considering the concomitant illnesses. We are not considering whether the person is having any pain, whether the person is having any mobility issues. We are not considering the fact whether the person is having any type 2 diabetes or any cancers. We are not considering whether 
the obese individuals having depression very important mental depression and changes in the bmi or waist circumference are not reflecting the functional status of the individual so the functional status of the individual will have a significance in deciding in deciding the therapy because we need not implement a therapy for all of those people who are obese so it is time my dear friends to move beyond obesity it is time to move beyond just measuring the body mass index and what is the solution the solution the easiest solution now with us is to accept to adopt the eoss and that is the edmonton obesity staging system and i am pretty sure that most of you are familiar with this but those of you who are not familiar let me tell you it is very very simple it is extremely simple to use uss in your practice you require only the assistance of your diabetes educator to classify and this is a staging system where <coughs> we are using three parameters one is medical and the second is mental and the third is functional so what is stage zero stage zero means everything is normal no medical conditions apart from the person being diagnosed as obese according to bmi and the mental status is normal and functionally also the person is normal and stage one is preclinical there are mild symptoms of depression there are mild issues with mobility or there can be pre hypertension or pre diabetes and the stage 2 will be moderate the presence of moderate disability whereas stage 3 is end organ damage there is a chronic kidney disease or there is osteoarthritis and that is severe and the stage 4 of course we as physicians or we as doctors will have lot of challenges managing stage 4 because that is end stage of obesity where either of these components so i repeat either of these will probably help you in assessing or putting them in one stage for example if there is a moderate mental involvement then that person will qualify for stage 2 of uss so long ago there is a validation for uss and that was with the help of the enhanced data from 1988 to 1994 and they have compared bmi with uss so this is bmi over there and this is uss and up to stage 3 because stage 4 is anyway disability and uh, it is irreversible and it is difficult for the nh hence to have a validation so what they have found is look at these numbers and the curves stage 0 then 1 2 and this is stage 3 of uss and when you are comparing with bmi bmi all those stages they look almost the same but when you are comparing the same with uss it is clearly depicting it is clearly correlating with prediction of mortality so when you are considering the functional status of the person when you are considering the mental status of the person when you are considering the multiple other comorbidities along with bmi it is closely correlating with it is directly correlating with the prediction of mortality in the population so this is similar to comparing hemoglobin a1c with percentage time in range metrics so you have the continuous glucose monitoring data where even when the a1c is same for four people when you are performing a cgm the tar metrics will be entirely different for those with the same hemoglobin a1c likewise likewise you may have people in the same class of obesity based on body mass index but when you are sub classifying or when you are categorizing based on uss the same bmi class will have multiple of these components 64% of them having stage 3 14% of them stage 0 this much so that is something which is alarming and that is something probably very interesting for us to adopt so that we are classify and based on the uss staging system we can decide on whether we need to go only for a primordial prevention or you need to have behavioral therapies or you can implement medical or surgical therapies or interventions based on the uss staging system so i will stop in another one minute this particular module and this is a couple of examples on how 
the BMI compares with because of the entire uh, topic of discussion is BMI versus the new USS staging system. So this is a 24 year old physically active female. So assuming that she is still beautiful despite a BMI of 32, very active with no demonstrable risk factors, very important, no demonstrable risk factors. So based on BMI, it is class two or grade two based on BMI, but based on USS, since no other medical, mental, or pa other parameters are there, it is stage zero of obesity. So you are not going to do anything. So this is a girl whom you probably can implement some primordial prevention, and there won't be any additional health benefits giving her any therapies. And moving on to another case, and this is a 32-year-old male, where the BMI is 36, and there are diseases. There is sleep apnea, there is depression. So here, it is stage two of obesity, and it is class three based on BMI. And treatment will have benefits. And here, this 63-year-old male with a BMI of 54, that is class three of obesity with severe disability. So this is stage four of obesity, where there'll be multiple challenges if you are planning for a management. Because as you can see, it is almost in stage. It is almost in stage and he's bound wheelchair. And here, you may have to have multiple strategies and the BMI alone, in this case, won't be helpful at all. So in conclusion, you need to move beyond BMI. You need to move beyond BMI in assessing obesity based on the functional status of the individual, based on mental and physical capabilities and functionality. And you know, in diabetes and in medicine and in obesity, doctor is least important now. Medical insurances are least important. The person with the disease is a dysentric, and is a dissenter. And these attempts, classifying obesity based on USS will help you with a patient-centric approach in addressing obesity. So shall we move on to the next one? One case, one case. So I'll be discussing the first case, and the second case will be discussed by Dr. Sunil Gupta. So this is going to be an interactive case-to-base approach, but because of the time constraints, I don't think it can be interactive, but if it can be interactive, let us see. Hmm? <laughs> so uh, this is the overall theme. And this clinical approach, you remember Dr. Sunil Gupta discussing about the various factors leading to obesity. And whenever there is a weight gain and a weight loss, there is always a tendency to regain weight. So here is a person, a 63-year-old male. So imagine that he is there in your clinic, a prototype of a person visiting your hospital with a BMI of 42. Of course, we all have such people visiting us with end organ damage such as osteoarthritis. He has got pain over there. He has plantar fasciitis and he has sleep apnea. He has pre-diabetes. So he has a lot of complications and consequences secondary to obesity. And he has attempted multiple uh, weight loss programs. And he has probably been successful in reducing around 10 kilograms. Is he exercising? He's trying to exercise, but very little daily, only 10 to 15 minutes. But that to only three or five days a week. And he describes himself as a foodie. He's traveling a lot. And the family history is also contributory because there are more than 100 factors, genetic factors contributing to obesity. And that is also probably contributory. There is positive family history to obesity and multiple other consequences. And he has attempted treatment with other medications, anti-obesity medications, that is AOM, but not effective. Dr. Sulingapta has described about the reasons for obesity, the RP8 nucleus, the agouti related protein, the GLP-1, the satiety hormone, the ghrelin. So multiple factors and all of them culminating in multiple disabilities. So he has the pain of osteoarthritis, he has the pain of, uh, pain of plantar fasciitis, he has sleep apnea. So now, how are you going to break this cycle? But before that, this is the life history of a person with obesity and most of the time, this is similar in most of our patients. Soon after high school, soon after college, having a job and then suddenly there is an increase in the body weight. 
and then with diet they may be successful in losing the weight and subsequently they will again start gaining weight so this is a cycle losing weight and gaining weight and ultimately at the end of the marriage he is again now with weight gain but there now there is a roadblock now he is there with weight gain and unable to even move around so we need to break this cycle we need to break this cycle of chronic pain because obesity is a disease where there are multiple reasons for chronic pain and this guy sunil 43 years has pain of arthritis he has pain of osteoarthritis of the knee and then plantar fasciitis cervical spondylosis and because of the pain of course there will be depression there is fear of movement he cannot move around so there is negative self efficacy and all these are contributing to the inflammatory factors and also the depression so what about this uh, evidence so far the evidence so far even for mild to moderate or even for modest weight loss let us consider 11% weight loss just 11% weight loss whatever be the reason for the weight loss or however he is losing the weight that will contribute to significant changes improvements in the pain of osteoarthritis significant improvement in stiffness and this is the overall improvement let us review the data from the step clinical trial step is the clinical development program where the injectable semaglutide 2.4 mg once weekly is compared against placebo and some of these clinical trials have been done in india as well so when you are comparing the three cohorts here those with more than or equal to 15% weight loss because with injectable semaglutide our people with obesity can have robust weight loss because it is capable of inducing huge weight loss and if you look at these people with greater weight loss it is also directly correlating with higher the weight loss better the improvement in physical functioning so that is a direct correlation so what are the solutions available in india the solutions available in india of course liraglutide is available but not at approved for weight loss but still many of us we are all using it for weight loss therapies the 3 mg as a off label indication orlistat very difficult minimal but with side effects and we have one more drug which is approved i don't know whether you are aware of the fact that injectable semaglutide is approved in india it is a medication which is approved by cdso in india and this is a once weekly injectable but not at launched in our country it is a blockbuster drug in many many other countries once weekly injectable semaglutide 2.4 mg and the trade name is vegovi and our guy but before that what are the indications in india we have those with bmi more than or equal to 30 or 27 or more with other comorbidities that is indication for a weight loss drug in india based on multiple other studies because we don't have an india specific study for our indian bmi standards so our guy was lucky and he went for a therapy in a clinical trial he was enrolled in a clinical trial where he received once weekly 2.4 mg of injectable semaglutide and he was successful in losing 16% so that amounts to around 18 kg for him so there was an 18 kg uh, uh, weight loss for him at the end of the clinic towards the end of the clinic you can see that there was a sustainable improvement in the weight during the course of period when he was enrolled in the clinical trial and he was actually about to have a knee surgery remember he is having osteoarthritis affecting both the knee but by the time he was getting prepared the clinical trial stopped <laughs> and uh, th th that is something which is a mystery there and the moment you remember dr sunil gupta discussing in the beginning the moment the medication was stopped he started gaining weight again so this is a step one extension trial where it is compared with placebo with you can see there is a steady reduction in the body weight and this is beyond the clinical trial when gradually gradually and this happens with any weight loss medication or with any weight loss trial whether it is a diet or an exercise whatever be the modality for a weight loss this happens so now the question to the audience is 
what is the solution for because the person is in front of you and uh, he need to go for a surgery for his knee with osteoarthritis and he need to reduce the weight further but this medication is no longer available and uh, probably he also cannot afford the medication even if, when it is available in india i don't know this is a hypothetical situation so these are the three choices for you number one restart aom that is anti obesity medication until the bmi is 25 restart the anti obesity medication bmi is around 42 continue weight management but without any medications that is the third choice so can i invite some responses from the audience please because it is supposed to be an interactive lecture before continue weight management without aom pardon so that is one response without aom uh, but here the challenge is he has tried multiple other modalities for weight loss earlier and he is also having end organ damage and he is almost bound to the wheelchair and without aom there is he is having limited capacity to exercise as well yes please sir to restart aom to restart aom yes first is until bmi falls 25 okay that is one sridhar sir yeah your comments will be very valuable sir you can speak even without mic or you can come here sir yeah no, but your speech yeah. is exciting <coughs> obesity is a chronic disease just like hypertension or diabetes so there's nothing like s- stopping the treatment science may say that you have to stop it after one year or two years or whatever like you give the off label uh, uh, use of semaglutide for weight loss we'll have to try to continue it as long as it is possible so there may not be much of science behind it but if you want to induce the weight loss or make the patient lose weight we'll have to use it as long as it is possible this is at least uh, some of the uh, bariatric specialists they say that think of obesity as a lifelong disease and like all lifelong diseases it needs lifelong management and you yourself mentioned that uh, lifestyle measures are effective up to a point and once you stop the drugs the weight is regained so it's a catch 22 situation we don't have much of choice but we try to use it as much as we possibly can thank you thank you very much sir for the inputs very valuable inputs and very valuable suggestions anything else say so, uh, next next okay i will conclude so and uh, here the uh, the answer here is uh, with uh, uh, anti obesity medications and restarting them it will be almost impossible to reach a bmi of 25 uh, because we need to be realistic going by the smart goals of current therapies you need to be it need to be achievable and we need to be realistic and here the only uh, solution will be to restart anti obesity medication and as you know uh, the oral semaglutide which is available in our country that is ribelsus is approved for treating diabetes and the double the dose of the same medication is approved globally for uh, weight loss the injectable once weekly the smaller doses are for diabetes and that is also big globally and once weekly 2.4 mg is approved for the treatment of obesity globally and in india also it is approved but the medication is currently not launched in india because of the high global demand it is getting delayed so here what they have done is they have restarted the anti obesity medication and the person again started losing weight so the uh, take home message is we need to have multiple strategies along with medications as i said the behavioral modica- modifications diet and exercise so i stop here and uh, moving thank on to you. the next case so the thank next, you very much the next case will be taken by dr sunil gupta you will tell us about this chest pain has made me think about tackling my weight yeah. 
So I'll be very brief uh, on this case, uh, management of obesity and its complication, an interactive case-based discussion. This chest pain has made me think about uh, tackling about my weight. I feel the focus is towards, uh, uh, towards the macroangiopathy. So we have Ash Ashok, 62-year-old man, and uh, his uh, uh, BMI is 40, and his 130 kg weight, pre-diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, osteoarthritis, two previous attempts of weight loss, uh, uh, at best achieving maximum of 5% reduction. Uh, weight loss has never been sustained, uh, has not previously been interested in discussing other forms of treatment of obesity till coronary artery, or till he got chest pain, which was diagnosed as angina. Now he got motivated and he said that now he would like to have a, have a weight loss. Through lifestyle modification, he could reduce a, by 4%. Now he explores further options. Now question to audiences, which obesity related complication do you encounter most commonly in, in patient with obesity? I feel I'll not waste much time, but we have uh, the uh, this additive risk of type 2 diabetes in obesity and pre-diabetes is coronary artery disease. If you just have obesity, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes is around 5%. If you just have pre-diabetes, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes is around 6.7%. But you have, if you have diabetes as well as uh, pre-diabetes as well as obesity, then the risk of developing diabetes is almost 17.4%. And the coronary artery disease, cerebral vascular disease, marked infarction in pre-diabetes and diabetes, I feel I don't need to go in detail of it because every one of you know, knows that pre-diabetics as well as people with type 2 diabetes are uh, known to have higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Now the effect of weight loss, uh, uh, if you have 0 to 5% weight loss, you tackle hypertension tri uh, and hyperglycemia. If you have 5 to 10% weight loss, the uh, you can have prevention of type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, PCOs, and dyslipidemia. 10 to 15% weight loss. Most of the studies, they expect you to be at least 5%, and 5 to 10%, most of them, they achieve. But if you, if you have 10 to 15% of the base weight loss, cardiovascular disease, urinary stress, incontinence, NASH, they have observed that fa the, the fat in the, in the hepatic cells, intrahepatic cells, have found to be less. NASH, they have seen the uh, reduce reduction in the fibrosis uh, in, in the liver and then obst uh, obstructive sleep apnea, GERD and knee or, uh, osteoarthritis. And if you have more than 15% weight loss, what we have seen in the injectable semaglutide, then you have seen type 2 diabetes remission, cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization for heart failure. So you have changed from the baseline at 104 weeks of semaglutide versus placebo. You have waste, uh, waste uh, circumference, systolic blood pressure, C-reactoprotein, triglyceride, all were statistically significantly lower uh, in, in patient with uh, 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 versus placebo. And there's a look ahead trial where they have seen type, uh, subject with type 2 diabetes, MACE is reduced when you have the, uh, when you have the uh, weight reduction of, of more than 10% versus less than 10%. So if you have that more than 10% reduction of weight, you end up with having the benefit in the coronary artery disease. And there are multiple trials of uh, various, uh, uh, various GLP-1 agonist. And if you see here, sustain 6 seems to have uh, uh, numbers higher versus others. But overall, uh, they have shown that there is a CV benefit in this uh, group. I feel this is, the, this is possibly the last slide that you have some uh, trial which is already in plan where you have a CV outcome trial in patient with overweight and obesity and cardiovascular disease may or may not have diabetes. And they have two arms, 2.54 milligram of SEMA versus placebo. And it's an event driven trial. And the primary outcome is going to be first occurrence of maze. Secondary is going to be re, uh, re, uh, uh, randomization to cardiovascular death and all cause death. I feel this trial is going to be coming in future. Thank you, Thank you very much. And as I promised to chairperson, I'll try to finish up well in time. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, they are welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sunil Gupta and Dr. Jyoti Dev. I think we can have two questions from the floor. So uh, if there is any question from the floor. Yes, Dr. Alok, uh, you can ask. So uh, the question. Oral semaglutide has, been, has not been approved for non-diabetic obese people. It's only injectable semaglutide across the globe has been approved for obesity and injectable liraglutide. 
Injectable recruited in India also. It's, it's also approved in non-diabetics. But not in India yet. Yeah. yeah. It's not available also. Three milligram. Right. The three milligram is not available with us. Excellent symposia. Uh, my question is that recently NEGM had shown uh, tirzepatide, which is a dual GLP-1 agonist and GIP agonist. So uh, what are your comments on this? It must be ben better than semaglutide, which is there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a GLP-1 and GIP. It's a dual uh, uh, agonist, and, and it has found to be have a higher weight loss versus any of the other GLP-1 analog across and uh, it is being you know, even available in few of the countries now. So it has been approved by uh, uh, various organizations, it's being, it's being taken. And it's, it's a drug which is again uh, uh, very promising for obesity. In it few. seems to be game changer, it, yes. I mean it can replace even by Presently we have only SEMA as a game changer, we'll wait for it, yes. Thank you. So with that, thank you very much both the speakers and we finish this session. One minute before time. And now, there is one another very, very important topic now. And that will be delivered by Dr. Anjana Ranjit. Anj Dr. Anjana, you are here? So I would like both these speakers to be here on the dais itself. She will speak on the reversal of diabetes, how real it is. Dr. Anjana is Managing Director and Diabetologist at Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Specialty Center and Vice President, Madras Diabetes Research Foundation, Chennai. Main research areas are prevention of diabetes, epidemiology, physical activity, transitional research, and technology related to diabetes. PI and co-PI for several national and international projects. Nearly 300 papers in prestigious national and international peer-reviewed journals and delivered lectures in several national and international conferences. She has received several awards and she is the member of various scientific bodies. So now the stage is yours, Dr. Anjana. Sir, thank you so very much uh, for the kind introduction. At the outset, thank you to the organizers, especially Anuj Maheshwari, sir, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be a part of this meeting. So I've been asked to talk about reversal of diabetes, how real is it? And I have no conflict of interest to declare. So when we talk about reversal, first let's talk about the natural history of diabetes. Usually we go from the state of glucose tolerance, normal glucose tolerance, to pre-diabetes, to clinical diabetes, and on to the state of complications. And all these years we've been talking about prevention, prevention of diabetes, prevention of complications, etc. But now the new kid on the block is going in the opposite direction, from diabetes to pre-diabetes, maybe all the way down to normal. Now what is reversal? The definition that has been approved and used worldwide is the term remission given by the ADA. So this is defined as an A1C of less than 6.5 for a period of at least three months without any oral antihyperglycemic agent. So this definition is what is being used. Now what is the evidence we have so far? Now initially, we had the first evidence came from this study from the UK, which was called the counterpoint study. What did they do? They just took 11 people with diabetes and looked at, gave them a liquid 8600 calorie diet. So it's just liquid meal replacement, full day, and they did, did it for a period of a few weeks, eight weeks to be precise, and looked at hepatic glucose output, insulin sensitivity, uh, pancreatic and liver triazylglycerol content. What did they find? They found superb responses. So right in week, so this is glucose. Right in week one, you'll see it zooms down to normal. The red is control, so they have an equal number of controls as well. The red line is control and almost, you know, on par with control, it was able to do that. Liver uh, fat came down, uh, pancreatic fat came down, insulin sensitivity improved almost to normal levels. So this was the first evidence that they were able to bring about normalcy of glucose through this diet. They then went on to do the next study called the counterbalance study, wherein they extended this study for the period of six months. Same thing, six months, but what they did is they went from liquid to same isocaloric solid weight maintenance. What did they show? Now two things. 
The first thing is weight loss. So uh, the other thing here is that in counterbalance, they had two types of groups. So one is the short duration diabetes, less than four, four years duration. Second was long duration diabetes, more than eight years. So in weight loss, what did you see? Whether it was short duration, long duration, weight came zooming down, stayed down. Okay, so that was great. Now what happened to diabetes? In short, sorry, uh, what happened to fasting glucose? The short duration, it came down, just like we saw in counterpoint, in week one and stayed down. But if duration of diabetes was longer, here, more than eight years, there were three types of responses. One response came down, stayed down, white line. Then there was a, a one that came down, but slowly, slowly, slowly started moving that way. And then the third one, no matter what you did with the weight, sugars did not come down. So with three types of responses based on duration. Then we move on to the direct trial. So this is a larger study uh, done in the US, uh, more hundreds of people, and for about 24 months. So what did they show? Now again, they showed that weight loss is related to reversal. Now here, the degree of weight loss was key. They said that you have to lose at least 10 to 15 kilos in weight in order to remove pancreatic fat and reverse diabetes. So that's what they showed here among intervention and control they show. And this was sustained even at 24 months, which is two years. So this is what they showed. It came down, stayed down. And they also had duration related issues. So shorter duration, good C peptide, the weight loss is good, the reversal happens. So there was a group of people for, for which it worked very well. The key point here is that weight loss was the key to reversal. However, now, how do we put this into the Indian context? Do we have effectiveness more than two years? If I were to tell the people in this room, everyone go on to a 600 calorie liquid diet for the next six months or two years, how many hands are gonna go up now? We can reverse diabetes, we bring your weight down. How many people are gonna put their hand up and said, yes, I'm going to do 600 calorie diet for the next two years? Well, there's not even one, is there? Oh, there's one. So is Jyoti Desa has enrolled. Noted, sir. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we have to have cultural adaptation. In the Indian scenario, the normal patient that you see in your clinic is not going to be very amenable to having liquids and bars and shakes and all. It's not very culturally appropriate in our population. So was there something that we could do that was India-specific, culturally appropriate and acceptable by our population? There were no national population level uh, data for us to look at. We looked at multiple surveys. We looked at NSSO, we looked at NNMB, NFHS. Was there anything that we could do to see whether uh, we could actually bring about this change? So we went then to the ICMR INDIAB study. This is a national study on diabetes and related complications, including risk factors, funded by ICMR and the Department of Health Research, Government of India. So the objective of this particular study, which was published in Diabetes Care a few months ago, was to provide optimal macronutrient recommendations for remission and prevention of type 2 diabetes at a population level in Asian Indian adults. So this is what we did. There were more than one lakh-ish people in the ICMR INDIAB study. On those, we had detailed FFQs in one in five individuals. So from that, we removed all those with diabetes and then looked at about 50, 18, 19,000 individuals were finally analyzed. If you look at the data spread, uh, it will sit exactly on the census population because INDIAB is modeled on that. You will have male, female distribution, urban rural distribution, everything that sits exactly on the census of India. So this is what we did. Now this is a mathematical modeling. I'm not even trying to pretend I know everything that goes into this. I'm a very simple physician, don't understand too much math, but I'll tell you the logic behind what was done. This is called QPP or quadratic programming uh, that was done. So what it does is that now there are three categories of people. There are normals, there are those with pre-diabetes, and there are those with diabetes. Three categories. Now, among those with pre-diabetes, there are two groups. There are people with pre-diabetes who look to become normal, right? And they're with pre-diabetes, 
to prevent diabetes. So there are two kinds of pre-diabetes groups. So now what we did is we took that entire data, we adjust for everything that confounds, so BMI, even other dietary risk factors, age, etc., etc., adjusted for. And we then asked the question, which optimal macronutrient, so this only has carbohydrate, fat, protein, and fiber. Only these macronutrients are there. Which combination of this macronutrients will push the population with newly detected diabetes to remission, which means A1C less than 6.5. Okay, so which combination does that? Same thing for prediabetes. Okay, which combination of macronutrients pushes them to normal? So two categories there. There are two other categories, which is which combination prevents progression to diabetes in a normal and which combination prevents progression to diabetes in a pre-diabetic. So there are four columns that we worked out. Now this is what it is. Right, so to put this in context, these are the current recommenda current population intakes of these four macronutrients. Carbohydrate is about 60-70% of everything the Asian Indian eats. Protein is about 12, fat is about 25, and fiber 3.5. So for newly detected diabetes, about 50% carbohydrate was the recommendation. Today it's at 60-70, bring it down to 50. Protein is at 20, today is at 12, it needs to go to about 20%. Fat is fine where it is, and dietary fiber needs to be doubled almost to about 6. Now this is the basic, and it stays the same. Now this say, changes whether you're in urban area, rural area, man, woman, age, BMI, activity, etc. There are changes, but very minuscule changes. The basic composition stays pretty much the same. What about prediabetes? Little more allowance is there for prediabetes. 55% carb, the rest are pretty much the same. So again, the, I told you if you are in rural area, there's little more allowance. If you're an active individual, more allowance, etc. And uh, men are allowed more, younger people are allowed more. And if you are not overweight, then of course you're allowed more. Very similar things for prediabetes, the same logic. All these only percentage, small, small percentage change only. The basic logic stays the same. So what about the last bit is about prevention of progression to diabetes. Again, similar but not the same. For those with normals, okay, so up to 60%, so this is the plate concept. Carbohydrate is about 55 to 60% here. Protein is again close to 20 and fiber. These are normal individuals without diabetes. And if you have prediabetes, it goes back to the prediabetes recommendation. So that's about it. I'd like to conclude by saying for the first time, we have attempted, we took more than two years to work these out. We now have population-based approaches for remission as well as prevention of progression to diabetes by macronutrient composition changes. The uh, crux of it is to decrease carb, and we're not going into fantastic reductions and making it single-digit carb. It's not sustainable, not doable. This is doable in the Indian kitchen. All you have to do is decrease the amount of carb, increase. Remember, when you decrease carb, you shouldn't increase fat, so increase the protein in instead. And uh, these recommendations, of course, change depending on various subcategories. So is diabetes reversal real? Yes, it is, and hopefully is here to stay. Thank you. A any two questions from the floor? Yes. I just showed you the results. Uh huh. I showed you the four groups. So let me go See, back. See, but Dr. Anjana has uh, told uh, she has rushed through, uh, rushed through the presentation, yeah. but the crux uh, she has already told, uh, and yeah. you can no. summarize no, it uh, for the audience again. Group one, okay. Group two, huh? This is diabetes remission, pre-diabetes remission. Two groups, okay. That subdivision, this is for group one subdivision, urban, rural, active, inactive. Group one subdivision here, group one subdivision, okay. This is group two, pre-diabetes, group two subdivisions. One, two, group two, group two. This is group three, this is group four. 
I just yes. changed the way it was presented. <laughs> Dr. Alok, you want to ask something? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Digital query. Sorry, I, I, mean, I can't hear you. Digital? Uh, there's a concept going on that you create a digital twin. Query, yeah? Uh. Of a diabetic patient, and they claim that it's going to reverse diabetes permanently. You digital have any query reversing diabetes. Digital man is sitting here, Dr. Joshi. Digital Dr. mapping of a diabetic patient, and they look into all the nutrients, the lifestyle, and everything. They create a digital uh, clone of a person. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. You, that one. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they no, I know what you're talking about. a lot about it. Yeah, yeah. And I there, know are, there are big names associated with it. Yeah. And uh, they claim that uh, once you can reach that clone, the digital clone, which is supposed to be the ideal clone of yourself. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. Diabetes is totally and completely reversible. Well, what are your comments about that? Yeah. So that's a good question. Sorry, I hadn't heard the word query before, but I know this is what you're that's, talking about. That's the platform with the so-called... Reversal of diabetes, you know, a lot of patients ask that's being bombarded in a big way today. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Now, this digital, uh, so, so first of all, in the reversal space, there's a lot going on, lot exploding, right? And someone was saying before, it's no longer in the hands of the doctors. It's in the hands of the uh, app guys. Because every app claims that they can reverse diabetes. And the funny thing is, uh, they claim that this reverse, so remember the definition is A1C 6.5. In 10 days, 15 days, how biologically A1C will change in that way, I'm still, you know, wondering. But a lot of it is no, no scientific backing at all. Having said this, this digital clone is a good one. And there is some evidence uh, for this. However, um, I still don't know how much it will work out practically uh, in the remission space. So not just for this, but for a lot of diseases, this is now coming out. Uh, they're trying to get your, basically they're trying to make a good version of you. I don't know whether um, that is a more like a utopian concept, right? It's very nice to have a good version of you, but at the end of the day, you are still you. And you are still eating and putting into your mouth whatever, you know, you get in front of you. You're still doing the same amount of exercise. So maybe it will help a certain group of people. But I'm not sure it will have population level, large scale benefits. I don't know. Yeah. There's a lot of hype around it. I don't Dr. know. It's Modi, very uh, utopian. I think you can discuss it later yeah. on also. And uh, Dr. Anjana has very rightly pointed out, the key here is sustainability. Yes. So what she has highlighted is that, what Dr. Roy Taylor and group has shown that reversal or remission can happen, but that is not sustainable and not a single hand was here which can sustain themselves on 600 kilocalorie diet. But it has been seen in the study that even if 14 to 16 percent of reduction in the diet carbohydrate can prevent the progression of the pre-diabetes or can actually Re uh, remit the stage of the diabetes into pre-diabetes. So this is the take-home message from Dr. Anjana's talk. And all of us can have a discussion uh, with Dr. Anjana after this. And thank you for keeping with the time. And now we close the obesity symposium. And we hand it back to Dr. Dhruvi. If she is here, she was the moderator of the session. Yeah. Thank you. Please join for a photograph. Thank you so much. I think this brings us to the end of all the sessions in this hall for day two of the ACP 2022. And with that, I think I'll hand back to the organizers. Thank you to our very respected chairpersons and all our fabulous speakers for this session of the Obesity Symposia. Let us have a round of applause for all of them, please.
would request uh, Professor Dr. Swati, ma'am, and Dr. Divya Saxena, ma'am, to take the dais and introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much. So now coming to the last part of this uh, academic uh, 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 information, so much we had. Coming to the last talk, we will be having a very senior faculty with us, Dr. Ajay Pandey, and he's going to speak on ST Elevation MI management, one size doesn't fit all. From Banaras, sir, your most, we welcome you to start the talk. Thank you, respected chairpersons. Uh, at the outset, I'm really thankful to the organizers, Dr. Maheshwari, Dr. Verma, and their colleagues. They have given me this opportunity to speak is a very important topic. You know, I am the tail ender batsman today and shifted from, you know, non-striker end to the striker end here because there was some gap of, uh, of scoring the runs. And uh, the topic allotted to me was, you know, one size does not fit to all. So we all know, understand that, you know, uh, uh, people, everybody sitting in the hall cannot have a similar size of, of shirt, similar size of trousers. The so same is the case with medicine as well, because we all are discussing today since morning the basics uh, and, and beyond. So acute myocardial infarction, as we all know as a physician, that is basically the most devastating atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. And time is muscle in this is disease because as the time is rushing on, we have to tackle these patients. And as a, as a clinician, as a cardiovascular physician, as a treating internist, we all understand that acute coronary syndrome is a bigger terminology for all these patients. And patients of acute coronary syndrome, they can present as a non-ST elevation MI or an ST elevation MI. Though ST elevation MI thought to be a little more dangerous, but that's not the case always. And non-ST elevation MI is where the troponins are raised as a biomarker with an acute chest pain is similarly same uh, abnormalities are there. How can we differentiate between STEMI and non-STEMI? We all know that the ECG abnormality of ST elevation and uh, troponin levels are highly raised. These are the, the, the most extreme part of an acute coronary syndrome which is most dangerous as well. And the pathophysiology changes, why? Because the, the atherosclerotic plaque which gets ruptured leads to, you know, there is a complete thrombus formation when there is a clot formation in a st STEMI case, whereas in non-STEMI, there is a partial clot resolution and there comes no, a role of uh, anticoagulation and dual antiplatelet. But the thrombolytic therapies are important for STEMI cases. We were discussing just now in the, in the previous hall the difference between uh, women and men in their diabetic management and diabetic uh, complication. And here is the cave as STEMI also because whenever we are 
looking for the STEMI patients, why the all STEMI patients are not same because we have to risk stratify them. Few of them may be having a low risk, but few of them may be having a high risk. It depends upon their time of presentation. You know, the time of presentation is the most important aspect because at the time of presentation, even the patient may, may have a negative acute coronary syndrome, patient may have a negative biomarker, but if you repeat it after three hours, because many times what we see as a clinician and, and our junior resident may see a patient of chest pain and do their troponin immediately, troponin will be negative and they refer the patient as a non-cardiac and refer them back. But these patients, they need to be observed in a chest pain, chest pain clinics or a chest pain or, you know, holding centers. And we need to see as a troponin levels after three hours. If it is positive, we have to look for the ECG changes as well as, you know, different other, other things as a risk stratification. So why one size can't fit, you know, to all of our, our patients of STEMI? Because there are patient variables. We have different type of patient. Transportation issues are the biggest problem nowadays in our country. Different types of hospitals. Now, you know, the, the trials which have been done, studies have been done in our own country of, uh, in Tamil Nadu regarding the STEMI India program. There are different types of hospitals, and we all understand that most of our hospitals are not PCI capable all the time. Even those who are having PCI facilities, they can't do it 24 into, into 7. Time from the symptom onset, when the patient reached to you, what was the time when the symptom chest pain has started? Because time is the most important part of STEMI management. Cost issue, patient came to us in a, in, a, in a window period of less than 120 minute, but the patient doesn't have a penny in their pocket. And most of the time, as an interventional cardiologist, if we have to take the patient, we have to take it, you know, on our own risk, and the patient will be able to pay or not in a cities like Varanasi from where I used to come up. Social problems, you all must be hearing and looking into the social media regarding the, you know, regarding the trauma, regarding the, the issues, regarding the uh, violence which patients are doing because STEMI patients, they are prone to die any time within next 24 to 70 hours because of arrhythmic events. Patient attendants, they are always violent, their expectations are high. Different clinical status as all STEMI are not same. So if a STEMI patient comes to you, when and what to treat? Are they stable? Are they in shock? How to treat? Whether we should give a pharmacotherapy or should take them for a technical, you know, PCI. Systems of care in primary PCI. Most of us, being a cardiologist also, are unable to do a primary PCI in cities like Varanasi and others. Why? Because I mean, they didn't come in time. If they come in time, the, the finance is the biggest issue. So pharmaco-invasive approach or fibrinolysis and pharmaco-invasive strategy is still the important aspect. So if I have to, to manage my STEMI patient, my roadmap will be the choice of reperfusion strategy. This is the most important aspect. If the patient is going to a PCI-capable hospital, the management will change. Going for a non-PCI-capable hospital, that we will definitely like to follow a pharmaco-invasive strategy. Medical management is always an important aspect of STEMI, and we have to take our medical, you know, drugs in a proper doses. Management of complications are important, and risk assessment post-MI and post-STEMI and post-hospital discharge is, is equally important. So the, as I said, that the time is much less, and the patient delay in the management is the most important aspect. And suppose the patient's the first medical contact which is there with with uh, the patient and the healthcare professional. And that time is very, very important. So from first medical contact, uh, the, the, the time clock starts and we need to see what is the symptom onset and what is the, what the first time when the patient is, is com coming to the healthcare professionals. So th we all face these problems in our management of STEMI in our clinical practice regarding from self-medication, lack of awareness that STEMI, they behave like it's a gas formation, Delay in a call for medical at attention or ambulance, transportation difficulties, poor trained paramedics, poorly equipped ambulances, lack of primary PCI facility, and so on. But if you look into this right side of the slide, there is a time when you know when the patient starts STEMI and you diagnose by doing an ECG, the first 120 minutes is very, very important. And that is a real important time if the patient comes to a PCI capable hospital. That is the important time. Alter, alter is, is the patient can be, can
can be diagnosed at that moment by a, an ECG and alert to, to transfer to PCI capable hospital. It is better to do a primary PCI in this 120 minutes of window period. If we are unable to do that, but then don't leave the patient. Don't, you know, do anything and just give antiplatelet therapy and refer the patient. Thrombolize the patient, that's the main and the most important aspect of management of STEMI in country like us. Why? Because fibrinolysis is the most important part in our country and pharmacoinvasive strategy is, is still the most important part. If you thrombolize the patient as early as possible and then transfer the patient to PCI is a capable center, that's really very, very important aspect. And there, the, they, within next 20 hours, 24 hours or so, the patient can be taken up for, P, for PCI if it is required, or if the patient is not able to pay, they, they can be still to manage with the medical therapy, and we can see that whether the, the thrombolysis was effective or not. The STEMI care in India was, was first, uh, you know, very well studied in, a, uh, in the STEMI pilot study from Tamil Nadu. Uh, where they have, you know, taken all the spoke and hub hospitals and they have followed this program that from the diagnosis at the, of uh, uh, STEMI in the ambulance, they are for paramedics, they can send the ECGs to the, these uh, uh, spoke and hub uh, uh, hospitals, those who can, if they are capable of PCI, they immediately they can be transferred to PCI capable hospitals and the PCI can be done. If, the, if, the, if they're coming at the odd hours and PCI cannot be done, even the pharmacoinvasive strategy means doing an in intervention within 24 hours may be the other best possible type of care. So what the STEMI guidelines says, I take it with an example like a 56-year-old male coming to the hospital within two hours, that is 120 minute of onset of chest pain. This is a period if the patient comes to you and the PCI capable hospital is there, the best way to treat this patient is do a PCI to this patient. ECG shows an ST elevation in anterior lateral lead. Blood pressure is stable. Heart rate is stable. He is not in shock. He is a past smoker with a past medical history of hypertension. The ECG looks like that. There is an ST elevation in 1 AVL, V1, V2, V3. Uh, These slides were not running, but the angiogram shows that you know, there was a, uh, uh, there is a 80 to 90 percent stenosis in left anterior descending as well as RCA both. The two arteries are involved, but the culprit artery was LAD. And many times we face this problem that what to do if the patient comes with two arteries, severe obstruction, and am I occurring in, in one of them? So the question comes to us that whether we should treat the one infarct-related artery only, or we go for both of the arteries, those are having critical lesion. What antiplatelet therapy should we give? How long should we give? And these are the two you know, important slides which will give you the whole lot of, you know, uh, how to manage a STEMI and the STEMI guidelines reality. That if the STEMI is confirmed and the patient goes to a PCI-capable hospital, load with aspirin, clopidogrel, or ticagrelol, and with the, if the person is having first medical contact to device time is less than 120, or two, uh, 120 minutes or two hours, and they can afford a primary angioplasty, which definitely cost in a any private hospital, not less than 1.5 lakh rupees. Government hospitals, they, do, they can do it within 50, 60,000 rupees. If yes, the primary PCI is the best possible management. If no, then thrombolytic therapy. Don't, if, if no, if the patient cannot afford a primary angioplasty, it doesn't mean the patient can't do anything. Thrombolize the patient immediately, and, and that will give the real benefit. Thrombolysis, and followed with, you know, uh, unfractionated heparin or a low molecular weight heparin, which drug you will prefer as a thrombolytic therapy? Definitely, I will prefer for my own patients, uh, you know, second or third generation thrombolytic therapies like tenecteplase, retiplase, LTplase, because they have got a better, you know, arterial uh, TME grade three flow and lift gives a better survival as well as the less amount of damage. So even the patient cannot afford it, at least gives streptokinase of 2,000 rupees if they can have going to have at least some effect. If the patient is not in a PCI capable hospital, at least load with aspirin and, do, and dual antiplatelet. If there's no contraindication to thrombolysis, thrombolize them. If yes, high risk STEMI or cardiogenic shock or heart failure, refer them to primary PCI capable hospital. If if within, if it patient comes to you more than three hours of the first medical contact, 
and it is less than 120, still you, patient can go for primary PCI. But if, if it comes after two hours, then definitely within less than 24 hours, you can thrombolize them if the patient is having chest pain ongoing. Definitely after 12 hours of window period, uh, the, the effectivity doesn't uh, stand good. But if it is less than three hours, it may be as effective as primary PCI. So thrombolysis is very, very good. And if the thrombolytic therapy will tell you, and there are few parameters that you can judge whether the patient is having a successful thrombolysis or not. If the patient is having a successful thrombolysis, the patient can still afford to go for primary angioplasty, transfer the patient to PCI capable hospital and angioplasty, or at least coronary angiogram can be done within the next 24 hours. This is regarding the uh, uh, STEMI patient protocol due to window period after 12 hours. Suppose patient comes to you after 12 hours, a late presentation, then these patient, if they're having hypotension, heart failure, electrical instability, these are the patient who require, you know, intervention and they should be referred to a hospital for CAG. And if the culprit artery is, is, is still having some lesions which are really to be, to be revascularized, it has to be done. If the patient is stable after 12 hours, you can manage them medically and you can patient make them, a, you know, assess the pre-discharge probability whether is any amount of ischemia is there. If the pre-discharge probability shows a high risk probability for ischemia or viability, take them for a coronary angiogram and these patients, they require an intervention. If it is negative, you can follow them on medical therapy. So those who are coming even after 24 hours, this was the, the slide which I, I was showing you. If the CAG reveals 100% occlusion, because many times we have seen the patient coming to you after 24 hours, we did his angiogram because the patient ejection fraction was less than 40%. If they're coming less, after 24 hours, the injection fraction is less, you have to do their angiogram and see what is their anatomy is. If it is 100% occluded, there's no benefit doing an angioplasty in that patient, at least assess the viability, whether the patient has got a viable myocardium or not. If the subtotal occlusion of the infarct-related artery, we can take them for angioplasty. If the patient is not high risk or EF is not less than 40, we can do a pre-discharge evaluation. This is... A, for STEMI in less than 12 hours and 12 to 24 hours, uh, we all can understand that there are two groups, thrombolyzed and non-thrombolyzed, and it depends upon the PCI facility. And why we are thinking of, you know, this time duration? Because there's a difference between a non-STEMI and STEMI. Non-STEMI, there's a, uh, the medical management versus interventional management doesn't have too much of uh, differences, but in STEMI, you can see as the time passes, the mortality increases. There are a few important uh, uh, terminology which have been discussed because, but with the paucity of time, I'm not discussing it here. These are the questions, uh, these are the recommendations regarding reperfusion therapy by the European Society, uh, which I have already discussed with you in a, in, a, in a bar diagram. So the adjective therapies are definitely important and antiplatelet therapies are re really important. A loading dose needs to be given for a clopidogrel of 600 milligram followed with 75, prasogrel of 60 milligram followed with 10, and if the patient is using ticagrelor, it should be given. So it is very difficult to, uh, to, to take on STEMI uh, assessment and management in 15 minutes. So I have summarized those important points, but uh, I just want to add two, I, I will just take uh, another two minutes or so. Routine medical therapies are equally important for STEMI patients regarding beta blockers, but it should not be given to all patients. And an intravenous beta blocker has got no role. We should avoid in patients, you know, those who are having heart block and, ha and severe LV dysfunction. Renin angiotensin, they are class one indication, and these and MRAs are aplinone or aldectone are also uh, important. Lipid management has already been discussed. Oxygen nitrate and CCBs are required, but oxygen is required when the patient is having less than 90%. Ventricular arrhythmias needs to be managed. ICD therapy doesn't require immediately, but for the arrhythmias, those are having after 48 hours. Bready arrhythmias needs to be managed, and pericarditis after STEMI has, has a role of aspirin in, in managing them, and uh, class 2BC for acetaminophen and colchicine. Blood sugar monitoring is very, very important by the NICE sugar guidelines. And it is said that tight glucose control of 80 to 108 is an important uh, part. Risk strategy, we can do it by submaximal exercise test. 
and uh, now coming to the the important parts and and the uh, the cardiac rehabilitation principle that we should not leave all our cardiac uh, STEMI patients without advising them for a cardiac rehabilitation. So to summarize my, my points of STEMI management, uh, what I mean to say that STEMI are the most critical phases of ACS and patient in India and uh, uh, patient that are in uh, India, the ACS have higher rate of STEMI. So we have to take care of them particularly. Pharmacological treatment is as important and pharmacology, pharmacoinvasive strategies pre-hospital thrombolysis are equally good. Patient awareness, education, and plan of action, we have to make them educated. We have to advise them how to, to, to behave post STEMI and their, their routine management. Physician's plan of action should be time dependent, as we all know that STEMI, time is muscle. Immediate ECG in the patient of suspected MI to confirm STEMI, avoid delay, systemic protocol, and pharmacoinvasive concept of ACS is very, very important. So as we all understand that, you know, medicine doesn't mean a coronary intervention. Medicine doesn't mean a pharmaco pharmacological treatment as well. Medicine means a practice of, of a triad of patient, skill knowledge, and place of practice. So as I'm practicing at a very small place as a cardiologist can't do, you know, uh, all the science which I know it. So the logic will get you from A to B, but our imagination sometimes take us everywhere. So I end up with my talk. Thank you all, and sorry to extend my, my time limit. So thank you all for, for your patient hearing. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Ajay, for uh, summarizing, topic, summarizing the topic very well, though you have to rush the slides uh, because of the paucity of time. So the take home message is that, that every size, one size doesn't fit all. So uh, PCI, primary PCI, is definitely the preferred choice of treatment. But somewhere it is not possible because of affordability, maybe because of non-availability. But thrombolysis can definitely be done. And if affordability is not the uh, reason or not the issue, then tenecteplase, retiplase are the drug of choices. But definitely we should thrombolyze every patient if not primary PCI can be done by streptokinase. So thank you so much, Dr. Ajay Pandey, for uh, such a wonderful deliberation. Thank you, thank you. so much. Now we, uh, yeah. All right. I think we should conclude this session and we would like the organizers to please start with their further program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swati and Dr. Divya. Welcome all. I think we have come to the final leg for the day and that will be with our governor's address. So I would request Dr. Tiffany, who is the ambassador for ACP, to come on to the dais to chair this session. And. Uh, we also have Dr. Sai Jayaprakash, who is uh, advisor to government of Andhra Pradesh in Swacha Andhra Pradesh, Abhiyan. And we request Sai also to <laughs> occupy the chair. Now I would call upon our honorable governor to come and have his address. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So ultimately, I got my chance also. <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> waiting for a long, uh, but it has been really been a very wonderful conference. Although I am organizer, one of the organizer, I should not say, but what kind of the topics has been discussed and the way people remained stuck with their seats, this uh, really has made me quite uh, happy. And uh, it's really, I think uh, uh, this is a thing which for which I am really very feeling very proud and uh, it is a uh, great pleasure for me. So this is the theme of the topic, uh, theme of the conference, what we kept that back to basics. Do we need to go back Osler's medicine? So before going in the depth of this topic, we must understand what was the Osler's medicine. William Osler was a great physician, many people know this, and many of our speakers has quoted this quote of William Osler, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. But uh, many uh, people doesn't know who was the William Osler and what he has really done 
because we Indians are usually looking and knowing our own heroes also. But William Osler was a tremendous personality and everybody should know about him. He has been born in 1849 and 1919 he died. Is generally regarded as one of the greatest and most admired physician in the history of medicine. An outstanding clinician, he possessed extraordinary charm which inspired many pupils. Osler's stretched bedside teaching, hard work, medical history, and lifelong learning. As professor of medicine at four institutions in three countries, four institutions, three countries, he exerted a profound influence on medical education. He was a prolific writer, his textbook become the most popular and widely read treatise on the med medicine in the world. His humanistic philosophy was reflected in all aspects of his life. Osler blended the art and science of medicine, perhaps better than anyone else, and remains a valuable role model for students and physicians. In fact, when it has been prompted about what would Sir William Osler wanted on his gravestone, he confidently started that, confidently stated that he wanted to be known for his teaching. Educating the medical students and always being near the bedside for the patient, it was his passion. Sir Osler curated infamous novel uh, ideologies that still continue to thrive in the fraternity all across the globe. From inventing journal clubs for the medical professionals to introducing residency in an effort to keep the physicians educated and informed at every step by their peers. Residency is a soul of nowadays medicine, current medicine, we all know that. In India also, we can't survive without residency. And journal club is really a thing which can improve our learning abilities. We talk a lot about the variability. Today, many of our speakers have talked about the variability in various aspects of the medicine, including the blood pressure, including the diabetes, but very few of understand that variability of the life. Variability is the law of life, and as no two faces are the same, so no two bodies are also alike, and no two individuals react alike and behave alike under the abnormal conditions which we know as disease. So whenever a two persons or three persons are alike in situations, you can understand that this is the situation which is not normal. It must be some disease. He started his career from teaching of the anatomy and he was having a very good interest for the pathology. He spent much of his clinical work managing the smallpox. And after moving to Pennsylvania in 1884, Pennsylvania is the place where ACP headquarter lies. He carried on publishing extensively and also began presenting his pathological and clinical research internationally, including in London on endocarditis in 1885, the condition arguably is most linked to the modern practice. Once he started that journal, it is sparkled with published articles, correspondence and lectures on the topics ranging from platelets to pneumonia and from cerebral palsy to the chorea, a diverse subject matter event by today's standards. He even wrote about the benefits of the learning from medical history, telling the student that they may be helped to get into the habit of looking at a subject from the historical endpoint, standpoint. His textbook, The Principles and Practice of Medicine, was remarkably approachable for students and was an instant international success, secondary to Osler's extensive publications, lectures, and educational curriculum writing. So this is another very important Osler's quote which we must understand. One of the very duties of the physician is to educate the masses, not to take the medicine. Educate the masses not by simply saying that you should do this or you should not do this, but by doing also. And we also tried today morning, once uh, Sai, Jai Prakash Sai asked us to come for Swachh Bharat Abhiyan and myself and my wife went there. And first time we experienced of doing the, uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, doing that uh, this service at the public place although in our house we usually do this but in public place first time we experienced this and thanks sai for this uh, wonderful experience so these were the <coughs> these were the people those who were there and they listened us they joined us in, the, in this activity they also did the same thing so i must want to say here that if you do something very good people always follow that if a person who is the having some standing in the society he is doctor he is doing some social service many people starts following that and probably we are we are forgetting this science of the medicine so let's come back to the oslers methods of the medicine although we have not deviated even before with the oslers method so that is also a part of the oslers method osler believed that all medical students should be taught at the bedside instead of having their heads permanently buried in books but what we do and what we see nowadays all our medical students remained with the books they remained buried in the books all the time may it be real book or it may be the virtual book or it may be the book online but they are rarely going towards the bedside very less going to the bedside bedside and covid has also made us little farther bedside clinic so bedside clinic and bedside teaching is the soul of the medicine and that should always be followed patient should be seen as both the starting point and the conclusion of the clinical procedure i remember one of my teachers saying when i was doing md he said that whenever you see the patient you must commit a diagnosis you must write the diagnosis whatever is you and is coming in your mind and many a times you will find that you have started with the common cold but ended with the tuberculosis many a times you will notice that you have started with the tuberculosis but ended with something very uh, a very small thing which was not required to be having that much of the attention so and it it has really happened i really uh, experienced this so i always tell to my students that whenever you are seeing any patient first commit the diagnosis and write that on the prescription not necessarily uh, you are committing the diagnosis in your own mind no no that is not enough you must write on the paper and then you see how much changes you are getting whenever you are moving further uh, forward with the disease or with the progression of disease or with the investigations or with the clinical examination it's much more important to know what sort of the patient has a disease than what sort of the disease a patient has so his belief was behavior unaffected by conflict the practice of medicine is an art not a trade a calling not a business a calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head many a times we also don't do that we also forgotten in which we keep on uh, taking the mind and heart together many a times only mind works but heart does not i don't mean heart actually heart which is pumping the blood i mean the heart which is also in the brain but thinks about sympathetically with the people so that is the most important dr murugnathan has taken that talk today about the empathy i think many of us must have liked that so developing rapport with patients students and colleagues is one of the very important lesson of the oslers medicine probably which we are forgetting day by day because of what so many conflicts we see in our day to day practice so many violence we see against the doctors careful observations and application of the clinical method to develop a working diagnosis that we have already discussed treatment based on the emerging scientific evidence and publishing the finding for a wider audience this last one is also very much important for the indian clinicians and indian physicians indian clinicians do lot of work they see big number of the patient they are very knowledgeable they are very good in the clinical sense but they never publish their experience they very rarely publish their experience and that is biggest shortcoming because of what we are not identified what we should be the concept of the patient centered care should be learn to study patient 
not cases, individuals, not diseases. But do we need to go back to Osler's medicine? This answer we really, uh, we really should know and we should keep that in mind. And whatever I told you about William Osler, I think most of us will agree we should go back to the Osler's medicine nowadays. Despite growing technology, despite uh, so many things which are coming up which does not need to touch the patient, but touching the patient is one of the most important art which is required by every clinician and every clinician should develop it as an art, not as a science. So ACP India chapter is actually growing in the way to make multiple doctors and multiple members of the India chapter towards the empathy, towards the principles of the Osler. And we across the year doing such kind of a program, you can see that uh, the program which we did at Lucknow, you can see the program in which uh, we have done in Noida with Amit and uh, his team, in which uh, we did the uh, Iris project started on that day. Similarly, we have done one program in the, uh, uh, one program in Calcutta in which uh, Dr. Raj Shekhar is also can be seen here. He was from Chennai. Uh, he was from Tamil Nadu. And apart from that, so many more programs. N a number of pictures are there. We cannot keep all the pictures here. This is the today's morning program where I ha have been invited by Sai Jai Prakash. So once we talk about the ACP high value care, what is the ACP high value care? This is actually aims to improve health, avoid harms, and eliminate wasteful practices. Initiative addresses high value care broadly, offering learning resources for clinicians and medical educators. Clinical guidelines, best practice advice, case studies, and patient resources on a wide variety of related topics. Some learning opportunities even offer free CME and MOCs, many of the meetings, what we organize in the conferences also. We are also looking forward the high value research also. And we also given the place and platform on our ACP annual conference for various researches which has been done under the guidance of a ACP in last two years, in which I can uh, I can tell about the few, one was the COVID diabetes, another was the TPDOS, and today we have seen the doctor's health study, which has been presented by Dr. Anubha Srivastava and Dr. Srinivas Murthy. So medical ethics and professionalism is a thing which is to be propagated and is being propagated by ACP. ACP's Center for Ethics and Professionalism is devoted to policy development, implementation and education on issues of medical ethics and professionalism, and is a resource for ACP members and the public. And this is just which has already been published in ACP Ethics Manual. So last but not the least, future is today, there is no tomorrow. The day of a man's salvation is now, the life of the present of today. Lived earnestly, intently, without a forward-looking thought is the only insurance for the future. Let the limit of your horizon be a 24-hour circle. This is the saying of William Osler, and we should start thinking about that. Not necessary, we should be blindly following everything, but we must keep this thing in our core of the heart, core of the mind, so that we can have a good uh, kind of the human being, we can become a good kind of the doctor and doctor with the touch of the humanity. Thank you very much. <laughs> so what I told in this uh, small talk, on the basis of all these principles, we across the year watched the members of the ACP, what they are doing in their area, what kind of the activities they are doing, and on the basis of we selected chapter awardees. Some of the chapter awardees are on the application basis, but we know that every good person who is doing good work in his area, not applying for the awards. 
So we also picked and choose few of them. We decided and uh, with our committee, which was the credential committee, and we reached to a conclusion that this person should be chosen for this award, what we call the chapter awards. And good thing is that ACP headquarter is also giving the recognition of these award. All the awardees are invited to be in the convocation ceremony of the ACP that will be held at San Diego. And if you will go there, you will be given appropriate honor and you will also be a part of the procession which will be for FACP or uh, usually it has to be only for the FACP granted people. So here in today's uh, uh, award ceremony, we shall be disclosing the chapter awardees, we'll invite them on the dais and we'll also uh, we'll also uh, uh, felicitate them. Apart from that, uh, their felicitation, we shall also felicitate the doctors who has been invited for the FACP this year in San Diego. Those who have been granted FACP and they have been invited to participate in the convocation of the San Diego, they will also be felicitated on this task. So I think uh, Srinivas Murthy wanted to say something. Nothing, sir. Pleasant. Thank you. And please hang around. Now, uh, I'm sure William Asler, sir, will be there in our memories and basics. Back to basics. The team was inspired by William Asler, and that's the app uh, governor's address. And uh, sincerely, thank you, sir. And Dr. Sai, please come on to the dais. And you wanted to felicitate our governor, Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, sir. Sir, please. I want to say something as a token of appreciation. I want to felicitate uh, our governor, ACP governor, Anuj Maheshwari, part for participating in such beach cleaning activity in the morning. So thank you, Dr. Anuj. Now we have one more great news that ACP India chapter has won the Gold Excellence Award among the chapters. And to hand over, I request Dr. Dr. Tiffany to announce this and hand over this to our governor. So the Chapter Excellence Award guides chapters to reach basic expectations in chapter management and inspires chapters through a tiered reward system to achieve excellence. I'm pleased to present this Chapter Excellence Award certificate to Dr. Maheshwari, who is instrumental in making the ACP India chapter an integral part of ACP. Oops, there we go. This award is not a thing which I have earned alone. My all council members, those who are sitting here, I would like to join them on the dais and would like to take this award with them. All council members, please come on the dais. And so, and, uh, this is also to acknowledge that you've um, maintained the excellence of ACP India as a strong and supportive chapter. The chapter achieved the gold tier of the award and Gold tier indicates truly extraordinary, extraordinary chapters that surpass excellence in chapter management by achieving excellence. This level is reached by achieving 21 bronze level activities, 17 silver level activities, and multiple gold level activities. They include holding volunteerism, community service activity, as we just saw, and also holding multiple standalone meetings, having revenue sources outside of dues and meeting registration fees, implementing a strategic plan, implementing a formal recruitment and retention plan, and measuring outcomes, conducting various activities for medical students, residents, and early career physicians. So thank you very much, and congratulations to all of you on this.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we sincerely appreciate all the efforts by our team members. That's our council members. Courts of the Asler, handed over by Dr. Tiffany to our governor. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think now let's move on to the most awaited event of the day. That is felicitation, handing over mementos, and felicitating people who have FACP also. I call upon our governor, Dr. Anuj, sir, to take over. Anuba, you can come on the dice. So for this uh, award ceremony, uh, I think all three persons who has worked very hard for the success of this conference are there. And uh, would like to start calling all the awardees one by one. So please join on the dais and uh, we'll also like one person to be from the audience to come there on the dais and to felicitate the people, those who are there. So first I'm going to start the, with the early career physician. Early career physician, if I announce the award of the early career physician and don't call Amit Gupta, I think this would be very much injustice. <laughs> Amit Gupta is a person who has really worked very hard for the early career physician. Although he is not winning the award, but he is the person who has made the, he has already won the award, a lot of award he has won. Uh, ACP has already given him award last year. But uh, Amit Gupta is a person who has made the ECP council, who helped me in creating the wonderful program which has won the John Tucker Evergreen Award. And uh, throughout the year, he worked very hard he is the person who helped me in starting the Iris project for the women's health. And uh, maybe next year we shall get the award to the women's health also. So uh, he is the person who is instrumental of getting the chapter awards. So I will call upon for early career physician award, Dr. Siddharth Gosavi. Dr. Go Siddharth Gosavi, if you are here, please. And would like Amit to honor all these uh, persons, those who are, yeah, yes, 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 one by one. They start from here. Another is Dr. Rohit Jacob. Dr. Rohit Jacob. Please come in the line so that uh, we may not get uh, uh, more time to waste in coming and going only. Dr. Dhruvi Hasnani. And uh, last but not the least of the Aldi Career Physician Award, our highly energetic, most tremendous Dr. Shed Singh Darya. Darya Sahib is the most uh, vibrant personality of Rajasthan. 
who has shaken whole of the India. <laughs> Now, I must call upon Hospitalist of the Year Award. And I would like to invite the person who has uh, made us learn today how to disclose the bad news to the patient, Dr. N.K. Soni, Dr. Naveen Kumar Soni. The next is Humanitarian of the Year Award to Dr. Ashish Saxena. Where is Ashish Saxena? Next is ACP India Internist Award. So this Internist Award, I would like to call upon a person who has won the ACP India Internist Award last year. He's a uh, member of our uh, council also, Dr. J.K. Sharma. Come on the dais to give the award, not to receive. And recipient of this award are Dr. G.R. Sridhar. Dr. G.R. Sridhar, please join us. Dr. Jia Shridhar has been the convener of this conference also and he helped us in multiple ways for organizing this whole. Dr. Shridhar and Dr. Ram, uh, Raghunandan Digamurthy, these were the two persons. I think Raghunandan Digamurthy is here, he, please stand up so that people can, oh yeah, you are here. So <laughs> give a round of applause for Dr. Raghunandan Digamurthy because he is the person who has uh, done lot of work for the conference silently. He is the person who has got the CME accreditation of the APMC. He is the person who has got printed all the certificates what you are carrying and uh, many other things because whenever a conference is organized so many things are to be done you cannot describe each and everything. Small, small things are there but they are very much important and they are very much required to be done. Uh, I think we can uh, call Dr. Raghunan Digumurti to uh, uh, come on the dais and we can <laughs> felicitate him with one uh, stroll. Yeah, come with this stroll. This, this I would like by myself. Yeah, forget it. 
I would like to do this by myself. Thank you. Next Thank conference. You. Very kind of you. Thank you, sir. Yes. हाँ मुझे मालूम है भूलेंगे नहीं भूलेंगे नहीं नहीं भूलेंगे नहीं उनका काम सीरीज में चलेगा नहीं वो एक्चुअली उस समय उनका नाम लिया ना तो उसी समय पार्टिनेंट का बुलाना डॉक्टर अनिल विरमानी डॉक्टर नरसिंह वर्मा वाज मेकिंग मी रिमेम्बर आई शुड नॉट फॉरगेट हिज नेम डॉक्टर अनिल विरमानी प्लीज ज्वाइन अस ऑन द डायस फॉर द ACP India Internist Award. ACP India Internist Award. ACP India Internist Award is being given to three physicians of the country, those who are the member of ACP also. Because India is such a big country, only one physician cannot be the recipient of the Internist Award. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. सर 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 अरे नो प्रॉब्लम इट्स ओके द थर्ड रेसिपिएंट ऑफ द इंटरनेशनल अवार्ड इज डॉक्टर बीजे पाटनी Now this very important award in the series of uh, announcement that is the Lifetime Achievement Award. And last year this award has been, uh, has been honored to Dr. V. Mohan. This year this award is being conferred to Professor R. K. Sharma. Professor R. K. Sharma is a very eminent personality. He has been the eminent nephrologist. He has been the director. He has been the director of uh, SGPGI and Department of the Nephrology. We'll request, uh, there is some uh, more nephrologist is here. Uh, no. Huh? Somebody is there? Yes, yes, sir. please join. Shivain uh, Kumar. Now, very prestigious researcher of the year award. And last year, this award has been won by our own Dr. Srinivas Murthy. So, Dr. Srinivas Murthy will be felicitating the, this year's researcher of the year award. And uh, I am very pleased to announce that this year, the uh, winner of this award is Dr. Ran Anjana Ranjit Mohan. <laughs> Needless to say, the research credential of Dr. Anjana, I think everybody of us knows whatever that she has done.
तो नेक्स्ट वन इज रेजिडेंट ऑफ द इयर अवार्ड डॉक्टर अर्नब खालरा डॉक्टर अर्नब खालरा हैज वन द डॉक्टर्स डायलेमा लास्ट ईयर बट अनफॉर्चुनेटली वी कुड नॉट टेक हिम टू द शिकागो फॉर द रीजन ही कुड गट द वीजा इन अप्रोप्रिएट टाइम सो दुड नॉट पार्टिसिपेट इन द डॉक्टर्स डायलेमा विच हैपेंड इन द शिकागो डॉक्टर्स डायलेमा इज अ वेरी डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ द कॉम्पिटिशन यूजली वी विच इज ऑर्गेनाइज बाई द ए सी पी वी स्टार्टेड दिस कॉम्पिटिशन सिंस फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी एटीन लखनऊ लेटर ऑन डॉक्टर मुर्गुनाथन हैज गिवेन दिस न्यू हाइट बाई टेकिंग द पार्टिसिपेंट्स टू द यू एस कॉम्पिटिशन ऑल दो वी कुड नॉट मेक एनी ऑफ द पार्टिसिपेंट ट्रेवल टू द यू एस बिकॉज द टाइम वेन डॉक्टर मुर्गुनाथन वॉन्टेड टू मेक दिस पार्टिसिपेंट्स ट्रेवलिंग टू यू एस कोविड अखर्ड एंड दे कुड नॉट गो देयर बट दैट टीम पार्टिसिपेटेड फ्रॉम हियर ओनली एंड दैट टीम हैज वन दैट अवार्ड इट वॉज द विनर ऑफ दैट अवार्ड द नेक्स्ट ईयर वी हैव चूज एन अनदर टीम इन विच डॉक्टर अर्नब कालरा वॉज द पार्टिसिपेंट वॉज द पार्टिसिपेंट एंड फ्यू मोर वर ऑल्सो विद हिम एंड बट ही वॉज द फर्स्ट वन हु हैज गॉट द हाइएस्ट मार्क्स बट अनफॉर्चुनेटली ही कुड नॉट गो टू द यू एस बिकॉज ऑफ द वीजा रीजन अगेन दिस ईयर ही इज वन ऑफ द सेलेक्टेड पार्टिसिपेंट ही हैज अगेन पार्टिसिपेटेड इन दैट ही हैज बीन सेलेक्टेड लेट सी वेदर वी कुड टेक हिम देयर और नॉट बट दिस मच इज एनफ टू अवॉर्ड हिम एट द रेजिडेंट ऑफ द ईयर अवार्ड for this award i would like that dr swati should also join us on the dais because dr swati shrivastava is that lady who has organized doctors dilemma both the years and she uh, took all the pain alone selected the candidates thank you thank you thank you arnab thank you there are some more residents recognition award for the leadership and these are those residents which have been participants of again the doctors dilemma which made us proud being selected in the doctors dilemma and also being a part of the team which has won the cup also one is dr kavya np dr kavya np if she is there she can come no Dr. Bhavesh Mohan Lal, I think he is also not here. Dr. Santosh P. He was calling me for two three days. I don't know why he is not here. Dr. Pallavi Goel. Yeah, at least one is there. teacher of the year award for the teacher of the year award our credential committee has chosen dr haider abbas join us here and 
लास्ट ईयर दिस अवार्ड हैज बीन ऑनर टू डॉक्टर नरसिंह वर्मा एंड डॉक्टर जैन पांडा चैप्टर एडवोकेसी अवार्ड डॉक्टर रघुनाथ राव दिगुमूर्ति वेर इज ही कहाँ गए अभी तो थे आई थिंक ये लेफ्ट ओके नो प्रॉब्लम इफ ही कम्स बैक देन वी कैन अगेन चैप्टर लीडर अवार्ड डॉक्टर अमित गुप्ता For this, uh, I will request Dr. Mulnathan to come on the dais and give the Amit Chapter Leader Award because Dr. Murugnathan is also have been one of the chapter leader in all the year days. Tim, ha, who are they? There is another one I am going to read that is ACP India Chapter Clinical Practice Award which is being given Dr. Manoj Chawla. ACP Community Teaching Award and this is being honored to Dr. Abhishek Srivastav from Jabalpur. He is an endocrinologist and hardworking clinician of the Jabalpur, organized resident update and few more updates on the ACP. <laughs> Green hota to match karta court se. Congratulations. Party party. Party party. Party party. Distinguished Teacher Award. Dr. Divendu Bhushan he is a professor of medicine at AIMS Patna. Then ACP India Educator Award, there are two teachers who are being offered, uh, honored with this award, Dr. Mohammad Riyaz, Dr. Mohammad Riyaz. And another one is Dr. Shivendra Kumar Singh. Dr. Shivendra Kumar Singh is head of the Department of Nephrology at BHU. And Mohammad Diaz, I think many of us knows about him. He is a professor of medicine at Hyderabad. So 
now we can give some more people the opportunity to give a word. Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. J.K. Sharma, sir, and Dr. Murugnathan, sir, please. So, sir. It's nominated. There is one very unique award that is called as Fostering Diversity Award. And uh, when I was uh, thinking about this award, I was just, uh, I could just found one name very much appropriate for, for this award and who, who belongs to the place of Dr. Murunathan is Dr. M. Gauri Shankar. Dr. M. Gauri Shankar. <laughs> we'll request uh, Dr. Jain Panda to join us on the dais. Dr. Gauri Shankar every day writes uh, one uh, history in medicine at uh, social media. CM India group. You must have received that in uh, various social media platforms, including the WhatsApp every day. Here it is matching perfectly with the quote. And all of those who are going, who are receiving this medal, if you join the convocation at San Diego in the ACP annual conference, don't forget to your, take your medal with you. Your medal would be the entry card there. Thank you so much. Am I right, Wendy? Thank you. <laughs> so last year, many people has not gone with that. very touchy topic which is uh, taken by ACP multiple times and that is wellness award. Wellness award is the thing which is uh, which attracts so many people. ACP has taken it very eminently and uh, for this award we have chosen a person who is really working for this that is Dr. N.K. Singh from Rachi. <laughs> Sorry. Dr. N.K. Singh from Dhanbad. Dr. N.K. Singh from Dhanbad. Uh, we'll request uh, Dr. C.L. Naval to join here and uh, honor Dr. N.K. Singh. Hi, sir. Volunteer Faculty of the Year Award. Next one. Volunteer Faculty of the Year Award. Yeah. Dr. Amit Day. Dr. Amit Day is a very ambitious member of ACP who has done work to promote ACP. He has made multiple members. He has organized many programs in Calcutta and nearby area with Dr. Supratik Bhattacharya and others. Dr. Vijay Patni has also been associated with him very closely. <laughs> this is entry pass of US. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
there is very important award that is called as Woman Physician of the Year Award. For this award, if I don't call Dr. Divya Saxena, that would be very wrong. <laughs> Dr. Divya Saxena is uh, our uh, Women Wing Chair. But uh, this award is being given to Dr. Jyoti Bajpayee and Dr. Divya Saxena will honor Dr. Jyoti Bajpayee. Thank you, 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 thank so just take it. Now we will call you. The one name has been left out uh, from the list of uh, uh, resident recognition award, Dr. P. Vijay Kumar. Sorry, uh, Ravi Kumar. R P. Ravi Kumar. So Ravi Kumar, please join us on the dais. And thanks, Amit. You made us reminded. No, it was different. And Dr. Ravi Kumar has also participated in the Doctor's Dilemma this year. And he has been uh, first four, am I right? First four, uh, those who have been uh, selected for the competition. Colonel Ravi Kumar. Colonel Ravi Kumar. Hmm? Governor's uh, Organization Award. Hmm? So there is a, there are few awards which are being given by Governor's discretion in which uh, we call that Governor's Recognition Award. These are those awards which we don't find the category for them, but they have worked very hard throughout the year for one thing or another thing in conferences, programs, other things. So we give them the Special Recognition Award that is called as Governor's Recognition Award. For this award, we have shortlisted few doctors. Dr. Asit Khanna, Dr. Asit Khanna, if you are here, okay. Dr. Sudarshan Balaji, good. Dr. Shafiq Ahmed, Dr. Shafiq Ahmed, Dr. Akshit Manaswi, Dr. Abhinav Verma. आप लोग रुक जाओ सबका एक साथ पिक्चर्स लेते हैं ना फिर अभी there's one more person ना किसका शफी हाँ शफी किस नॉट देयर Stay back. Uh, next, love. Dr. 
डॉक्टर वर्मा आप भी खड़े हुई आकर के We all can be together for a picture. Shafiq नहीं आया ना? अगर आप खड़े हो तो लोग लाइन लगाएं। Yes, yes, yes. तो उसमें लाइन से लगे हुए ना, तो भूल जाएंगे वो, है ना? वो मेरे किसके पास है वो पेपर? अभी किसका है अपने पास? या या अंदर। Yes yes yes. So that is on sequence. So ACP India Excellence Award is being honoured for Dr. Jyoti Dev. For his excellent work throughout the year, number of publications coming out from his center, he is the person keep on involving multiple activities, maybe the social education, maybe the research activity. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations. This year, ACP has started very unique, uh, ah, yes, very unique award. That was the award for outstanding women contributing in the women's health. So we have actually this year we started the Iris project and we thought that we should select those doctors who are working for the women's health. So we decided them, mostly women's work for the women's health. The so competition is very tough there. But uh, if a man works for the women's health, then competition comparatively lesser, but I don't say that it is not very easy to do that. Yes. So in the category of the award for outstanding women contributing in the women's health, is none other than our own Dr. Divya Saxena. ACP India Women Educator Award. There are the two uh, persons who have been selected for this award. One is Dr. Purvi Chawla, who always remained very busy for multiple conferences, speaking at one time, and mostly remains in the flight. So please join us, Dr. Purvi Chawla. Abhi bhi somebody came and said in my ear that Dr. Purvi Chawla has to catch the flight. <laughs> you please do it early. Any more council member who have been left, who I have not called up, so you can please come or, uh, by yourself also. Whosoever I can see that, uh, Dr. R. R. Singh is there. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Another ACP India Women Educator Award is for Dr. Preeti Singh Dwat. 
and uh, I think many people may be knowing for last one day Priti Singh Dohat is doing tremendously very hard work and our uh, free paper session which has been organized virtually online whole free paper session has been single handedly organized by her <laughs> coordinated with all the judges prepared the results and Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, very good, good job. Now, uh, it's time for that award for the outstanding men who is contributing for the women's health. Can anybody guess? Outstanding men who is contributing to the women's health. Is uh, Hamari is meeting me. I just want to know is uh, the